the Philippine Islands A Political, Geographical, Ethnographical, Social, and Commercial History of the Philippine Archipelago Embracing the Whole Period of Spanish Rule with an Account of the Succeeding American Insular Government by John Foreman, FRGS 3rd Edition, Revised and Enlarged with Maps and Illustrations London, T. Fisher Unwin 1, Adelphi Terrace. McVie Table of Contents Preface to the First Edition Preface to the Third Edition Table of Contents List of Illustrations Introduction General Description of the Archipelago Discovery of the Archipelago Philippine Dependencies, up to 1898, the Ladrones, Carolines, and Palu Islands attempted conquest by Chinese early relations with Japan conflicts with the Dutch-British occupation of Manila the Chinese wild tribes and pagans Mahometans and southern tribes domesticated natives origin character. The religious orders Spanish insular government Spanish Philippine finances trade of the islands, its early history agriculture Manila hemp coffee tobacco sundry forest and farm produce, maize cacao copra, etc. mineral products, coal gold iron copper sulfur, etc. domestic livestock ponies, buffaloes, etc. Manila under Spanish rule the Tagalog Rebellion of 1896-98, first period the Tagalog Rebellion of 1896-98, second period, American intervention and outline of the War of Independence, period. 1899-1901 The Philippine Republic in the Central and Southern Islands The Spanish Prisoners End of the War of Independence and After Modern Manila The Land of the Moros, Allah Akbar. The Spanish Friars, after 1898 trade and agriculture since the American Advent Trade Statistics Chronological Table of Leading Events Index printed and bound by Hazel, Watson and Viney, LD, London, and Aylesbury v. Preface to the first edition It would be surprising if the concerns of an interesting colony like the Philippine Islands had not commanded the attention of literary genius. I do not pretend, therefore, to improve upon the able productions of such eminent writers as Juan de L. E. Concepcion, Martinez Zuniga, Tomas de Comen and others, nor do I aspire, through this brief composition, to detract from the merit of Jagger's work which, in its day, commended itself as a valuable book of reference. But since then, and within the last twenty years, this colony has made great strides on the path of social and material progress, its political and commercial importance is rapidly increasing, and many who know the Philippines have persuaded me to believe that my notes would be an appreciated addition to what was published years ago on this subject. The critical opinions herein expressed are based upon personal observations made during the several years I have traveled in and about all the principal islands of the archipelago, and are upheld by reference to the most reliable historical records. An author should be benevolent in his judgment of men and manners and guarded against mistaking isolated cases for rules. In matters of history he should neither hide the truth nor twist it to support a private view, remembering how easy it is to criticize an act when its sequel is developed, such will be my aim in the fullest measure consistent. By certain classes I may be thought to have taken a hypercritical view of things, I may even offend their susceptibilities if I adulated them I should fail to chronicle the truth, and my work would be a deliberate imposture. I would desire it to be understood, with regard to the classes and six races in their collectedness, that my remarks apply only to the large majority, exceptions undoubtedly there are these form the small minority. Moreover, I need hardly point out that the native population of the capital of the Philippines by no means represents the true native character, to comprehend which, so far as its complicacy can be fathomed, one must penetrate into and reside for years in the interior of the colony, as I have done, in places where extraneous influences have, as yet, produced no effect. There may appear to be some incongruity in the plan of a work which combines objects so dissimilar as those enumerated in the contents pages, but this is not exclusively a history, or a geography, or an account of travels it is a concise review of all that may interest the reader who seeks for a general idea of the condition of affairs in this colony in the past and in the present. JF7 Preface to the Third Edition The success which has attended the publication of the second edition of this work has induced me to revise it carefully throughout, adding the latest facts of public interest up to the present period. Long years of personal acquaintance with many of the prime movers in the Revolutionary Party enabled me to estimate their aspirations. 
my associations with Spain and Spaniards since my boyhood help me, as an eyewitness of the outbreak of the rebellion, to judge of the opponents of that movement. My connection with the American Peace Commission in Paris afforded me an opportunity of appreciating the noble desire of a free people to aid the lawful aspirations of millions of their fellow creatures. My criticism of the regular clergy applies only to the four religious confraternities in their lay capacity of government agents in these islands and not to the Jesuit or the Paul Fathers, who have justly gained the respect of both Europeans and natives, neither is it intended, in any degree, as a reflection on the sacred institution of the Church. I take this opportunity of acknowledging, with gratitude, my indebtedness to Governor General Lukey Wright, Major General Leonard Wood, Colonel Philip Reed, Major Hugh L. Scott, Captain E. N. Jones, Captain C. H. Martin, Captain Henry C. Cabell, Captain George Bennett, Captain John P. Finley, Dr. David P. Barrows, Mr. Tobias Epstein, and many others too numerous to mention, who gave me such valuable and cordial assistance in my recent investigations throughout the archipelago. This book is not written to promote the interests of any person or party, and so far as is consistent with guiding the reader to a fair appreciation of the facts recorded, controversial comment has been avoided, for to pronounce a just dictum on the multifarious questions eight involved would demand a catholicity of judgment never concentrated in the brain of a single human being. I am persuaded to believe that the bare truth, unvarnished by flattery, will be acceptable to the majority, amongst whom may be counted all those educated Americans whose impartiality is superior to their personal interest in the subject at issue. It is therefore confidently hoped that the present edition may merit that approval from readers of English which has been so graciously accorded to the previous ones. J.F. September 1905 9 Table of Contents Introduction Chapter I General Description of the Archipelago Geographical Features of the Islands Limits Mountains Thirteen Rivers Lakes Volcanoes Eruptions of the Mayon and Tal Volcanoes Fourteen Monsoons Seasons Temperature Rains Climate Earthquakes 22 Chapter 2 Discovery of the Archipelago Hernando de Magallanes Treaty of Tordesillas 24 Discovery of Magellan Straits and the Ladrone Islands 27 Death of Magallanes Elcano's Voyage Round the World 28 The Loisa Expedition The Villalobos Expedition Andres de Urdaneta 31 Miguel de Legaspi, His Expedition, He Reaches Cebu dethrones King Tupas. 33 Manila is proclaimed the capital of the archipelago. 36 Martin de Goiti. Once all Cito. Native local government initiated. 37 Chapter 3 Philippine Dependencies, up to 1898 The Ladrone, Caroline, and Palu Islands. 39 First Mission to the Ladrone Islands. Palu Islanders. Caroline Islanders. 40 Spain's possession of the Caroline Islands disputed by Germany. 44 Poseidio, governor of the Caroline Islands, is murdered. 45 The Ladrone, Caroline, and Palu Islands, except Guam, sold to Germany. 46 Chapter 4 Attempted conquest by Chinese Li Mahong, a Chinese corsair, attacks Manila. 47 He settles in Pangasinan, evacuates the islands. 49 Rivalry of Lay and Monastic Authorities Philip II's Decree of Reforms 51 X Manila Cathedral Founded Mendicant Friars Archbishopric Created 55 Supreme Court Suppressed and Re-Established Church and State Contentions 57 Murder of Government General Bustament Bustillo The Monks in Open Riot 60 Chapter V Early Relations with Japan The Catholic Missions The Emperor of Japan Demands the Surrender of the Islands 63 Fray Pedro Bautista's Mission, he and 25 others are crucified 65 Jesuit and Franciscan Jealousy The Martyr's Mortal Remains Lost at Sea 67 Emperor Takasuma Explains His Policy Further Missions and Executions 68 Missionary Martyrs Declared Saints 
Emperor of Japan sends a shipment of lepers. 70 Spaniards expelled from Formosa by the Dutch. Missions to Japan abandoned. 71 Chapter 6 Conflicts with the Dutch The Spanish expedition to the Moluccas fails. 72 Chinese mutiny, murder the Spanish leader, and take the ship to Cochin, China. 73 Expeditions of Bravo de Acuna and Pedro de Heredia. Battle of Playa Honda. 74 Coxinga, a Chinese adventurer, threatens to attack the colony. 76 Vittorio Riccio, an Italian monk, visits Manila as Coxinga's ambassador. 77 Chinese goaded to rebellion, great massacre. 77 vicissitudes of Gov's general. Defalcations. Impeachments. 78 Government General Fajardo de Tua kills his wife and her paramour. 80 Separation of Portugal and Spain, 1640. Spanish failure to capture Macau. 81 Nunneries. Mother Cecilia's Love Adventures. Santa Clara Convent. 81 The High Host is Stolen. Inquisition. Letter of Anathema. 82 The Spanish Prime Minister Valenzuela is banished to Cavita. 83 Monsignor Maillard de Ternon, the papal legate. 84 His arrogance and eccentricities, he dies in prison at Macau. 85 Question of the Regium Exequator. Philip V.S. Edict of Punishments. 86 Chapter 7 British Occupation of Manila Coalition of France and Spain against England by the Family Compact. 87 Simon de Anda y Salazar usurps the Archbishop Governor's authority. 88 British bombard Manila. Archbishop Governor Rojo capitulates. 89 British in possession of the city. Sack and pillage. Agreed indemnity. 90 Simon de Anda y Salazar defies Governor Rojo and declares war. 91 British carry war into the provinces. Bustos opposes them. 92 Bustos completely rooted. Chinese take the British side. 93 Massacre of Chinese. Villa Corda's fate. The Filipino treasure. 94 Simon de Anda y Salazar offers rewards for British heads. 95 11 Austin Friars on Battlefields. Peace of Paris, February 10, 1763. 96 Archbishop Governor Rojo dies. La Torre appointed government general. 97 British evacuate Manila. La Torre allows Anda to receive back the city. 98 Anda goes to Spain, is rewarded by the king, returns as government general. 99 Anda is in conflict with the outgoing governor, the Jesuits, and the friars. 99 Anda dies in hospital, 1776. His burial place and monument. 100 Rebellion succeeds the war. Ilico's rebellion led by Diego de Silan. 100 Revolt in Bajal Island led by Dagahoy. 101 Revolts in Leyte Island Surajao, Mindanao is, and Samar Island. 102 Rebellion of King Malong and Count Gumapo. 103 Rebellion of Andres Novals. Execution of A. Novals and Ruiz. 104 Apolinario de la Cruz declares himself king of the Tagalogs. 105 General Marcelo Azcarraga, Spanish War Minister, Philippine born. 105 The Cavita Conspiracy of 1872. The Secret Society of Reformers. 106 The Philippine Martyrs, Dr. Burgos and Fathers Zamora and Gomez. 107 Illustrious Exiles Dr. Antonio M. Regidor and Jose M. Basa. 108 Chapter 8 The Chinese The China Manila Trade in the Days of Legaspi. 109 The Alcaceria. The Parian. Chinese Banished. Restrictions. 110 The Chinese as Immigrants, Their Comparative Activity. 112 Chinese Mandarins Come to Seek the Mount of Gold in Cavita. 114 The Chinese are goaded to revolt. St. Francis victory over them. 115 Massacre of foreigners. The Chinese traders, their guilds. 
116, Chinese patron saint, population. The Sangli. The Macau. 118 restrictions on Chinese immigration. Their gradual exclusion. 119 Chapter 9 Wild Tribes and Pagans The Edas or Negritos or Bailugas. 120 The Gadanes. The Atabas. The Igor Rotes. The Ibanax. 122 Attempt to subdue the Igor Rotes. Its failure. 124 The Kalinas. The Igoro Chinese. The Tinguians. 125 The Bazans. The Mangians. The Hindus. Albinos. 128 Chapter X Mahometans and Southern Tribes Early History of the Mahometans, called Moros. 129 The First Expedition Against the Mindanao Moros. 130 Government General Corcuera Effects a Landing in Sulu Island. 131 The Scourge of Moro Piracy. Devastation of the Coasts. Captives. 132 Samboanga Ford, Cost of its Maintenance. Fighting Friars. 133 12 Vicissitudes of Sultan Muhammad al Imutin. 134 The Sultan appeals to his suzerain's delegate and is made prisoner. 134 His letter to Sultan Mohammed Amirabdin. 135 The charges against the Sultan. Extermination of Miras decreed. 136 Mindanao and Sulu Moros join forces. Extermination impossible. 137 The treaty with Sultan Muhammad al Imutin. 138 The Claveria and Urbistondo expeditions against Moros. 139 Government General Malcampo finally annexes Holo, 1876. 140 Spain appoints Harun Narasid Sultan of Sulu, 1885. 141 The Ceremony of Investiture. Opposition to the Nominee. 142 De Toado defies the Spaniards. Torero's Expedition, January, 1887. 143 Colonel Arola's victory at Maybon, Sulu is. April, 1887. 144 The Marawi Campaign, 1895. The Moro Tribes. 145 The Juramantadu. Moro Dress, Character, Arts, Weapons. 146 Moro Customs. The Pundita. The Ditto. 148 Holo, Sulu, Town. HH The Sultan of Sulu. 149 A Juramantadu runs amok. Across Sulu Island to Maybun. 152 The Sultan's Official Reception. Subuanos of Samboanga. 154 Climate in the South. Palauan Island. Spanish Settlers. 157 Across Palauan Island. The Tugbanuas Tribe. 158 Their Dress, Customs, and Country. 159 Efforts to Colonize Palauan Island. The Moro Problem. 160 Chapter 11 Domesticated Natives Origin Character Theory Concerning the First Inhabitants of These Islands. 163 Their Advent Before the Spanish Conquest. 165 Japanese and Chinese Early Immigrants. 166 Native Character, Idiosyncrasies and Characteristics. 167 Notion of Sleep. Castilla. 169 Tagalog and Visaya Hospitality. The Natives' Good Qualities. 172 Native Aversion to Discipline, Bravery, Resignation, Geniality. 175 Mixed Races. Native Physiognomy, Marriages, Minors' Rights. 176 Family Names. The Catapuzan. 179 Dancing, the Balintau, the Comitan, the Azuan. 180 Mixed Marriages. The Half-Caste, Mestizo. 
181 The Shrines and Saints The Holy Child of Cebu Saint Francis of Tears 183 Our Lady of Cagsese The Virgin of Antipolo 184 Miraculous Saints Sant Ones Native Conception of Religion 187 Musical Talent Slavery Education in Spanish Times 190 The Intellectuals The Illiterates State Aid for Schools 192 The Athenaeum Girls Colleges St. Thomas's University 194 The Nautical School The Provincial Student Talented Natives 195 Diseases Leprosy Insanity Death Rate Sanitation 197 Chapter 12 The Religious Orders Their Early Cooperation and Necessity 199 Their Power and Influence 213 Opinions for and against that power 201 The Spanish Parish Priest Father Pierre Navigia 202 Virtuous Friars Monastic Persecution 204 The Hierarchy The Orders Church Revenues and State Aid 206 Rivalry of Religious Orders Papal Intervention to Ensure Peace 209 Chapter 13 Spanish Insular Government The Encomiendas The Trading Governors 211 The Judge Governors, all called a Mayor The Reforms of 1886 213 Cost of Spanish Insular Government The Provincial Civil Governor's Duties 214 The Position of Provincial Civil Governor Local Funds Provincial Poverty 216 Highways and Public Works Cause of National Decay 218 Fortunes Made Easily Peculations Town Local Government 220 The Gobernator Sio, Petty Governor The Cabeza de Baranai, Tax Collector 222 The Cuadrilero, Guard The Phallus, Tax The Sadala Personal 224 The Tribunal, Town Hall Reforms Affecting Travelers 225 Chapter 14 Spanish Philippine Finances Philippine Budgets Curious Items of Revenue and Expenditure 227 Spanish Philippine Army, Police and Constabulary Statistics 230 The Armed Forces in the Olden Times 232 Spanish Philippine Navy and Judicial Statistics 233 Prison Statistics Brigandage The Brigand Superstition 235 A Chase for Brigands the Antying Antying Pirates 237 The Notorious Tankard Dilatory Justice A Cause Celebre 239 Spanish Philippine Criminal Law Procedure 241 Chapter 15 Trade of the Islands from Early Times Its Early History Its State Galleons 243 The Consolado Merchants The Mexican Subsidy 244 In the Days of the Mexican Galleons The Obras Pias 245 Losses of the Treasure-Laden Galleons Trade Difficulties 246 The Period of Restrictions on Trade Prohibitory Decrees 248 The Manila Merchants Alarmed, Appeal to the King 249 Penalties on Free Traders Trading Friars the budget for 1757 250 decline of trade spanish trading company failures 252 the real compania de filipinas its privileges and failure 253 the dawn of free trade foreign traders admitted 254 manila port unrestrictedly open to foreigners 1834 becomes known to the world. 256 14 Pioneers of Foreign Trade Foreign and Philippine Banks 
257 The Spanish Philippine currency. Mexican dollar smuggling. 259 Ports of Samboanga, Iloilo, Cebu, and Sewol open to foreign trade. 261 Mail service. Carrying trade. Middlemen. Native industries. 263 The first Philippine railway. Telegraph service. Seclusion of the colony. 265 Chapter 16 Agriculture Interest on Loans to Farmers Land Values and Tenure in Luzon Island 269 Sugarcane Lands and Cultivation Land Measures 271 Process of Sugar Extraction Labor Conditions on Sugar Estates 273 Sugar Statistics World's Production of Cane and Beet Sugar 275 Rice Rice Measure Rice Machinery, Husking, Purling, Statistics 276 Macon and Pega Rice Rice Planting and Trading 278 Chapter 17 Manila Hemp Coffee Tobacco Musa Text Elise Extraction and Uses of the Fiber Machinery 281 Hemp Experiments in British India Cultivation Qualities 283 Labor Difficulties Statistics Albay Province, Local, Land Measure 286 Coffee Coffee Dealing and Cultivation 289 Tobacco The Government Tobacco Monopoly 292 Tobacco Growing by Compulsory Labor Condition of the Growers 294 Tobacco Monopoly Abolished Free Trade in Tobacco 296 Tobacco Trading Risks, Qualities, Districts Cigar Values 299 Chapter 18 Sundry Forest and Farm Produce Maize Cacao Beans Chocolate 300 Cacao Cultivation Castor Oil Gogo 302 Camote Gabby. Potatoes. Mani, peanut. Arakanut. Bio. 303 coconuts. Extraction of tuba, beverage. 304 coconut oil extraction. Copra. Coir. 305 nipa palm. Cogon grass. Cotton tree. 307 buri palm. Dita. Palma Brava Bamboo 308 Bojo Bijuko, Rattan Cane Palasin, Bushrope 310 Gum Mastic Gutta Percha Wax Cinnamon Edible Bird's Nest 311 Ballad, Trepang Supon Wood Tree Saps 312 Hardwoods Varieties and Qualities 313 Molave Wood Tensile and Transverse Experiments 315 Relative Strengths of Hardwoods Timber Trade 317 Fruits, the Mango, the Banana, the Pawpaw, etc. 318 Guavas, Pineapples, Tamarinds, the Mabalo 320 Sundry Vegetable Produce Flowers 32115 Botanical Specimens Curious and Beautiful Orchids 322 Firewoods, Locust Beans, Amor Seco 324 Botanical Names Given to Islands, Towns etc. 324 Medicinal Herbs, Roots, Leaves and Barks Perfumes 325 Chapter 19 Mineral Products Coal Import Coal Mining Ventures 326 Comparative Analyses of Coal 328 Gold Mining Ventures The Parakale and Mombalau Mines 329 Iron Mining Ventures Failures, Poverty and Suicide 332 Copper Marble Stone Gypsum Sulfur Mineral Oil 
334 Chapter XX Domestic Livestock Ponies, Buffaloes, etc. Ponies Horses Buffaloes, Carabaos 336 Donkeys Mules Sheep Fish Insects Reptiles Snakes 338 Butterflies White Ants Bats Deer Wild Boars 340 Fowls Birds The Locust Plague Edible Insects 341 Chapter XXI Manila Under Spanish Rule The Fortified City The Moats The Drawbridges 343 Public Buildings in the City The Port in Construction 344 Manila Bay Corregidor Island and Marivals 345 The Pasig River Public Lighting Tonda Suburb 346 Binondo Suburb Chinese and Native Artificers 347 Easter Week The Vehicle Traffic 348 The Theaters The Carrillo The Moro Moro Performance 349 The Bullring Annual Feasts Cockfighting 350 European Club Hotels the Press Spanish Journalism 351 Botanical Gardens Dwelling Houses 353 Manila Society Water Supply Climate 354 Population of the Islands in 1845, of Manila in 1896 355 Typhoons and Earthquakes Affecting Manila 356 dress of both sexes. A first class funeral. 357 excursions from Manila. Los Banos. 359 the story of Los Banos and Jala Jala. The legend of Guadalupe Church. 360 chapter XXII the Tagalog rebellion of 1896 to 98 first period the Cortes de Cadiz. Philippine deputies in the peninsula. 362 The Assembly of Reformists. Effect of the Cavite Rising of 1872. 363 16 Official Acts Conducive to Rebellion. The Katipunan League. 364 Arrest of Prominent Filipinos. The First Overt Act of Rebellion. 366 War Commences. The Battle of San Juan del Monte 368 Execution of Sancho Valenzuela and others 369 Andres Bonifacio heads the movement. He is superseded by Emilio Aguinaldo. 370 Imus, Cavita, is captured by the rebels. The History of Imus 372 Atrocities of the Rebels Rebel Victory at Binacayan 373 Execution of 13 Rebels in Cavita. The Rebel Chief Lainras in Bulacan. 374 Volunteers are enrolled. Tragedy at Fort Santiago, cartloads of corpses. 375 A Court Martial Cabal. Government General Blanco is recalled. 376 The Rebels destroy a part of the railway. They threaten an assault on Manila. 377 General Camilo Polavieja succeeds Blanco as government general. 378 General Lach Ambra, the liberator of Cavita. Polavieja returns to Spain. 379 Dr. Jose Rizal, the Philippine ideal patriot, his career and hopes. 381 His return to Manila, banishment, liberation, rearrest, and execution. 383 The Love Romance of Dr. Jose Rizal's Life 387 General Primo de Rivera succeeds Polavieja as Government General 389 The Government General decrees concentration, its bad effect 391 The Rebels define their demands in an exhortation to the people 
392 Emilio Aguinaldo now claims independence. 394 Don Pedro A. Paterno acts as peace negotiator. 395 The protocol of peace between the rebels and the government general. 396 The alleged treaty of Bayacanabato, December 14, 1897. 397 The Primo de Rivera Paterno agreement as to indemnity payment. 398 Emilio Aguinaldo in exile. Peace rejoicings. Spain defaults. 399 The rebel chiefs being in exile, the people are goaded to fresh revolt. 400 The tragedy of the Calle de Camba. Cebu Island rises in revolt. 401 The Cebuanos raid on Cebu City, Ludao in flames, piles of corpses. 402 Exciting adventures of American citizens. Here trending scenes in Cebu City. 404 Raja Muta de Tomundi visits Cebu. Rebels in Bolineo, Zimbals. 406 Relief of Bolineo. Father Santos of Malolos is murdered. 408 The peacemaker states his views on the reward he expects from Spain. 409 Don Maximo Paterno, the Philippine Grand Old Man. 411 Biographical sketch of his son, Don Pedro A. Paterno. 411 General Basilio Augusti succeeds Primo de Rivera as government general. 413 The existence of a peace treaty with the rebels is denied in the Spanish Cortes. 414 Chapter XXIII The Tagalog Rebellion of 1896-98 Second Period American Intervention Events Leading to the Spanish-American War, April, August, 1898 417 Events Preliminary to the Naval Battle of Cavita, May 1, 1898 419 Aspirations of the Revolutionary Party 420 Revolutionary Exhortation Denouncing Spain 421 Allocution of the Archbishop of Madrid to the Spanish Army 423 Government General Basilio Augusti issues a call to arms 42417 His Proclamation Declaring a State of War with America 425 War in the Islands Approaching Flight of Noncombatants 426 The Naval Battle of Cavita. Destruction of the Spanish Fleet. 427 The Stars and Stripes Hoisted at Cavita. 429 The First News of the Naval Defeat Raises Panic in Madrid. 431 Emilio Aguinaldo Returns from Exile to Cavita, May 19, 1898. 432 Revolutionary Exhortation to the People to Aid America. 433 In the beleaguered city of Manila. German Attitude. 434 The Merchant's Harvest. Run on the Banco Español Filipino. 435 General Aguinaldo becomes dictator. Filipinos congratulate America. 436 Conditions in and around Manila. Senor Paterno's Pro-Spanish Manifesto. 438 The Revolutionists' Refutation of Senor Paterno's Manifesto. 440 General Monet's Terrible Southward March with Refugees. 445 Terror-Stricken Refugees' Flight for Life. The Maccabees. 446 The Revolutionary Government Proclaimed. Statutes of Constitution. 448 Message of the Revolutionary President accompanying the proclamation. 454 The Revolutionists Appeal to the Powers for Recognition. 457 Spain Makes Peace Overtures to America. The Protocol of Peace. 458 The Americans Prepare for the Attack on Manila. 460 The Americans Again Demand the Surrender of Manila. 461 The Americans Attack on Manila, August 13, 1898. 462 Spain's Blood Sacrifice for the Honor of the Country. 464 Capitulation of Manila to the Americans, August 14, 1898. 465 The Americans' First Measures of Administration in Manila. 
467 trade resumed. Liberty of the Press. Malolos, Bulacan, the rebel capital. 468 General Aguinaldo's triumphal entry into Malolos. 470 The Paris Peace Commission, October Deck, 1898. 471 Peace concluded in Paris between America and Spain, December 10, 1898. 472 Innovations in Manila Customs. Spanish Government in Visayas. 473 Strained Relations between the Rebels and the Americans. 475 Rebels attack the Spaniards in Visayas. The Spaniards evacuate the Visayas. 476 The End of Spanish Rule. The Rebels' Disagreement. 478 Text of the Treaty of Peace between America and Spain. 479 Chapter XXIV An Outline of the War of Independence Period, 1899-1901 Insurgents Prepare for the Coming Conflict. 484 Anti-American Manifesto. The Philippine Republic. 486 The War Begins, The Opening Shot. Battle of Paco. 487 Fighting Around Manila, Gagalanging. Manila in Flames. 489 Battle of Marilao. Capture of Malolos, the insurgent capital. 490 Proclamation of American Intentions. Santa Cruz, La Laguna, captured. 493 Effect of the War on Public Opinion in America. 495 Insurgent Defeat. Columpet captured. Insurgents ask for an armistice. 496 Insurgent Tactics. General Lawton in Cavita. 499 Violent Death of General Antonio Luna. 501 General Aguinaldo's Manifesto, his pathetic allusion to the past. 502 18 Insurgents Destroy the SS Saturnus. Death of General Lawton. 503 War on the Wayne. Many Chiefs Surrender. 505 Partial Disbandment of the Insurgent Army Urged by Hunger. 506 Capture of General Emilio Aguinaldo, March 23, 1901. 507 He Swears Allegiance to America. His Home at Canet, Cavita Viejo. 509 Chapter XXV The Philippine Republic in the Central and Southern Islands The Spaniards Evacuate Iloilo, December, 1898. Native Government There. 511 General Miller Demands the Surrender of Iloilo. The Panay Army. 512 Riotous Insurgent Soldiery. Flight of Civilians. 513 The Iloilo Native Government Discusses the Crisis in Open Assembly. 514 Mob Riot. Iloilo in Flames. Looting anarchy, and terrorism. 515 Bombardment of Iloilo. The American forces enter and the insurgents vanish. 516 Surrender of insurgent leaders. Peace overtures. Water cure. 517 Formal surrender of the Panay Army remnant at Jairo, February 2, 1901. 518 Iloilo Town. Native Government in Negros Island. Peaceful Settlement. 519 An Armed Rabble Overruns Negros Island. 521 Native Government in Cebu Island. American Occupation of Cebu City. 522 Cebuano Insurgents on the Warpath. Peace Signed with Cebuanos. 524 Reformed Government in Cebu Island. Cebu City. 526 American Occupation of Bajal Island. Insurgent Rising Quelled. 528 Native Government in Kot Abado. Slaughter of the Christians. 529 The Spaniards' Critical Position in Samboanga, Mindanao is. 531 Rival Factions and Anarchy in Samboanga. Opportune American Advent. 532 The Rajamuta de Tomati. 
Samboanga Town. 534 Samar and Maranduka Islands under native leaders. 535 Slaughter of American officers and troops at Balanjiga, Samar is. 536 Chapter XXVI The Spanish prisoners The approximate number of Spanish prisoners and their treatment. 537 The Spanish government's dilemma in the matter of the prisoners. 538 Why the prisoners were detained. Baron du Marais ill-fated mission. 539 Further efforts to obtain their release. The captors state their terms. 541 Discussions between Generals E. S. Otis and Nicolas Jaramillo. 542 The Spanish commissioners' ruse to obtain the prisoners' release fails. 543 The end of the Spaniards' captivity. 544 Chapter XXVII End of the War of Independence and after the last of the recognized insurgent leaders. Notorious Outlaws. 545 Apollinario Mabini. Brigands of the old and of the new type. 546 Ferocity of the new cast of brigands. 548 19 The Montalan and Felizardo outlaw bands. 549 The Guards of Honor. The Pulajan in gloomy Samar. 550 Army and Constabulary Statistics. Insurgent Navy. 553 Sedition. Seditious Plays. 554 Land ownership is conducive to social tranquility. 555 Chapter XXVIII Modern Manila Innovations under American Rule. 556 Clubs. Theaters. Hotels. Saloons. The Walled City. 558 The Insular Government. Feast Days. Municipality. 560 Emoluments of High Officials. The Sherman Commission. 561 The Taft Commission. The Philippines for the Filipinos Doctrine. 563 The Philippine Civil Service. Civil Government Established. 565 Constabulary. Secret Police. The Vagrant Act. 567 Army Strength. Military Division. Scout Corps. 569, Chapter XXIX The Land of the Moros The Bates Agreement with the Sultan of Sulu. 571 The Warlike Dittos and Their Clansmen. 573 Captain Pershing's Brilliant Exploits Around Lake Laneo. 574 Storming the Katas. American Pluck. 575 American Policy in Moro Land. Major General Leonard Wood. 576 Constitution of the Moro Province. 577 Municipalities. Tribal Wards. Moro Province Finances. 578 Moro Province Armed Forces. General Wood's Victory at Kudarangan. 580 Dito Pedro Cuevas of Basilan Island. His career. 582 General Wood in Sulu Island. Panglima Hassan. Major H. L. Scott. 584 Major Hugh L. Scott vanquishes Panglima Hassan. Abai Kara. 585 Holo Town. H. H. The Sultan of Sulu. 587 American policy towards the Moro chiefs. 588 The Mangigan's eventful visit to Samboanga. 589 Education and progress in the Moro province. 591 What the Moro province needs. The prospect therein. 592 Chapter Triple X The Spanish Friars, after 1898 Free Cult. Causes of the Anti Friar Feeling. 594 Attitude of the Philippine Clergy. Monsignor Chappell. 596 The Question of the Friars' Lands. American View. 597 The American Government Negotiates with the Holy See. 599 The Pope's Contrary View of the Friars' Case. 600 The Friars' Lands Purchase. 
the approximate acreage. Monsignor Giddy. 601XX The Anti-Friar Feeling Diminishes. The Philippine Independent Church. 602 The Head of the Philippine Independent Church Throws Off Allegiance to the Pope. 604 Conflict Between Catholics and Schismatics. 606 Aglipayan Doctrine. Native Clergy. Monsignor Agius. 607 American Education. The Normal School. The Nautical School. 608 The School for Chinese. The Spanish Schools. 610 The English Language for Orientals. Native Politics. 611 The Philippine Assembly. The Cry for Independence. 612 The Native Interpretation of the Term Protection. 613 Capacity for Self-Government. Population. Bangay Road. 614 Census Statistics. Regulations Affecting Foreign Travelers. 616 Administration of Justice. Provincial Courts. Justices of the Peace. 618 Chapter XXXI Trade and Agriculture Since the American Advent Trade in Wartime. After Effect of War on Trade and Agriculture. 620 Losses in Tilth Cattle. The Congressional Relief Fund. 621 Fruitless Endeavors to Replace the Lost Buffalo Herds. 622 Government Supplies Rise to the Needy. Planters Embarrassments. 623 Agitation for an Agricultural Bank. Bureau of Agriculture. 624 Land Tax. Manila Port Works. The Southern Ports. 626 Need of Roads. Railway Projects. 627 The Carrying Trade. The Shipping Law. Revenue and Expenditure. 628 The Internal Revenue Law. Enormous increase in cost of living. 630 The Democratic Labor Union. The Chinese Exclusion Act. 632 Social position of the Chinese in the islands since 1898. 634 The new Philippine currency, peso conant. 635 American banks. The commercial policy of the future. 637 Trade statistics. Total import and export values. Hemp shipments. 639 Total chief exports. Total sugar export. 640 Tobacco, cigar, and copper shipments. Values of copper and coconut oil. 644 Supon wood, gum mastic, and coffee shipments. 646 Gold and silver imports and exports. Tonnage. Exchange. 647 Proportionate Table of Total Exports. 648 Proportionate Table of Total Imports. 649 Proportionate Table of Staple Exports and Rice Imports. 650 Chronological Table of Leading Events. 651 Index. 655 XXI List of Illustrations The author Frontispiece Tall Volcano Facing 16 Mavon Volcano 16 Effect of the Hurricane of September 26, 1905-23 A Negrito Family 120 An Igor Road Type, Luzon, 128 A Pagan Type, Mindanao, 128 A Tagalog Girl 128 Moro Weapons 132 A Scene in the Moro Country 148 Samboanga Fortress, Fuerza del Pilar, 148 A Visayan Girl 164 A Tagalog Girl 164 A Visayan Planter 172 A Chinese Half Caste 172 A Tagalog Milk Woman 182 A Tagalog Townsman 182 Middle Class Tagalog Natives 196 A Spanish Mexican Galleon 244 A Canoe 244 A Casco, Sailing Barge 244 A Prahua, Sailing Canoe, 244 A Sugar Estate House, 
Southern Philippines 275 shipping hemp in the provinces 288 botanical specimen 321 botanical specimen 322 XXII botanical specimen facing 323 botanical specimen 324 the old walls of Manila City 344 La Escalta in the business quarter of Manila 347 a Riverside washing scene 359 Dr. Jose Rizal 381 Don Felipe Agoncillo 381 General Emilio Aguinaldo 396 Don Pedro A Paterno 396 Admiral Patricio Montojo 430 Admiral George Dewey 430 General Basilio Augusti 430 Major General Wesley Merritt 430 Archbishop Bernardino Nozalata 430 Tagalog Bowie Knives and Weapons 485 A Pundita, Mahometan Priest 534 Rajamuta de Tomundi and Wife 534 Santa Cruz Church, Manila Suburb, 559 Panglima Hassan, of Sulu, 584 A Mindanao de To and Suite 584 The Root Reverend Bishop Gregorio Aglipe 604 A Roadside Scene in Bulacan Province 627 Maps The Province of Cavite 371 Map of the Archipelago at the and one introduction nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. Othello, Act V, SC2. During the three centuries and a quarter of more or less effective Spanish dominion, this archipelago never ranked above the most primitive of colonial possessions. That powerful nation which in centuries gone by was built up by Iberians, Celts, Phoenicians, Carthaginians, Visigoths, Romans, and Arabs was in its zenith of glory when the conquering spirit and dauntless energy of its people led them to gallant enterprises of discovery which astonished the civilized world. Whatever may have been the incentive which impelled the Spanish monarchs to encourage the conquest of these islands, there can, at least, be no doubt as to the earnestness of the individuals entrusted to carry out the royal will. The nerve and muscle of chivalrous Spain plowing through a wide unknown ocean in quest of glory and adventure, the unswerving devotion of the ecclesiastics to the cause of Catholic supremacy, each bearing intense privations, cannot fail to excite the wonder of succeeding generations. But they were satisfied with conquering and leaving unimproved their conquests, for whilst only a small fraction of this archipelago was subdued, millions of dollars and hundreds of lives were expended in futile attempts at conquest in Gamboj, Siam, Pigo, Moluccas, Borneo, Japan, etc., and for all these toils there came no reward, not even the sterile laurels of victory. The Manila seat of government had not been founded five years when the governor-general solicited royal permission to conquer China. Extension of dominion seized them like a mania. Had they followed up their discoveries by progressive social enlightenment, by encouragement to commerce, by the concentration of their efforts in the development of the territory and the new resources already under their sway, half the money and energy squandered on fruitless and inglorious expeditions would have sufficed to make high roads crossing and recrossing the islands, tenfold wealth would have accrued, civilization would too have followed as a natural consequence, and they would. Perhaps even to this day, have preserved the loyalty of those who struggled for and obtained freer institutions. But they had elected to follow the principles of that religious age, and all we can credit them with is the conversion of millions to Christianity and the consequent civility at the expense of cherished liberty, forever on the track of that fearless band of warriors followed the monk, ready to pass the breach opened for him by the sword, to conclude the conquest by the persuasive influence of the Holy Cross. The civilization of the world is but the outcome of wars, and probably as long as the world lasts the ultimate appeal in all questions will be made to force, notwithstanding peace conferences. The hope of ever extinguishing warfare is as meager as the advantage such a state of things would be. The idea of totally suppressing martial instinct in the whole civilized community is as hopeless as the effort to convert all the human race to one religious system. Moreover, the common good derived from war generally exceeds the losses it inflicts on individuals, nor is war an isolated instance of the few suffering for the good of the many. Salus Populi Suprema Lex Nearly every step in the world's progress has been reached by warfare. In modern times the peace of Europe is only maintained by the equality of power to coerce by force. 
liberty in England, gained first by an exhibition of force, would have been lost but for bloodshed. The great American Republic owes its existence and the preservation of its unity to this inevitable means, and neither arbitration, moral persuasion, nor sentimental argument would ever have exchanged Philippine monastic oppression for freedom of thought and liberal institutions. The right of conquest is admissible when it is exercised for the advancement of civilization, and the conqueror not only takes upon himself, but carries out, the moral obligation to improve the condition of the subjected peoples and render them happier. How far the Spaniards of each generation fulfilled that obligation may be judged from these pages, the works of Mr. W. H. Prescott, the writings of Padre de las Casas, and other chroniclers of Spanish colonial achievements. The happiest colony is that which yearns for nothing at the hands of the mother country, the most durable bonds are those engendered by gratitude and contentment. Such bonds can never be created by religious teaching alone, unaccompanied by the twofold inseparable conditions of moral and material improvement. There are colonies wherein equal justice, moral example, and constant care for the welfare of the people have riveted European dominion without the dispensable adjunct of an enforced state religion. The reader will judge the merits of that civilization which the Spaniards engrafted on the races they subdued, for as mankind has no philosophical criterion of truth, it is a matter of opinion where the unpolluted fountain of the truest three modern civilization is to be found. It is claimed by China and by Europe, and the whole universe is schismatic on the subject. When Japan was only known to the world as a nation of artists, Europe called her barbarous, when she had killed 50,000 Russians in Manchuria, she was proclaimed to be highly civilized. There are even some who regard the adoption of European dress and the utterance of a few phrases in a foreign tongue as signs of civilization. And there is a continental nation, proud of its culture, whose sense of military honor, dignity, and discipline involves in human brutality of the lowest degree. Juan de la Concepcion one who wrote in the 18th century, bases the Spaniard's right to conquest solely on the religious theory. He affirms that the Spanish kings inherited a divine right to these islands, their dominion being directly prophesied in Isaiah 18. He assures us that this title from heaven was confirmed by apostolic authority too and by the many manifest miracles with which God, the Virgin, and the saints, as auxiliaries of our arms, demonstrated its unquestionable justice. Saint Augustine, he states, considered it a sin to doubt the justice of war which God determines, but, let it be remembered, the same savant insisted that the world was flat, and that the sun hid every night behind a mountain. An apology for conquest cannot be rightly based upon the sole desire to spread any particular religion, more especially when we treat of Christianity, the benign radiance of which was overshadowed by that debasing institution the Inquisition, which sought out the brightest intellects only to destroy them. But whether conversion by coercion be justifiable or not, one is bound to acknowledge that all the urbanity of the Filipinos of today is due to Spanish training, which has raised millions from obscurity to a relative condition of culture. The fatal defect in the Spanish system was the feudal endeavor to stem the tide of modern methods and influences. The government of the archipelago alone was no mean task. A group of islands inhabited by several heathen races surrounded by a sea exposed to typhoons, pirates, and Christian-hating Musulmans had to be ruled by a handful of Europeans with inadequate funds, bad ships, and scant war material. For nearly two centuries the financial administration was a chaos, and military organization hardly existed. Local enterprise was disregarded and discouraged so long as abundance of silver dollars came from across the Pacific. Such a short-sighted, unstable dependence left the colony resourceless when bold foreign traders stamped out monopoly and brought commerce to its natural four-level by competition. In the meantime the astute ecclesiastics quietly took possession of rich arable lands in many places, the most valuable being within easy reach of the capital and the arsenal of Cavita. Landed property was undefined. It all nominally belonged to the state, which, however, granted no titles, Squatters took up land where they chose without determined limits, and the embroilment continues, in a measure, to the present day. 
about the year 1885 the question was brought forward of granting government titles to all who could establish claims to land. Indeed, for about a year, there was a certain enthusiasm displayed both by the applicants and the officials in the matter of Titulo's reels. But the large majority of landholders among whom the monastic element conspicuously figured could only show their title by actual possession three it might have been sufficient, but the fact is that the clergy favored neither the granting of Titulo's reels nor the establishment of the projected real estate registration offices. Agrarian disputes had been the cause of so many armed risings against themselves in particular, during the 19th century, that they opposed an investigation of the land question, which would only have revived old animosities, without giving satisfaction to either native or friar, seeing that both parties were intransigent. Point for the fundamental laws, considered as a whole, were the wisest devisable to suit the peculiar circumstances of the colony, but whilst many of them were disregarded or treated as a dead letter, so many loopholes were invented by the dispensers of those in operation as to render the whole system a wearisome, dilatory process. Up to the last every possible impediment was placed in the way of trade expansion, and in former times, when worldly majesty and sanctity were a joint idea, the struggle with the king and his counselors for the right of legitimate traffic was fierce. So long as the archipelago was a dependency of Mexico, up to 1819, not one Spanish colonist in a thousand brought any cash capital to this colony with which to develop its resources. During the first two centuries and a quarter Spain's exclusive policy forbade the establishment of any foreigner in the islands, but after they did settle there they were treated with such courteous consideration by the Spanish officials that they could often secure favors with greater ease than the Spanish colonists themselves. Everywhere the white race urged activity like one who sits behind a five horse and goads it with the whip. But good advice without example was lost to an ignorant class more apt to learn through the eye than through the ear. The rougher class of colonists either forgot, or did not know, that, to civilize a people, every act one performs, or intelligible word one utters, carries an influence which pervades and gives a color to the future life and thoughts of the native, and makes it felt upon the whole frame of the society in embryo. On the other hand, the value of prestige was perfectly well understood by the higher officials, and the rigid maintenance of their dignity, both in private life and in their public offices, played an important part in the moral conquest of the Filipinos. Equality of races was never dreamed of, either by the conquerors or the conquered, and the latter, up to the last days of Spanish rule, truly believed in the superiority of the white man. This belief was a moral force which considerably aided the Spaniards in their task of civilization, and has left its impression on the character of polite Philippine society to this day. Christianity was not only the basis of education, but the symbol of civilization, and that the government should have left education to the care of the missionaries during the proselytizing period was undoubtedly the most natural course to take. It was desirable that conversion from paganism should precede any kind of secular tuition. But the friars, to the last, held tenaciously to their old monopoly, hence the university, the high schools, and the colleges, except the Jesuit schools, were in their hands, and they remained as stumbling blocks in the intellectual advancement of the colony. Instead of the state holding the fountains of knowledge within its direct control, it yielded them to the exclusive manipulation of those who eked out the measure as it suited their own interests. Successful government by that sublime ethical essence called moral philosophy has fallen away before a more practical regime. Liberty to think, to speak, to write, to trade, to travel, was only partially and reluctantly yielded under extraneous pressure. The venality of the conqueror's administration, the judicial complicacy, want of public works, weak imperial government, and arrogant local rule tended to dismember the once powerful Spanish Empire. The same causes have produced the same effects in all Spain's distant colonies, and today the mother country is almost childless. Criticism, physical discovery of the age, and contact with foreigners shook the ancient belief in the fabulous and the supernatural, the rising generation began to inquire about more certain scientific theses. The immutability of theology is inharmonious to science the school of progress, 
and long before they had finished their course in these islands the friars quaked at the possible consequences. The dogmatical affirmation ki non credit anathema sit, so indiscriminately used, had lost its power. Public opinion protested against an order of things which checked the social and material onward six movement of the colony. And, strange as it may seem, Spain was absolutely impotent, even though it cost her the whole territory, as indeed happened, to remedy the evil. In these islands what was known to the world as the government of Spain was virtually the executive of the religious corporations, who constituted the real government, the members of which never understood patriotism as men of the world understand it. Every interest was made subservient to the welfare of the orders. If, one day, the colony must be lost to them, it was a matter of perfect indifference into whose hands it passed. It was their happy hunting ground and last refuge. But the real government could not exist without its executive, and when that executive was attacked and expelled by America, the real government fell as a consequence. If the executive had been strong enough to emancipate itself from the dominion of the friars only two decades ago, the Philippines might have remained a Spanish colony today. But the wealth in hard cash and the moral religious influence of the monastic orders were factors too powerful for any number of executive ministers, who would have fallen like ninepins if they had attempted to extricate themselves from the thraldom of sacerdotalism. Outside political circles there was, and still is in Spain, a class who shrink from the abandonment of ideas of centuries duration. Whatever the fallacy may be, not a few are beguiled into thinking that its antiquity should command respect. The conquest of this colony was decidedly far more a religious achievement than a military one, and to the friars of old their nation's gratitude is fairly due for having contributed to her glory, but that gratitude is not an inheritance. Prosperity began to dawn upon the Philippines when restrictions on trade were gradually relaxed since the second decade of last century. As each year came round reforms were introduced, but so clumsily that no distinction was made between those who were educationally or intellectually prepared to receive them and those who were not, hence the small minority of natives, who had acquired the habits and necessities of their conquerors, sought to acquire for all an equal status, for which the masses were unprepared. The abolition of tribute in 1884 obliterated caste distinction, the university graduate and the herder were on a legal equality if they each carried a sedula personal, whilst certain Spanish legislators exercised a rare effort to persuade themselves and their partisans that the colony was ripe for the impossible combination of liberal administration and monastic rule. It will be shown in these pages that the government of these islands was practically as theocratic as it was civil. Upon the principle of religious preeminence all its statutes were founded, and the reader will now understand whence the innumerable church and state contentions originated. Historical facts lead one to inquire, how far was Spain ever a moral potential factor in the world's progress? Spanish colonization 7 seems to have been only a colonizing mission preparatory to the attainment, by her colonists, of more congenial conditions under other regimes, for the repeated struggles for liberty, generation after generation, in all her colonies, tend to show that Spain's sovereignty was maintained through the inspiration of fear rather than love and sympathy, and that she entirely failed to render her colonial subjects happier than they were before. One cannot help feeling pity for the Spanish nation, which has let the pearl of the Orient slip out of its fingers through culpable and stubborn mismanagement, after repeated warnings and similar experiences in other quarters of the globe. Yet although Spain's lethargic, petrified conservatism has had to yield to the progressive spirit of the times, the loss to her is more sentimental than real, and Spaniards of the next century will probably care as little about it as Britons do about the secession of their transatlantic colonies. Happiness is merely comparative, with a lovely climate a continual summer and all the absolute requirements of life at hand, there is not one-tenth of the misery in the Philippines that there is in Europe, and none of that forlorn wretchedness facing the public gaze. Beggary that constant attribute of the highest civilization hardly exists, and suicide is extremely rare. There are no ferocious animals, insects, or reptiles that one cannot reasonably guard against, it is essentially one of those countries where man's greatest enemy is man. There is ample room for double the population, 
and yet a million acres of virgin soil only awaiting the cooperation of husbandmen and capitalists to turn it to lucrative account. A humdrum life is incompatible here with the constant emotion kept up by typhoons, shipwrecks, earthquakes, tidal waves, volcanic eruptions, brigands, epidemics, devastating fires, etc. It is a beautiful country, copiously endowed by nature, where the effulgent morning sun contributes to a happy frame of mind where the colonists' rural life passes pleasantly enough to soothe the longing for home, sweet home. And yet perhaps if countries we compare and estimate the blessings which they share, though patriots flatter, yet shall wisdom find an equal portion dealt to all mankind. Such is America's new possession, wherein she has assumed the moral responsibility of establishing a form of government on principles quite opposite to those of the defunct Spanish regime, whether it will be for better or for worse cannot be determined at this tentative stage. Without venturing on the prophetic, one may not only draw conclusions from accomplished facts, but also reasonably assume, in the light of past events, what might have happened under other circumstances. There is scarcely a power which has not, in the zenith of its prosperity, ate consciously or unconsciously felt the divine right impulse, and claimed that providence has singled it out to engraft upon an unwilling people its particular conception of human progress. The venture assumes, in time, the more dignified name of mission, and when the consequent torrents of blood recede from memory with the ebbing tide of forgetfulness, the conqueror soothes his conscience with a profession of moral duty, which the conquered seldom appreciate in the first generation. No unforeseen circumstances whatever caused the United States to drift unwillingly into Philippine affairs. The war in Cuba had not the remotest connection with these islands. The adversary's army and navy were too busy with the task of quelling the Tagalog rebellion for anyone to imagine they could be sent to the Atlantic. It was hardly possible to believe that the defective Spanish-Philippine squadron could have accomplished the voyage to the Antilles, in time of war, with every neutral port en route closed against it. In any case, so far as the ostensible motive of the Spanish-American war was concerned, American operations in the Philippines might have ended with the Battle of Cavite. The Tagalog rebels were neither seeking nor desiring a change of masters, but the state of war with Spain afforded America the opportunity, internationally recognized as legitimate, to seize any of the enemy's possessions, hence the acquisition of the Philippines by conquest. Up to this point there is nothing to criticize, in face of the universal tacit recognition, from time immemorial, of the right of might. American dominion has never been welcomed by the Filipinos. All the principal Christianized islands, practically representing the whole archipelago, except Moro land, resisted it by force of arms, until, after two years of warfare, they were so far vanquished that those still remaining in the field, claiming to be warriors, were, judged by their exploits, undistinguishable from the brigand gangs which have infested the islands for a century and a half. The general desire was, and is, for sovereign independence, and although a pro-American party now exists, it is only in the hope of gaining peacefully that which they despaired of securing by armed resistance to superior force. The question as to how much nearer they are to the goal of their ambition belongs to the future, but there is nothing to show, by a review of accomplished facts, that, without foreign intervention, the Filipinos would have prospered in their rebellion against Spain. Even if they had expelled the Spaniards their independence would have been of short duration, for they would have lost it again in the struggle with some colony-grabbing nation. A united archipelago under the Malolos government would have been simply untenable, for, apart from the possible secessions of one or more islands, like Negros, for instance, no Christian Philippine government could ever have conquered Mindanao and the Sulu Sultanate, indeed, the attempt might have brought about nine their own ruin, by exhaustion of funds, want of unity in the hopeless contest with the Moro, and foreign intervention to terminate the Internecine War. Seeing that Emilio Aguinaldo had to suppress two rivals, even in the midst of the bloody struggle when union was most essential for the attainment of a common end, how many more would have risen up against him in the period of peaceful victory? The expulsion of the friars and the confiscation of their lands would have surprised no one cognizant of Philippine history. 
but what would have become of religion? Would the predominant religion in the Philippines, 50 years hence, have been Christian? Recent events lead one to conjecture that liberty of cult, under native rule, would have been a misnomer, and Roman Catholicism a persecuted cause, with the civilizing labors of generations ceasing to bear fruit. No generous, high-minded man, enjoying the glorious privilege of liberty, would withhold from his fellow men the fullest measure of independence which they were capable of maintaining. If America's intentions be as the world understands them, she is endeavoring to break down the obstacles which the Filipinos, desiring a lasting independence, would have found insuperable. America claims, as other colonizing nations have done, to have a mission to perform, which, in the present case, includes teaching the Filipinos the art of self-government. Did one not reflect that America, from her birth as an independent state, has never pretended to follow on the beaten tracks of the old world, her brand new method of colonization would surprise her older contemporaries in a similar task. She has been the first to teach Asiatics the doctrine of equality of races a theory which the proletariat has interpreted by a self-assertion hitherto unknown, and a gradual relinquishment of that courteous deference towards the white man formerly observable by every European. This democratic doctrine, suddenly launched upon the masses, is changing their character. The polite and submissive native of Europe is developing into an ill-bred, up-to-date, wrangling politician. Hence rule by coercion, instead of sentiment, is forced upon America, for up to the present she has made no progress in winning the hearts of the people. Outside the high-salaried circle of Filipinos one never hears a spontaneous utterance of gratitude for the boon of individual liberty or for the suppression of monastic tyranny. The Filipinos craving for immediate independence, regard the United States only in the light of a useful medium for its attainment, and there are indications that their future attachment to their stepmother country will be limited to an unsentimental acceptance of her protection as a material necessity. Measures of practical utility and of immediate need have been set aside for the pursuit of costly fantastic ideals, which excite more the wonder than the enthusiasm of the people, who see left in abeyance the reforms they most desire. The system of civilizing the natives on a 10 curriculum of higher mathematics, literature, and history, without concurrent material improvement to an equal extent, is like feeding the mind at the expense of the body. No harbor improvements have been made, except at Manila, no canals have been cut, few new provincial roads have been constructed, except for military purposes, no rivers are deepened for navigation, and not a mile of railway opened. The enormous sums of money expended on such unnecessary works as the Bengay Road and the creation of multifarious bureaus, with a superfluity of public servants, might have been better employed in the development of agriculture and cognate wealth producing public works. The excessive salaries paid to high officials seem to be out of all proportion to those of the subordinate assistants. Extravagance in public expenditure necessarily brings increasing taxation to meet it, the luxuries introduced for the sake of American trade are gradually, and unfortunately, becoming necessities, whereas it would be more considerate to reduce them if it were possible. It is no blessing to create a desire in the common people for that which they can very well dispense with and feel just as happy without the knowledge of. The deliberate forcing up of the cost of living has converted a cheap country into an expensive one, and an income which was once a modest competence is now a miserable pittance. The infinite vexatious regulations and complicated restrictions affecting trade and traffic are irritating to every class of businessmen, whilst the colony's indebtedness is increasing, the budget shows a deficit, and agriculture the only local source of wealth is languishing. Innovations, costing immense sums to introduce, are forced upon the people, not at all in harmony with their real wants, their instincts, or their character. What is good for America is not necessarily good for the Philippines. One could more readily conceive the feasibility of assimilation with the Japanese than with the Anglo-Saxon. To rule and to assimilate are two very different propositions, the latter requires the existence of much in common between the parties. No legislation, example, or tuition will ramble the people's life in direct opposition to their natural environment. Even the descendants of whites in the Philippines tend to merge into, rather than alter, the conditions of the surrounding race, 
and vice versa. It is quite impossible for a race born and living in the tropics to adopt the characteristics and thought of a temperate zone people. The Filipinos are not an industrious, thrifty people, or lovers of work, and no power on earth will make them so. The colony's resources are, consequently, not a quarter developed, and are not likely to be by a strict application of the theory of the Philippines for the Filipinos. But why worry about their lethargy, if, with it, they are on the way to perfect contentment, that summit of human happiness which no one attains? Ideal government may reach a point where its exact ions tend to make life a eleven burden, practical government stops the side of that point. White men will not be found willing to develop a policy which offers them no hope of bettering themselves, and as to labor other willing Asiatics are always close at hand. Uncertainty of legislation, constantly changing laws, new regulations, the fear of a tax on capital, and general perspective insecurity make large investors pause. Democratic principles have been too suddenly sprung upon the masses. The autonomy granted to the provinces needs more control than the civil government originally intended, and ends in an appeal on almost every conceivable question being made to one man the government general, this excessive concentration makes efficient administration too dependent on the abilities of one person. There are many who still think, and not without reason, that ten years of military rule would have been better for the people themselves. Even now military government might be advantageously re-established in Samar Island, where the common people are not anxious for the franchise, or care much about political rights. A reasonable amount of personal freedom, with justice, would suffice for them, whilst the trading class would welcome any effective and continuous protection, rather than have to shift for themselves with the risk of being persecuted for having given succour to the Polajanes to save their own lives and property. Civil government, prematurely inaugurated, without sufficient preparation, has had a disastrous effect, and the present state of many provinces is that of a wilderness overrun by brigand bands too strong for the civil authority to deal with. But one cannot fail to recognize and appreciate the humane motives which urged the premature establishment of civil administration. Scores of nobodies before the rebellion became somebodies during the four or five years of social turmoil. Some of them influenced the final issue, others were mere show figures, really not more important than the Beausabreur in comic opera. Yet one and all claimed compensation for laying aside their weapons, and in changing the play from anarchy to civil life these actors had to be included in the new cast to keep them from further mischief. The moral conquest of the Philippines has hardly commenced. The benevolent intentions of the Washington government, and the irreproachable character and purpose of its eminent members who wield the destiny of these islanders, are unknown to the untutored masses, who judge their new masters by the individuals with whom they come into close contact. The hearts of the people cannot be won without moral prestige, which is blighted by the presence of that undesirable class of immigrants to whom Major General Leonard Wood refers so forcibly in his first report of the Moro province. In this particular region, which is ruled semi-independently of the Philippine Commission, the peculiar conditions require a special legislation. But, apart from this, the common policy of its enlightened government general would serve 12 as a pattern of what it might be, with advantage, throughout the archipelago. So much United States money and energy have been already expended in these islands, and so far-reaching are the pledges made to their inhabitants that American and Philippine interests are indissolubly associated for many a generation to come. It does not necessarily follow that the fullest measure of national liberty will create real personal liberty. Such an idea does not at all appeal to Asiatics, according to whose instinct every man dominates over, or is dominated by, another. If America should succeed in establishing a permanently peaceful independent Asiatic government on democratic principles, it will be one of the unparalleled achievements of the age 13 one Historia General de Filipinas, Chap I, Part I, Volume I, by Juan de la Concepcion published in 14 volumes, Manila, 1788. To no es necesario calificar el derecho a tales reinos o dominios, 
a special ment entre vasilos de reyes tan justos y catholicos y tan obedience hijos de la suprema autoridad apostolica con que facultad han ocupado estas regions. Ibid. 3. Dominium a possessione copus dissider. La Maxim. 4. In September, 1890, a lawsuit was still pending between the Dominican Corporation and a number of native residents in Calumba, Laguna, who disputed the Dominicans' claim to lands in that vicinity so long as the corporation were unable to exhibit their title. For this implied monastic indiscriminate acquisition of real estate several of the best native families, some of them personally known to me, were banished to the island of Mindoro. General description of the archipelago the Philippine Islands, with the Sulu Protectorate, extend a little over 16 degrees of latitude from 4 degrees 45 minutes to 21 degrees n, and longitude from 116 degrees 40 minutes to 126 degrees 30 minutes e and number some 600 islands, many of which are mere islets, besides several hundreds of rocks jutting out of the sea. The 11 islands of primary geographical importance are Luzon, Mindanao, Samar, Panay, Negros, Palawan, Paragua, Mindoro, Leyte, Cebu, Masbate, and Bajal. Ancient maps show the islands and provinces under a different nomenclature. For example, old names in parentheses, Albay, Ibalan, Batangas, Comintan, Basilan, Taguima, Bulacan, Makoyan, Capiz, Panay, Cavita, Kaurt, Cebu, Sogbu, Leyte, Baibay, Mindoro, Mate, Negros, Buglas, Rizal, Tonda, later on Manila, Surajao, Cariga, Samar, Ibebeo, Tayaba, Calilean. Luzon and Mindanao united would be larger in area than all the rest of the islands put together. Luzon is said to have over 40,000 square miles of land area. The northern half of Luzon is a mountainous region formed by ramifications of the Great Cordilleras, which run N to S. All the islands are mountainous in the interior, the principal peaks being the following, viz colon feet above sea level Halcon, Mindoro, 8868 Apo 1, Mindanao, 8804 Mayon, Luzon, 8283 San Cristobal, Luzon, 7375 Isarog, Luzon, 6,443 Benajao, Luzon, 6,097 Labo, Luzon, 5,090 South Caraballo, Luzon, 4,720 Caraballo del Baylor, Luzon, Maquiling, Luzon, 3,933 3,720 Most of these mountains and subordinate ranges are thickly covered with forest and light undergrowth, whilst the stately trees are gaily festooned with clustering creepers and flowering parasites of the most brilliant hues. The Mayon, which is an active volcano, is comparatively bare, whilst also the Apo, although no longer in eruption, exhibits 14 abundant traces of volcanic action in acres of lava and blackened scoriae. Between the numberless forest-clad ranges are luxuriant plains glowing in all the splendor of tropical vegetation. The valleys, generally of rich fertility, are about one-third under cultivation. There are numerous rivers, few of which are navigable by sea-going ships. Vessels drawing up to 13 feet can enter the Pasig River, but this is due to the artificial means employed. The principal rivers are in Luzon Island the Rio Grande de Cagayan, which rises in the South Caraballo Mountain in the center of the island, and runs in a tortuous stream to the northern coast. It has two chief affluents, the Rio Chico de Cagayan and the Rio Mayget, besides a number of streams which find their way to its main course. Steamers of 11 feet draft have entered the Rio Grande, but the sand shoals at the mouth are very shifty, and frequently the entrance is closed to navigation. The river, which yearly overflows its banks, bathes the Great Cagayan Valley the richest tobacco-growing district in the colony. Immense trunks of trees are carried down in the torrent with great rapidity, rendering it impossible for even small craft the Berngayans to make their way up or down the river at that period. 
the Rio Grande de la Pampanga rises in the same mountain and flows in the opposite direction southwards through an extensive plain, until it empties itself by some 20 mouths into the Manila Bay. The whole of the Pampanga Valley and the course of the river present a beautiful panorama from the summit of Araya Mountain, which has an elevation of 2,877 feet above the sea level. The whole of this flat country is laid out into embanked rice fields and sugar cane plantations. The towns and villages interspersed are numerous. All the primeval forest, at one time dense, has disappeared, for this being one of the first districts brought under European subjection, it supplied timber to the invaders from the earliest days of Spanish colonization. The Rio Agno rises in a mountainous range towards the west coast about 50 miles NNW of the South Caraballo runs southwards as far as Lat. 16 degrees, where it takes a SW direction down to Lat. 15 degrees 48 thence a NW course up to Lat. 16 degrees, whence it empties itself by two mouths into the Gulf of Lingon. At the highest tides there is a maximum depth of 11 feet of water on the sand bank at the E mouth, on which is situated the port of Degupan. The Baikal River, which flows from the Bato Lake to the Bay of San Miguel, has sufficient depth of water to admit vessels of small draft a few miles up from its mouth. In Mindanao Island the Butuan River or Rio Agusan rises at a distance of about 25 miles from the southern coast and empties itself on the northern coast, so that it nearly divides the island, and is navigable for a few miles from the mouth 15 The Rio Grande de Mindanao rises in the center of the island and empties itself on the west coast by two mouths, and is navigable for some miles by light draft steamers. It has a great number of affluents of little importance. The only river in Negros Island of any appreciable extent is the Daneo, which rises in the mountain range running down the center of the island, and finds its outlet on the east coast. At the mouth it is about a quarter of a mile wide, but too shallow to permit large vessels to enter, although past the mouth it has sufficient depth for any ship. I went up this river, six hours journey in a boat, and saw some fine timber near its banks in many places. Here and there it opens out very wide, the sides becoming mangrove swamps. The most important lakes are in Luzon Island the Bay Lake or Laguna de Bay, supplied by numberless small streams coming from the mountainous district around it. Its greatest length from E to W is 25 miles, and its greatest breadth N to S 21 miles. In it there is a mountainous island Talim of no agricultural importance, and several islets. Its overflow forms the Pasig River, which empties itself into the Manila Bay. Each wet season in the middle of the year the shores of this lake are flooded. These floods recede as the dry season approaches, but only partially so from the south coast, which is gradually being incorporated into the lake bed. Bomban Lake, in the center of which is a volcano in constant activity, has a width E to W of 11 miles, and its length from N to S is 14 miles. The origin of this lake is apparently volcanic. According to tradition it was formed by the terrific upheaval of a mountain 7,000 or 8,000 feet high, in the year 1700. It is not supplied by any streams emptying themselves into it, further than two insignificant rivulets, and it is connected with the sea by the Pansipat River, which flows into the Gulf of Balayan at Lat. 13 degrees 52 minutes north. Cagayan Lake in the extreme NE of the island, is about 7 miles long by 5 miles broad. Lake Bato, 3 miles across each way, and Lake Boai, 3 miles N to S and 2 one half miles wide, situated in the eastern extremity of Luzon Island, are very shallow. In the center of Luzon Island, in the large valley watered by the above-mentioned Pampanga and Agno rivers, are three lakes, respectively Kinaram, Mangabal, and Kandava, the last two being lowland mirrors flooded and navigable by canoes in the rainy season only. In Mindoro Island there is one lake called Nautjan, two one-half miles from the NE coast. Its greatest width is three miles, with four miles in length. In Mindanao Island there are the lakes Magindaneo or Boian, in the center of the island, 20 miles E to W by 12 N to S, Laneo, 18 miles distant from the north coast, Liguazan and Buluan towards the 16 south, connected with the Rio Grande de Mindanao, 
and a group of four small lakes on the Agajuan River. The Lanao Lake has great historical associations with the struggles between Christians and Muslims during the period of the Spanish Dominion, and is to this day a center of strife with the Americans. In some of the straits dividing the islands there are strong currents, rendering navigation of sailing vessels very difficult, notably in the San Bernardino Strait separating the islands of Luzon and Samar, the roadstead of Iloilo between Panay and Gomorrah's Islands, and the passage between the south points of Cebu and Negros Islands. Most of the islets, if not indeed the whole archipelago, are of volcanic origin. There are many volcanoes, two of them in frequent intermittent activity, viz. The Mayon, in the extreme east of Luzon Island, and the Tal Volcano, in the center of Bomban Lake, 34 miles due south of Manila. Also in Negros Island the Canlaon Volcano and Lat. 10 degrees 24 is occasionally invisible eruption. In 1886 a portion of its crater subsided, accompanied by a tremendous noise and a slight ejection of lava. In the picturesque island of Camaguan a volcano mountain suddenly arose from the plain in 1872. Tal Volcano Tal Volcano The Mayon Volcano is in the north of the province of Albi, hence it is popularly known as the Albi Volcano. Around its base there are several towns and villages, the chief being Albi, the capital of the province, Kigsaya, called Deriga, and Kamaling on the one side, and Malineo, Tubaco, etc., on the side facing the east coast. The earliest eruption recorded is that of 1616, mentioned by Spilbergen. In 1769 there was a serious eruption, which destroyed the towns of Kigsaya and Malineo, besides several villages, and devastated property within a radius of 20 miles. Lava and ashes were thrown out incessantly during two months, and cataracts of water were formed. In 1811 loud subterranean noises were heard proceeding from the volcano, which caused the inhabitants around to fear an early renewal of its activity, but their misfortune was postponed. On February 1, 1814, 2 it burst with terrible violence. Kigsaya, Badio, and three other towns were totally demolished. Stones and ashes were ejected in all directions. The inhabitants fled to caves to shelter themselves. So sudden was the occurrence, that many natives were overtaken by the volcanic projectiles and a few by lava streams. In Kigsaya nearly all property was lost. Father Aragoneses estimates that 2,200 persons were killed, besides many being wounded. Mavan Volcano Mavan Volcano Another eruption, remarkable for its duration, took place in 1881-82, and again in the spring of 1887, but only a small quantity of ashes was thrown out, and did very little or no damage to the property in the surrounding towns and villages. 17 The eruption of July 9, 1888, severely damaged the towns of Libig and Legaspi, Plantations were destroyed in the villages of Baigat and Bonco, several houses were fired, others had the roofs crushed in, a great many domestic animals were killed. Fifteen natives lost their lives, and the loss of livestock, buffaloes and oxen, was estimated at 500. The ejection of lava and ashes and stones from the crater continued for one night, which was illuminated by a column of fire. The last great eruption occurred in May. 1897. Showers of red-hot lava fell like rain in a radius of 20 miles from the crater. In the immediate environs about 400 persons were killed. In the village of Bakake houses were entirely buried beneath the lava, ashes, and sand. The road to the port of Legaspi was covered out of sight. In the important town of Tobacco there was total darkness and the earth opened. Hemp plantations and a large number of cattle were destroyed. In Libig over 100 inhabitants perished in the ruins. The hamlets of San Roque, Misericordia and Santo Nino, with over 150 inhabitants, were completely covered with burning debris. At night time the sight of the fire column, heaving up thousands of tons of stones, accompanied by noises like the booming of cannon afar off, was indescribably grand but it was the greatest public calamity which had befallen the province for some years past. 
The mountain is remarkable for the perfection of its conic form. Owing to the perpendicular walls of lava formed on the slopes all around, it would seem impossible to reach the crater. The elevation of the peak has been computed at between 8,200 and 8,400 feet. I have been around the base on the ENS sides, but the grandest view is to be obtained from Kiksaya, Deriga. On a clear night, when the moon is hidden, a stream of fire is distinctly seen to flow from the crest. Tal Volcano is in the island of the Bomban Lake referred to above. The journey by the ordinary route from the capital would be about 60 miles. This volcano has been in an active state from time immemorial, and many eruptions have taken place with more or less effect. The first one of historical importance appears to have occurred in 1641, again in 1709 the crater vomited fire with a deafening noise, on September 21, 1716, it threw out burning stones and lava over the whole island from which it rises, but so far no harm had befallen the villagers in its vicinity. In 1731 from the waters of the lake three tall columns of earth and sand arose in a few days, eventually subsiding into the form of an island about a mile in circumference. In 1749 there was a famous outburst which delacerated the coniform peak of the volcano, leaving the crater disclosed as it now is. Being only 850 feet high, it is remarkable as one of the lowest volcanoes in the world. The last and most desolating of all the eruptions of importance occurred in the year 1754, when the stones, lava, ashes, and waves of 18 the lake, caused by volcanic action, contributed to the utter destruction of the towns of Tal, Tanayan, Sala, and Lipa, and seriously damaged property in Balayan, 15 miles away, whilst cinders are said to have reached Manila, 34 miles distant in a straight line. One writer says in his Ms. 3 compiled 36 years after the occurrence, that people in Manila dined with lighted candles at midday, and walked about the streets confounded and thunderstruck, clamouring for confession during the eight days that the calamity was visible. The author adds that the smell of the sulfur and fire lasted six months after the event, and was followed by malignant fever, to which half the inhabitants of the province fell victims. Moreover, adds the writer, the lake waters threw up dead alligators and fish, including sharks. The best detailed account extant is that of the parish priest of Sala at the time of the event. Point four, he says that about 11 o'clock at night on August 11, 1749, he saw a strong light on the top of the volcano island, but did not take further notice. At 3 o'clock the next morning he heard a gradually increasing noise like artillery firing, which he supposed would proceed from the guns of the galleon expected in Manila from Mexico, saluting the sanctuary of Our Lady of Cagsese whilst passing. He only became anxious when the number of shots he heard far exceeded the royal salute, for he had already counted a hundred times, and still it continued. So he arose, and it occurred to him that there might be a naval engagement off the coast. He was soon undeceived, for four old natives suddenly called out, Father, let us flee, and on his inquiry they informed him that the island had burst, hence the noise. Daylight came and exposed to view an immense column of smoke gushing from the summit of the volcano, and here and there from its side smaller streams rose like plumes. He was joyed at the spectacle, which interested him so profoundly that he did not heed the exhortations of the natives to escape from the grand but awful scene. It was a magnificent sight to watch mountains of sand hurled from the lake into the air in the form of erect pyramids, and then falling again like the stream from a fountain jet. Whilst contemplating this imposing phenomenon with tranquil delight, a strong earthquake came and upset everything in the convent. Then he reflected that it might be time to go, pillars of sand ascended out of the water nearer to the shore of the town, and remained erect, until, by a second earthquake, they, with the trees on the islet, were violently thrown down and submerged in the lake. The earth opened out here and there as far as the shores of the Laguna de Bay, and the lands of 19 Sala and Tanagan shifted. Streams found new beds and took other courses, whilst in several places trees were engulfed in the fissures made in the soil. Houses, which one used to go up into, one now had to go down into, but the natives continued to inhabit them without the least concern. The volcano, 
on this occasion, was in activity for three weeks, the first three days ashes fell like rain. After this incident, the natives extracted sulfur from the open crater, and continued to do so until the year 1754. In that year, 1754, the same chronicler continues, between 9 and 10 o'clock at night on May 15, the volcano ejected boiling lava, which ran down its sides in such quantities that only the waters of the lake saved the people on shore from being burnt. Towards the north, stones reached the shore and fell in a place called Bioyongan, in the jurisdiction of Tal. Stones and fire incessantly came from the crater until June 2nd, when a volume of smoke arose which seemed to meet the skies. It was clearly seen from Vaughan, which is on a low level about 4 leagues, 14 miles, from the lake. Matters continued so until July 10, when there fell a heavy shower of mud as black as ink. The wind changed its direction and a suburb of Sala, called Bailalai, was swamped with mud. This phenomenon was accompanied by a noise so great that the people of Batangas and Bayan, who that day had seen the galleon from Acapulco passing on her home voyage, conjectured that she had saluted the shrine of Our Lady of Cagsese on her way. The noise ceased, but fire still continued to issue from the crater until September 25th. Stones fell all that night, and the people of Tal had to abandon their homes, for the roofs were falling in with the weight upon them. The chronicler was at Tal at this date, and in the midst of the column of smoke a tempest of thunder and lightning raged and continued without intermission until December 4th. The night of All Saints Day, November 1st, was a memorable one, for the quantity of falling firestones, sand, and ashes increased, gradually diminishing again towards November 15th. Then, on that night, after vespers, great noises were heard. A long melancholy sound dinned in one's ears, volumes of black smoke rose, an infinite number of stones fell, and great waves proceeded from the lake, beating the shores with appalling fury. This was followed by another great shower of stones, brought up amidst the black smoke, which lasted until 10 o'clock at night. For a short while the devastation was suspended prior to the last supreme effort. All looked half dead and much exhausted after seven months of suffering in the way described five it was resolved to remove the image of Our Lady of Cagsese and put in its place the second image of the Holy Virgin 20 on November 29, from seven o'clock in the evening, the volcano threw up more fire than all put together in the preceding seven months. The burning column seemed to mingle with the clouds, the whole of the island was one ignited mass. A wind blew. And as the priests and the mayor, Alcalde, were just remarking that the fire might reach the town, a mass of stones was thrown up with great violence, thunderclaps and subterranean noises were heard, everybody looked aghast, and nearly all knelt to pray. Then the waters of the lake began to encroach upon the houses, and the inhabitants took to flight, the natives carrying away whatever chattels they could. Cries and lamentations were heard all around, mothers were looking for their children in dismay, half-caste women of the Paradin were calling for confession, some of them beseechingly falling on their knees in the middle of the streets. The panic was intense, and was in no way lessened by the Chinese, who took to yelling in their own jargonic syllables. After the terrible night of November 29th they thought all was over, when again several columns of smoke appeared, and the priest went off to the sanctuary of Cagsese, where the prior was. Tal was entirely abandoned, the natives having gone in all directions away from the lake. On November 29th and 30 there was complete darkness around the lake vicinity, and when light reappeared a layer of cinders about five inches thick was seen over the lands and houses, and it was still increasing. Total darkness returned, so that one could not distinguish another's face, and all were more horror-stricken than ever. In Cagsese the natives climbed onto the housetops and threw down the cinders, which were overweighting the structures. On November 30th smoke and strange sounds came with greater fury than anything yet experienced, while lightning flashed in the dense obscurity. It seemed as if the end of the world was arriving. When light returned, the destruction was horribly visible, the church roof was dangerously covered with ashes and earth, and the chronicler opines that its not having fallen in might be attributed to a miracle. 
then there was a day of comparative quietude, followed by a hurricane which lasted two days. All were in a state of melancholy, which was increased when they received the news that the whole of Tal had collapsed, amongst the ruins being the government house and stores, the prison, state warehouses and the royal rope walk, besides the church and convent. The government general sent food and clothing in a vessel, which was nearly wrecked by storms, whilst the crew pumped and bailed out continually to keep her afloat, until at length she broke up on the shoals at the mouth of the Pansipit River. Another craft had her mast split by a flash of lightning, but reached port. With all this, some daft natives lingered about the site of the town of Tal till the last, and two men were sepulchred in the government house ruins. A woman left her house just before the roof 21 fell in and was carried away by a flood, from which she escaped, and was then struck dead by a flash of lightning. A man who had escaped from Musulman pirates, by whom he had been held in captivity for years, was killed during the eruption. He had settled in Tal, and was held to be a perfect genius, for he could mend a clock. The road from Tal to Balayan was impassable for a while on account of the quantity of lava. Tal, once so important as a trading center, was now gone, and Batangas, on the coast, became the future capital of the province. The actual duration of this last eruption was six months and seventeen days. In 1780 the natives again extracted sulfur, but in 1790 a writer at that date 6 says that he was unable to reach the crater owing to the depth of soft lava and ashes on the slopes. There is a tradition current amongst the natives that an Englishman some years ago attempted to cut a tunnel from the base to the center of the volcanic mountain, probably to extract some metallic product or sulfur. It is said that during the work the excavation partially fell in upon the Englishman, who perished there. The cave-like entrance is pointed out to travelers as the Cueva del Inglés. Referring to the volcano, Fray Gaspar de San Agustin in his History 7 remarks as follows The volcano formerly emitted many large fire stones which destroyed the cotton, sweet potato and other plantations belonging to the natives of Tal on the slopes of the volcano mountain. Also it happened that if three persons arrived on the volcanic island, one of them had infallibly to die there without being able to ascertain the cause of this circumstance. This was related to Father Albuquerque VIII who after a fervent thesis and reading compassion on the natives, went to the island, exorcised the evil spirits there and blessed the land. A religious procession was made, and mass was celebrated with great humility. On the elevation of the host, horrible sounds were heard, accompanied by groaning voices and sad lamentations, two craters opened out, one with sulfur in it and the other with green water, sick which is constantly boiling. The crater on the Lipa side is about a quarter of a league wide, the other is smaller, and in time smoke began to ascend from this opening so that the natives, fearful of some new calamity, went to Father Bartholomew, who repeated the ceremonies already described. Mass was said a second time, so that since then the volcano has not thrown out any more fire or 22 smoke.9 however, Whilst Fray Thomas Abrazi was parish priest of Tal, about 1611, thunder and plaintive cries were again heard, therefore the priest had a cross, made of anobing wood, borne to the top of the volcano by more than 400 natives, with the result that not only the volcano ceased to do harm, but the island has regained its original fertile condition. The Tal volcano is reached with facility from the end side of the island, the ascent on foot occupying about half an hour. Looking into the crater, which would be about 4,500 feet wide from one border to the other of the shell, one sees three distinct lakes of boiling liquid, the colors of which change from time to time. I have been up to the crater four times, the last time the liquids in the lakes were respectively of green, yellow, and chocolate colors. At the time of my last visit there was also a lava chimney in the middle, from which arose a snow-white volume of smoke. The Philippine Islands have numberless creeks and bays forming natural harbors, but navigation on the W coasts of Cebu, Negros, and Palawan Islands is dangerous for any but very light draft vessels, the water being very shallow, whilst there are dangerous reefs all along the W coast of Palawan, Paragua, and between the south point of this island and Balabac Island. 
The SW monsoon brings rain to most of the islands, and the wet season lasts nominally six months from about the end of April. The other half of the year is the dry season. However, on those coasts directly facing the Pacific Ocean, the seasons are the reverse of this. The hottest season is from March to May inclusive, except on the coasts washed by the Pacific, where the greatest heat is felt in June, July, and August. The temperature throughout the year varies but slightly, the average heat in Luzon Island being about 81 degrees 50 minutes Fahrenheit. In the highlands of North Luzon, on an elevation above 4,000 feet, the maximum temperature is 78 degrees Fahrenheit and the minimum 46 degrees Fahrenheit Samboanga, which is over 400 miles south of Manila, is cooler than the capital. The average number of rainy days in Luzon during the years 1881 to 1883 was 203. Commencing July 11, 1904, three days of incessant rain in Rizal province produced the greatest inundation of Manila suburbs within living memory. Human lives were lost, many cattle were washed away, barges in the river were wrenched from their moorings and dashed against the bridge piers, pirogues were used instead of vehicles in the thoroughfares, considerable damage was done in the shops and many persons had to wade through the flooded streets knee-deep in water. The climate is a continual summer, which maintains a rich verdure throughout the year, and during nine months of the twelve an alternate 23 heat and moisture stimulates the soil to the spontaneous production of every form of vegetable life. The country generally is healthy. The whole of the archipelago, as far south as 10 degrees lat, is affected by the monsoons, and periodically disturbed by terrible hurricanes, which cause great devastation to the crops and other property. The last destructive hurricane took place in September, 1905. In Rizal province, near Manila. Effect of the hurricane of September 26, 1905. In Rizal province, near Manila. Effect of the hurricane of September 26, 1905. Earthquakes are also very frequent, the last of great importance having occurred in 1863, 1880, 1892, 1894, and 1897. In 1897 a tremendous tidal wave affected the island of Leyte, causing great destruction of life and property. A portion of Tacloban, the capital of the island, was swept away, rendering it necessary to extend the town in another direction. In the wet season the rivers swell considerably, and often overflow their banks, whilst the mountain torrents carry away bridges, cattle, tree trunks, etc., with terrific force, rendering traveling in some parts of the interior dangerous and difficult. In the dry season long droughts occasionally occur, about once in three years, to the great detriment of the crops and livestock. The southern boundary of the archipelago is formed by a chain of some 140 islands, stretching from the large island of Mindanao as far as Borneo, and constitutes the Sulu archipelago, the sultanate of which was under the protection of Spain, Vidi Chap XXIX. It is now being absorbed, under American rule, in the rest of the archipelago, under the denomination of Moro Province, QV.241 According to the Spanish hydrographic map, it is 8,813 feet, the Pajal and Montano expedition, 1,880, made it 10,270 feet, the Schottenberg and Cook expedition, 1,882, computed it at 10,827 feet. Two Vidi pamphlet published immediately after the event by Father Francisco Aragoneses, PP of Cagsaya, begging alms for the victims. Three History de la Prov de Batangas, por de Pedro Andres de Castro y Amades. Indictmas in the Baan Convent, Batangas. Four milliseconds exhaustive report of the eruptions of Tal Volcano in 1749 and 1754, dated December 22. 1754, compiled by Fray Francisco Vancuchillo. Preserved in the archives of the Corporation of St. Augustine in Manila. 5. Still it appears that all classes were willing to risk their lives to save their property. 
they were not forcibly detained in that plight. 6. History de la PROV de Batangas, por Don Pedro Andres de Castro y Amades. Inditemis in the Baan Convent, Province of Batangas. 7. History de Filipinas, by Dr. Gaspar de San Agustin, two volumes first part published in Madrid, 1698, the second part yet indict and preserved in the archives of the Corporation of St. Augustine in Manila. 8. P.P. of Tal from 1572 to 1575. 9. In the same archives of the St. Augustine Corporation in Manila an eruption in 1641 is recorded. Discovery of the Archipelago The discoveries of Christopher Columbus in 1492, the adventures and conquests of Hernan Cortés, Blasco Núñez de Balboa and others in the South Atlantic, had awakened an ardent desire amongst those of enterprising spirit to seek beyond those regions which had hitherto been traversed. It is true the Pacific Ocean had been seen by Balboa, who crossed the Isthmus of Panama, but how to arrive there with his ships was as yet a mystery. On April 10, 1495, the Spanish government published a general concession to all who wished to search for unknown lands. This was a direct attack upon the privileges of Columbus at the instigation of Fonseca, Bishop of Burgos, who had the control of the Indian affairs of the realm. Rich merchants of Cadiz and Seville, whose imagination was inflamed by the reports of the abundance of pearls and gold on the American coast, fitted out ships to be manned by the roughest class of gold hunters, so great were the abuses of this common license that it was withdrawn by royal decree of June 2, 1497. It was the age of chivalry, and the restless cavalier who had won his spurs in Europe lent a listening ear to the accounts of romantic glory and wealth attained across the seas. That an immense ocean washed the western shores of the great American continent was an established fact. That there was a passage connecting the great southern sea the Atlantic with that vast ocean was an accepted hypothesis. Many had sought the passage in vain, the honor of its discovery was reserved for Hernando de Magallanes, Portuguese, Fernando de Magalhães. This celebrated man was a Portuguese noble who had received the most complete education in the palace of King John II. Having studied mathematics and navigation, at an early age he joined the Portuguese fleet which left for India in 1505 under the command of Almeida. He was present at the siege of Malacca under the famous Albuquerque, and accompanied another expedition to the rich Moluccas, or Spice Islands, when the islands of Bunda, Tidur, and Ternate were discovered. It was here he obtained the information which led him to contemplate the voyage which he subsequently realized 25 on his return to Portugal he searched the crown archives to see if the Moluccas were situated within the demarcation accorded to Spain. Point one. In the meantime he repaired to the wars in Africa, where he was wounded in the knee, with the result that he became permanently lame. He consequently retired to Portugal, and his companions in arms, jealous of his prowess, took advantage of his affliction to assail him with vile imputations. The King Emmanuel encouraged the complaints, and accused him of feigning a malady of which he was completely cured. Wounded to the quick by such an assertion, and convinced of having lost the royal favor, Magallanes renounced forever, by a formal and public instrument, his duties and rights as a Portuguese subject, and henceforth became a naturalized Spaniard. He then presented himself at the Spanish court, at that time in Valladolid, where he was well received by the King Charles I, the Bishop of Burgos, Juan Rodriguez Fonseca, Minister of Indian Affairs, and by the King's Chancellor. They listened attentively to his narration, and he had the good fortune to secure the personal protection of His Majesty, himself a well-tried warrior, experienced in adventure. The Portuguese ambassador, Alvaro de Acosta, incensed at the success of his late countrymen, and fearing that the project under discussion would lead to the conquest of the Spice Islands by the rival kingdom, made every effort to influence the court against him. At the same time he ineffectually urged Magallanes to return to Lisbon, alleging that his resolution to abandon Portuguese citizenship required the sovereign sanction. Others even meditated his assassination to save the interests of the King of Portugal. This powerful opposition only served to delay the expedition, for finally the King of Portugal was satisfied that his Spanish rival had no intention to authorize a violation of the Convention of Demarcation. 
Between King Charles and Magdalene's a contract was signed in Saragossa by virtue of which the latter pledged himself to seek the discovery of rich spice islands within the limits of the Spanish Empire. If he should not have succeeded in the venture after ten years from the date of sailing he would thenceforth be permitted to navigate and trade without further royal assent, reserving one twentieth of his net gains for the crown. The king accorded to him the title of cavalier and invested him with the habit of St. James and the hereditary government 26 in male succession of all the islands he might annex. The crown of Castile reserved to itself the supreme authority over such government. If Magallanes discovered so many as six islands, he was to embark merchandise in the king's own ships to the value of 1,000 ducats as royal dues. If the islands numbered only two, he would pay to the crown one-fifteenth of the net profits. The king, however, was to receive one-fifth part of the total cargo sent in the first return expedition. The king would defray the expense of fitting out and arming five ships of from 60 to 130 tons with a total crew of 234 men, he would also appoint captains and officials of the royal treasury to represent the state interests in the division of the spoil. Orders to fulfill the contract were issued to the Crown officers in the port of Seville, and the expedition was slowly prepared, consisting of the following vessels, viz., the Commodore ship La Trinidad, under the immediate command of Magallanes, the San Antonio, Captain Juan de Cartagena, the Victoria, Captain Luis de Mendoza, the Santiago, Captain Juan Rodriguez Serrano, and the Concepcion, Captain Gaspar de Quesada. The little fleet had not yet sailed when dissensions arose. Magallanes wished to carry his own ensign, whilst Dr. Sancho Machenza insisted that it should be the royal standard. Another, named Tolero, disputed the question of who should be the standard bearer. The king himself had to settle these quarrels by his own arbitrary authority. Tolero was disembarked and the royal standard was formally presented to Magallanes by injunction of the king in the church of Santa Maria de la Victoria de la Triana, in Seville, where he and his companions swore to observe the usages and customs of Castile, and to remain faithful and loyal to his Catholic majesty. On August 10, 1519, the expedition left the port of San Lucar de Baramita in the direction of the Canary Islands. On December 13 they arrived safely at Rio Janeiro. Following the coast in search of the longed for passage to the Pacific Ocean, they entered the Solis River so called because its discoverer, João de Solis, a Portuguese, was murdered there. Its name was afterwards changed to that of Rio de la Plata, the Silver River. Continuing their course, the intense cold determined Magalanes to winter in the next large river, known then as San Julian. Tumults arose, some wished to return home, others harbored a desire to separate from the fleet, but Magallanes had sufficient tact to persuade the crews to remain with him, reminding them of the shame which would befall them if they returned only to relate their failure. He added that, so far as he was concerned, nothing but death would deter him from executing the royal commission. As to the rebellious captains, Juan de Cartagena was already put in twenty-seven irons and sentenced to be cast ashore with provisions, and a disaffected French priest for a companion. The sentence was carried out later on. Then Magallanes sent a boat to each of three of the ships to inquire of the captains whom they served. The reply from all was that they were for the king and themselves. Thereupon thirty men were sent to the Victoria with a letter to Mendoza, and whilst he was reading it, they rushed on board and stabbed him to death. Quesada then brought his ship alongside of the Trinidad, and, with sword and shield in hand, called in vain upon his men to attack. Magallanes, with great promptitude, gave orders to board Quesada's vessel. The next day Quesada was executed. After these vigorous but justifiable measures, obedience was ensured. Still bearing southwards within sight of the coast, on October 28, 1520, the expedition reached and entered the seaway thenceforth known as the Magellan Straits, dividing the island of Tierra del Fuego from the mainland of Patagonia. Point two on the way, one ship had become a total wreck, and now the San Antonio deserted the expedition, her captain having been wounded and made prisoner by his mutinous officers, she was sailed in the direction of New Guinea. The three remaining vessels waited for the San Antonio several days 
and then passed through the straits. Great was the rejoicing of all when, on November 26, 1520, they found themselves on the Pacific Ocean. It was a memorable day. All doubt was now at an end as they cheerfully navigated across that broad expanse of sea. On March 16, 1521, the Ladrone Islands were reached. There the ships were so crowded with natives that they were obliged to be expelled by force. They stole one of the ship's boats, and 90 men were sent on shore to recover it. After a bloody combat the boat was regained, and the fleet continued its course westward until it hoped to off an islet, then called Yomanjal, now known as Malhau, situated in the channel between Samar and Danagat Islands, Vidi Map. Then coasting along the north of the island of Mindanao, they arrived at the mouth of the Butuan River, where they were supplied with provisions by the chief. It was Easter week, and on this shore the first mass was celebrated in the Philippines. The natives showed great friendliness, in return for which Magallanes took formal possession of their territory in the name of Charles I. The chieftain himself volunteered to pilot the ships to a fertile island, the kingdom of a relation of his, and, passing between the islands of Bajal and Leyte, the expedition arrived on April 7 at Cebu, where, on receiving the news, over 2,000 men appeared on the beach in battle array with lances and shields. The Butuan chief went on shore and explained that the expedition brought people of peace who sought provisions. The king agreed to a 28 treaty, and proposed that it should be ratified according to the native formula drawing blood from the breast of each party, the one drinking that of the other. This form of bond was called by the Spaniards the Pacto de Sangre, or the Blood Compact, QV. Magallanes accepted the conditions, and a hut was built on shore in which to say mass. Then he disembarked with his followers, and the king, queen, and prince came to satisfy their natural curiosity. They appeared to take great interest in the Christian religious rites and received baptism, although it would be venturesome to suppose they understood their meaning, as subsequent events proved. The princes and headmen of the district followed their example, and swore fealty and obedience to the king of Spain. Magallanes espoused the cause of his new allies, who were at war with the tribes on the opposite coast, and on April 25, 1521, he passed over to Magdan Island. In the affray he was mortally wounded by an arrow, and thus ended his brief but lustrous career, which fills one of the most brilliant pages in Spanish annals. Magallanes called the group of islands, so far discovered, the St. Lazarus Archipelago. In Spain they were usually referred to as the Islas del Poniente, and in Portugal as the Islas del Orient. On the left bank of the Pasig River, facing the city of Manila, stands a monument to Magallanes' memory. Another has been erected on the spot in Magdan Island, where he is supposed to have been slain on April 27, 1521. Also in the city of Cebu, near the beach, there is an obelisk to commemorate these heroic events. It was perhaps well for Magallanes to have ended his days out of reach of his royal master. Had he returned to Spain he would probably have met a fate similar to that which befell Columbus after all his glories. The San Antonio, which, as already mentioned, deserted the fleet at the Magellan Straits, continued her voyage from New Guinea to Spain, arriving at San Lucar de Baramita in March, 1521. The captain, Alvaro Mesquita, was landed as a prisoner, accused of having seconded Magallanes in repressing insubordination. To Magallanes were ascribed the worst cruelties and infraction of the royal instructions. Accused and accusers were alike cast into prison, and the king, unable to lay hands on the deceased Magallanes, sought this hero's wife and children. These innocent victims of royal vengeance were at once arrested and conveyed to Burgos, where the court happened to be, whilst the San Antonio was placed under embargo. On the decease of Magallanes, the supreme command of the expedition in Cebu Island was assumed by Duarte de Barbosa, who, with 26 of his followers, was slain at a banquet to which they had been invited by Hamabar, the king of the island. Juan Serrano had so ingratiated himself with the natives during the sojourn on shore that his life was spared for a while. Stripped of his raiment and armor, he was 29 conducted to the beach, 
where the natives demanded a ransom for his person of two cannons from the ship's artillery. Those on board saw what was passing and understood the request, but they were loath to endanger the lives of all for the sake of one Melius est ut periat unus quam ut periat communitis, St. Augustine, so they raised anchors and sailed out of the port, leaving Serrano to meet his terrible fate. Due to sickness, murder during the revolts, and the slaughter in Cebu, the exploring party, now reduced to 100 souls all told, was deemed insufficient to conveniently manage three vessels. It was resolved therefore to burn the most dilapidated one the Concepcion. At a general council, Juan Caraballo was chosen commander-in-chief of the expedition, with Gonzalo Gomez de Espinosa as captain of the Victoria. The royal instructions were read, and it was decided to go to the island of Borneo, already known to the Portuguese and marked on their charts. On the way they provisioned the ships off the coast of Palauan Island, Paragua, and thence navigated to within 10 miles of the capital of Borneo, probably Brunei. Here they fell in with a number of native canoes, in one of which was the king's secretary. There was a great noise with the sound of drums and trumpets, and the ships saluted the strangers with their guns. The natives came on board, embraced the Spaniards as if they were old friends, and asked them who they were and what they came for. They replied that they were vassals of the King of Spain and wished to barter goods. Presents were exchanged, and several of the Spaniards went ashore. They were met on the way by over 2,000 armed men, and safely escorted to the king's quarters. After satisfying His Majesty's numerous inquiries, Captain Espinosa was permitted to return with his companions. He reported to Caraballo all he had seen, and in a council it was agreed that the town was too large and the armed men too numerous to warrant the safety of a longer stay. However, being in need of certain commodities, five men were dispatched to the town. As days passed by, their prolonged absence caused suspicion and anxiety, so the Spaniards took in reprisal the son of the king of Luzon Island, who had arrived there to trade, accompanied by 100 men and five women in a large prahua. The prince made a solemn vow to see that the five Spaniards returned, and left two of his women and eight chiefs as hostages. Then Caraballo sent a message to the king of Borneo, intimating that if his people were not liberated he would seize all the junks and merchandise he might fall in with and kill their crews. Thereupon two of the retained Spaniards were set free, but, in spite of the seizure of craft laden with silk and cotton, the three men remaining had to be abandoned, and the expedition set sail. For reasons not very clear, Caraballo was deprived of the supreme command and Espinosa was appointed in his place, whilst Juan Sebastian Elcano was elected captain of the Victoria. With a native pilot, captured thirty from a junk which they met on the way, the ships shaped their course towards the Moluccas Islands, and on November 8, 1521, they arrived at the island of Tidur. Thus the essential object of the expedition was gain the discovery of a western route to the Spice Islands. Years previous the Portuguese had opened up trade and still continued to traffic with these islands, which were rich in nutmegs, cloves, cinnamon, ginger, sage, pepper, etc. It is said that Saint Francis Xavier had propagated his views amongst these islanders, some of whom professed the Christian faith. The king, richly attired, went out with his suite to receive and welcome the Spaniards. He was anxious to barter with them, and when the Trinidad was consequently laden with valuable spices it was discovered that she had sprung a leak. Her cargo was therefore transferred to the sister ship, whilst the Trinidad remained in tighter for repairs, and Elcano was deputed to make the voyage home with the Victoria, taking the western route of the Portuguese in violation of the Treaty of Tordesillas. Elcano's crew consisted of 53 Europeans and a dozen natives of Tidur. The Victoria started for Spain at the beginning of the year 1522, passed through the Sunda Straits at great risk of being seized by the Portuguese, experienced violent storms in the Mozambique Channel, and was almost wrecked rounding the Cape of Good Hope. A few of the crew died their only food was a scanty ration of rice and in their extreme distress they put in at Santiago Island. 350 miles w of Cape Verde, to procure provisions and beg assistance from the Portuguese governor. It was like jumping into the lion's mouth. 
The governor imprisoned those who went to him, in defense of his sovereign's treaty rights, he seized the boat which brought them ashore, inquired of them where they had obtained the cargo, and projected the capture of the Victoria. Captain Elkano was not slow to comprehend the situation, he raised anchor and cleared out of the harbor, and, as it had happened several times before, those who had the misfortune to be sent ashore were abandoned by their countrymen. The Victoria made the port of San Licar de Baramita on September 6, 1522, so that in a little over three years Juan Sebastian Elcano had performed the most notable voyage hitherto on record it was the first yet accomplished round the world. It must, however, be borne in mind that the discovery of the way to the Moluccas, going westward, was due to Magalanes of Portuguese birth and that the route thence to Europe, continuing westward, had long before been determined by the Portuguese traders, whose charts Elcano used. When Elcano and his seventeen companions disembarked, their appearance was most pitiable mere skeletons of men, weather beaten and famished. The city of Seville received them with acclamation, but their first act was to walk barefooted, in procession, holding lighted thirty-one candles in their hands, to the church to give thanks to the Almighty for their safe deliverance from the hundred dangers which they had encountered. Clothes, money, and all necessaries were supplied to them by royal bounty, whilst Elcano and the most intelligent of his companions were cited to appear at court to narrate their adventures. His Majesty received them with marked deference. Elcano was rewarded with a life pension of 500 ducats, worth at that date about 112 pounds 10 s, and as a lasting remembrance of his unprecedented feat, his royal master knighted him and conceded to him the right of using on his escutcheon a globe bearing the motto, Primus circundidit me. Two of Elcano's officers, Miguel de Rodas and Francisco Alva, were each awarded a life pension of 50,000 maravedis, worth at that time about 14 guineas, whilst the king ordered one-fourth of that fifth part of the cargo, which by contract with Magalanes belonged to the state treasury, to be distributed amongst the crew, including those imprisoned in Santiago Island. The cargo of the Victoria consisted of 26 and a half tons of cloves, a quantity of cinnamon, sandalwood, nutmegs, etc. Amongst the Tider Islanders who were presented to the king, one of them was not allowed to return to his native home, because he had carefully inquired the value of the spices in the Spanish bazaars. Meanwhile the Trinidad was repaired in Tider and on her way to Panama, when continued tempests and the horrible sufferings of the crew determined them to retrace their course to the Moluccas. In this interval Portuguese ships had arrived there, and a fort was being constructed to defend Portuguese interests against the Spaniards, whom they regarded as interlopers. The Trinidad was seized, and the captain Espinosa with the survivors of his crew were granted a passage to Lisbon, which place they reached five years after they had set out with Magalanes. The enthusiasm of King Charles was equal to the importance of the discoveries which gave renown to his subjects and added glory to his crown. Notwithstanding a protracted controversy with the Portuguese court, which claimed the exclusive right of trading with the Spice Islands, he ordered another squadron of six ships to be fitted out for a voyage to the Moluccas. The supreme command was confided to Garcia Yafra de Loisa, Knight of St. John, whilst Sebastian Elcano was appointed captain of one of the vessels. After passing through the Magellan Straits, the commander Loisa succumbed to the fatigues and privations of the stormy voyage. Elcano succeeded him, but only for four days, when he too expired. The expedition, however, arrived safely at the Moluccas Islands, where they found the Portuguese in full possession and strongly established, but the long series of combats, struggles and altercations which ensued between the rival powers, in which Captain Andres de Erdenita prominently figured, left no decisive advantage to either nation 32 but the king was in no way disheartened. A third expedition the last under his auspices was organized and dispatched from the Pacific coast of Mexico by the Viceroy, by royal mandate. It was composed of two ships, two transports, and one galley, well manned and armed, chosen from the fleet of Pedro Alvarado, the late governor of Guatemala. Under the leadership of Rui López de Villalobos it sailed on November 1, 1542, discovered many small islands in the Pacific, lost the galley on the way, 
and anchored off an island about 20 miles in circumference which was named Antonia. They found its inhabitants very hostile. A fight ensued, but the natives finally fled, leaving several Spaniards wounded, of whom six died. Villalobos then announced his intention of remaining here some time, and ordered his men to plant maize. At first they demurred, saying that they had come to fight, not to till land, but at length necessity urged them to obedience, and a small but insufficient crop was reaped in due season. Hard pressed for food, they lived principally on cats, rats, lizards, snakes, dogs, roots and wild fruit, and several died of disease. In this plight a ship was sent to Mindanao Island, commanded by Bernardo de la Torre, to seek provisions. The voyage was fruitless. The party was opposed by the inhabitants, who fortified themselves, but were dislodged and slain. Then a vessel was commissioned to Mexico with news and to solicit reinforcements. On the way, Volcano Island, of the Ladrone Islands group, was discovered on August 6, 1543. A most important event followed. The island, now known as Samar, was called the Isla Filipina, and a galeot was built and dispatched to the group, it is doubtful which, named by this expedition the Philippine Islands in honor of Philip, Prince of Asturias, the son of King Charles I, heir apparent to the throne of Castile, to which he ascended in 1555 under the title of Philip II. On the abdication of his father, the craft returned from the Philippine Islands laden with abundance of provisions, with which the ships were enabled to continue the voyage. By the royal instructions, Rui Lopez de Villalobos was strictly enjoined not to touch at the Moluccas Islands, peace having been concluded with Portugal. Heavy gales forced him nevertheless to take refuge at Jalilo. The Portuguese, suspicious of his intentions in view of the treaty, arrayed their forces against his, inciting the king of the island also to discard all Spanish overtures and refuse assistance to Villalobos. The discord and contentions between the Portuguese and Spaniards were increasing, nothing was being gained by either party. Villalobos personally was sorely disheartened in the struggle, fearing all the while that his opposition to the Portuguese in contravention of the royal instructions would only excite the king's displeasure and lead to his own downfall. Hence he decided to capitulate with his rival and accepted a safe conduct for himself and party to Europe in Portuguese ships. They arrived at Amboina Island, where Villalobos, already 33 crushed by grief, succumbed to disease. The survivors of the expedition, amongst whom were several priests, continued the journey home via coach in China, Malacca, and Goa, where they embarked for Lisbon, arriving there in 1549. In 1558 King Charles was no more, but the memory of his ambition outlived him. His son Philip, equally emulous and unscrupulous, was too narrow-minded and subtly cautious to initiate an expensive enterprise encompassed by so many hazards as materially unproductive as it was devoid of immediate political importance. Indeed the basis of the first expedition was merely to discover a western route to the rich Spice Islands, already known to exist, the second went there to attempt to establish Spanish Empire, and the third to search for, and annex to, the Spanish crown, lands as wealthy as those claimed by, and now yielded to, the Portuguese. But the value of the Philippine Islands, of which the possession was but recent and nominal, was thus far a matter of doubt. One of the most brave and intrepid captains of the Loisa expedition Andres de Urdaneta returned to Spain in 1536. In former years he had fought under King Charles I, in his wars in Italy, when the study of navigation served him as a favorite pastime. Since his return from the Moluccas his constant attention was given to the project of a new expedition to the far west, for which he unremittingly solicited the royal sanction and assistance. But the king had grown old and weary of the world, and whilst he did not openly discourage Erdnita's pretensions he gave him no effective aid. At length, in 1553, two years before Charles abdicated, Erdnita, convinced of the futility of his importunity at the Spanish court, and equally unsuccessful with his scheme in other quarters, retired to Mexico, where he took the habit of an Augustine monk. Ten years afterwards King Philip, 
inspired by the religious sentiment which pervaded his whole policy, urged his viceroy in Mexico to fit out an expedition to conquer and Christianize the Philippine Islands. Urdaneta, now a priest, was not overlooked. Accompanied by five priests of his order, he was entrusted with the spiritual care of the races to be subdued by an expedition composed of four ships and one frigate well armed, carrying 400 soldiers and sailors, commanded by a Basque navigator, Miguel López de Legazpi. This remarkable man was destined to acquire the fame of having established Spanish dominion in these islands. He was of noble birth and a native of the province of Guipuzco in Spain. Having settled in the city of Mexico, of which place he was elected mayor, he there practiced as a notary. Of undoubted piety, he enjoyed reputation for his justice and loyalty, hence he was appointed general of the forces equipped for the voyage. The favorite desire to possess the valuable Spice Islands still lurked in the minds of many Spaniards. Amongst them was Urdaneta, 34 who laboured in vain to persuade the viceroy of the superior advantages to be gained by annexing New Guinea instead of the Philippines, whence the conquest of the Moluccas would be but a facile task. However, the viceroy was inexorable and resolved to fulfil the royal instructions to the letter, so the expedition set sail from the Mexican port of Navidad for the Philippine Islands on November 21, 1564. The Ladrone Islands were passed on January 9, 1565, and on the 13th of the following month the Philippines were sighted. A call for provisions was made at several small islands, including Camaguan, whence the expedition sailed to Bajal Island. A boat dispatched to the port of Butuan returned in a fortnight with the news that there was much gold, wax and cinnamon in that district. A small vessel was also sent to Cebu, and on its return reported that the natives showed hostility, having decapitated one of the crew whilst he was bathing. Nevertheless, General Legaspi resolved to put in at Cebu, which was a safe harbour, and on the way there the ships anchored off Limasana Island, to the south of Leyte. Thence, running southwest, the port of Dapitan, Mindanao is, was reached. Prince Pagbuia, who ruled there, was astonished at the sight of such formidable ships, and commissioned one of his subjects, specially chosen for his boldness, to take note of their movements, and report to him. His account was uncommonly interesting. He related that enormous men with long, pointed noses, dressed in fine robes, ate stones, hard biscuits, drank fire and blew smoke out of their mouths and through their nostrils. Their power was such that they commanded thunder and lightning, discharge of artillery, and that at meal times they sat down at a clothed table. From their lofty port, their bearded faces, and rich attire, they might have been the very gods manifesting themselves to the natives, so the prince thought it wise to accept the friendly overtures of such marvelous strangers. Besides obtaining ample provisions in barter for European wares, Legaspi procured from this chieftain much useful information respecting the condition of Cebu. He learned that it was esteemed a powerful kingdom, of which the magnificence was much vaunted amongst the neighboring states, that the roadstead was one of great safety, and the most favorably situated amongst the islands of the painted faces. Point three the general resolved, therefore, to filch it from its native king and annex it to the crown of Castile. He landed in Cebu on April 27, 1565, and negotiations were entered into with the natives of that island. Remembering, by tradition, the pretensions of the Magallanes party, they naturally opposed this 35 renewed menace to their independence. The Spaniards occupied the town by force and sacked it, but for months were so harassed by the surrounding tribes that a council was convened to discuss the prudence of continuing the occupation. The general decided to remain, little by little the natives yielded to the new condition of things, and thus the first step towards the final conquest was achieved. The natives were declared Spanish subjects, and hopeful with the success thus far attained, Legaspi determined to send dispatches to the king by the priest Andres de Urdaneta, who safely arrived at Navidad on October 3, 1565, and proceeded thence to Spain. In a letter written by Legaspi in 1567 he alluded, for the first time, to the whole archipelago as the Islas Filipinas. 
the pacification of Cebu and the adjacent islands was steadily and successfully pursued by Legaspi, the confidence of the natives was assured, and their dethroned King Tupas accepted Christian baptism, whilst his daughter married a Spaniard. In the midst of the invaders' felicity the Portuguese arrived to dispute the possession, but they were compelled to retire. A fortress was constructed and plots of land were marked out for the building of the Spanish settlers' residences, and finally, in 1570, Cebu was declared a city, after Legaspi had received from his royal master the title of government general of all the lands which he might be able to conquer. In May, 1570, Captain Juan Salcedo, Legaspi's grandson, was dispatched to the island of Luzon to reconnoitre the territory and bring it under Spanish dominion. The history of these early times is very confused, and there are many contradictions in the authors of the Philippine Chronicles, none of which seem to have been written contemporaneously with the first events. It appears, however, that Martin de Goiti and a few soldiers accompanied Salcedo to the north. They were well received by the native chiefs or petty kings Lakendola, Raja of Tanda, known as Raja Matanda, which means in native dialect the aged Raja, and his nephew the young Raja Solomon of Manila. The sight of a body of European troops armed as was the custom in the 16th century, must have profoundly impressed and overawed these chieftains, otherwise it seems almost incredible that they should have consented, without protest, or attempt at resistance, to, forever, give up their territory, yield their independence, pay tribute for and become the tools of invading foreigners for the conquest of their own race without recompense whatsoever. 36 A treaty of peace was signed and ratified by an exchange of drops of blood between the parties thereto. Solomon, however, soon repented of his paltroonery, and roused the war cry among some of his tribes. To save his capital, then called Manila, falling into the hands of the invaders he set fire to it. Lakendola remained passively watching the issue. Solomon was completely rooted by Salcedo, and pardoned on his again swearing fealty to the King of Spain. Goiti remained in the vicinity of Manila with his troops, whilst Salcedo fought his way to the Bomban Lake, Tal, district. The present Batangas province was subdued by him and included in the jurisdiction of Mindoro Island. During the campaign Salcedo was severely wounded by an arrow and returned to Manila. Legaspi was in the island of Phanai when Salcedo, some writers say Goiti, arrived to advise him of what had occurred in Luzon. They at once proceeded together to Cavita, where Lakendola visited Legaspi on board, and, prostrating himself, avert his submission. Then Legaspi continued his journey to Manila, and was received there with acclamation. He took formal possession of the surrounding territory, declared Manila to be the capital of the archipelago, and proclaimed the sovereignty of the King of Spain over the whole group of islands. Gaspar de San Agustin, writing of this period, says, he, Legaspi, ordered them, the natives, to finish the building of the fort in construction at the mouth of the river, Pasig, so that His Majesty's artillery might be mounted therein for the defense of the fort and the town. Also he ordered them to build a large house inside the battlement walls for Legaspi's own residence another large house and church for the priests, etc. Besides these two large houses, he told them to erect a hundred and fifty dwellings of moderate size for the remainder of the Spaniards to live in. All this they promptly promised to do, but they did not obey, for the Spaniards were themselves obliged to terminate the work of the fortifications. The city council of Manila was constituted on June 24, 1571. On August 20, 1572, Miguel López de Legaspi succumbed to the fatigues of his arduous life leaving behind him a name which will always hold a prominent place in Spanish colonial history. He was buried in Manila in the Augustine Chapel of San Fausto, where hung the royal standard and the hero's armorial bearings until the British troops occupied the city in 1763. A street in Manila and others in provincial towns bear 37 his name. Near the Luneta Esplanade, Manila, there is a very beautiful Legaspi, and Erdenita, monument, erected shortly after the rebellion of 1896. Death makes no conquest of this conqueror, for now he lives in fame, 
though not in life. Richard III, Act 3, Sc. 1. In the meantime Salcedo continued his task of subjecting the tribes in the interior. The natives of Taytay and Cainta, in the Spanish military district of Morong, now Rizal province, submitted to him on August 15, 1571. He returned to the Laguna de Bay to pacify the villagers, and penetrated as far as Camarines Norte to explore the Baikal River. Bolineo and the provinces of Pangasinan and Ilocos yielded to his prowess, and in this last province he had well established himself when the defense of the capital obliged him to return to Manila. At the same time Martin de Goiti was actively employed in overrunning the Pampanga territory with the double object of procuring supplies for the Manila camp and coercing the inhabitants on his way to acknowledge their new liege lord. It is recorded that in this expedition Goiti was joined by the Rajas of Tonda and Manila. Yet La Condola appears to have been regarded more as a servant of the Spaniards Nolans Valens than as a free ally, for, because he absented himself from Goiti's camp without license from the Maestre de Campo, he was suspected by some writers of having favored opposition to the Spaniards' incursions in the marshes of Haganoy, Pampanga coast, and boundary of Manila Bay. The district which constituted the ancient province of Talwai Balayan, subsequently denominated province of Batangas, was formerly governed by a number of Kachi Kays, the most notable of whom were Gatpajal and Gajan Linton. They were usually at war with their neighbors. Gajan Linton, the cacique of the Batangas River, Pansipat, at the time of the conquest, was famous for his valor. Gatsangayan, who ruled on the other side of the river, was celebrated as a hunter of deer and wild boar. These men were half-castes of Borneo and Ida extraction, who formed a distinct race called by the natives Dagagang. None of them would submit to the king of Spain or become Christians, hence their descendants were offered no privileges. The Edas collected tribute. Gabriel Montoya, a Spanish soldier of Legaspi's legion, partially conquered those races, and supported the mission of an Austin friar amongst them. This was probably Fray Diego Moxica, who undertook the mission of Batangas on its separation from the local administration of Mindoro Island in 1581. The first governor of San Pablo or Sampalic in the name of the King of Spain was appointed by the soldier Montoya, and was called Bartolomé Magallan, the second was Cristobal Somangalit and the third was Bernabé Pandan, all of whom had adopted Christianity. Bay, on the 38 borders of the lake of that name, and four leagues from San Pablo, was originally ruled by the cacique Augustin Malanzangan. Calilean, now called Tayaba, was founded by the woman Ladaya, and subsequently administered by a native alcalde, who gave such satisfaction that he was three times appointed the king's lieutenant and baptized as Francisco de San Juan. San Pablo, the center of a once independent district, is situated at the foot of the mountains of San Cristobal and Benageo, from which over 14 streams of fresh water flow through the villages. The system established by Juan Salcido was to let the conquered lands be governed by the native Cachiques and their male successors so long as they did so in the name of the King of Castile. Territorial possession seems to have been the chief aim of the earliest European invaders, and records of having improved the condition of the people or of having opened up means of communication and traffic as they went on conquering, or even of having explored the natural resources of the colony for their own benefit, are extremely rare 39 one during the previous century jealousy had run so high between Spain and Portugal with regard to their respective colonization and trading rights, that the question of demarcation had to be settled by the Pope Alexander VI, who issued a bull dated May 4, 1493, dividing the world into two hemispheres, and decreeing that all heathen lands discovered in the western half, from the meridian 100 leagues W of Cape Verde Island, should belong to the Spaniards, in the eastern half to the Portuguese. The bull was adopted by both nations in the Treaty of Tordesillas, June 7, 1494. It gave rise to many passionate debates, as the Spaniards wrongly insisted that the Philippines and the Moluccas came within the division allotted to them by pontifical donation. Two probably so called from the enormous number of pedos, ducks, found there. Three the Visios, inhabiting the central group of the archipelago, tattooed themselves, 
a cutaneous disease also disfigured the majority, hence for many years their islands were called by the Spaniards Islas de los Pintados. For Legaspi and Guido Lavezars, under oath, made promises of rewards to the Lacandola family and a remission of tribute in perpetuity, but they were not fulfilled. In the following century year 1660 it appears that the descendants of the Raja Lacandola still upheld the Spanish authority, and having become sorely impoverished thereby, the heir of the family petitioned the governor, Sabaniano Manrique de Lara, to make good the honor of his first predecessors. Eventually 36 and the Lacandolas were exempted from the payment of tribute and poll tax forever, as recompense for the filching of their domains. In 1884, when the fiscal reforms were introduced which abolished the tribute and established in lieu thereof a document of personal identity, say the law personal, for which a tax was levied, the last vestige of privilege disappeared. Descendants of Lacandola are still to be met with in several villages near Manila. They do not seem to have materially profited by their transcendent ancestry one of them I found serving as a waiter in a French restaurant in the capital in 1885. Philippine Dependencies, up to 1898 The Ladrones, Carolines, and Palu Islands in 1521 Magallanes cast anchor off the Ladrone Islands, situated between 17 degrees and 20 degrees north lat by 146 degrees east long, on his way to the discovery of those islands afterwards denominated the Philippines. This group was named by him Islas de las Velas.1 Legaspi called them the Ladrones.2 Subsequently several navigators sighted or touched at these islands, and the indistinct demarcation which comprised them acquired the name of St. Lazarus Archipelago. In 1662 the Spanish vessel San Damian, on her course from Mexico to Luzon, anchored here. On board was a missionary, Fray Diego Luis de San Victors, who was so impressed with the dejected condition of the natives, that on reaching Manila he made it his common theme of conversation. In fact, so importunately did he pursue the subject with his superiors that he had to be constrained to silence. In the following year the governor, Diego Salcedo, replied to his urgent appeal for a mission there in terms which permitted no further solicitation in that quarter. But the friar was persistent in his project, and petitioned the archbishop's aid. The prelate submitted the matter to King Philip IV, and the friar himself wrote to his father, who presented a memorial to His Majesty and another to the Queen beseeching her influence. Consequently in 1666 a royal decree was received in Manila sanctioning a mission to the Ladrones. Fray Diego took his passage in the galleon San Diego, and having arrived safely in the viceregal court of Mexico, he pressed his views on the viceroy, who declared that he had no orders. Then the priest appealed to the viceroy's wife, who, it is said, was entreating her husband's help on bended knee, when an earthquake occurred which considerably damaged the city. It was a manifestation from heaven, the wily priest avowed, and the viceroy, yielding to the superstition of the age, complied with the friar's request. Therefore, in March, 1668, Fray Diego started from Acapulco in 40 charge of a Jesuit mission for the Ladrones, where they subsequently received a pension of 3,000 Cuban pesos per annum from Queen Maria Anna, who, meanwhile, had become a widow and regent. To commemorate this royal munificence, these islands have since been called by the Spaniards Islas Marianas, although the older name Ladrones is better known to the world. When the mission was fairly established, troops were sent there, consisting of 12 Spaniards and 19 Philippine natives, with two pieces of artillery. The acquiescence of the Ladrone natives was being steadily gained by the old policy of conquest, under the veil of Christianity, when they suddenly rebelled against the strangers' religion, which brought with it restraint of liberty and a social dominion practically amounting to slavery. Fortunately, nature came again to the aid of Fray Diego, for, whilst the natives were in open revolt, a severe storm leveled their huts to the ground, and the priest having convinced them that it was a visitation from heaven, peace was concluded. Fray Diego left the mission for Visayas, where he was killed. After his departure the natives again revolted against servile subjection, and many priests were slain from time to time some in the exercise of their sacerdotal functions, others in open warfare. 
In 1778 a governor was sent there from Mexico with 30 soldiers, but he resigned his charge after two years' service, and others succeeded him. The islands are very poor. The products are rice, sago, coconuts, and cane sugar to a small extent, there are also pigs and fowls in abundance. The Spaniards taught the natives the use of fire. They were a warlike people, every man had to carry arms. Their language is Chamorro, much resembling the Visayan dialect. The population, for a hundred years after the Spanish occupation, diminished. Women purposely stir least themselves. Some threw their newborn offspring into the sea, hoping to liberate them from a world of woe, and that they would regenerate in happiness. In the beginning of the 17th century the population was further diminished by an epidemic disease. During the first century of Spanish rule, the government were never able to exact the payment of tribute. Up to the Spanish evacuation the revenue of these islands was not nearly sufficient to cover the entire cost of administration. About 20 years ago Governor Pazos was assassinated there by a rebellious group. There were nine towns with parish priests. All the churches were built of stone, and roofed with reed thatching, except that of the capital, which had an iron roof. Six of the towns had town halls made of bamboo and reed grass, one had a wooden building, and in two of them, including the capital, the town halls were of stone. 41 The seat of government was at Agaña, called in old official documents the city of San Ignacio de Agaña. It is situated in the island of Guam, in the creek called the Port of Opera. Ships have to anchor about two miles off Punta Piti, where passengers, stores, and mails are conveyed to a wooden landing stage. Five hundred yards from here was the harbor master's office, built of stone, with a tile roof. From Punta Piti there was a bad road of about five miles. The situation of Agaña seems to be ill-suited for communication with vessels, and proposals were ineffectually made by two governors, since 1835, to establish the capital town elsewhere. The central government took no heed of their recommendations. In Agaña there was a government house, a military hospital and pharmacy, an artillery depot and infantry barracks, a well-built prison, a town hall, the administrator's office, called by the natives the shop, and the ruins of former public buildings. It is a rather pretty town, but there is nothing notable to be seen. The natives are as domesticated as the Philippine Islanders, and have much better features. Spanish and a little English are spoken by many of them, as these islands in former years were the resort of English-speaking whalemen. For the elementary education of the natives, there was the College of San Juan de Letran for boys, and a girls' school in Agaña, and in seven of the towns there was, in 1888, a total of four schools for boys, five schools for girls, and nine schools for both sexes, under the direction of twenty masters and six mistresses. When the Ladrone Islands, Marianas, were a dependency of the Spanish Philippine general government, a subsidized mail steamer left Manila for Agaña, and two or three other ports, every three months. An island was discovered by one of the Spanish galleon pilots in 1686, and called Carolina, in honor of Charles II of Spain, but its bearings could not be found again for years. In 1696 two canoes, with 29 Palu Islanders, drifted to the coast of Samar Island, and landed at the town of Givan. They were 60 days on the drift, and five of them died of privations. They were terror-stricken when they saw a man on shore making signs to them. When he went out to them in a boat, and boarded one of the canoes, they all jumped out and got into the other, then when the man got into that, they were in utter despair, considering themselves prisoners. They were conducted to the Spanish priest of Givan, whom they supposed would be the king of the island, and on whom would depend their lives and liberty. They prostrate themselves, and implored his mercy and the favor of sparing their lives, whilst the priest did all he could, by signs, to reassure them. It happened that there had been living here, for some years, two other strange men brought to this shore by currents and contrary 42 winds. These came forward to see the novelty, and served as interpreters, so that the newcomers were all lodged in native houses in twos and threes, 
and received the best hospitality. They related that their islands numbered 32, and only produced fowls and sea birds. One man made a map, by placing stones in the relative position of the islands. When asked about the number of the inhabitants, one took a handful of sand to demonstrate that they were countless. There was a king, they explained, who held his court in the island of Lamarek, to whom the chiefs were subject. They much respected and obeyed him. Among the castaways was a chief, with his wife the daughter of the king. The men had a leaf fiber garment around their loins, and to it was attached a piece of stuff in front, which was thrown over the shoulders and hung loose at the back. The women were dressed the same as the men, except that their loin vestment reached to their knees. The king's daughter wore, moreover, tortoise shell ornaments. They were afraid when they saw a cow and a dog, their island having no quadrupeds. Their sole occupation consisted in providing food for their families. Their mark of courtesy was to take the hand of the person whom they saluted and pass it softly over the face. The priest gave them pieces of iron, which they prized as if they had been of gold, and slept with them under their heads. Their only arms were lances, with human bones for points. They seemed to be a pacific people, intelligent and well-proportioned physically. Both sexes wore long hair down to their shoulders. Very content to find so much luxury in Samar, they offered to return and bring their people to trade. The Jesuits considered this a capital pretext for subjecting their islands, and the government approved of it. At the instance of the Pope, the king ordered the government general, Domingo Zabalberu, to send out expeditions in quest of these islands, and, between 1708 and 1710, several unsuccessful efforts were made to come across them. In 1710, two islands were discovered, and named San Andres. Several canoes arrived alongside of the ship, and the occupants accepted the commander's invitation to come on board. They were much astonished to see the Spaniards smoke, and admired the iron fastenings of the vessel. When they got near shore, they all began to dance, clapping their hands to beat time. They measured the ship, and wondered where such a large piece of wood could have come from. They counted the crew, and presented them with coconuts, fish and herbs from their canoes. The vessel anchored near to the shore, but there was a strong current and a fresh wind blowing, so that it was imprudent to disembark. However, two priests insisted upon erecting a cross on the shore, and were accompanied by the quartermaster and an officer of the troops. The weather compelled the master to weigh anchor, and the vessel set sail, leaving 43 on land the four Europeans, who were ultimately murdered. For a quarter of a century these islands were lost again to the Spaniards. In 1721 two Caroline Prahus were wafted to the Ladrone Islands, where de Luis Sanchez was governor. The Caroline Islanders had no idea where they had landed, and were quite surprised when they beheld the priest. He forcibly detained these unfortunate people, and handed them over to the governor, whom they entreated, with tears but all in vain to be allowed to return to their homes. There they remained prisoners, until it suited the governor's convenience to send a vessel with a priest to their island. The priest went there, and thence to Manila, where a fresh expedition was fitted out. It was headed by a missionary, and included a number of soldiers whom the natives massacred soon after their arrival. All further attempt to subdue the Caroline Islands was necessarily postponed. The natives, at that time, had no religion at all, or were, in a vague sense, polytheists. Their wise men communicated with the souls of the defunct. They were polygamists, but had a horror of adultery. Divorce was at once granted by the chiefs on proof of infidelity. They were cannibals. In each island there was a chief, regarded as a semi-spiritual being, to whom the natives were profoundly obedient. Huts were found used as astrological schools, where also the winds and currents were studied. They made cloth of plantain fiber hatchets with stone heads. Between sunset and sunrise they slept. When war was declared between two villages or tribes, each formed three lines of warriors, first, young men, second, tall men, third, old men, then the combatants pelted each other with stones and lances. 
a man or de combat was replaced by one of the back file coming forward. When one party acknowledged themselves vanquished, it was an understood privilege of the victors to shower invectives on their retiring adversaries. They lived on fruits, roots, and fish. There were no quadrupeds and no agriculture. Many Spanish descendants were found, purely native in their habits, and it was remembered that about the year 1566, several Spaniards from an expedition went ashore on some islands, supposed to be these, and were compelled to remain there. The Carolines, Islas Carolinas, and Palus, Islas Palaus, comprise some 48 groups of islands and islets, making a total of about 500. Their relative position to the Ladrone Islands is of the former, SSW stretching to SE, of the latter, SW. Both groups lie due of Mindanao Island, Vidi Map. The principal Palu Islands are Babaldruape and Kosaryap and Panapi, Asensian is, are the most important of the Carolines. The centers of Spanish government were respectively in Yap and Babaldruape, with the vice governor of the Eastern Carolines in Panapi all formerly dependent on the general government in Manila. The Carolines and Palus were included in 44 the Bishopric of Cebu, and were subject, judicially, to the Supreme Court of Manila. These islands were subsequently many times visited by ships of other nations, and a barter trade gradually sprang up in dried coconut kernels, copra, for the extraction of oil in Europe and America. Later on, when the natives were thoroughly accustomed to the foreigners, British, American, and German traders established themselves on shore, and vessels continued to arrive with European and American manufacturers in exchange for copra, trepang, ivory nuts, tortoise shell, etc. Anglo-American missionaries have settled there, and a great number of natives profess Christianity in the Protestant form. Religious books in native dialect, published in Honolulu, Sandwich is, by the Hawaiian Evangelical Association, are distributed by the American missionaries. I have one before me now, entitled Kappas Fell, Puck EU, describing incidents from the Old Testament. A few of the natives can make themselves understood in English. Besides copra, the chief export, the islands produce rice, yams, breadfruit, rima, sugarcane, etc. Until 1886 there was no government, except that of several petty kings or chiefs, each of whom still rules over his own tribe, although the Protestant missionaries exercised a considerable social influence. In 1885 a Spanish naval officer, named Caprals, having been appointed governor of the islands, arrived at Yap, ostensibly with the object of landing to hoist the Spanish flag as a signal of possession, for it was known in official quarters that the Germans were about to claim sovereignty. However, three days were squandered, perhaps intentionally, in trivial formalities, and although two Spanish men o' war the Manila and the San Quintin were already anchored in the port of Yap, the German warship Iltis entered, landed marines, and hoisted their national flag, whilst the Spaniards looked on. Then the German commander went on board the San Quintin to tell the commander that possession of the islands had been taken in the name of the Emperor of Germany. Neither Caprals, the appointed governor, nor Espana, the commander of the San Quintin, made any resistance, and as we can hardly attribute their inactivity to cowardice, presumably they followed their government's instructions. Caprals and Espana returned to Manila, and were both rewarded for their inaction, the former being appointed to the government of Mindoro Island. In Manila an alarming report was circulated that the Germans contemplated an attack upon the Philippines. Earthworks were thrown up outside the city wall, cannons were mounted, and the cry of invasion resounded all over the colony. Hundreds of families fled from the capital and environs to adjacent provinces, and the personal safety of the German residents was menaced by individual patriotic enthusiasts. In Madrid, popular riots followed the publication of the incident. The German embassy was assaulted, and its escutcheon was burnt in 45 the streets by the indignant mob, although, probably, not 5 per cent of the rioters had any idea where the Caroline Islands were situated, or anything about them. Spain acted so feebly, and Germany so vigorously, 
in this affair, that many asked was it not due to a secret understanding between the respective ministries, disrupted only by the weight of Spanish public opinion? Diplomatic notes were exchanged between Madrid and Berlin, and Germany, anxious to withdraw with apparent dignity from an affair over which it was probably never intended to waste powder and shot, referred the question to the Pope, who arbitrated in favor of Spain. But for these events, it is probable that Spain would never have done anything to demonstrate possession of the Caroline Islands, and for 16 months after the question was solved by pontific mediation, there was a Spanish governor in Yap Sister Elisa a few troops and officials, but no government. No laws were promulgated, and everybody continued to do as heretofore. In Ponape, Ascension is. Sister Posadio was appointed governor. A few troops were stationed there under a sub-lieutenant, whilst some Capuchin friars European ecclesiastics of the meanest type were sent there to compete with the American Protestant missionaries in the salvation of native souls. A collision naturally took place, and the governor well known to all of us in Manila as crack-brained and tactless sent the chief Protestant missionary, Mr. E. T. Doan, a prisoner to Manila on June 16. 1887.3 He was sent back free to Ponape by the government general, but, during his absence, the eccentric Posadio exercised a most arbitrary authority over the natives. The chiefs were compelled to serve him as menials, and their subjects were formed into gangs, to work like convicts, native teachers were suspended from their duties under threat, and the Capuchins disputed the possession of land and attempted to coerce the natives to accept their religion. On July 1 the natives did not return to their bondage, and all the soldiers, led by the sub-lieutenant, were sent to bring them in by force. A fight ensued, and the officer and troops, to the last man, were killed or mortally wounded by clubs, stones, and knives. The astonished governor fortified his place, which was surrounded by the enemy. The tribes of the chiefs Knot and Jockets were up in arms. There was the Hulk D.A. Maria de Molina anchored in the roadstead, and the Capuchins fled to it on the first alarm. The governor escaped from his house on the night of July 4 with his companions, and rushed to the sea, probably intending to swim out to the Hulk. But who knows? He and all his partisans were chased and killed by the natives. On September 21 the news of the tragedy reached Manila by the Men O' War San Quintin. About six weeks afterwards, three Men O' War 46 were sent to Ponape with infantry, artillery, a mountain battery, and a section of engineers a total of about 558 men but on their arrival they met an American warship the Essex which had hastened on to protect American interests. The Spaniards limited their operations to the seizure of a few accused individuals, whom they brought to Manila, and the garrison of Yap was increased to 100 men, under a captain and subordinate officers. The prisoners were tried in Manila by court-martial, and I acted as interpreter. It was found that they had only been loyal to the bidding of their chiefs, and were not morally culpable, whilst the action of the late governor of Ponape met with general reprobation. Again, in July, 1890, a party of 54 soldiers, under Lieutenant Porus, whilst engaged in felling timber in the forest, was attacked by the Malatana, Caroline, tribe, who killed the officer and 27 of his men. The news was telegraphed to the home government, and caused a great sensation in Madrid. A conference of ministers was at once held, and the Canovas del Castillo ministry cabled to the government general Whaler discretionary power to punish these islanders. Within a few months troops were sent from Manila for that purpose. Instead, however, of chastising the Canucks, the government forces were repulsed by them with great slaughter. The commissariat arrangements were most deficient, my friend Colonel Gutierrez Soto, who commanded the expedition, was so inadequately supported by the War Department that, yielding to despair, and crestfallen by reason of the open and adverse criticism of his plan of campaign, he shot himself. Under the Treaty of Paris, 1898, the island of Guam, Ladrone Group, was ceded by Spain to the United States, together with the Philippine Islands. 
The remainder of the Ladrone Group, the Caroline, and the Palu Islands were sold by Spain to Germany in June, 1899-47 1 Velas, Spanish for sales. 2 Ladrones, Spanish for thieves. 3 M. Ardone is reported to have died in Honolulu about June, 1890 attempted conquest by Chinese on the death of General Legaspi, the government of the colony was assumed by the royal treasurer, Guido de Lavezars, in conformity with the sealed instructions from the Supreme Court of Mexico, which were now opened. During this period, the possession of the islands was unsuccessfully disputed by a rival expedition under the command of a Chinaman, Li Mahong, whom the Spaniards were pleased to term a pirate, forgetting, perhaps, that they themselves had only recently wrested the country from its former possessors by virtue of might against right. On the coasts of his native country he had indeed been a pirate. For the many depredations committed by him against private traders and property, the celestial emperor, failing to catch him by cajoli, outlawed him. Born in the port of Teochiu, Li Mahong at an early age evinced a martial spirit and joined a band of corsairs which for a long time had been the terror of the China coasts. On the demise of his chief he was unanimously elected leader of the buccaneering cruisers. At length, pursued in all directions by the imperial ships of war, he determined to attempt the conquest of the Philippines. Presumably the same incentives which impelled the Spanish mariners to conquer lands and overthrow dynasties the vision of wealth, glory, and empire awakened a like ambition in the Chinese adventurer. It was the spirit of the age.1 in his sea wanderings he happened to fall in with a Chinese trading junk returning from Manila with the proceeds of her cargo sold there. This he seized, and the captive crew were constrained to pilot his fleet towards the capital of Luzon. From them he learned how easily the natives had been plundered by a handful of foreigners the probable extent of the opposition he might encounter the defenses established the wealth and resources of the district, and the nature of its inhabitants 48 his fleet consisted of 62 warships or armed junks, well found, having on board 2,000 sailors, 2,000 soldiers, 1,500 women, a number of artisans, and all that could be conveniently carried with which to gain and organize his new kingdom. On its way the squadron cast anchor off the province of Ilocos Sur, where a few troops were sent ashore to get provisions. Whilst returning to the junks, they sacked the village and set fire to the huts. The news of this outrage was hastily communicated to once Alcido, who had been pacifying the northern provinces since July, 1572, and was at the time in Villa Fernandina, now called Vigan. Li Mahong continued his course until comms compelled his ships to anchor in the roads of Caoayan, Ilocos coast, where a few Spanish soldiers were stationed under the orders of Juan Salcido, who still was in the immediate town of Vigan. Under his direction preparations were made to prevent the enemy entering the river, but such was not Li Mahong's intention. He again set sail, whilst Salcido, naturally supposing his course would be towards Manila, also started at the same time for the capital with all the fighting men he could collect, leaving only 30 men to garrison Vigan and protect the state interests there. On November 29, 1574, the squadron arrived in the Bay of Manila, and Li Mahong sent forward his lieutenant Siako a Japanese at the head of 600 fighting men to demand the surrender of the Spaniards. A strong gale, however, destroyed several of his junks, in which about 200 men perished. With the remainder he reached the coast at Paranaki, a village seven miles south of Manila. Thence, with tow lines, the 400 soldiers hauled their junks up to the beach of the capital. Already at the village of Malate the alarm was raised, but the Spaniards could not give credit to the reports, and no resistance was offered until the Chinese were within the gates of the city. Martin de Goiti, the Maestre de Campo II second in command to the governor, was the first victim of the attack. The flames and smoke arising from his burning residence were the first indications which the governor received of what was going on. The Spaniards took refuge in the fort of Santiago, which the Chinese were on the point of taking by storm, when their attention was drawn elsewhere by the arrival of fresh troops led by a Spanish sub-lieutenant. Under the mistaken impression that these were the vanguard of a formidable corps, Siako sounded the retreat. A bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat followed, 
and with great difficulty the Chinese collected their dead and regained their junks. In the meantime Li Mahong, with the reserved forces, was lying in the roadstead of Kavita, and Siako hastened to report to him the result 49 of the attack, which had cost the invader over 100 dead and more than that number wounded. Thereupon Li Mahong resolved to rest his troops and renew the conflict in two days' time under his personal supervision. The next day once all Sito arrived by sea with reinforcements from Vigan, and preparations were unceasingly made for the expected encounter. Saul Sito having been appointed to the office of Maestre de Campo, vacant since the death of Goiti, the organization of the defense was entrusted to his immediate care. By daybreak on December 3 the enemy's fleet hoped to off the capital, where Li Mahong harangued his troops, whilst the cornets and drums of the Spaniards were sounding the alarm for their fighting men to assemble in the fort. Then 1,500 chosen men, well armed, were disembarked under the leadership of Siako, who swore to take the place or die in the attempt. Siako separated his forces into three divisions. The city was set fire to, and Siako advanced towards the fort, into which hand grenades were thrown, whilst Li Mahong supported the attack with his ship's cannon. Siako, with his division, at length entered the fort, and a hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued. For a while the issue was doubtful. Saul Sito fought like a lion. Even the aged governor was well to the front to encourage the deadly struggle for existence. The Spaniards finally gained the victory, the Chinese were repulsed with great slaughter, and their leader having been killed, they fled in complete disorder. Saul Sito, profiting by the confusion, now took the offensive and followed up the enemy, pursuing them along the seashore, where they were joined by the 3rd Division, which had remained inactive. The panic of the Chinese spread rapidly, and Li Mahong, in despair, landed another contingent of about 500 men, whilst he still continued afloat, but even with this reinforcement the morale of his army could not be restored. The Chinese troops therefore, harassed on all sides, made a precipitate retreat on board the fleet, and Li Mahong set sail again for the west coast of the island. Foiled in the attempt to possess himself of Manila, Li Mahong determined to set up his capital in other parts. In a few days he arrived at the mouth of the Agno River, in the province of Pangasinan, where he proclaimed to the natives that he had gained a signal victory over the Spaniards. The inhabitants there, having no particular choice between two masters, received Li Mahong with welcome, and he thereupon set about the foundation of his new capital some four miles from the mouth of the river. Months passed before the Spaniards came in force to dislodge the invader. Feeling themselves secure in their new abode, the Chinese had built many dwellings, a small fortress, a pagoda, etc. At length an expedition was dispatched under the command of once all Sito. This was composed of about 250 Spaniards and 1,600 natives well equipped with small arms, ammunition, and artillery. The flower of 50 the Spanish colony, accompanied by two priests and the Raja of Tonda, set out to expel the formidable foe. Li Mahong made a bold resistance, and refused to come to terms with Sal Sito. In the meantime, the Viceroy of Fokien, having heard of Li Mahong's daring exploits, had commissioned a ship of war to discover the whereabouts of his imperial master's old enemy. The envoy was received with delight by the Spaniards, who invited him to accompany them to Manila to interview the governor. Li Mahong still held out, but perceiving that an irresistible onslaught was being projected against him by Saul Sito's party, he very cunningly and quite unexpectedly slipped away, and sailed out of the river with his ships by one of the mouths unknown to his enemies. Point three, in order to divert the attention of the Spaniards, Li Mahong ingeniously feigned an assault in an opposite quarter. Of course, on his escape, he had to abandon the troops employed in this maneuvre. These, losing all hope, and having indeed nothing but their lives to fight for, fled to the mountains. Hence it is popularly supposed that from these fugitives descends the race of people in the hill district north of that province still distinguishable by their oblique eyes and known by the name of Igoro Chinese. A toi ti is an old French maxim, but the Spaniards chose to attribute their deliverance from their Chinese rivals to the friendly intervention of Saint Andrew. 
This saint was declared thenceforth to be the patron saint of Manila, and in his honor High Mass was celebrated in the cathedral at 8 a.m. on the 30th of each November. In Spanish times it was a public holiday and gala day, when all the highest civil, military, and religious authorities attended the function votiva de San Andres. This opportunity to assert the supremacy of ecclesiastical power was not lost to the Church, and for many years it was the custom, after hearing Mass, to spread the Spanish national flag on the floor of the cathedral for the Metropolitan Archbishop to walk over it. However, a few years prior to the Spanish evacuation the government general refused to witness this antiquated formula and it subsequently became the practice to carry the royal standard before the altar. Both before and after the Mass, the bearer, Alfred Real, wearing his hat and accompanied by the mayor of the city, stood on the altar floor, raised his hat three times, and three times dipped the flag before the image of Christ, then, facing the public, he repeated the ceremony. On St. Andrew's Eve the royal standard was borne in procession from the cathedral through the principal streets of the city, escorted by civil functionaries and followed by a band of music. This ceremony was known as the Paseo del Real Pendant 51 according to Juan de la Concepcion, the Rajas for Solomon and La Condola took advantage of these troubles to raise a rebellion against the Spaniards. The natives, too, of Mindoro Island revolted and maltreated the priests, but all these disturbances were speedily quelled by a detachment of soldiers. The governor willingly accepted the offer of the commander of the Chinese Man O' War to convey ambassadors to his country to visit the viceroy and make a commercial treaty. Therefore two priests, Martin Rada and Geronimo Martin, were commissioned to carry a letter of greeting and presents to this personage, who received them with great distinction, but objected to their residing in the country. After the defeat of Limahong, once all Sido again set out to the northern provinces of Luzon Island, to continue his task of reducing the natives to submission. On March 11, 1576, he died of fever near Vigan, then called Villa Fernandina, capital of the province of Ilocos Sur. A year afterwards, what could be found of his bones were placed in the ossuary of his illustrious grandfather, Legaspi, in the Augustine Chapel of St. Fausto, Manila. His skull, however, which had been carried off by the natives of Ilocos, could not be recovered in spite of all threats and promises. In Vigan there is a small monument raised to commemorate the deeds of this famous warrior, and there is also a street bearing his name in Vigan and another in Manila. For several years following these events, the question of prestige in the civil affairs of the colony was acrimoniously contested by the government general, the Supreme Court, and the ecclesiastics. The governor was censured by his opponents for alleged undue exercise of arbitrary authority. The Supreme Court, established on the Mexican model, was reproached with seeking to overstep the limits of its functions. Every legal quibble was adjusted by a dilatory process, impracticable in a colony yet in its infancy, where summary justice was indispensable for the maintenance of order imperfectly understood by the masses but the fault lay less with the justices than with the constitution of the court itself. Nor was this state of affairs improved by the growing discontent and immoderate ambition of the clergy, who unremittingly urged their pretensions to immunity from state control, affirming the supermundane condition of their office. An excellent code of laws, called the Leyes de Indias, in force in Mexico, was adopted here, but modifications in harmony with the special conditions of this colony were urgently necessary, whilst all the branches of government called for reorganization or reform. Under these circumstances, the Bishop of Manila, Domingo Salazar V took the 52 initiative in commissioning an Austin friar, Alonso Sanchez, to repair firstly to the Viceroy of Mexico and afterwards to the King of Spain, to expose the grievances of his party. Alonso Sanchez left the Philippines with his appointment as Procurator General for the Augustine Order of Monks. As the execution of the proposed reforms, which he was charged to lay before His Majesty, would, if conceded, be entrusted to the control of the Government of Mexico, his first care was to seek the partisanship of the Viceroy of that colony, and in this he succeeded. Thence he continued his journey to Seville, where the court happened to be, arriving there in September, 
1587. He was at once granted an audience of the king, to present his credentials and memorials relative to Philippine affairs in general and ecclesiastical, judicial, military and native matters in particular. The king promised to peruse all the documents, but suffering from gout, and having so many and distinct state concerns to attend to, the negotiations were greatly delayed. Finally, Alonso Sanchez sought a minister who had easy access to the royal apartments, and this personage obtained from the king permission to examine the documents and hand to him a succinct resume of the whole for his majesty's consideration. A commission was then appointed, including Sanchez, and the deliberations lasted five months. At this period, public opinion in the Spanish universities was very divided with respect to Catholic missions in the Indies. Some maintained that the propaganda of the faith ought to be purely apostolic, such as Jesus Christ taught to his disciples, inculcating doctrines of humility and poverty without arms or violence, and if, nevertheless, the heathens refused to welcome this mission of peace, the missionaries should simply abandon them in silence without further demonstration than that of shaking the dust off their feet. Others held, and amongst them was Sanchez, that such a method was useless and impracticable, and that it was justifiable to force their religion upon primitive races at the point of the sword if necessary, using any violence to enforce its acceptance. Much ill feeling was aroused in the discussion of these two and distinct theories. Juan Volante, a Dominican friar of the convent of Our Lady of Atacha, presented a petition against the views of the Sanchez faction, declaring that the idea of engrafting religion with the aid of arms was scandalous. Juan Volante was so importunate that he had to be heard in council, but neither party yielded. At length, the intervention of the bishops of Manila, Macau and Malacca and several captains and governors in the Indies influenced the king to put an end to the controversy, on the ground that it would lead to no good. The king retired to the monastery of the Escorial, and Sanchez was cited to meet him there to learn the royal will. About the same time the news reached the king of the loss of the so-called Invincible Armada, 53 sent under the command of the incompetent Duke of Medina Sidonia to annex England. Notwithstanding this severe blow to the vain ambition of Philip, the affairs of the Philippines were delayed but a short time. On the basis of the recommendation of the junta, the royal assent was given to an important decree, of which the most significant articles are the following, namely the tribute was fixed by the king at 10 reals, 5 s, per annum, payable by the natives in gold, silver, or grain, or part in one commodity and part in the other. Of this tribute, 8 reals were to be paid to the treasury, one half real to the bishop and clergy, sanctorum tax, and one and a half reals to be applied to the maintenance of the soldiery. Full tribute was not to be exacted from the natives still unsubjected to the crown. Until their confidence and loyalty should be gained by friendly overtures, they were to pay a small recognition of vassalage, and subsequently the tribute in common with the rest. Instead of one-fifth value of gold and hidden treasure due to His Majesty, Real Quinto, he would thenceforth receive only one-tenth of such value, excepting that of gold, which the natives would be permitted to extract free of rebate. A customs duty of 3 per cent ad valorem was to be paid on merchandise sold, and this duty was to be spent on the army. Export duty was to be paid on goods shipped to New Spain, Mexico, and this impost was also to be exclusively spent on the armed forces. These goods were chiefly Chinese manufactures. The number of European troops in the colony was fixed at 400 men at arms, divided into six companies, each under a captain a sub-lieutenant, a sergeant, and two corporals. Their pay was to be as follows, namely Captain 35 Cuban pesos, sub-lieutenant 20 Cuban pesos, sergeant 10 Cuban pesos, corporal 7 Cuban pesos, rank and file 6 Cuban pesos per month, besides which, an annual gratuity of 10,000 Cuban pesos was to be proportionately distributed to all. Recruits from Mexico, for military service in the islands, were not to enlist under the age of 15 years. The captain general was to have a bodyguard of 24 men, halberdiers, with the pay of those of the line, under the immediate command of a captain to be paid 15 Cuban pesos per month. 
salaries due to state employees were to be punctually paid when due, and when funds were wanted for that purpose, they were to be supplied from Mexico. The king made a donation of 12,000 Cuban pesos, which, with another like sum to be contributed by the Spaniards themselves, would serve to liquidate their debts incurred on their first occupation of the islands. The governor and bishop were recommended to consider the project of a refuge for young Spanish women arrived from Spain and Mexico, and to study the question of dowries for native women married to poor Spaniards 54 the offices of secretaries and notaries were no longer to be sold, but conferred on persons who merited such appointments. The governors were instructed not to make grants of land to their relations, servants, or friends, but solely to those who should have resided at least three years in the islands, and have worked the land so conceded. Any grants which might have already been made to the relations of the governors or magistrates were to be cancelled. The rent paid by the Chinese for the land they occupied was to be applied to the necessities of the capital. The governor and bishop were to enjoin the judges not to permit costly lawsuits, but to execute summary justice verbally, and so far as possible, fines were not to be inflicted. The city of Manila was to be fortified in a manner to ensure it against all further attacks or risings. Four penitentiaries were to be established in the islands in the most convenient places, with the necessary garrisons, and six to eight galleys and frigates well armed and ready for defense against the English corsairs who might come by way of the Moluccas. In the most remote and unexplored parts of the islands, the governor was to have unlimited powers to act as he should please, without consulting his majesty, but projected enterprises of conversion, pacification, etc., at the expense of the royal treasury, were to be submitted to a council comprising the bishop, the captains, etc. The governor was authorized to capitulate and agree with the captain and others who might care to undertake conversions and pacifications on their own account, and to concede the title of maestre de campo to such persons, on condition that such capitulations should be forwarded to His Majesty for ratification. Only those persons domiciled in the islands would be permitted to trade with them. A sum of 1,000 Cuban pesos was to be taken from the tributes paid into the royal treasury for the foundation of the hospital for the Spaniards, and the annual sum of 600 Cuban pesos, appropriated by the governor for its support, was confirmed. Moreover, the Royal Treasury of Mexico was to send clothing to the value of 400 ducats for the hospital use. The hospital for the natives was to receive an annual donation of 600 Cuban pesos for its support, and an immediate supply of clothing from Mexico to the value of 200 Cuban pesos. Slaves held by the Spaniards were to be immediately set at liberty. No native was thenceforth to make slaves. All newborn natives were declared free. The bondage of all existing slaves from 10 years of age was to cease on their attaining 20 years of age. Those above 20 years of age were to serve 5 years longer, and then become free. At any time, notwithstanding the foregoing conditions, they would be entitled to purchase their liberty, 55 the price of which was to be determined by the governor and the bishop. Point six, there being no tithes payable to the church by Spaniards or natives, the clergy were to receive for their maintenance the half real above mentioned in lieu thereof, from the tribute paid by each native subjected to the crown. When the Spaniards should have crops, they were to pay tithes to the clergy, diasmos prediles. A grant was made of 12,000 ducats for the building and ornaments of the Cathedral of Manila, and an immediate advance of 2,000 ducats on account of this grant was made from the funds to be remitted from Mexico. Forty Austin friars were to be sent at once to the Philippines, to be followed by missionaries from other corporations. The king allowed 500 Cuban pesos to be paid against the 1,000 Cuban pesos passage money for each priest, the balance to be defrayed out of the common funds of the clergy, derived from their share of the tribute. Missionaries in great numbers had already flocked to the Philippines and roamed wherever they thought fit, without license from the bishop, whose authority they utterly repudiated. Affirming that they had the direct consent of His Holiness the Pope, they menaced with excommunication whosoever attempted to impede them in their free peregrination. Five years after the foundation of Manila, the city and environs were infested with niggardly mendicant friars, 
whose slothful habits placed their supercilious countrymen in ridicule before the natives. They were tolerated but a short time in the islands, not altogether because of the ruin they would have brought to European moral influence on the untutored tribes, but because the bishop was highly jealous of all competition against the Augustine order which he assisted. Consequent on the representations of Alonso Sanchez, his majesty ordained that all priests who went to the Philippines were, in the first place, to resolve never to quit the islands without the bishop's sanction, which was to be conceded with great circumspection and only in extreme cases, whilst the governor was instructed not to afford them means of exit on his sole authority. Neither did the bishop regard with satisfaction the presence of the commissary of the Inquisition, whose secret investigations, shrouded with mystery, curtailed the liberty of the loftiest functionary, sacred or civil. At the instigation of Alonso Sanchez, the junta recommended the king to recall the commissary and extinguish the office, but 56 he refused to do so. In short, the chief aims of the bishop were to enhance the power of the friars, raise the dignity of the colonial mitre, and secure a religious monopoly for the Augustine order. Gomez Porras das Marinas was the next governor appointed to these islands, on the recommendation of Alonso Sanchez. In the royal instructions which he brought with him were embodied all the above-mentioned civil, ecclesiastical, and military reforms. At the same time, King Philip abolished the Supreme Court. He wished to put an end to the interminable lawsuit so prejudicial to the development of the colony. Therefore the president and magistrates were replaced by justices of the peace, and the former returned to Mexico in 1591. This measure served only to widen the breach between the bishop and the civil government. Das Marinas compelled him to keep within the sphere of his sacerdotal functions, and tolerated no rival in state concerns. There was no appeal on the spot against the governor's authority. This restraint irritated and disgusted the bishop to such a degree that, at the age of 78 years, he resolved to present himself at the Spanish court. On his arrival there, he explained to the king the impossibility of one bishop attending to the spiritual wants of a people dispersed over so many islands. For seven years after the foundation of Manila as capital of the archipelago, its principal church was simply a parish church. In 1578 it was raised to the dignity of a cathedral, at the instance of the king. Three years after this date the Cathedral of Manila was solemnly declared to be a suffragan cathedral of Mexico, under the advocation of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, Domingo Salazar being the first bishop consecrated. He now proposed to raise the Manila See to an archbishopric, with three suffragan bishops. The king gave his consent, subject to approval from Rome, and this following in due course, Salazar was appointed first archbishop of Manila, but he died before the papal bull arrived, dated August 14, 1595, officially authorizing his investiture. In the meantime, Alonso Sanchez had proceeded to Rome in May, 1589. Amongst many other pontifical favors conceded to him, he obtained the right for himself, or his assigns, to use a die or stamp of any form with one or more images, to be chosen by the holder, and to contain also the figure of Christ, the very Holy Virgin, or the Saints Peter or Paul. On the reverse was to be engraven a bust portrait of His Holiness, with the following indulgences attached thereto, viz. colon to him who should convey the word of God to the infidels, or give them notice of the holy mysteries each time three hundred years indulgence. To him who, by industry, converted any one of these, or brought him to the bosom of the church full indulgence for all sins. A number of minor indulgences were conceded for services to be rendered to the pontificate, and for the praying so many Pater Nostas and Ave Marias. This bull was dated in Rome July 28, 1591-57 Popes Gregory XIV. And Innocent IX. Granted other bulls relating to the rewards for using beads, medals, crosses, pictures, blessed images, etc., with which one could gain nine plenary indulgences every day or rescue nine souls from purgatory, and each day, twice over, all the full indulgences yet given in and out of Rome could be obtained for living and deceased persons. Sanchez returned to Spain, where he died, bringing with him the body of Saint Polycarp, 
relics of Saint Potenciana, and 157 meritres, amongst them, 27 popes, for remission to the Cathedral of Manila. The Supreme Court was re-established with the same faculties as those of Mexico and Lima in 1598, and since then, on seven occasions, when the governorship has been vacant, it has acted pro tem. The following interesting account of the pompous ceremonial attending the reception of the royal seal, restoring this court, is given by Concepcion.7 He says the royal seal of office was received from the ship with the accustomed solemnity. It was contained in a chest covered with purple velvet and trimmings of silver and gold, over which hung a cloth of silver and gold. It was escorted by a majestic accompaniment, marching to the sounds of clarions and cymbals and other musical instruments. The cortege passed through the noble city with rich vestments, with leg trimmings and uncovered heads. Behind these followed a horse, gorgeously caparisoned and girthed, upon whose back the president placed the coffer containing the royal seal. The streets were beautifully adorned with exquisite drapery. The high bailiff, magnificently robed, took the reins in hand to lead the horse under a purple velvet pall, bordered with gold. The magistrates walked on either side, the aldermen of the city, richly clad, carried their staves of office in the August procession, which concluded with a military escort, standard bearers, etc., and proceeded to the cathedral, where it was met by the dean, holding a cross. As the company entered the sacred edifice, the te deum was intoned by a band of music. In 1886 a Supreme Court, exactly similar to, and independent of, that of Manila, was established in the city of Cebu. The question of precedence in official acts having been soon after disputed between the president of the court and the brigadier governor of Visayas, it was decided in favor of the latter, on appeal to the government general. In the meantime, the advisability of abolishing the Supreme Court of Cebu, was warmly debated by the public. For many years after the conquest, deep religious sentiment pervaded the state policy, and not a few of the governors general acquired fame for their demonstrations of piety. Nevertheless, the conflictive ambition 58 of the state and church representatives was a powerful hindrance to the progress of the colony. The quarrel between Sebastian Hurtado de Corcuera, 1635-44, and the archbishop arose from a circumstance of little concern to the colony. The archbishop ordered a military officer, who had a slave, either to sell or liberate her. The officer, rather than yield to either condition, wished to marry her, but failing to obtain her consent, he stabbed her to death. He thereupon took asylum in a convent, whence he was forcibly removed, and publicly executed in front of St. Augustine's church by order of the governor. The archbishop protested against the act, which, in those days, was qualified as a violation of sanctuary. The churches were closed whilst the dispute lasted. The Jesuits, always opposed to the Austin friars, sided with the governor. The archbishop therefore prohibited them to preach outside their churches in any public place, under pain of excommunication and 4,000 ducats fine, whilst the other priests agreed to abstain from attending their religious or literary reunions. Finally, a religious council was called, but a coalition having been formed against the archbishop, he was excommunicated his goods dis terrained his salary stopped, and he was suspended in his archiepiscopal functions under a penalty of 4,000 ducats fine. At this crisis, he implored mercy and the intervention of the Supreme Court. The magistrates decided against the prelate's appeal, and allowed him 12 hours to comply, under pain of continued excommunication and a further fine of 1,000 ducats. The archbishop thereupon retired to the convent of St. Francis, where the governor visited him. The archbishop subsequently made the most abject submission in an archiepiscopal decree which fully sets forth the admission of his guilt. Such a violent settlement of disputes did not long remain undisturbed, and the archbishop again sought the first opportunity of opposing the lay authority. In this he can only be excused if excuse it be as the upholder of the traditions of cordial discord between the two great factions church and state. The Supreme Court, under the presidency of the governor, resolved therefore to banish the archbishop from Manila. With this object, 
50 soldiers were deputed to seize the prelate, who was secretly forewarned of their coming by his co-conspirators. On their approach he held the host in his hand, and it is related that the sub-lieutenant sent in charge of the troops was so horrified at his mission that he placed the hilt of his sword upon the floor and fell upon the point, but as the sword bent he did not kill himself. The soldiers waited patiently until the archbishop was tired out and compelled, by fatigue, to replace the host on the altar. Then they immediately arrested him, conducted him to a boat under a guard of five men, and landed him on the desert island of Corregidor. The churches were at once reopened, the Jesuits preached 59 where they chose, terms were dictated to the contumacious archbishop, who accepted everything unconditionally, and was thereupon permitted to resume his office. The acts of Corcuera were inquired into by his successor, who caused him to be imprisoned for five years, but it is to be presumed that Corcuera was justified in what he did, for on his release and return to Spain, the king rewarded him with the governorship of the Canary Islands. It is chronicled that Sabaniano Manrique de Lara, 1653-63, who arrived in the galleon San Francisco Xavier with the Archbishop Pobalt, refused to disembark until this dignitary had blessed the earth he was going to tread. It was he too who had the privilege of witnessing the expurgation of the islands of the excommunications and admonitions of Rome. The Archbishop brought peace and goodwill to all men, being charged by His Holiness to sanctify the colony. The ceremony was performed with great solemnity, from an elevation, in the presence of an immense concourse of people. Later on, the pious governor Lara was accused of perfidy to his royal master, and was fined 60,000 Cuban pesos, but on being pardoned, he retired to Spain, where he took holy orders. His successor, Diego Salcido, 1663-68, was not so fortunate in his relations with Archbishop Pobalt, for during five years he warmly contested his intervention in civil affairs. Pobalt found it hard to yield the exercise of veto in all matters which, by courtesy, had been conceded to him by the late Governor Lara. The Archbishop refused to obey the royal decrees relating to church appointments under the royal patronage, such preferments being in the hands of the government general as vice royal patron. These decrees were twice notified to the archbishop, but as he still persisted in his disobedience, Saul Cito signed an order for his expulsion to Marivals. This brought the prelate to his senses, and he remained more submissive in future. It is recorded that the relations between the governor and the archbishop became so strained that the latter was compelled to pay a heavy fine to remain standing whilst awaiting an audience to submit to contumely during the interviews and when he died, the governor ordered royal feasts to celebrate the joyful event, whilst he prohibited the de profundis mass, on the ground that such would be inconsistent with the secular festivities. The king, on being apprised of this, permitted the inquisition to take its course. Diego Salcido was surprised in his palace, and imprisoned by the bloodthirsty agents of the Santo Officio. Some years afterwards, he was shipped on board a galleon as a prisoner to the inquisitors of Mexico, but the ship had to put back under stress of weather, and Salcido returned to his dungeon. There he suffered the worst privations, until he was again embarked for Mexico. On this voyage 60 he died of grief and melancholy. The king espoused the cause of the ecclesiastics, and ordered Saul Cito's goods, as well as those of his partisans, to be confiscated. Manuel de Leon, 1669-77, managed to preserve a good understanding with the clergy, and, on his decease, he bequeathed all his possessions to the Obras Pias, QV. Troubles with the archbishop and friars were revived on the government being assumed by Juan de Nargas, 1678-84. In the last year of his rule, the Archbishop was banished from Manila. It is difficult to adequately appreciate the causes of this quarrel, and there is doubt as to which was right the governor or the Archbishop. On his restoration to his see, he was one of the few prelates perhaps the only one who personally sought to avenge himself. During the dispute, a number of friars had supported the government, and these he caused to stand on a raised platform in front of a church, and publicly recant their former acts, declaring themselves miscreants. 
Wanda Nargas had just retired from the governorship after seven years' service, and the archbishop called upon him likewise to abjure his past proceedings and perform the following penance to wear a penitence garb to place a rope around his neck, and carry a lighted candle to the doors of the cathedral and the churches of the Parian, San Gabriel and Binondo, on every feast day during four months. Nargas objected to this degradation, and claimed privilege, arguing that the archbishop had no jurisdiction over him, as he was a cavalier of the military order of St. James. But the archbishop only desisted in his pretensions to humiliate Nargas when the new governor threatened to expel him again. Fernando Bustamante Bustillo y Ruta, 1717-19, adopted very stringent measures to counteract the archbishop's excessive claims to immunity. Several individuals charged with heinous crimes had taken church asylum and defied the civil power and justice. The archbishop was appealed to, to hand them over to the civil authorities, or allow them to be taken. He refused to do either, supporting the claim of immunity of sanctuary. At the same time it came to the knowledge of the governor that a movement had been set on foot against him by those citizens who favored the archbishop's views, and that even the friars had so debased themselves as to seek the aid of the Chinese residents against the governor. José Torralba, QV, the late acting governor, was released from confinement by the governor, and reinstated by him as judge in the Supreme Court, although he was under an accusation of embezzlement to the extent of 700,000 Cuban pesos. The archbishop energetically opposed this act. He notified to Torralba his excommunication and ecclesiastical pains, and, on his own authority, attempted to seize his person in violation of the privileges of the Supreme Court. Torralba, with his sword and shield in hand, expelled 61 the archbishop's messenger by force. Then, as judge in the Supreme Court, he hastened to avenge himself of his enemies by issuing warrants against them. They fled to church asylum, and, with the moral support of the archbishop, laughed at the magistrates. There the refugees provided themselves with arms, and prepared for rebellion. When the archbishop was officially informed of these facts, he still maintained that nothing could violate their immunity. The governor then caused the archbishop to be arrested and confined in a fortress, with all the ecclesiastics who had taken an active part in the conspiracy against the government. Open riot ensued, and the priests marched to the palace, amidst hideous clamourings, collecting the mob and citizens on the way. It was one of the most revolting scenes and remarkable events in Philippine history. Priests of the sacred orders of St. Francis, St. Dominic, and St. Augustine joined the Ricolitos in shouting Viva la Iglesia, Viva Nuestro Rey Don Felipe Quinto ate the excited rabble rushed to the palace, and the guard having fled, they easily forced their way in. One priest who impudently dared to advance towards the governor, was promptly ordered by him to stand back. The governor, seeing himself encircled by an armed mob of laymen and servants of Christ clamouring for his downfall, pulled the trigger of his gun, but the flint failed to strike fire. Then the crowd took courage and attacked him, whilst he defended himself bravely with a bayonet, until he was overwhelmed by numbers. From the palace he was dragged to the common jail, and stabbed and maltreated on the way. His son, hearing of this outrage, arrived on horseback, but was run through by one of the rebels, and fell to the ground. He got up and tried to cut his way through the infuriated rioters, but was soon surrounded and killed, and his body horribly mutilated. The populace, urged by the clerical party, now fought for the liberty of the archbishop. The prison doors were broken open, and the archbishop was amongst the number of offenders liberated. The prelate came in triumph to the palace, and assumed the government in October, 1719. The mob, during their excesses, tore down the royal standard, and maltreated those whom they met of the unfortunate governor's faithful friends. A mock inquiry into the circumstances of the riot was made in Manila in apparent judicial form. Another investigation was instituted in Mexico, which led to several of the minor actors in this sad drama being made the scapegoat victims of the more exalted criminals. The archbishop held the government for nine years, and was then transferred to the Mexican bishopric of Mecoacan. P.
Pedro Manuel de Arandia, 1754-59, is said to have expired of 62 melancholy, consequent, in a measure, on his feudal endeavors to govern at peace with the friars, who always secured the favor of the king. On four occasions the supreme state authority in the colony has been vested in the prelates. Archbishop Manuel Rojo, acting governor at the time of the British occupation of Manila in 1763, is said to have died of grief and shame in prison, 1764, through the intrigues of the violent Simon de Anda y Salazar, QV. Jose Ruan was government general in 1768, when the expulsion of the Jesuits was decreed. After the secret determination was made known to him, he was accused of having divulged it, and of having concealed his instructions. He was thereupon placed under guard in his own residence, where he expired, Vidi Simon de Anda y Salazar. Domingo Mori once y Marillo, 1877-80, it is alleged, had grave altercations with the friars, and found it necessary to remind the Archbishop Peo that the supreme power in the Philippines belonged to the state not to the church representative. From the earliest times of Spanish dominion, it had been the practice of the natives to expose to view the corpses of their relations and friends in the public highways and villages whilst conveying them to the parish churches, where they were again exhibited to the common gaze, pending the pleasure of the parish priest to perform the last obsequies. This outrage on public decorum was proscribed by the Director General of Civil Administration in a circular dated October 18, 1887, addressed to the provincial governors, enjoining them to prohibit such indecent scenes in future. Thereupon the parish priests simply showed their contempt for the civil authorities by simulating their inability to elucidate to the native petty governors the true intent and meaning of the order. At the same time, the Archbishop of Manila issued instructions on the subject to his subordinates in very equivocal language. The native local authorities then petitioned the civil governor of Manila to make the matter clear to them. The civil governor forthwith referred the matter back to the Director General of Civil Administration. This functionary, in a new circular dated November 4, confirmed his previous mandate of October 18, and censured the action of the parish priests, who in improper language and from the pulpit, had incited the native headman to set aside his authority. The author of the circular sarcastically added the pregnant remark, that he was penetrated with the conviction that the archbishop's sense of patriotism and rectitude would deter him from subverting the law. This incident seriously aroused the jealousy of the friars holding vicarages, and did not improve the relations between church and state. 63 One Guido de Lavezars deposed a sultan in Borneo in order to aid another to the throne, and even asked permission of King Philip II to conquer China, which of course was not conceded to him. Vidi also the history of the destruction of the Aztec, Mexican, and Incas, Peruvian, dynasties by the Spaniards, in W. H. Prescott's Conquest of Mexico and Conquest of Peru. Two Maestre de Campo, obsolete grade, about equivalent to the modern general of brigade. This officer was practically the military governor. Three according to Juan de la Concepcion, in his History General de Filipinas, Volume I, p. 431, Li Mahong made his escape by cutting a canal for his ships to pass through, but this would appear to be highly improbable under the circumstances. For some authors assert that only Solomon rebelled. 5. Domingo Salazar, the first bishop of Manila, took possession in 1581. He and one companion were the only Dominicans in the islands until 1587. Six bondage in the Philippines was apparently not so necessary for the interests of the church as it was in Cuba, where a commission of friars, appointed soon after the discovery of the island, to deliberate on the policy of partially permitting slavery there, reported that the Indians would not labor without compulsion and that, unless they laboured, they could not be brought into communication with the whites, nor be converted to Christianity. Vidi W. H. Prescott's History of the Conquest of Mexico, Tom. 2, Chap, I, P. 104, ed. 1878 7 History General de Filipinas, by Juan de la Concepcion, Volume 3, Chap, 9, 
P365, published at Manila, 1788. 8. Long live the Church, long live our King Philip V. Early relations with Japan Two decades of existence in the 16th century was but a short period in which to make known the conditions of this new colony to its neighboring states, when its only regular intercourse with them was through the Chinese who came to trade with Manila. Japanese mariners, therefore, appear to have continued to regard the north of Luzon as no man's land, four years after its nominal annexation by the Spaniards they assembled there, whether as merchants or buccaneers it is difficult to determine. Spanish authority had been asserted by Salcedo along the west coast about as far as Lat. 18 degrees N, but in 1591 the north coast was only known to Europeans geographically. So far, the natives there had not made the acquaintance of their new masters. A large Spanish galley cruising in these waters met a Japanese vessel off Cape Bojadar, NW Point, and fired a shot which carried away the stranger's main mast, obliging him to heave to. Then the galley men, intending to board the stranger, made fast the sterns, whilst the Spaniards rushed to the bows, but the Japanese came first, boarded the galley, and drove the Spaniards aft, where they would have all perished had they not cut away the mizzenmast and let it fall with all sail set. Behind this barricade they had time to load their arquebuses and drive back the Japanese, over whom they gained a victory. The Spaniards then entered the Rio Grande de Cagayan, where they met a Japanese fleet, between which they passed peacefully. On shore they formed trenches and mounted cannons on earthworks, but the Japanese scaled the fortifications and pulled down the cannons by the mouths. These were recovered, and the Spanish captain had the cannon mouths greased, so that the Japanese tactics should not be repeated. A battle was fought and the defeated Japanese set sail, whilst the Spaniards remained to obtain the submission of the natives by force or by persuasion. The Japanese had also come to Manila to trade, and were located in the neighboring village of Dalau one where the Franciscan friars undertook 64 their conversion to Christianity, whilst the Dominican order considered the spiritual care of the Chinese their especial charge. The Portuguese had been in possession of Macau since the year 1557, and traded with various Chinese ports, whilst in the Japanese town of Nagasaki there was a small colony of Portuguese merchants. These were the indirect sources whence the Emperor of Japan learnt that Europeans had founded a colony in Luzon Island, and in 1593 he sent a message to the governor of the Philippines calling upon him to surrender and become his vassal, threatening invasion in the event of refusal. The Spanish colonies at that date were hardly in a position to treat with haughty scorn the menaces of the Japanese potentate, for they were simultaneously threatened with troubles with the Dutch in the Moluccas, for which they were preparing an armament, Vitae Chap 6. The want of men, ships, and war material obliged them to seek conciliation with dignity. The Japanese ambassador, Faranda Kayaman, was received with great honors and treated with the utmost deference during his sojourn in Manila. The governor replied to the emperor, that being but a leger of the king of Spain a mighty monarch of unlimited resources and power he was unable to acknowledge the emperor Susi Ainti, for the most important duty imposed upon him by his sovereign was the defense of his vast domains against foreign aggression, that, on the other hand, he was desirous of entering into amicable and mutually advantageous relations with the emperor, and solicited his conformity to a treaty of commerce, the terms of which would be elucidated to him by an envoy. A priest, Juan Cobo, and an infantry captain were thereupon accredited to the Japanese court as Philippine ambassadors. On their arrival they were, without delay, admitted in audience by the emperor, the treaty of commerce was adjusted to the satisfaction of both parties, and the ambassadors, with some Japanese nobles, set sail for Manila in Japanese ships, which foundered on the voyage, and all perished. Neither the political nor the clerical party in Manila was, however, dismayed by this first disaster, and the prospect of penetrating Japan was followed up by a second expedition. Between the friars an animated discussion arose when the Jesuits protested against members of any other order being sent to Japan. Saint Francis Xavier had, years before, obtained a papal bull from Pope Gregory XIII, awarding Japan to his order, 
which had been the first to establish missions in Nagasaki. Jesuits were still there in numbers, and the necessity of sending members of rival religious bodies is not made clear in the historical records. The jealous feud between those holy men was referred to the governor, who naturally decided against the Jesuits, in support of the king's policy of grasping territory under the cloak of piety. A certain Fray Pedro Bautista was chosen as ambassador, and in his suite were three other priests. These sixty-five embarked in a Spanish frigate, whilst Faranda Cayaman, who had remained in Manila the honored guest of the government, took his leave, and went on board his own vessel. The authorities bade farewell to the two embassies with ostentatious ceremonies, and amidst public rejoicings the two ships started on their journey on May 26, 1593. After 30 days navigation one ship arrived safely at Nagasaki, and the other at a port 35 miles further along the coast. Pedro Bautista, introduced by Fernando Cayaman, was presented to the Emperor Takasima, who welcomed him as an ambassador authorized to negotiate a treaty of commerce, and conclude an offensive and defensive alliance for mutual protection. The protocol was agreed to and signed by both parties, and the relations between the Emperor and Pedro Bautista became more and more cordial. The latter solicited, and obtained, permission to reside indefinitely in the country and send the treaty on by messenger to the governor of the Philippines, hence the ships in which the envoys had arrived remained about ten months in port. A concession was also granted to build a church at Miyako, near Osaka, and it was opened in 1594, when Mass was publicly celebrated. In Nagasaki the Jesuits were allowed to reside unmolested and practice their religious rites amongst the Portuguese population of traders and others who might have voluntarily embraced Christianity. Bautista went there to consult with the chief of the Jesuit mission, who energetically opposed what he held to be an encroachment upon the monopoly rights of his order, conceded by Pope Gregory XIII, and confirmed by royal decrees. Bautista, however, showed a permission which he had received from the Jesuit general, by virtue of which he was suffered to continue his course pending that dignitary's arrival. The Portuguese merchants in Nagasaki were not slow to comprehend that Bautista's coming with priests at his command was but a prelude to Spanish territorial conquest, which would naturally retard their hope for emancipation from the Spanish yoke. Point two, therefore, in their own interests, they forewarned the governor of Nagasaki, who prohibited Bautista from continuing his propaganda against the established religion of the country in contravention of the emperor's commands, but as Bautista took no heed of this injunction, he was expelled from Nagasaki for contumacy. It was now manifest to the emperor that he had been basely deceived, and that under the pretext of concluding a commercial and political treaty, Bautista and his party had, in effect, introduced themselves into his realm with the clandestine object of seducing his subjects from their allegiance, of undermining their consciences, perverting them from the religion of their forefathers, and that all this would bring about the dismemberment of his empire and the overthrow of his 66th dynasty. Not only had Takasima abstained from persecuting foreigners for the exercise of their religious rites, but he freely licensed the Jesuits to continue their mission in Nagasaki and wherever Catholics happened to congregate. He had permitted the construction of their temples, but he could not tolerate a deliberate propaganda which foreshadowed his own ruin. Point three Pedro Bautista's designs being prematurely obstructed, he took his passage back to Manila from Nagasaki in a Japanese vessel, leaving behind him his interpreter, Fray Jerome, with the other Franciscan monks. An imperial decree was then issued to prohibit foreign priests from interfering with the religion of Japanese subjects, but this law having been set at naught by Bautista's colleagues, one was arrested and imprisoned, and warrants were issued against the others, meanwhile the Jesuits in Nagasaki were in no way restrained. The governor of Nagasaki caused the Franciscan propagandists to be conducted on board a Portuguese ship and handed over to the charge of the captain, under severe penalties if he aided or allowed their escape, but they were free to go wherever they chose outside the Japanese Empire. The captain, however, permitted one to return ashore, and for some time he wandered about the country in disguise. Pedro Bautista had reached Manila, where the ecclesiastical dignitaries prevailed upon the governor to sanction another expedition to Japan, 
and Bautista arrived in that country a second time with a number of Franciscan friars. The emperor now lost all patience, and determined not only to repress these venturesome foreigners, but to stamp out the last vestige of their revolutionary machinations. Therefore, by imperial decree, the arrest was ordered of all the Franciscan friars, and all natives who persisted in their adhesion to these missionaries' teachings. Twenty-six of those taken were tried and condemned to ignominious exhibition and death the Spaniards, because they had come into the country and had received royal favors under false pretenses, representing themselves as political ambassadors and sweet the Japanese, because they had forsworn the religion of their ancestors and bid fair to become a constant danger and source of discord in the realm. Amongst these Spaniards was Pedro Bautista. After their ears and noses had been cut off, they were promenaded from town to town in a cart, finally entering Nagasaki on horseback, each bearing the sentence of death on a breastboard. On a high ground, near the city and the port, in front of the Jesuits' church, these twenty-six persons were crucified and stabbed to death with lances, in expiation of their political offenses. It was a sad fate for men who conscientiously believed that they were justified in violating rights and 67 laws of nations for the propagation of their particular views, but can one complain? Would Buddhist missionaries in Spain have met with milder treatment at the hands of the inquisitors, for each Catholic body was supposed to designate the same road to heaven each professed to teach the same means of obtaining the grace of God, yet, strange to say, each bore the other an implacable hatred and inextinguishable jealousy. If conversion to Christianity were for the glory of God only, what could it have mattered whether souls of Japanese were saved by Jesuits or by others? For King Philip it was the same whether his political tools were of one denomination or the other, but many of the Jesuits in Japan happened to be Portuguese. The Jesuits in Manila probably felt that in view of their opposition to the Franciscan missions, public opinion might hold them morally responsible for indirectly contributing to the unfortunate events related, therefore, to justify their acts, they formally declared that Pedro Bautista and his followers died excommunicated, because they had disobeyed the bull of Pope Gregory XIII. The general public were much excited when the news spread through the city, and a special mass was said, followed by a religious procession through the streets. The governor sent a commission to Japan, under the control of Luis de Navarrete, to ask for the dead bodies and chattels of the executed priests. The emperor showed no rancor whatsoever, on the contrary, his policy was already carried out, and to welcome the Spanish lay deputies, he gave a magnificent banquet and entertained them sumptuously. Luis de Navarrete having claimed the dead bodies of the priests, the emperor at once ordered the guards on the execution ground to retire, and told Navarrete that he could dispose as he pleased of the mortal remains. Navarrete therefore hastened to Nagasaki, but before he could reach there, devout Catholics had cut up the bodies, one carrying away a head, another a leg, and so forth. It happened, too, that Navarrete died of disease a few days after his arrival in Nagasaki. His successor, Diego de Lassa, recovered the pieces of the deceased priests, which he put into a box and shipped for Manila, but the vessel and box of relics were lost on the way. Diego de Lassa returned to Manila, the bearer of a polite letter and very acceptable presents from the emperor to the governor of the Philippines. The letter fully expatiated on recent events, and set forth a well-reasoned justification of the emperor's decrees against the priests, in terms which proved that he was neither a tyrant nor a wanton savage, 68 but an astute politician. The letter stated, that under the pretext of being ambassadors, the priests in question had come into the country and had taught a diabolical law belonging to foreign countries, and which aimed at superseding the rights and laws of his own religion, confused his people, and destroyed his government and kingdom, for which reason he had rigorously proscribed it. Against these prohibitions, the religious men of Luzon preached their law publicly to humble people, such as servants and slaves. Not being able to permit this persistence in law-breaking, he had ordered their death by placing them on crosses, for he was informed that in the kingdom where Spaniards dominated, this teaching of their religious doctrine was but an artifice and stratagem by means of which the civil power was deceitfully gained. 
he astutely asks the government general if he would consent to Japanese preaching their laws in his territory, perturbing public peace with such novelties amongst the lower classes. Certainly it would be severely repressed, argued the emperor, adding that in the exercise of his absolute power and for the good of his subjects, he had avoided the occurrence in his dominions of what had taken place in those regions where the Spaniards deposed the legitimate kings, and constituted themselves masters by religious fraud. He explains that the seizure of the cargo of a Spanish ship was only a reprisal for the harm which he had suffered by the tumult raised when the edict was evaded. But as the Spanish governor had thought fit to send another ambassador from so far, risking the perils of the sea, he was anxious for peace and mutual good feeling, but only on the precise condition that no more individuals should be sent to teach a law foreign to his realm, and under these unalterable conditions the governor's subjects were at liberty to trade freely with Japan, that by reason of his former friendship and royal clemency, he had refrained from killing all the Spaniards with the priests and their servants, and had allowed them to return to their country. As to religion itself, Takasuma is said to have remarked that among so many professed, one more was of little consequence hence his toleration in the beginning, and his continued permission to the Jesuits to maintain their doctrines amongst their own sectarians. Moreover, it is said that a map was shown to Takasuma, marking the domains of the King of Spain and Portugal, and that in reply to his inquiry, how could one man have conquered such vast territory? A certain Father Guzman, probably a Portuguese, answered, by secretly sending religious men to teach their doctrine, and when a sufficient number of persons were so converted, the Spanish soldiery, with their aid, annexed their country and overthrew their kings. Such an avowal naturally impressed Takasima profoundly. 569 in Seville there was quite a tumult when the details of the executions in Japan were published. In the meantime, the lamentable end of the Franciscan missionaries did not deter others from making further attempts to follow their example. During the first twenty years of the 17th century, priests succeeded in entering Japan, under the pretense of trading, in spite of the extreme measures adopted to discover them and the precautions taken to uproot the new doctrine, which it was feared would become the forerunner of sedition. Indeed, many Japanese nobles professing Christianity had already taken up their residence in Manila, and were regarded by the emperor as a constant danger to his realm, hence he was careful to avoid communication with the Philippines. During the short reigns of Defusima and his son Kagusima, new decrees were issued, not against foreign Christians, but against those who made apostates amongst the Japanese, and consequently two more Spanish priests were beheaded. In September, 1622, a large number of Spanish missionaries and Christian Japanese men and children were executed in Nagasaki. Twenty-five of them were burnt and the rest beheaded, their remains being thrown into the sea to avoid the Christians following their odious custom of preserving parts of corpses as relics. Two days afterwards, four Franciscan and two Dominican friars with five Japanese were burnt in Omura. Then followed an edict stating the pains and penalties, civil deprivations, etc., against all who refused to abandon their apostasy and return to the faith of their forefathers. Another edict was issued imposing death upon those who should conduct priests to Japan, and forfeiture of the ships in which they should arrive and the merchandise with which they should come. To all informers against native apostates the culprits' estates and goods were transferred as a reward. A Spanish deputation was sent to the Emperor of Japan in 1622, alleging a desire to renew commercial relations, but the Emperor was so exasperated at the recent defiance of his decrees that he refused to accept the deputies' presence from the Philippine government, and sent them and the deputation away. Still there were friars in Manila eager to seek martyrdom, but the Philippine traders, in view of the danger of confiscation of their ships and merchandise if they carried missionaries, resolved not to dispatch vessels to Japan if ecclesiastics insisted on taking passage. The government supported this resolution in the interests of trade, and formally prohibited the transport of priests. The Archbishop of Manila, on his part, imposed ecclesiastical penalties on those of his subordinates who should clandestinely violate this prohibition. Supplicatory letters from Japan reached the religious communities in Manila, and reading them to send more priests to aid in the spread of Christianity, 
therefore the chiefs of the orders consulted together, seventy bought a ship, and paid high wages to its officers to carry four Franciscan, four Dominican, and two Ricolito priests to Japan. When the governor, Alonso Fajardo de Troyes, heard of the intended expedition, he threatened to prohibit it, affirming that he would not consent to any more victims being sent to Japan. Thereupon representatives of the religious orders waited upon him, to state that if he persisted in his prohibition, upon his conscience would fall the enormous charge of having lost the souls which they had hoped to save. The governor therefore retired from the discussion, remitting the question to the archbishop, who at once permitted the ship to leave, conveying the ten priests disguised as merchants. Several times the vessel was nearly wrecked, but at length arrived safely in a Japanese port. The ten priests landed, and were shortly afterwards burned by imperial order. In Rome a very disputed inquiry had been made into the circumstances of the Franciscan mission, but, in spite of the severe ordeal of the Diaboli Advocatus, canonization was conceded to Pedro Bautista and his companions. In 1629 the papal bull of Urban VIII, dated September 14, 1627, was published in Manila, amidst public feasts and popular rejoicing. The bull declared the missionaries of Japan to be saints and martyrs and patron saints of the second class. Increased animation in favor of missions to Japan became general in consequence. 10,000 pesos were collected to fit out a ship to carry 12 priests from Manila, besides 24 priests who came from Pangasinan to embark privately. The ship, however, was wrecked off the Ilocos province coast, Luzon is, but the crew and priests were saved. A large junk was then secretly prepared at a distance from Manila for the purpose of conveying another party of friars to Japan, but, just as they were about to embark, the governor sent a detachment of soldiers with orders to prevent them doing so, and he definitely prohibited further missionary expeditions. In 1633 the final extinction of Christians was vigorously commenced by the emperor to Kagansama, and in the following year 79 persons were executed. The same emperor sent a ship to Manila with a present of 150 lepers, saying that, as he did not permit Christians in his country, and knowing that the priests had specially cared for these unfortunate beings, he remitted them to their care. The first impulse of the Spaniards was to sink the ship with cannon shots, but finally it was agreed to receive the lepers, who were conducted with great pomp through the city and lodged in a large shed at Dalao, now the suburb of Paco. This gave rise to the foundation of the St. Lazarus, Lepers, Hospital, existing at the present day. Point six. The governor replied 71 to the emperor that if any more were sent he would kill them and their conductors. The emperor then convoked a great assembly of his vassal kings and nobles, and solemnly imposed upon them the strict obligation to fulfill all the edicts against the entry and permanence of Christians, under severe penalties, forfeiture of property, deprivation of dignities, or death. So intent was this prince on effectually annihilating Christianity within his empire, that he thenceforth interdicted all trade with Macau, and when in 1640 his decree was disregarded by four Portuguese traders, who, describing themselves as ambassadors, arrived with a suite of 46 Orientals, they were all executed. In the same year the governor of the Philippines called a congress of local officials and ecclesiastics, amongst whom it was agreed that to send missionaries to Japan was to send them directly to death, and it was thenceforth resolved to abandon Catholic missions in that country. Secret missions and consequent executions still continued until about the year 1642, when the Dutch took Tanchio in Formosa Island from the Spaniards, and intercepted the passage to Japan of priests and merchants alike. The conquest of Japan was a feat which all the artifice of King Philip IV's favorites and their monastic agents could not compass. In 1862, during the pontificate of Pius IX, 620 missionaries who had met with martyrdom in Japan, in the 17th century, were canonized with great pomp and appropriate ceremony in Rome 72-1 now the suburb of Paco. Between 1606 and 1608, owing to a rising of the Japanese settlers, their dwellings in Dalao were sacked and the settlement burnt. Two Portugal was forcibly annexed to the Spanish crown from 1581 to 1640. 
3. Philip II's persecution of religious apostates during the Wars of the Flanders was due as much to the fact that Protestantism was becoming a political force, threatening Spain's dominion, as to Catholic sentiment. 4. Religious intolerance in Spain was confirmed in 1822 by the new penal code of that date, the text reads thus, Todo el que conspirace directamente y de heco a estabilizar otra religión en las Españas, o a que la nación española deje de profesar la religión apostólica romana y es traidor y sufrirá la pena de muerte. Artículo 227 del Código Penal presenta de las Cortes en 22 de abril de 1821 y sancionado en 1822. 5. History General de Filipinas, by Juan de la Concepción Vol. 3, Chap. 8. 6. This hospital was rebuilt with a legacy left by the Government General Don Manuel de Leon in 1677. It was afterwards subsidized by the government, and was under the care of the Franciscan friars up to the close of the Spanish Dominion. Conflicts with the Dutch consequent on the union of the crowns of Portugal and Spain, 1581-1640, the feuds, as between nations, diplomatically subsided, although the individual antagonism was as rife as ever. Spanish and Portuguese interests in the Moluccas, as elsewhere, were thenceforth officially mutual. In the Molucca group, the old contests between the once rival kingdoms had estranged the natives from their ancient compulsory alliances. Anti-Portuguese and Philo-Portuguese parties had sprung up amongst the petty sovereignties, but the Portuguese fort and factory established in Ternate Island were held for many years, despite all contentions. But another rivalry, as formidable and more detrimental than that of the Portuguese in days gone by, now menaced Spanish ascendancy. From the close of the 16th century up to the year of the Family Compact Wars, 1763, Holland and Spain were relentless foes. To recount the numerous combats between their respective fleets during this period, would itself require a volume. It will suffice here to show the bearing of these political conflicts upon the concerns of the Philippine colony. The Treaty of Antwerp, which was wrung from the Spaniards in 1609, 28 years after the union of Spain and Portugal, broke the scourge of their tyranny, whilst it failed to assuage the mutual antipathy. One of the consequences of the Wars of the Flanders, which terminated with this treaty, was that the Dutch were obliged to seek in the Far East the merchandise which had hitherto been supplied to them from the peninsula. The short-sighted policy of the Spaniards in closing to the Dutch the Portuguese markets, which were now theirs, brought upon themselves the destruction of the monopolies which they had gained by the Union. The Dutch were now free, and their old tyrant's policy induced them to establish independently their own trading headquarters in the Molucca Islands, whence they could obtain directly the produce forbidden to them in the home ports. Hence, from those islands, the ships of a powerful Netherlands trading company sallied forth from time to time to meet the Spanish galleons from Mexico laden with silver and manufactured 73 goods. Previous to this, and during the Wars of the Flanders, Dutch corsairs hovered about the waters of the Moluccas, to take reprisals from the Spaniards. These encounters frequently took place at the eastern entrance of the San Bernardino Straits, where the Dutch were accustomed to heave to in anticipation of the arrival of their prizes. In this manner, constantly roving about the Philippine waters, they enriched themselves at the expense of their detested adversary, and, in a small degree, avenged themselves of the bloodshed and oppression which for over sixty years had desolate the Low Countries. The Philippine colony lost immense sums in the seizure of its galleons from Mexico, upon which it almost entirely depended for subsistence. Being a dependency of New Spain, its whole intercourse with the civilized world, its supplies of troops and European manufactured articles, were contingent upon the safe arrival of the galleons. Also the dollars with which they annually purchased cargoes from the Chinese for the galleons came from Mexico. Consequently, the Dutch usually took the aggressive in these sea battles, although they were not always victorious. When there were no ships to meet, they bombarded the ports where others were being built. The Spaniards, on their part, from time to time fitted out vessels to run down to the Molucca Islands to attack the enemy in his own waters. During the governorship of Gomez Porras das Marinas, 
1590-93, the native king of Shao Island one of the Malacca group came to Manila to offer homage and vassalage to the representative of the king of Spain and Portugal, in return for protection against the incursions of the Dutch and the raids of the Ternate natives. Das Marinas received him and the Spanish priests who accompanied him with affability, and, being satisfied with his credentials, he prepared a large expedition to go to the Moluccas to set matters in order. The fleet was composed of several frigates, one ship, six galleys, and one hundred small vessels, all well armed. The fighting men numbered one hundred Spaniards, four hundred Pampanga and Tagalog arquebusiers, one thousand Vasia archers and lancers, besides one hundred Chinese to row the galleys. This expedition, which was calculated to be amply sufficient to subdue all the Moluccas, sailed from Cavita on October 6, 1593. The sailing ships having got far ahead of the galleys, they hoped to off Punta de Zufra, and of Mari Cabin is, to wait for them. The galleys arrived, and the next day they were able to start again in company. Meanwhile, a conspiracy was formed by the Chinese galleymen to murder all the Spaniards. Assuming these Chinese to be volunteers, their action would appear to be extremely vile. If, however, as is most probable, they were pressed into this military service to foreigners, it seems quite natural, that being forced to bloodshed without alternative, they should first fight for their own liberty, seeing that they had come to the islands to trade. All but the Chinese were asleep, and they fell upon the Spaniards in 74 a body. Eighteen of the troops and four slaves escaped by jumping into the sea. The governor was sleeping in his cabin, but awoke on hearing the noise. He supposed the ship had grounded, and was coming up the companion and decibile, when a Chinaman clove his head with a cutlass. The governor reached his stateroom, and taking his missile and the image of the virgin in his hand, he died in six hours. The Chinese did not venture below, where the priests and armed soldiers were hidden. They cleared the decks of all their opponents, made fast the hatches and gangways, and waited three days, when, after putting ashore those who were still alive, they escaped to Cochin China, where the king and Mandarin seized the vessel and all she carried. On board were found 12,000 pesos in coin, some silver and jewels belonging to the governor and his suite. Thus the expedition was brought to an untimely end. The king of Xiao, and the missionaries accompanying him, had started in advance for Otong, Panayas, to wait for the governor, and there they received the news of the disaster. Amongst the most notable of the successful expeditions of the Spaniards, was that of Pedro Bravo de Acuna, in 1606, which consisted of 19 frigates, 9 galleys, and 8 small craft, carrying a total of about 2,000 men, and provisions for a prolonged struggle. The result was that they subdued a petty sultan, friendly to the Dutch, and established a fortress on his island. About the year 1607, the Supreme Court, the governorship being vacant from 1606 to 1608, hearing that a Dutch vessel was hovering off Ternate, sent a ship against it, commanded by Pedro de Heredia. A combat ensued. The Dutch commander was taken prisoner with several of his men, and lodged in the fort at Ternate, but was ransomed on payment of 50,000 Cuban pesos to the Spanish commander. Heredia returned joyfully to Manila, where, much to his surprise, he was prosecuted by the Supreme Court for exceeding his instructions, and expired of melancholy. The ransomed Dutch leader was making his way back to his headquarters in a small ship, peacefully, and without threatening the Spaniards in any way, when the Supreme Court treacherously sent a galley and a frigate after him to make him prisoner a second time. Overwhelmed by numbers and arms, and little expecting such perfidious conduct of the Spaniards, he was at once arrested and brought to Manila. The Dutch returned 22 Spanish prisoners of war to Manila to ransom him, but whilst these were retained, the Dutch commander was nevertheless imprisoned for life. Some years afterwards a Dutch squadron anchored off the south point of Bataan province, not far from Punta Marivals, at the entrance to Manila Bay. Juan de Silva, the governor, 1609-16, was in great straits. Several ships had been lost by storms, others were away, 
and there was no adequate floating armament with which to meet the enemy. However, the Dutch later for five or six seventy-five months, waiting to seize the Chinese and Japanese traders' goods on their way to the Manila market. They secured immense booty, and were in no hurry to open hostilities. This delay gave Da Silva time to prepare vessels to attack the foe. In the interval he dreamt that Saint Mark had offered to help him defeat the Dutch. On awaking, he called a priest, whom he consulted about the dream, and they agreed that the nocturnal vision was a sign from heaven denoting a victory. The priest went, from Cavita, to Manila to procure a relic of this glorious intercessor, and returned with his portrait to the governor, who adored it. In haste the ships and armament were prepared. On Saint Mark's Day, therefore, the Spaniards sallied forth from Cavita with six ships, carrying seventy guns, and two galleys and two launches, also well armed, besides a number of small, light vessels to assist in the formation of line of battle. All the European fighting men in Manila and Cavita embarked over 1,000 Spaniards the flower of the colony, together with a large force of natives, who were taught to believe that the Dutch were infidels. On the issue of this day's events perchance depended the possession of the colony. Manila and Cavita were garrisoned by volunteers. Orations were offered in the churches. The miraculous image of Our Lady of the Guide was taken in procession from the Hermitage, and exposed to public view in the cathedral. The saints of the different churches and sanctuaries were adored and exhibited daily. The governor himself took the supreme command, and dispelled all wavering doubt in his subordinates by proclaiming Saint Mark's promise of intercession. On his ship he hoisted the royal standard, on which was embroidered the image of the Blessed Virgin, with the motto Most Rate Esse Matram and over a beautifully calm sea he led the way to battle and to victory. A shot from the Spanish heavy artillery opened the bloody combat. The Dutch were completely vanquished, after a fierce struggle, which lasted six hours. Their three ships were destroyed, and their flags, artillery, and plundered merchandise, to the value of 300,000 Cuban pesos, were seized. This famous engagement was thenceforth known as the Battle of Playa Honda. Again, in 1611, under De Silva, a squadron sailed to the Moluccas and defeated the Dutch off Jalilo Island. In 1617 the Spaniards had a successful engagement off the Zimbal's coast with the Dutch, who lost three of their ships. In July, 1620, three Mexican galleons were met by three Dutch vessels off Cape Espiritu Santo, Samar is, at the entrance of the San Bernardino Straits, but managed to escape in the dark. Two ran ashore and broke up, the third reached Manila. After this, the government general, Alonso Fajardo de Trois, ordered the course of the state ships to be varied on each voyage 76 in 1625 the Dutch again appeared off the Zimbal's coast, and Geronimo de Silva went out against them. The Spaniards, having lost one man, relinquished the pursuit of the enemy, and the commander was brought to trial by the Supreme Court. In 1626, at the close of the governorship of Fernando de Silva, a Spanish colony was founded on Formosa Island, but no supplies were sent to it, and consequently in 1642 it surrendered to the Dutch, who held it for 20 years, until they were driven out by the Chinese adventurer Coxinga. And thus for over a century and a half the strife continued, until the Dutch concentrated their attention on the development of their eastern colonies, which the power of Spain, growing more and more effete, was incompetent to impede. In the middle of the 17th century the Tartars invaded China and overthrew the Min dynasty at that time represented by the Chinese Emperor Yunlik. He was succeeded on the throne by the Tartar Emperor Kangxi, to whose arbitrary power nearly all the Chinese Empire had submitted. Amongst the few Mongol chiefs who held out against Tatsing dominion was a certain Mandarin known by the name of Koxinga, who retired to the island of Kinmuan, where he asserted his independence and defied his nation's conqueror. Securely established in his stronghold, he invited the Chinese to take refuge in his island and oppose the Tartars' rule. Therefore the emperor ordered that no man should inhabit China within four leagues of the coast, except in those provinces which were undoubtedly loyal to the new government. The coast was consequently laid bare, vessels, houses, plantations, 
and everything useful to man, were destroyed in order to cut off effectually all communications with lands beyond the Tartar Empire. The Chinese from the coast, who for generations had earned a living by fishing, etc., crowded into the interior, and their misery was indescribable. Coxinga, unable to communicate with the mainland of the empire, turned his attention to the conquest of Formosa Island, at the time in the possession of the Dutch. According to Dutch accounts the European settlers numbered about 600, with a garrison of 2,200. The Dutch artillery, stores and merchandise were valued at 8 million Cuban pesos, and the Chinese, who attacked them under Coxinga, were about 100,000 strong. The settlement surrendered to the invaders' superior numbers, and Coxinga established himself as king of the island. Coxinga had become acquainted with an Italian Dominican missionary named Vittorio Riccio, whom he created a Mandarin, and sent him as ambassador to the governor of the Philippines. Riccio therefore arrived in Manila in 1662, the bearer of Coxinga's dispatches calling upon the governor to pay tribute, under threat of the colony being attacked by Coxinga if his demand were refused. 77 The position of Riccio as a European friar and ambassador of a Mongol adventurer was as awkward as it was novel. He was received with great honor in Manila, where he disembarked, and rode to the government house in the full uniform of a Chinese envoy, through lines of troops drawn up to salute him as he passed. At the same time, letters from Formosa had also been received by the Chinese in Manila, and the government at once accused them of conniving at rebellion. All available forces were concentrated in the capital, and to increase the garrison the governor published a decree, dated May 6, 1662, ordering the demolition of the forts of Samboanga, Iligan, Mindanao is, Colomians and Ternal One, Moluccas. The only provincial fort preserved was that of Surajeo, then called Caraga, Consequently in the south the Mahometans became complete masters on land and at sea for half a year. The troops in Manila numbered 100 cavalry and 8,000 infantry. Fortifications were raised, and redoubts were constructed in which to secrete the treasury funds. When all the armament was in readiness, the Spaniards incited the Chinese to rebel, in order to afford a pretext for their massacre. Two junk masters were seized, and the Chinese population was menaced, therefore they prepared for their own defense, and then opened the affray, for which the government was secretly longing, by killing a Spaniard in the marketplace. Suddenly artillery fire was opened on the Parian, and many of the peaceful Chinese traders, in their terror, hanged themselves, many were drowned in the attempt to reach the canoes in which to get away to sea, some few did safely arrive in Formosa Island and joined Coxinga's camp, whilst others took to the mountains. Some 8,000 to 9,000 Chinese remained quiet, but ready for any event, when they were suddenly attacked by Spaniards and natives. The confusion was general, and the Chinese seemed to be gaining ground, therefore the governor sent the ambassador Riccio and a certain Fray Joseph de Madrid to parley with them. The Chinese accepted the terms offered by Riccio, who returned to the governor, leaving Fray Joseph with the rebels, but when Riccio went back with a general pardon and a promise to restore the two junk masters, he found that they had beheaded the priest. A general carnage of the Mongols followed, and Juan de la Concepcion says too that the original intention of the Spaniards was to kill every Chinaman, but that they desisted in view of the inconvenience which would have ensued from the want of tradesmen and mechanics. Therefore they made a virtue of a necessity, 78 and graciously pardoned in the name of his Catholic Majesty all who laid down their arms. Riccio returned to Formosa Island, and found Coxinga preparing for warfare against the Philippines, but before he could carry out his intentions he died of fever. The chief successor, of a less bellicose spirit, sent Riccio a second time to Manila, and a treaty was agreed to, re-establishing commercial relations with the Chinese. Shortly after Coxinga's decease a rebellion was raised in Formosa, and the island, falling at length into the hands of a Tartar party, became annexed to China under the new dynasty. Then Riccio was called upon to relate the part he had taken in Coxinga's affairs, and he was heard in council. 
Some present were in favor of invading the Philippines in great force because of the cruel and unwarranted general massacre of the Chinese in cold blood, but Riccio took pains to show how powerful Spain was, and how justified was the action of the Spaniards, as a measure of precaution, in view of the threatened invasion of Coxinga. The Chinese party was appeased, but had the Tartars cared to take up the cause of their conquered subjects, the fate of the Philippines would have been doubtful. The rule of the governors general of the islands was, upon the whole, benignant with respect to the natives who manifested submission. Apart from the unconcealed animosity of the monastic party, the government general's liberty of action was always very much locally restrained by the Supreme Court and by individual officials. The standing rule was, that in the event of the death or deprivation of office of the government general, the civil government was to be assumed by the Supreme Court, and the military administration by the senior magistrate. Latterly, in the absence of a government general, from any cause whatsoever, the sub-inspector of the forces became acting gov-general. Up to the beginning of the last century the authority of the king's absolute will was always jealously imposed, and the governors general were frequently rebuked for having exercised independent action, taking the initiative in what they deemed the best policy. But royal decrees could not enforce honesty, the peculations and frauds on the part of the secular authorities, and increasing quarrels and jealousies amongst the several religious bodies, seemed to annihilate all prospect of social and material progress of the colony. As early as the reign of Philip III, 1598-1621, the procurators of Manila had, during three years, been unsuccessfully soliciting from the mother country financial help for the Philippines to meet official discrepancies. The affairs of the colony were eventually submitted to a special royal commission in Spain, the result being that the king was advised to abandon this possession, which was not only unproductive, but had become a costly center of disputes and bad feeling. However, Fray Hernando de Moraga, a missionary from the 79 Philippines, happened to be in the peninsula at the time, and successfully implored the king to withhold his ratification of the recommendation of the commission. His Majesty avowed that even though the maintenance of this colony should exhaust his Mexican treasury, his conscience would not allow him to consent to the perdition of souls which had been saved, nor to relinquish the hope of rescuing yet far more in these distant regions. During the first two centuries following the foundation of the colony, it was the custom for a royal commission to be appointed to inquire into the official acts of the outgoing governor before he could leave the island's Hasserla La Residencia, as it was called. Whilst on the one hand this measure effectually served as a check upon a governor who might be inclined to adopt unjustifiable means of coercion, or commit defalcations, it was also attended with many abuses, for against an energetic ruler an antagonistic party was always raised, ready to join in the ultimate ruin of the governor who had aroused their susceptibilities by refusing to favor their nefarious schemes. Hence when a prima facie case was made out against a governor, his inexperienced successor was often persuaded to consent to his incarceration whilst the articles of impeachment were being investigated. Sebastian Hurtado de Corcuera, 1635-44, had been governor of Panama before he was appointed to the Philippines. During his term of office here he had usually sided with the Jesuits on important questions taken up by the friars, and on being succeeded by Diego Fajardo, he was brought to trial, fined 25,000 Cuban pesos, and put into prison. After five years confinement he was released by royal order and returned to Spain, where the king partially compensated him with the government of the Canary Islands. Juan Vargas, 1678-84, had been in office for nearly seven years, and the royal commissioner who inquired into his acts took four years to draw up his report. He filled twenty large volumes of a statement of the charges made against the late governor, some of which were grave, but the majority of them were of a very frivolous character. This is the longest inquiry of the kind on record. Acting Governor José Torralba, 1715-17, was arrested on the termination of his governorship and confined in the fortress of Santiago, charged with embezzlement to the amount of 700,000 Cuban pesos. He had also to deposit the sum of 20,000 Cuban pesos for the expenses of the inquiry commission. 
several other officials were imprisoned with him as accomplices in his crimes. He is said to have sent his son with public funds on trading expeditions around the coasts, and his wife and young children to Mexico with an enormous sum of money defrauded from the government. Figures at that date show, that when he took the government, there was a balance in the treasury of 238,849 Cuban pesos, and 80 when he left it in two years and a half, the balance was 33,226 Cuban pesos, leaving a deficit of 205,623 Cuban pesos, whilst the expenses of the colony were not extraordinary during that period. Amongst other charges, he was accused of having sold 10 provincial government licenses, encomiendas, many offices of notaries, scriveners, etc., and conceded 27 months gambling licenses to the Chinese in the Paradin without accounting to the treasury. He was finally sentenced to pay a fine of 100,000 Cuban pesos, the costs of the trial, the forfeiture of the 20,000 Cuban pesos already deposited, perpetual deprivation of public office, and banishment from the Philippine Islands and Madrid. When the royal order reached Manila he was so ill that his banishment was postponed. He lived for a short time nominally under arrest, and was permitted to beg alms for his subsistence within the city until he died in the hospital of San Juan de Dios in 1736. The defalcations of some of the governors caused no inconsiderable anxiety to the sovereign. Pedro de Arandia, in his dual capacity of government general and chief justice, 1754-59, was a corrupt administrator of his country's wealth. He is said to have amassed a fortune of 25,000 Cuban pesos during his five years term of office, and on his death he left it all to pious works, Vide Obras Pius. Governor Berenger y Marquina, 1788-93, was accused of bribery, but the king absolved him. In the last century a governor of Iloilo is said to have absconded in a sailing ship with a large sum of the public funds. A local governor was then also ex officio administrator, and, although the system was afterwards reformed, official extortion was rife throughout the whole Spanish administration of the colony, up to the last. A strange drama of the year 1622 well portrays the spirit of the times the immunity of a government general in those days, as well as the religious sentiment which accompanied his most questionable acts. Alonso Fajardo de Troyes having suspected his wife of infidelity, went to the house where she was accustomed to meet her paramour. Her attire was such as to confirm her husband's surmises. He called a priest and instructed him to confess her, telling him that he intended to take her life. The priest, failing to dissuade Fajardo from inflicting such an extreme penalty, took her confession and proffered her spiritual consolation. Then Fajardo, incensed with jealousy, mortally stabbed her. No inquiry into the occurrence seems to have been made, and he continued to govern for two years after the event, when he died of melancholy. It is recorded that the paramour, who was the son of a Cadiz merchant, had formerly been the accepted fiancé of Fajardo's wife, and that he arrived in Manila in their company. The governor gave him time to confess before he killed him, after which, according to one account, he caused his house to be razed to the ground, and the land on which it stood to be strewn with salt. Juan de la Concepcion, 81 however, says that the house stood for 100 years after the event as a memorial of the punishment. In 1640 Olivares, King Philip IV's chief counselor, had succeeded by his arrogance and unprecedented policy of repression in arousing the latent discontent of the Portuguese. A few years previously they had made an unsuccessful effort to regain their independent nationality under the sovereignty of the Duke of Braganza. At length, when a call was made upon their boldest warriors to support the King of Spain in his protracted struggle with the Catalanians, an insurrection broke out, which only terminated when Portugal had thrown off, forever, the scourge of Spanish supremacy. The Duke of Braganza was crowned King of Portugal under the title of John IV, and every Portuguese colony declared in his favor, except Suda, on the African coast. The news of the separation of Portugal from Spain reached Manila in the following year. 
The government general at that time Sebastian Hurtado de Corcuera at once sent out an expedition of picked men under Juan Claudio with orders to take Macau a Portuguese settlement at the mouth of the Canton River, about 40 miles west of Hong Kong. The attempt miserably failed, and the blue and white ensign continued to wave unscathed over the little territory. The governor of Macau, who was willing to yield, was denounced a traitor to Portugal, and killed by the populace. Juan Claudio, who was taken prisoner, was generously liberated by favor of the Portuguese viceroy of Goa, and returned to Manila to relate his defeat. Point three, the convent of Santa Clara was founded in Manila in 1621 by Geronimo de la Asuncion, who, three years afterwards, was expelled from the management by the friars because she refused to admit reforms in the conventual regulations. The General Council subsequently restored her to the matronship for 20 years. Public opinion was at this time vividly aroused against the superiors of the convents, who, it was alleged, made serious inroads on society by inveigling the marriageable young women into taking the veil and to live unnatural lives. The public demanded that there should be a fixed limit to the number of nuns admitted. An ecclesiastic of high degree made strenuous efforts to rescue three nuns who had just been admitted, but the abbess persistently refused to surrender them until her excommunication was published on the walls of the nunnery. In 1750 a certain mother Cecilia, who had been in the nunnery of Santa Catalina since she was 16 years of age, fell in love with a Spaniard who lived opposite, named Francisco Antonio de Figueroa, and begged 82 to be relieved of her vows and have her liberty restored to her. The archbishop was willing to grant her request, which was, however, stoutly opposed by the Dominican friars. On appeal being made to the governor, as vice-regal patron, he ordered her to be set at liberty. The friars nevertheless defied the governor, who, to sustain his authority, was compelled to order the troops to be placed under arms, and the commanding officer of the artillery to hold the cannons in readiness to fire when and where necessary. In view of these preparations, the friars allowed the nun to leave her confinement, and she was lodged in the College of Santa Potenciana pending the dispute. Public excitement was intense. The archbishop ordered the girl to be liberated, but as his subordinates were still contumacious to his bidding, the bishop of Cebu was invited to arbitrate on the question, but he declined to interfere, therefore an appeal was remitted to the archbishop of Mexico. In the meantime the girl was married to her lover, and long afterwards a citation arrived from Mexico for the woman to appear at that ecclesiastical court. She went there with her husband, from whom she was separated whilst the case was being tried, but in the end her liberty and marriage were confirmed. During the government of Nino de Tabra, 1626-32, the high host and sacred vessels were stolen from the Cathedral of Manila. The archbishop was in consequence sorely distressed, and walked barefooted to the Jesuits' convent to weep with the priests, and therein find a solace for his mental affliction. It was surmised that the wrath of God at such a crime would assuredly be avenged by calamities on the inhabitants, and confessions were made daily. The friars agreed to appease the anger of the Almighty by making public penance and by public prayer. The archbishop subjected himself to a most rigid abstinence. He perpetually fasted, ate herbs, drank only water, slept on the floor with a stone for a pillow, and flagellated his own body. On Corpus Christi Day a religious procession passed through the public thoroughfares solemnly exhorting the delinquents to restore the body of our Savior, but all in vain. The melancholy prelate, weak beyond recovery from his self-imposed privations, came to the window of his retreat as the cortege passed in front of it, and there he breathed his last. As in all other Spanish colonies, the Inquisition had its secret agents or commissaries in the Philippines. Sometimes a priest would hold powers for several years to inquire into the private lives and acts of individuals, whilst no one knew who the informer was. The Holy Office ordered that its letter of anathema, with the names in full of all persons who had incurred pains and penalties for heresy, should be read in public places every three years, but this order was not fulfilled. The letter of anathema was so read in 1669, and the only time since then up to the present day was in 1718. 83 during the minority of the young Spanish King Charles II. 
The regency was held by his mother, the Queen Dowager, who was unfortunately influenced by favorites, to the great disgust of the court and the people. Amongst these sycophants was a man named Valenzuela, of noble birth, who, as a boy, had followed the custom of those days, and entered as page to a nobleman the Duke del Infanta do to learn manners and court etiquette. The Duke went to Italy as Spanish ambassador, and took Valenzuela under his protection. He was a handsome and talented young fellow, learned for those times intelligent, well versed in all the generous exercises of chivalry, and a poet by nature. On his return from Italy with the Duke, his patron caused him to be created a cavalier of the Order of St. James. The Duke shortly afterwards died, but through the influence of the Dowager Queen's confessor the notorious Knighthard, also a favorite young Valenzuela was presented at court, where he made love to one of the Queen's maids of honor a German and married her. The Prince, Don Juan de Austria, who headed the party against the Queen, expelled her favorite, Knighthard, from court, and Valenzuela became Her Majesty's sole confidential advisor. Nearly every night, at late hours, the Queen went to Valenzuela's apartment to confer with him, whilst he daily brought her secret news gleaned from the courtiers. The Queen created him Marquis of San Bartolomé and of Villa Sierra, a first-class grandee of Spain, and Prime Minister. He was a most perfect courtier, and it is related of him that when a bullfight took place, he used to go to the royal box richly adorned in fighting attire, and, with profound reverence, beg Her Majesty's leave to challenge the bull. The Queen, it is said, never refused him the solicited permission, but tenderly begged of him not to expose himself to such dangers. Sometimes he would appear in the ring as a cavalier, in a black costume embroidered with silver and with a large white and black plume, in imitation of the Queen's half mourning. It was much remarked that on one occasion he wore a device of the sun with an eagle looking down upon it, and the words, I alone have license. He composed several comedies, and allowed them to be performed at his expense for the free amusement of the people. He also much improved the city of Madrid with fine buildings, bridges, and many public works to sustain his popularity amongst the citizens. The young king, now a youth, ordered a deer hunt to be prepared in the Escorial grounds, and during the diversion his majesty happened to shoot Valenzuela in the muscle of his arm, whether intentionally or accidentally is not known. However, the terrified queen mother fainted and fell into the arms of her ladies in waiting. This circumstance was much commented upon, and contributed in no small degree to the public odium and final downfall of Valenzuela in 1684. At length Don Juan de Austria returned to the court, when the young king was of an age 84 to appreciate public concerns, and he became more the court favorite than ever Valenzuela or Knighthard had been during the Dowager Queen's administration. Valenzuela fell at once from the exclusive position he had held in royal circles and retired to the Escorial, where, by order of Don Juan de Austria, a party of young noblemen, including Don Juan's son, the Duke of Medina Sidonia, the Marquis of Valparaiso, and others of rank, accompanied by two hundred horsemen, went to seize the disfavoured courtier. He was out walking at the time of their arrival, but he was speedily apprised of the danger by his bosom friend, the prior of St. Jerome Monastery. The priest hid him in the roof of the monastery, where, being nearly suffocated for want of ventilation, a surgeon was sent up to bleed him and make him sleep. The search party failed to find the refugee, and were about to return, when the surgeon treacherously betrayed the secret to them, and Valenzuela was discovered sleeping with arms by his side. He was made prisoner, confined in a castle, degraded of all his honors and rank, and finally banished by Don Juan de Austria to the furthermost Spanish possession in the world the Philippines whilst his family was incarcerated in a convent at Talavera in Spain. When the Pope heard of this violation of church asylum in the Escorial committed by the nobles, he excommunicated all concerned in it, and in order to purge themselves of their sin and obtain absolution, they were compelled to go to church in their shirts, each with a rope around his neck. They actually performed this penance, and then the nuncio accredited to the Spanish court, Cardinal Melani, relieved them of their ecclesiastical pains and penalties. 
Valenzuela was permitted to establish a house within the prison of Cavita, where he lived for several years as a state prisoner and exile. When Don Juan de Austria died, the Dowager Queen regained in a measure her influence at court, and one of the first favors she begged of her son, the king, was the return of Valenzuela to Madrid. The king granted her request, and she at once dispatched a ship to bring him to Spain, but the Secretary of State interfered and stopped it. Nevertheless, Valenzuela, pardoned and liberated, set out for the peninsula, and reached Mexico, where he died from the kick of a horse. In 1703 a vessel arrived in Manila Bay from India, under an Armenian captain, bringing a young man 35 years of age, a native of Turin, who styled himself Monsignor Charles Thomas Maillard de Turnon, Visitor General, Bishop of Savoy, Patriarch of Antioch, Apostolic Nuncio and Legate ad latera of the Pope. He was on his way to China to visit the missions, and called at Manila with eight priests and four Italian families. Following the custom established with foreign ships, the custodian of the fort of Cavita placed guards on board this vessel. This act seems to have aroused the indignation of the exalted stranger, who assumed a 85 very haughty tone, and arrogantly insisted upon a verbal message being taken to the governor, Domingo Savalberco, to announce his arrival. In Manila these circumstances were much debated, and at length the governor instructed the custodian of Cavita Fort to accompany the stranger to the city of Manila. On his approach a salute was fired from the city battlements, and he took up his residence in the house of the Maestre de Campo. There the governor went to visit him as the Pope's legate, and was received with great arrogance. However, the governor showed no resentment, he seemed to be quite dumbfounded by the patriarch's dignified airs, and consulted with the Supreme Court about the irregularity of a legate arriving without exhibiting the Regium Exequator. The court decided that the stranger must be called upon to present his papal credentials and the royal confirmation of his powers with respect to Spanish dominions, and with this object a magistrate was commissioned to wait upon him. The patriarch treated the commissioner with undisguised contempt, expressing his indignation and surprise at his position being doubted, he absolutely refused to show any credentials, and turned out the commissioner, raving at him and causing an uproarious scandal. At each stage of the negotiations with him the patriarch put forward the great authority of the Pope, and his unquestionable right to dispose of realms and peoples at his will, and somehow this ruse seemed to subdue everybody, the governor, the archbishop, and all the authorities, civil and ecclesiastical, were overawed. The archbishop, in fact, made an unconditional surrender to the patriarch, who now declared that all state and religious authority must be subordinate to his will. The archbishop was ordered by him to set aside his archiepiscopal cross, whilst the patriarch used his own particular cross in the religious ceremonies, and left it in the cathedral of Manila on his departure. He went so far as to cause his master of the ceremonies to publicly divest the archbishop of a part of his official robes and insignia, to all which the prelate meekly consented. All the chief authorities visited the patriarch, who, however, was too dignified to return their calls. Here was, in fact, an extraordinary case of a man unknown to everybody, and refusing to prove his identity, having absolutely brought all the authority of a colony under his sway. He was, as a matter of fact, the legate of Clement XI. The only person to whom he appears to have extended his friendship was the Maestre de Campo, at the time under ecclesiastical arrest. The Maestre de Campo was visited by the Patriarch, who so ingeniously blinded him with his patronage, that this official squandered about 20,000 Cuban pesos in entertaining his strange visitor and making him presents. The Patriarch in return insisted upon the Governor and Archbishop pardoning the Maestre de Campo of all his alleged misdeeds, and when this was conceded he caused the pardon to be proclaimed in a public act. All the Manila officials were treated by the Patriarch with open disdain, 86 but he created the Armenian captain of the vessel which brought him to Manila a knight of the Golden Spur, in a public ceremony in the Maestre de Campo's house in which the government general was ignored. From Manila the Patriarch went to China, where his meddling with the Catholic missions met with fierce opposition. He so dogmatically asserted his unproved authority, 
that he caused European missionaries to be cited in the Chinese courts and sentenced for their disobedience, but he was playing with fire, for at last the emperor of China, wearied of his importunities, banished him from the country. Thence he went to Macau, where, much to the bewilderment of the Chinese population, he maintained constant disputes with the Catholic missionaries until he died there in 1710 in the Inquisition prison, where he was incarcerated at the instance of the Jesuits. When King Philip V became aware of what had occurred in Manila, he was highly incensed, and immediately ordered the government general to Mexico, declaring him disqualified for life to serve under the crown. The senior magistrates of the Supreme Court were removed from office. Each priest who had yielded to the legate's authority without previously taking cognizance of the regium exequator was ordered to pay 1,000 Cuban pesos fine. The archbishop was degraded and transferred from the archbishopric of Manila to the bishopric of Guadalajara in Mexico. In spite of this punishment, it came to the knowledge of the king that the ex-archbishop of Manila, as bishop of Guadalajara, was still conspiring with the patriarch to subvert civil and religious authority in his dominions, with which object he had sent him 1,000 Cuban pesos from Mexico, and had promised a fixed sum of 1,000 Cuban pesos per annum, with whatever further support he could afford to give him. Therefore the king issued an edict to the effect that any legate who should arrive in his domains without royal confirmation of his papal credentials should thenceforth be treated simply with the charity and courtesy due to any traveller, and in order that this edict should not be forgotten, or evaded, under pretext of its having become obsolete, it was further enacted that it should be read in full on certain days in every year before all the civil and ecclesiastical functionaries 87 one from. This date the Molucca Islands were definitely evacuated and abandoned by the Spaniards, although as many men and as much material and money had been employed in garrisons and conveyance of subsidies there as in the whole Philippine colony up to that period. 2 History General de Filipinas, by Juan de la Concepcion, Volume 7, P48, published at Manila, 1788. 3 Macau is held by the Portuguese since 1557. During the Union of Spain and Portugal, 1581-1640, the Dutch made two unsuccessful attempts to seize it, 1622 and 1627. This colony was the great European Chinese emporium prior to Hong Kong, 1841, and paid crown rent to China up to 1848. British occupation of Manila in 1761 King George III had just succeeded to the throne of England, and the protracted contentions with France had been suspended for a while. It was soon evident, however, that efforts were being made to extinguish the power and prestige of Great Britain, and with this object a convention had been entered into between France and Spain known as the Family Compact. It was so called because it was an alliance made by the three branches of the House of Bourbon, namely, Louis XV. Of France, Charles III. Of Spain, and his son Ferdinand, who, in accordance with the Treaty of Vienna, had ascended the throne of Naples. Spain engaged to unite her forces with those of France against England on May 1, 1762, if the war still lasted, in which case France would restore Menorca to Spain. Pitt was convinced of the necessity of meeting the coalition by force of arms, but he was unable to secure the support of his ministry to declare war, and he therefore retired from the premiership. The succeeding cabinet were, nevertheless, compelled to adopt his policy, and after having lost many advantages by delaying their decision, war was declared against France and Spain. The British were successful everywhere. In the West Indies the Caribbean islands and Havana were captured with great booty by Rodney and Moncton, whilst a British fleet was dispatched to the Philippine Islands with orders to take Manila. On September 14, 1762, a British vessel arrived in the Bay of Manila, refused to admit Spanish officers on board, and after taking soundings she sailed again out of the harbor. In the evening of September 22 the British squadron, composed of 13 ships, under the command of Admiral Cornish, entered the bay, and the next day two British officers were deputed to demand the surrender of the citadel, which was refused. 
Brigadier General Draper thereupon disembarked his troops, and again called upon the city to yield. This citation being defied, the bombardment commenced the next day. The fleet anchored in front of a powder magazine, took possession of the churches of Malate, Ermita, San Juan de Bagumbayan, and Santiago. Two picket guards made an unsuccessful sortie against them. The 88 whole force in Manila, at the time, was the King's Regiment, which mustered about 600 men and 80 pieces of artillery. The British forces consisted of 1,500 European troops, one regiment of infantry and two companies of artillery, 3,000 seamen, 800 sepoy fusiliers, and 1,400 sepoy prisoners, making a total of 6,830 men, including officers. Point one: There was no government general in the Philippines at the time, and the only person with whom the British commander could treat was the acting governor, the Archbishop Manuel Antonio Rojo, who was willing to yield. His authority was, however, set aside by a rebellious war party, who placed themselves under the leadership of a magistrate of the Supreme Court, named Simon de Anda y Salazar. This individual, instead of leading them to battle, fled to the province of Bulacan the day before the capture of Manila in a prahu with a few natives, carrying with him some money and half a ream of official stamped paper. Point two, he knew perfectly well that he was defying the legal authority of the acting governor, and was, in fact, in open rebellion against his mandate. It was necessary, therefore, to give an official color to his acts by issuing his orders and proclamations on government stamped paper, so that their validity might be recognized if he subsequently succeeded in justifying his action at court. On September 24 the Spanish batteries of San Diego and San Andres opened fire, but with little effect. A richly laden galleon the Filipino was known to be on her way from Mexico to Manila, but the British ships which were sent in quest of her fell in with another galleon the Trinidad and brought their prize to Manila. Her treasure amounted to about 2,500,000.3 Cuban pesos a Frenchman resident in Manila, Monsieur Fowler, made an attack on the British, who forced him to retire, and he was then accused by the Spaniards of treason. Artillery fire was kept up on both sides. The archbishop's nephew was taken prisoner, and an officer was sent with him to hand him over to his uncle. However, a party of natives fell upon them and murdered them. The officer's head having been cut off, it was demanded by General Draper. Excuses were made for not giving it up, and the general determined thenceforth to continue the warfare with vigor and punish this atrocity. The artillery was increased by another battery of three mortars, placed behind the church of Santiago, and the bombardment continued. 5,000 native recruits arrived from the provinces, and out 89 of this number 2,000 Pampangos were selected. They were divided into three columns, in order to advance by different routes and attack respectively the churches of Santiago, Malate, and Ermita, and the troops on the beach. At each place they were driven back. The leader of the attack on Malate and Ermita Don Santiago Orandane was declared a traitor. The two first columns were dispersed with great confusion and loss. The third column retreated before they had sustained or inflicted any loss. The natives fled to their villages in dismay, and on October 5 the British entered the walled city. After a couple of hours bombardment, the forts of San Andres and San Eugenio were demolished, the artillery overturned, and the defenders fusiliers and sappers were killed. A council of war was now held by the Spaniards. General Draper sustained the authority of the Archbishop against the war party, composed chiefly of civilians determined to continue the defense in spite of the opinion of the military men, who argued that a capitulation was inevitable. But matters were brought to a crisis by the natives, who refused to repair the fortifications, and the Europeans were unable to perform such hard labor. Great confusion reigned in the city the clergy fled through the Puerta del Perian, where there was still a native guard. According to Zuniga, the British spent 20,000 cannonballs and 5,000 shells in the bombardment of the city. Major Fell entered Manila, October 6, at the head of his troops, and General Draper followed, leading his column unopposed, with two field pieces in the van, whilst a constant musketry fire cleared the Calle Real, 
the central thoroughfare, as they advanced. The people fled before the enemy. The gates being closed, they scrambled up the walls and got into boats or swam off. Colonel Monson was sent by Draper to the Archbishop Governor to say that he expected immediate surrender. This requisition was disputed by the Archbishop, who presented a paper purporting to be terms of capitulation. The Colonel refused to take it, and demanded an unconditional surrender. Then the Archbishop, a Colonel of the Spanish troops, and Colonel Monson went to interview the General, whose quarters were in the palace. The Archbishop, offering himself as a prisoner, presented the terms of capitulation, which provided for the free exercise of their religion, security of private property, free trade to all the inhabitants of the islands, and the continuation of the powers of the Supreme Court to keep order amongst the ill-disposed. These terms were granted, but General Draper, on his part, stipulated for an indemnity of four millions of pesos, and it was agreed to pay one half of the sum in specie and valuables and the other half in treasury bills on Madrid. The capitulation, with these modifications, was signed by Draper and the Archbishop Governor. The Spanish colonel took the document to the fort to have it countersigned by the ninety magistrates, which was at once done, the fort was delivered up to the British, and the magistrates repaired to the palace to pay their respects to the conquerors. When the British flag was seen floating over the fort of Santiago there was great cheering from the British fleet. The archbishop stated that when Draper reviewed the troops, more than 1,000 men were missing, including 16 officers. Among these officers were a major fatally wounded by an arrow on the first day of the assault, and the vice-admiral, who was drowned whilst coming ashore in a boat. The natives who had been brought from the provinces to Manila were plundering and committing excesses in the city, so Draper had them all driven out. Guards were placed at the doors of the nunneries and convents to prevent outrages on the women, and then the city was given up to the victorious troops for pillage during three hours. Zuniga, however, remarks that the European troops were moderate, but that the Indian contingents were insatiable. They are said to have committed many atrocities, and, reveling in bloodshed, even murdered the inhabitants. They ransacked the suburbs of Santa Cruz and Binondo, and, acting like savage victorious tribes, they ravished women, and even went into the highways to murder and rob those who fled. The three hours having expired, the troops were called in, but the following day a similar scene was permitted. The archbishop thereupon besought the general to put a stop to it, and have compassion on the city. The general complied with this request, and immediately restored order under pain of death for disobedience. Some Chinese were in consequence hanged. General Draper himself killed one whom he found in the act of stealing, and he ordered that all church property should be restored, but only some priest's vestments were recovered. Draper demanded the surrender of Cavita, which was agreed to by the archbishop and magistrates, but the commanding officer refused to comply. The major of that garrison was sent with a message to the commander, but on the way he talked with such freedom about the surrender to the British, that the natives quitted their posts and plundered the arsenal. The commander, rather than face humiliation, retired to a ship, and left all further responsibility to the major. Measures were now taken to pay the agreed indemnity. However, the consequent heavy contributions levied upon the inhabitants, together with the silver from the pious establishments, church ornaments, plate, the archbishop's rings and breast cross, only amounted to 546,000 Cuban pesos. The British then proposed to accept one million at once and draw the rest from the cargo of the galleon Filipino, should it result that she had not been seized by the British previous to the day the capitulation was signed but the one million was not forthcoming. The day before the capture of Manila a royal messenger had been sent off with 111,000 Cuban pesos, 91 with orders to hide them in some place in the Laguna de Bay. The archbishop now ordered their return to Manila, and issued a requisition to that effect, but the Franciscan friars were insubordinate, and armed the natives, whom they virtually ruled, and the treasure was secreted in Maheje convent, Tayaba province. Thence, on receipt of the archbishop's message, it was carried across country to a place in North Pampanga, 
bordering on Cagayan and Pangasinan. The British, convinced that they were being duped, insisted on their claim. Thomas Backhouse, commanding the troops stationed at Pasig, went up to the Laguna de Bay with 80 mixed troops, to intercept the bringing of the Filipino treasure. He attacked Tunasan, Vinan, and Santa Rosa, and embarked for Pagsanjan, which was then the capital of the Laguna province. The inhabitants, after firing the convent and church, fled. Backhouse returned to Calamba, entered the province of Batangas, overran it, and made several Austin friars prisoners. In Lipa he seized 3,000 Cuban pesos, and established his quarters there, expecting that the Filipino treasure would be carried that way, but on learning that it had been transported by sea to a Pampanga coast town, Backhouse returned to his post at Pasig. In the capitulation, the whole of the archipelago was surrendered to the British, but the magistrate Simon de Anda determined to appeal to arms. Draper used stratagem, and issued a proclamation commiserating the fate of the natives who paid tribute to Spaniards, and assuring them that the King of England would not exact it. The Archbishop, as governor, became Draper's tool, sent messages to the Spanish families, persuading them to return, and appointed an Englishman, married in the country, to be alderman of Tonda. Despite the strenuous opposition of the Supreme Court, the Archbishop, at the instance of Draper, convened a council of native headmen and representative families, and proposed to them the cession of all the islands to the King of England. Draper clearly saw that the ruling powers in the colony, judging from their energy and effective measures, were the friars, so he treated them with great respect. The Frenchman Faller, who unsuccessfully opposed the British assault, was offered troops to go and take possession of Samboanga and assume the government there, but he refused, as did also a Spaniard named Sandoval. Draper returned to Europe, Major Fell was left in command of the troops, whilst Drake assumed the military government of the city, with Smith and Brock as counsel, and Barretton in charge of Cavita. Draper, on leaving, gave orders for two frigates to go in search of the Filipino treasure. The ships got as far as Capul Island and put into harbor. They were detained there by a ruse on the part of a half-caste pilot, and in the meantime the treasure was stealthily carried away. Simon de Anda, from his provincial retreat, proclaimed himself government general. He declared that the archbishop and the magistrates, 92 as prisoners of war, were dead in the eye of the law, and that his assumption of authority was based upon old laws. None of his countrymen disputed his authority, and he established himself in Bacolor. The British Council then convened a meeting of the chief inhabitants, at which Enda was declared a seditious person and deserving of capital punishment, together with the Marquis of Monte Castro, who had violated his parole de honneur, and the provincial of the Austin Friars, who had joined the rebel party. All the Austin Friars were declared traitors for having broken their allegiance to the Archbishop's authority. The British still pressed for the payment of the one million, whilst the Spaniards declared they possessed no more. The Austin Friars were ordered to keep the natives peaceable if they did not wish to provoke hostilities against themselves. At length, the British, convinced of the futility of decrees, determined to sally out with their forces, and 500 men under Thomas Backhouse went up the Pasig River to secure a free passage for supplies to the camp. Whilst opposite to Maybanga, a Spaniard, named Bustos, and his Cagayan troops fired on them. The British returned the fire, and Bustos fled to Maraquina. The British passed the river, and sent an officer with a white flag of truce to demand surrender. Bustos was insolent, and threatened to hang the officer if he returned. Backhouse's troops then opened fire and placed two field pieces, which completely scared the natives, who fled in such great confusion that many were drowned in the river. Thence the British drove their enemy before them like a flock of goats, and reached the Bomban River, where the Sultan of Sulu IV resided with his family. The Sultan, after a feigned resistance, surrendered to the British, who fortified his dwelling, and occupied it during the whole of the operations. There were subsequent skirmishes on the Pasig River banks with the armed insurgents, who were driven as far as the Antipolo Mountains. Meanwhile, Anda collected troops, 
and Bustos, as his lieutenant general, vaunted the power of his chief through the Bulacan and Pampanga provinces. A Franciscan and an Austin friar, having led troops to Masalo, about seven miles from Manila, the British went out to dislodge them, but on their approach most of the natives feigned they were dead, and the British returned without any loss in arms or men. The British, believing that the Austin friars were conspiring against them in connivance with those inside the city, placed these friars in confinement, and subsequently shipped away eleven of them to Europe. For the same reason they at last determined to enter the St. Augustine convent, and on ransacking it, they found that the priests had been lying to them all the time. Six thousand pesos in coin were found hidden in the garden, and large quantities of wrought silver elsewhere. The whole premises were then searched, and all the valuables were seized. A British expedition went out to Bulacan, sailing across the bay and up 93 the Haganoi River, where they disembarked at Malolos on January 19, 1763. The troops, under Captain Esley, of the Grenadiers, numbered 600 men, many of whom were Chinese volunteers. As they advanced from Malolos, the natives and Spaniards fled. On the way to Bulacan, Bustos came out to meet them, but retreated into ambush on seeing they were superior in numbers. Bulacan convent was defended by three small cannons. As soon as the troops came in sight of the convent, a desultory fire of case shot made great havoc in the ranks of the resident Chinese volunteers forming the British vanguard. At length the British brought their field pieces into action, and pointing at the enemy's cannon, the first discharge carried off the head of their artillery Manibara. The panic-stricken natives decamped, the convent was taken by assault, there was an indiscriminate fight and general slaughter. The Alcalde and a Franciscan friar fell in action, one Austin friar escaped, and another was seized and killed to avenge the death of the British soldiers. The invading forces occupied the convent, and some of the troops were shortly sent back to Manila. Bustos reappeared near the Bulacan convent with 8,000 native troops, of whom 600 were cavalry, but they dared not attack the British. Bustos then maneuvered in the neighborhood and made occasional alarms. Small parties were sent out against him, with so little effect that the British commander headed a body in person, and put the whole of Bustos' troops to flight like mosquitoes before a gust of wind, for Bustos feared they would be pursued into Pampanga. After clearing away the underwood, which served as a cover for the natives, the British reoccupied the convent, but Bustos returned to his position, and was a second time as disgracefully rooted by the British, who then withdrew to Manila. At this time it was alleged that a conspiracy was being organized amongst the Chinese resident in the province of Pampanga with the object of assassinating Anda and his Spanish followers. The Chinese cut trenches and raised fortifications, avowing that their bellicose preparations were only to defend themselves against the possible attack of the British, whilst the Spaniards saw in all this a connivance with the invaders. The latter no doubt conjectured rightly. Anda, acting upon the views of his party, precipitated matters by appearing with fourteen Spanish soldiers and a crowd of native bowmen to commence the slaughter in the town of Guagua. The Chinese assembled there in great numbers, and Anda endeavored in vain to induce them to surrender to him. He then sent a Spaniard, named Miguel Garces, with a message, offering them pardon in the name of the King of Spain if they would lay down their arms, but they killed the emissary, and Anda therefore commenced the attack. The result was favorable for Anda's party, and great numbers of the Chinese were slain. Many fled to the fields, where they were pursued by the troops, whilst those who were captured were hanged. Such was the inveterate hatred which 94 Anda entertained for the Chinese, that he issued a general decree declaring all the Chinese traitors to the Spanish flag, and ordered them to be hanged wherever they might be found in the provinces. Thus thousands of Chinese were executed who had taken no part whatever in the events of this little war. Admiral Cornish having decided to return to Europe, again urged for the payment of the two millions of pesos installment of the indemnity. The archbishop was in great straits, he was willing to do anything, but his colleagues opposed him, and Cornish was at length obliged to content himself with a bill on the Madrid treasury. Anda appointed Bustos Alcalde of Bulacan, 
and ordered him to recruit and train troops, as he still nurtured the hope of confining the British to Manila perhaps even of driving them out of the colony. The British in the city were compelled to adopt the most rigorous precautions against the rising of the population within the walls, and several Spanish residents were arrested for intriguing against them in concert with those outside. Several French prisoners from Pondicherry deserted from the British, and some Spanish regular troops, who had been taken prisoners, effected their escape. The fiscal of the Supreme Court and a Senor Villacorta were found conspiring. The latter was caught in the act of sending a letter to Enda, and was sentenced to be hanged and quartered the quarters to be exhibited in public places. The Archbishop, however, obtained pardon for Villacorta on the condition that Enda should evacuate the Pampanga province, Villacorta wrote to Enda, begging him to accede to this, but Enda absolutely refused to make any sacrifice to save his friend's life, and at the same time he wrote a disgraceful letter to the Archbishop, couched in such insulting terms that the British commander burned it without letting the Archbishop see it. Villacorta's life was saved by the payment of 3,000 Cuban pesos. The treasure brought by the Filipino served Enda to organize a respectable force of recruits. Spaniards who were living in the provinces in misery, and a crowd of natives always ready for pay, enlisted. These forces, under Lt. Gen. Bustos, encamped at Malinta, about five miles from Manila. The officers lodged in a house belonging to the Austin Friars, around which the troops pitched their tents the whole being defended by redoubts and palisades raised under the direction of a French deserter, who led a company. From this place Bustos constantly caused alarm to the British troops, who once had to retreat before a picket guard sent to carry off the church bells of Quiapo. The British, in fact, were much molested by Bustos Malinta troops, who forced the invaders to withdraw to Manila and reduce the extension of their outposts. This measure was followed up by a proclamation, dated January 23, 1763, in which the British commander alluded to Bustos troops as Cana Isle and robbers, and offered a reward of 5,000 Cuban pesos 95 for Enda's head, declaring him and his party rebels and traitors to their majesties the kings of Spain and England. Enda, chafing at his impotence to combat the invading party by force of arms, gave vent to his feelings of rage and disappointment by issuing a decree, dated from Bacolor, Pampanga, May 19, 1763, of which the translated text reads as follows, viz. Royal Government Tribunal of these islands for His Catholic Majesty whereas the Royal Government Tribunal, Supreme Government and Captain Generalship of His Catholic Majesty in these islands are gravely offended at the audacity and blindness of those men, who, forgetting all humanity, have condemned as rebellious and disobedient to both their majesties, him, who as a faithful vassal of His Catholic Majesty, and in conformity with the law, holds the royal tribunal, government, and captain generalship, and having suffered by a reward being offered by order of the British governor in council to whomsoever shall deliver me alive or dead, and by their having placed the arms captured in Bulacan at the foot of the gallows seeing that instead of their punishing and censuring such execrable proceedings, the spirit of haughtiness and pride is increasing, as shown in the proclamation published in Manila on the 17th instant, in which the troops of His Majesty are infamously calumniated treating them as blackguards and disaffected to their service charging them with plotting to assassinate the English officers and soldiers, and with having fled when attacked the whole of these accusations being false, now therefore by these presents, be it known to all Spaniards and true Englishmen, that Messrs. Drake, Smith, and Brock who signed the proclamation referred to, must not be considered as vassals of His Britannic Majesty, but as tyrants and common enemies unworthy of human society, and therefore, I order that they be apprehended as such, and I offer 10,000 pesos for each one of them alive or dead. At the same time, I withdraw the order to treat the vassals of His Britannic Majesty with all the humanity which the rights of war will permit, as has been practiced hitherto with respect to the prisoners and deserters. Enda had by this time received the consent of his king to occupy the position which he had usurped, and the British commander was thus enabled to communicate officially with him, if occasion required it, Drake therefore replied to this proclamation, recommending Enda to carry on the war with greater moderation and humanity. 
On June 27, 1763, the British made a sortie from the city to dislodge Bustos, who still occupied Melinda. The attacking party consisted of 350 fusiliers, 50 horsemen, a mob of Chinese, and a number of guns and ammunition. The British took up quarters on one side of the river, whilst Bustos remained on the other. The opposing parties exchanged fire, but neither cared nor dared to cross 96 the waterway. The British forces retired in good order to Masilo, and remained there until they heard that Bustos had burnt Melinta House, belonging to the Austin Friars, and removed his camp to Makoian. Then the British withdrew to Manila in the evening. On the Spanish side there were two killed, five mortally wounded, and two slightly wounded. The British losses were six mortally wounded and seven disabled. This was the last encounter in open warfare. Chin A men occasionally lost their lives through their love of plunder in the vicinity occupied by the British. During these operations the priesthood taught the ignorant natives to believe that the invaders were infidels and a holy war was preached. The friars, especially those of the Augustine Order 5 abandoned their mission of peace for that of the sword, and the British met with a slight reverse at Masilo, where a religious fanatic of the Austin friars had put himself at the head of a small band lying in ambush. On July 23, 1763, a British frigate brought news from Europe of an armistice, and the preliminaries of peace, by virtue of which Manila was to be evacuated, Peace of Paris, February 10, 1763, were received by the British commander on August 27 following, and communicated by him to the Archbishop Governor for the Commander-in-Chief of the Spanish Arms. Anda stood on his dignity, and protested that he should be addressed directly, and be styled Captain General. On this plea he declined to receive the communication. Drake replied by a manifesto, dated September 19, to the effect that the responsibility of the blood which might be spilt in consequence of Anda's refusal to accept his notification would rest with him. Anda published a counter-manifesto, dated September 28, in Bacolor, Pampanga, protesting that he had not been treated with proper courtesy, and claiming the governor-generalship. Greater latitude was allowed to the prisoners, and Villa Corda effected his escape disguised as a woman. He fled to Anda the co-conspirator who had refused to save his life and their superficial friendship was renewed. Villa Corda was left in charge of business in Bacolor during Anda's temporary absence. Meanwhile the archbishop became ill, and it was discussed who should be his successor in the government in the event of his death. Villa Corda argued that it fell to him as senior magistrate. The discussion came to the knowledge of Enda, and seriously aroused his jealousy. Fearing conspiracy against 97 his ambitious projects, he left his camp at Polo, and hastened to interrogate Villa Corda, who explained that he had only made casual remarks in the course of conversation. Enda, however, was restless on the subject of the succession, and sought the opinion of all the chief priests and the bishops. Various opinions existed. Some urged that the decision be left to the Supreme Court, others were in favor of Enda, whilst many prudently abstained from expressing their views. Enda was so nervously anxious about the matter that he even begged the opinion of the British commander, and wrote him on the subject from Bacolor, Pampanga, on November 2, 1763. Major Fell seriously quarreled with Drake about the Frenchman Faller, whom Admiral Cornish had left under sentence of death for having written a letter to Java accusing him of being a pirate and a robber. Drake protected Faller, whilst Fell demanded his execution, and the dispute became so heated that Fell was about to slay Drake with a bayonet, but was prevented by some soldiers. Fell then went to London to complain of Drake, hence Anda's letter was addressed to Backhouse, who took Fell's place. Anda, who months since had refused to negotiate or treat with Drake, still claimed to be styled Captain General. Backhouse replied that he was ignorant of the Spaniard's statutes or laws, but that he knew the governor was the archbishop. Anda thereupon spread the report that the British commander had forged the preliminaries of peace because he could no longer hold out in warfare. The British necessarily had to send to the provinces to purchase provisions, and Anda caused their forage parties to be attacked, so that the war really continued, 
in spite of the news of peace, until January 30, 1764. On this day the Archbishop died, sorely grieved at the situation, and weighed down with cares. He had engaged to pay four millions of pesos and surrender the islands, but could he indeed have refused any terms? The British were in possession, and these conditions were dictated at the point of the bayonet. Immediately after the funeral of the Archbishop, Ander received dispatches from the King of Spain, by way of China, confirming the news of peace to his governor at Manila. Then the British acknowledged Anda as governor, and proceeded to evacuate the city. But rival factions were not so easily set aside, and fierce quarrels ensued between the respective parties of Anda, Villacorta, and Usturiz as to who should be governor and receive the city officially from the British. Anda, being actually in command of the troops, held the strongest position. The conflict was happily terminated by the arrival at Maranduca Island of the newly appointed government general, from Spain, Don Francisco de la Torre. A galley was sent there by Anda to bring His Excellency to Luzon, and he proceeded to Bacolor, where Anda resigned the government to him on March 17, 1764. La Torre sent a message to Backhouse and Barretton the commanding 98 officers at Manila and Cavita stating that he was ready to take over the city in due form, and he thereupon took up his residence in Santa Cruz, placed a Spanish guard with sentinels from that ward as far as the pontoon bridge, Puente de Barcas, which then occupied the site of the present Puente de España, where the British advance guard was, and friendly communication took place. Governor Drake was indignant at being ignored in all these proceedings, and ordered the Spanish governor to withdraw his guards, under threat of appealing to force. Backhouse and Barretton resented this rudeness and ordered the troops under arms to arrest Drake, whose hostile action, due to jealousy, they declared unwarrantable. Drake, being apprised of their intentions, escaped from the city with his suite, embarked on board a frigate, and sailed off. La Torre was said to be indisposed on the day appointed for receiving the city. Some assert that he feigned indisposition as he did not wish to arouse Anda's animosity, and desired to afford him an opportunity of displaying himself as a delegate, at least, of the highest local authority by receiving the city from the British, whilst he pampered his pride by allowing him to enter triumphantly into it. As the city exchanged masters, the Spanish flag was hoisted once more on the fort of Santiago amidst the hurrahs of the populace, artillery salutes, and the ringing of the church bells. Before embarking, Barretton offered to do justice to any claims which might legitimately be established against the British authorities. Hence a sloop lent to Drake, valued at 4,000 Cuban pesos, was paid for to the Jesuits, and the 3,000 Cuban pesos paid to ransom Villa Corda's life was returned. Barretton remarking, that if the sentence against him were valid, it should have been executed at the time, but it could not be commuted by money payment. At the instance of the British authorities, a free pardon was granted and published to the Chinese, few of whom, however, confided in it, and many left with the retiring army. Barretton, with his forces, embarked for India, after dispatching a packet boat to restore the Sultan of Sulu to his throne. In connection with this expedition, 150 British troops temporarily remained on the island of Balambangan, near Balabak Island, and Anda sent a messenger to inquire about this. The reply came that the Moros, in return for British friendliness, invited the 150 to a feast and treacherously slew 144 of them. During this convulsed period, great atrocities were committed. Unfortunately the common felons were released by the British from their prisons, and used their liberty to perpetrate murders and robbery in alliance with those always naturally bent that way. So great did this evil become, so bold were the marauders, that in time they formed large parties, infested highways, attacked plantations, and the poor peasantry had to flee, leaving their cattle and all their belongings in 99 their power. Several avenged themselves of the friars for old scores others settled accounts with those Europeans who had tyrannized over them of old. The Chinese, whether so-called Christians or pagans, declared for and aided the British. The proceedings of the Cole Eric Simon de Anda y Salazar were approved by his sovereign, 
but his impetuous disposition drove from him his best counselors, whilst those who were bold enough to uphold their opinions against his, were accused of connivance with the British. Communications with Europe were scant indeed in those days, but Ender could not have been altogether ignorant of the causes of the war, which terminated with the Treaty of Paris. A few months afterwards Ender returned to Spain and was received with favour by the king, who created him a cavalier of the order of Charles III. With a pension of 4,000 reals, about 40 pounds, and awarded him a pension of 3,000 pesos, and on November 6, 1767, appointed him a councillor of Castile. In the course of the next three years government general José Ruin, who superseded La Torre, had fallen into disgrace, and in 1770 Anda was appointed to the governor generalship of the islands, specially charged to carry out the royal will with respect to the expulsion of the Jesuits and the defense of crown rights in ecclesiastical matters. Anda at once found himself in conflict with the Jesuits, the friars, and the outgoing government general Ruin. As soon as Ruin vacated his post, Anda, as government general, had his predecessor confined in the fort of Santiago, where he died. At the same time he sent back to Spain two magistrates who had sided with Ruin, imprisoned other judges, and banished military officers from the capital. Anda's position was a very peculiar one. A partisan of the friars at heart, he had undertaken the defense of crown interests against them, but, in a measure, he was able to palliate the bitterness he thus created by expelling the Jesuits, who were an eyesore to the friars. The Jesuits might easily have promoted a native revolt against their departure, but they meekly submitted to the decree of banishment and left the islands, taking away nothing but their clothing. Having rid himself of his rivals and the Jesuits, Anda was constantly haunted by the fear of fresh conflict with the British. He had the city walls repaired and created a fleet of ships built in the provinces of Pangasinan, Cavita, and Zimbals, consisting of one frigate of war with 18 cannon, another with 32 cannon, besides 14 vessels of different types, carrying a total of 98 cannon and 12 swivel guns, all in readiness for the British who never reappeared. Born on October 28, 1709, in the province of Alava, Spain, Simon de Anda's irascible temper, his vanity, and his extravagant love of power created enmities and brought trouble upon himself at every step. Exhausted by six years of continual strife in his private and official 100 capacities, he retired to the Austin Friars Hospital of San Juan de Dios, in Cavita, where, on October 30, 1776, he expired, much to the relief of his numerous adversaries. The last resting place of his mortal remains is behind the altar of the cathedral, marked by a tablet, and a monument erected to his memory 107 years after his death stands on the quayside at the end of the Paseo de Santa Lucia, near the fort of Santiago, Manila. Consequent on the troubled state of the colony, a serious rebellion arose in Iligan, Cagayan province, amongst the Timava natives, who flogged the commandant, and declared they would no longer pay tribute to the Spaniards. The revolt spread to Ilicos and Pangasinan, in the latter province Don Fernando Arraya raised a troop of 30 Spaniards with firearms, and 400 friendly natives with bows and arrows, and after great slaughter of the rebels the ringleaders were caught, and tranquility was restored by the gallows. A rising far more important occurred in Ilicos Sur. The alcalde was deposed, and escaped after he had been forced to give up his staff of office. The leader of this revolt was a cunning and wily Manila native, named Diego de Silan, who persuaded the people to cease paying tribute and declare against the Spaniards, who, he pointed out, were unable to resist the English. The city of Vigan was in great commotion. The vicar general parleyed in vain with the natives, then, at the head of his troops, he dispersed the rebels, some of whom were taken prisoners. But the bulk of the rioters rallied and attacked, and burnt down part of the city. The loyal natives fled before the flames. The vicar general's house was taken, and the arms in it were seized. All the Austin friars within a large surrounding neighborhood had to ransom themselves by money payments. Sillan was then acknowledged as chief over a large territory north and south of Vigan. He appointed his lieutenants, 
and issued a manifesto declaring Jesus of Nazareth to be captain general of the place, and that he was his alcalde for the promotion of the Catholic religion and dominion of the King of Spain. His manifesto was wholly that of a religious fanatic. He obliged the natives to attend Mass, to confess, and to see that their children went to school. In the midst of all this pretended piety, he stole cattle and exacted ransoms for the lives of all those who could pay them, he levied a tax of 100 Cuban pesos on each friar. Under the pretense of keeping out the British, he placed sentinels in all directions to prevent news reaching the terrible Simon de Anda. But Anda, though fully informed by an Austin friar of what was happening, had not sufficient troops to march north. He sent a requisition to Silan to present himself within nine days, under penalty of arrest as a traitor. Whilst this order was published, vague reports were intentionally spread that the Spaniards were coming to Ilicos in great force. Many deserted Silan, but he contrived to deceive even the clergy and others by his feigned piety. 101 Silan sent presents to Manila for the British, acknowledging the King of England to be his legitimate sovereign. The British governor sent, in return, a vessel bearing dispatches to Silan, appointing him alcalde. Elated with pride, Silan at once made this public. The natives were undeceived, for they had counted on him to deliver them from the British, now, to their dismay, they saw him the authorized magistrate of the invader. He gave orders to make all the Austin friars prisoners, saying that the British would send other clergy in their stead. The friars surrendered themselves without resistance and joined their bishop near Vigan, awaiting the pleasure of Silan. The bishop excommunicated Silan, and then he released some of the priests. The Christian natives having refused to slay the friars, a secret compact was being made, with this object, with the mountain tribes, when a Spanish half-caste named Vicos obtained the bishop's benediction and killed Silan, and the Ilicos rebellion, which had lasted from December 14, 1762, to May 28, 1763, ended. Not until a score of little battles had been fought were the numerous riots in the provinces quelled. The loyal troops were divided into sections, and marched north in several directions, until peace was restored by March, 1765. Zuniga says that the Spaniards lost in these riots about 70 Europeans and 140 natives, whilst they cost the rebels quite 10,000 men. The submission made to the Spaniards, in the time of Legaspi, of the Manila and Tonda chiefs, was but of local importance, and by no means implied a total Pacific surrender of the whole archipelago, for each district had yet to be separately conquered. In many places a bold stand was made for independence, but the superior organization and science of the European forces invariably brought them final victory. The numerous revolutionary protests registered in history against the Spanish dominion show that the natives, from the days of Legaspi onwards, only yielded to a force which they repeatedly, in each generation, essayed to overthrow. But it does not necessarily follow that either the motives which inspired the leaders of these social disturbances, or the acts themselves, were, in every case, laudable ones. The Pampanga natives were among the first to submit, but a few years afterwards they were in open mutiny against their masters, who, they alleged, took their young men from their homes to form army corps, and busily employed the able-bodied men remaining in the district to cut timber for government requirements and furnish provisions to the camp and to the arsenal at Cavita. In 1622 the natives of Bajal Island erected an oratory in the mountain in honor of an imaginary deity, and revolted against the tyranny of the Jesuit missionaries. They proclaimed their intention to regain their liberty, and freedom from the payment of tribute to 102 foreigners, and taxes to a church they did not believe in. Several towns and churches were burnt, and Catholic images were desecrated, but the rebels were dispersed by the governor of Cebu, who, with a considerable number of troops, pursued them into the interior. In the same island a more serious rising was caused in 1744 by the despotism of a Jesuit priest named Morales, who arrogated to himself governmental rights, ordering the apprehension of natives who did not attend mass, and exercising his sacerdotal functions according to his own caprice. 
The natives resisted these abuses, and a certain Dagahoy, whose brother's body had been left uninterred to decompose by the priest's orders, organized a revenge party, and swore to pay the priest in his own coin. The Jesuit was captured and executed, and his corpse was left four days in the sun to corrupt. Great numbers of disaffected natives flocked to Dagahoy's standard. Their complaint was, that whilst they risked their lives in foreign service for the sole benefit of their European masters, their homes were wrecked and their wives and families maltreated to recover the tribute. Dagahoy, with his people, maintained his independence for the space of 35 years, during which period it was necessary to employ constantly detachments of troops to check the rebels' raids on private property. On the expulsion of the Jesuits from the colony, Ricolito friars went to Bajal, and then Dagahoy and his partisans submitted to the government on the condition of all receiving a full pardon. In 1622 an insurrection was set on foot in Leyte Island against Spanish rule, and the governor of Cebu went there with 40 vessels, carrying troops and war material, to cooperate with the local governor against the rebels. The native leader was made prisoner, and his head placed on a high pole to strike terror into the populace. Another prisoner was Garat, four more were publicly executed by being shot with arrows, and another was burnt. In 1629 an attempt was made in the province of Surajao, then called Caraga, in the east of Mindanao Island, to throw off the Spanish yoke. Several churches were burnt and four priests were killed by the rebels, and the rising was only quelled after three years guerrilla warfare. In 1649 the government general decided to supply the want of men in the arsenal at Cavita and the increasing necessity for troops, by pressing the natives of Samar Island into the king's service. Thereupon a native headman named Sumoro killed the priest of Ibabeo, on the east coast of Samar, and led the mob who sacked and burnt the churches along the coast. The governor at Katbalagan got together a few men, and sent them into the mountains with orders to send him back the head of Sumoroi, but instead of obeying they joined the rebels and sent him a pig's head. The revolt increased, and General Andres López Azaldigui was dispatched to the island 103 with full powers from the government general, whilst he was supported on the coast by armed vessels from Samboanga. Sumoroi fled to the hills, but his mother was found in a hut, and the invading party wreaked their vengeance on her by literally pulling her to pieces. Sumoroi was at length betrayed by his own people, who carried his head to the Spanish captain, and this officer had it exhibited on a pole in the village. Some years afterwards another rebel chief surrendered, under a pardon obtained for him by the priests, but the military authorities imprisoned and then hanged him. The riots of 1649 extended to other provinces for the same cause. In Albi, the parish priest of Sorsagon had to flee for his life, in Masbait Island, a sub-lieutenant was killed, in Samboanga, a priest was murdered, in Cebu, a Spaniard was assassinated, and in Surajao, then called Carriga, and Butuan, many Europeans fell victims to the fury of the populace. To quell these disturbances, Captain Gregorio de Castillo, stationed at Butuan, was ordered to march against the rebels with a body of infantry, but bloodshed was avoided by the captain publishing a general pardon in the name of the king, and crowds of insurgents came to the camp in consequence. The king's name, however, was sullied, for very few of those who surrendered ever regained their liberty. They were sent prisoners to Manila, where a few were pardoned, others were executed, and the majority became galley slaves. In 1660 there was again a serious rising in Pampanga, the natives objecting to cut timber for the Cavita arsenal without payment. The revolt spread to Pangasinan province, where a certain Andres Malong was declared king, and he in turn gave to another Pedro Gumapo the title of count. Messages were sent to Zimbals and other adjacent provinces ordering the natives to kill the Spaniards, under pain of incurring King Malong's displeasure. Three army corps were formed by the rebels, one of 6,000 men, under Melchor de Veras, for the conquest of Pampanga, another of 3,000 men, led by the titular Count Gumapo, to annex Ilocos and Cagayan, whilst the so-called King Malong took the field against the Pangasinan people at the head of 2,000 followers. Ilocos province declared in his favor, 
and furnished a body of insurgents under a chief named Juan Manzano, whilst everywhere on the march the titular king's troops increased until they numbered about 40,000 men. On the way many Spaniards priests and laymen were killed. The government general sent by land to Pampanga 200 Spanish troops, 400 Pampangos and half-breeds, well-armed and provisioned, and Mount Araya was fortified and garrisoned by 500 men. By sea, two galleys, six small vessels, and four cargo launches carrying 700 Spaniards and half-breeds, and 30 Pampangos went to Bolineo, in Zambul's province. The rebels were everywhere rooted, and their chiefs were hanged some in Pampanga and others in Manila 104 almost each generation has called forth the strong arm of the conqueror to extinguish the flame of rebellion in one island or another, the revolt being sometimes due to sacerdotal despotism, and at other times to official rapacity. In the last century, prior to 1896, several vain attempts to subvert Spanish authority were made, notably in 1811 in Ilicos, where the fanatics sought to establish a new religion and set up a new god. An attempt was then made to enlist the wild tribes in a plot to murder all the Spaniards, but it was opportunely discovered by the friars and suppressed before it could be carried out. In June, 1823, an order was received from Spain to the effect that officers commissioned in the peninsula should have precedence of all those appointed in the colony, so that, for instance, a lieutenant from Spain would hold local rank above a Philippine major. The Philippine officers protested against this anomaly, alleging that the commissions granted to them in the name of the sovereign were as good as those granted in Spain. The government general refused to listen to the objections put forward, and sent Captain Andres Novales and others on board a ship bound for Mindanao. Novales, however, escaped to shore, and, in conspiracy with a certain Ruiz, attempted to overthrow the government. At midnight all Manila was aroused by the cry of Long live the Emperor Novales. Disaffected troops promenade the city, the people sympathized with the movement, flags were waved as the rebels passed through the streets, the barrack used by Novales' regiment was seized, the cathedral and town hall were occupied, and at six o'clock in the morning Andres Novales marched to Fort Santiago, which was under the command of his brother Antonio. To his great surprise, the brother Antonio stoutly refused to join in the rising, and Andres' expostulations and exhortations were finally met with a threat to fire on him if he did not retire. Meanwhile, the government general remained in hiding until he heard that the fort was holding out against Andres' assault, when he sent troops to assist the defenders. Hemmed in between the fort and the troops outside, Andres Novales and Ruiz made their escape, but they were soon taken prisoners. Andres Novales was found hiding underneath the drawbridge of the Puerto Real. The government general at once ordered Andres Novales, Ruiz, and Antonio Novales to be executed. The town council then went in a body to the government general to protest against the loyal defender of Fort Santiago being punished simply because he was Andres Novales' brother. The government general, however, threatened to have shot anyone who should say a word in favor of the condemned. In a garden of the Episcopal Palace, near the ancient Puerta del Postigo, the execution of the three condemned men was about to take place, and crowds of people assembled to witness it. At the critical moment an assessor of the Supreme Court shouted to the government general 105 that to take the life of the loyal defender of the fort, solely on the ground of his relationship to the rebel leader, would be an iniquity. His words found a sympathetic echo among the crowd, and the government general, deadly pale with rage, yielded to this demonstration of public opinion. Antonio Novales was pardoned, but the strain on his nerves weakened his brain, and he lived for many years a semi-idiot in receipt of a monthly pension of 14 pesos. In 1827 the standard of sedition was raised in Cebu and a few towns of that island, but these disturbances were speedily quelled through the influence of the Spanish friars. In 1828 a conspiracy of a separatist tendency was discovered, and averted without bloodshed. In 1835 Feliciano Peyron took the field against the Spaniards in Cavita province, and held out so effectually that the government general came to terms with him and afterwards deported him to the Ladrone Islands.
In 1836 there was much commotion of a revolutionary character, the peculiar feature of it being the existence of pro-friar and anti-friar native parties, the former seeking to subject absolutely the civil government to ecclesiastical control. Point six In 1841 a student for the priesthood, named Apolinario de la Cruz, affected with religious mania, placed himself at the head of a fanatical party in Teaba, ostensibly for the purpose of establishing a religious sect. Some thousands of natives joined the movement, and troops had 106 to be sent to suppress the rising. Having assumed the title of King of the Tagalogs, he pretended to have direct heavenly support, telling the ignorant masses that he was invulnerable and that the soldiers' bullets would fly from them like chaff before the wind. In 1844, during a rising at Jamamelan, in Negros Island, the Spanish governor was killed. The revolt is said to have been due to the governor having compelled the state prisoners to labor for his private account. In 1854 a Spanish half-caste, named Cuesta, came back from Spain with the rank of major, and at once broke out into open rebellion. The cry was for independence, and four Luzon provinces rose in his support, but the movement was crushed by the troops and Cuesta was hanged. In 1870 a certain came Reno raised rebellion in Cavita province, and after many unsuccessful attempts to capture him he came to terms with the government general, who gave him a salaried employment for a couple of years and then had him executed on the allegation that he was concerned in the rising of Cavita Arsenal. In 1871 there existed a secret society of reformers who used to meet in Santa Cruz, Manila, at the house of the Philippine priest, Father Mariano.7 from the house proper a narrow staircase led to a cistern about 25 feet square in the side of which there was a door which closed perfectly. The cistern was divided into two unequal parts, the top compartment being full of water, whilst the lower part served as the reformer's conference room, so that if search were made, the cistern was, in fact, a cistern. Among the members of this confraternity were Father Augustin Mendoza, the parish priest of Santa Cruz, Dr. Jose Burgos, also a native priest, Maximo Paterno, the father of Pedro A. Paterno, Ambrosio Ryanzars Bautista, and others still living, some personally known to me, under the presidency of Jose Maria Bassa, now residing in Hong Kong. This secret society demanded reforms, and published in Madrid their organ, Eco de Filipinas, copies of which reached the islands. The copy for the paper was the result of the society's deliberations. The monks, incensed at its publication, were, for a long time, puzzled to find out whence the information emanated. Many of the desired reforms closely affected the position of the regular clergy, the Philippine priests, led by Dr. Burgos, urging the fulfillment of the Council of Trent decisions, which forbade the friars to hold benefices unless there were no secular priests available. It appears that the friars, nevertheless, secured these ecclesiastical 107 preferments by virtue of papal bulls of Pius V and subsequent popes, who authorized friars to act as parish priests, not in perpetuity, but so long as secular clergymen were insufficient in number to attend to the cure of souls. The native party consequently declared that the friars retained their incumbencies illegally and by intrusion, in view of the sufficiency of Philippine secular priests. Had the Council of Trent enactments been carried out to the letter, undoubtedly the religious communities in the Philippines would have been doomed to comparative political impotence. The friars, therefore, sought to embroil Dr. Burgos and his party in overt acts of sedition, in order to bring about their downfall and so quash the movement. To this end they contrived to draw a number of Manila and Cavitan natives into a conspiracy to subvert the Spanish government. The native soldiers of the Cavita garrison were induced to cooperate in what they believed to be a genuine endeavor to throw off the Spanish dominion. They were told that rockets fired off in Manila would be the signal for revolt. It happened, however, that they mistook the fireworks of a suburban feast for the agreed signal and precipitated the outbreak in Cavita without any support in the capital. The disaffected soldiers seized the arsenal, whilst others attacked the influential Europeans. Colonel Sabas was sent over to Cavita to quell the riot, and after a short, but stubborn resistance, the rebels were overcome, disarmed, and then formed up in line. 
on Colonel Sabas asking if there were anyone who would not cry, Viva España, one man stepped forward a few paces out of the ranks. The colonel shot him dead, and the remainder were marched to prison. The ruse operated effectually on the lay authorities, who yielded to the Spanish monks' demand that the extreme penalty of the law should be inflicted upon their opponents. Thereupon, Dr. Jose Burgos, aged 30 years, Father Jacinto Zamora, aged 35 years, and Father Mariano Gomez VIII, a dotard, 85 years of age, were executed, February 28, 1872, on the Luneta, the fashionable esplanade outside the walled city, facing the sea. The friars then caused a bill of indictment to be put forward by the public prosecutor, in which it was alleged that a revolutionary government had been projected. The native clergy were terror-stricken. It was decreed that whilst the Filipinos already acting as parish priests would not be deposed, no further appointments would be made, and the most the Philippine novice could aspire to would be the position of co-tutor practically servant to the friar incumbent. Moreover, the opportunity was taken to banish to the Ladrone, Marianas, Islands many members of wealthy and influential families whose passive resistance was an eyesore to the friars. Among these was the late Maximo Paterno 108, QV, the father of Pedro A. Paterno, also Dr. Antonio M. Regidor y Gerardo and Jose Maria Bassa, who are still living. Point nine In 1889 I visited a penal settlement La Colonia Agricola de San Ramon in Mindanao Island, and during my stay at the director's house I was every day served at table by a native convict who was said to have been nominated by the Cavita rebels to the civil governorship of Manila. There was, However, no open trial from which the public could form an opinion of the merits of the case, and the idea of subverting the Spanish government would appear to have been a fantastic concoction for the purposes stated. But from that date there never ceased to exist a secret revolutionary agitation which culminated in the events of 1898-109 Zygas History, Vol. 2, Chap. 12, English Translation, published in London, 1814. 2 Cronica de los P.P. Dominicos, Volume 4, pages 637 to 650, edition of Rivadeneira, published in Madrid. 3 This money constituted the Manila merchants' specie remittances from Acapulco, together with the Mexican subsidy to support the administration of this colony, which was merely a dependency of Mexico up to the second decade of last century, Vidi Chap 15. Four vicissitudes of Sultan Muhammad Ali Mutin, Vidi Chap X. Five so tenacious was the opposition of the Austin friars, both in Manila and the provinces, that the British appear to have regarded them as their special foes. From the archives of Bahan Convent, province of Batangas, I have taken the following notes, viz. Colon the Austin friars lost 238,000 Cuban pesos and 15 convents. Six of their estates were despoiled. The troops killed were 300 Spaniards, 500 Pampanga natives, and 300 Tagalog natives. Besides the Austin friars from the Galleon Trinidad, who were made prisoners and shipped to Bombay, 10 of their order were killed in battle and 19 were captured and exiled to India and Europe. Six the prominent men in this movement were the brothers Palmero, maternal uncles of the well-known Spanish soldier politician, General Marcelo Azcaraga. Born in 1832 in Manila, General Marcelo Azcaraga was the son of Jose Azcaraga, a Biscayan Spaniard, and his Creole wife Dr. Maria Palmero. Jose Azcaraga was a bookseller, established in the Escalta, Binondo, in a building, burnt down in October, 1885, on the site where stood the general post office up to June, 1904. In the fire of 1885 the first Ms. of the first edition of this work was consumed, and had to be rewritten. Jose Azcaraga had several sons and daughters. His second son, Marcelo, first studied law at St. Thomas's University, and then entered the nautical school, where he gained the first prize in mathematics. Sent to Spain to continue his studies, he entered the military school, and in three years' time obtained the rank of captain. For his services against the O'Donnell Revolutionary Movement, 1854, 
in Madrid, he was promoted to major. At the age of 23 he obtained the cross of San Fernando, with pension. Having served Spain with distinction in several important missions to Mexico, Cuba, and Sto. Domingo, he returned to Cuba and espoused the daughter of the great banker, Fessor, who gave him a fortune of £20,000 on the day of his marriage. In the year of Isabella II's deposition, 1868, he returned to Spain, promoted the Bourbon Restoration, and became Lieutenant General on the proclamation of Alfonso XII. 1875, he then became successively MP, Senator by election, and Life Senator. He was Minister of War under Canovas del Castillo, on whose assassination, August 8, 1897, he became Prime Minister of the Interim Government specially charged to keep order until after the unpopular marriage of the Princess of Asturias. After several ministerial changes he again took the leadership of the government, was lately President of the Senate, and on his retirement, at the age of 72, he received the Toison de Oro, Golden Fleece, the most elevated order in Spain. On his mother's side he descends from the Philippine Creole family of the Conde de Lizarraga, and his uncle to the Conde de Albi, better known in Philippine society as Senor Govent. 7. It was practically a secret branch of the Junta General de Reformas authorized to discuss reforms, and created by the colonial minister Becerra during the governor generalship of General La Torre in the time of the provisional government in Spain which succeeded the deposed Queen Isabella II. 8. He was the grandfather of one of the most conspicuous surviving generals of the Tagalog Rebellion, 1896, and the War of Independence, 1899. 9. Jose Maria Bassa was the son of Matias Bassa, a builder and contractor by trade, who made a contract with the Spanish government to fill up the stream which branched from the Pasig River and crossed the Escalta, Manila, where now stands the street called Calle de San Jacinto. In consideration of this work he was permitted to build houses on the reclaimed land, provided he made a thoroughfare where the former bed of the rivulet existed. This undertaking made his fortune. His son, José María, had several trading schemes, the most prosperous of which was his distillery at Trezo, Manila, which brought him large profits, and was a flourishing concern in 1872. On being amnestied, he established himself in Hong Kong, where he is still living with his family in easy circumstances and highly respected. His unbounded hospitality to all who know him, and especially to his countrymen, has justly earned for him in Hong Kong the title of the father of the Filipinos. Dr. Antonio Maria Regidor y Gerardo, a young lawyer, was arrested and banished to the Ladrone Islands, whence he afterwards escaped to Hong Kong in a foreign vessel, disguised as a priest. From that colony he found his way to France, where he intended to settle, but eventually established himself in London, where he still holds a high position as a Spanish consulting lawyer. By his marriage with an Irish lady, he has a son and several charming daughters, his well-appointed home being the rendezvous of all the best class of Filipinos who visit the British metropolis. The Chinese long before the foundation of Manila by Legaspi in 1571 the Chinese traded with these islands. Their locus standi, however, was invariably a critical one, and their commercial transactions with the semi-barbarous Philippine islanders were always conducted afloat. Often their junks were boarded and pillaged by the natives, but, in spite of the immense risk incurred, the Chinese lacked nothing in their active pursuit. Their chief home port was Canton. Legaspi soon perceived the advantages which would accrue to his conquest by fostering the development of commerce with these islands, and, as an inducement to the Chinese to continue their traffic, he severely punished all acts of violence committed against them. In the course of time the Chinese had gained sufficient confidence under European protection, to come ashore with their wares. In 1588, Chinese were already paying rent for the land they occupied. Some writers assert that they propagated their religious doctrines as well as their customs, but nothing can be found to confirm this statement, and a knowledge of Chinese habits inclines one to think it most improbable. In their trading junks they frequently carried their idols, as a Romish priest carries his missal when he travels. 
the natives may have imitated the Chinese religious rites years before the Spaniards came. There is no evidence adduced to prove that they made any endeavor to proselytize the natives as the Spaniards did. On the other hand, there is reason to believe that some idols, lost by the Chinese in shipwreck and piratical attacks, have been, and still are, revered by the natives as authenticated miraculous images of Christian saints, Vaidi Holy Child of Cebu and Our Lady of Cagsese. The Chinese contributed, in a large measure, to bring about a state of order and prosperity in the new colony, by the introduction of their small trades and industries, and their traffic in the interior, and with China, was really beneficial, in those times, to the object which the conquerors had in view. So numerous, however, did they become, that it was found necessary to regulate the growing commerce and the modus vivendi of the foreign traders 110 in the bad weather they were unable to go to and from their junks, and, fearing lest under such circumstances the trade would fall off, the government determined to provide them with a large building called the Alcaceria. The contract for its construction was offered to any private person or corporation willing to take it up on the following terms, viz. Colon the original cost, the annual expense of maintenance, and the annual rents received from the Chinese tenants were to be equally shared by the government and the contractor. The contract was accepted by a certain Fernando de Meyer y Noriega, who was appointed bailiff of the Alcaceria for life, and the employment was to be hereditary in his family, at a salary of 50 pesos per month. However, when the plan was submitted to the government, it was considered too extensive, and was consequently greatly reduced, the government defraying the total cost, 48,000 Cuban pesos. The bailiff's salary was likewise reduced to 25 Cuban pesos per month, and only the condition of sharing rent and expense of preservation was maintained. The Alcaceria, was a square of shops, with a back store, and one apartment above each tenement. It was inaugurated in 1580, in the Calle de San Fernando, in Binondo, opposite to where is now the harbor master's office, and within firing range of the forts. In the course of years this became a ruin, and on the same site government stores were built in 1856. These, too, were wrecked in their turn by the great earthquake of 1863. In the meantime, the Chinese had long ago spread far beyond the limits of the Alcaceria, and another center had been provided for them within the city of Manila. This was called the Parian, which is the Mexican word for marketplace. It was demolished by government order in 1860, but the entrance to the city at that part, constructed in 1782, still retains the name of Puerta del Parian. Hence it will be seen that from the time of the conquest, and for generations following, the Spanish authorities offered encouragement and protection to the Chinese. Dr. Antonio Morga, in his work on the Philippines, p. 349, writes, At the close of the 16th century it is true the town cannot exist without the Chinese, as they are workers in all trades and business, and very industrious and work for small wages. Juan de la Concepcion writes one, referring to the beginning of the 17th century, without the trade and commerce of the Chinese, these dominions could not have subsisted. The same writer estimates the number of Chinese in the colony in 1638 at 33,000.2 in 1686 the policy of fixing the statutory maximum number of Chinese at 6,000 was discussed, but commercial conveniences outweighed its adoption. Had the measure been carried out, it was 111 proposed to lodge them all in one place within easy cannon range, in view of a possible rising. In 1755 it was resolved to expel all non-Christian Chinese, but a term was allowed for the liquidation of their affairs and withdrawal. By June 30, 1755, the day fixed for their departure from Manila, 515 Chin Amen had been sharp enough to obtain baptism as Christians, in order to evade the edict, besides 1,108 who were permitted to remain because they were studying the mysteries and intricacies of Christianity. 2,070 were banished from Manila, the expulsion being rigidly enforced on those newly arriving in junks. Except a few Europeans and a score of Western Asiatics, the Chinese who remained were the only merchants in the archipelago. 
the natives had neither knowledge, tact, energy, nor desire to compete with them. The Chinese were a boon to the colony, for, without them, living would have been far dearer commodities and labor of all kinds more scarce, and the export and import trade much embarrassed. The Chinese and the Japanese are really the people who gave to the natives the first notions of trade, industry, and fruitful work. The Chinese taught them, amongst many other useful things, the extraction of saccharin juice from the sugar cane, the manufacture of sugar, and the working of wrought iron. They introduced into the colony the first sugar mills with vertical stone crushers, and iron boiling pans. The history of the last 150 years shows that the Chinese, although tolerated, were always regarded by the Spanish colonists as an unwelcome race, and the natives have learned, from example, to despise them. From time to time, especially since the year 1763, the feeling against them has run very high. The public clamored for restrictions on their arrival, impediments to the traffic of those already established there, intervention of the authorities with respect to their dwellings and mode of living, and not a few urged their total expulsion. Indeed, such influence was brought to bear on the Indian Council at Madrid during the temporary governorship of Juan Arecadira, Bishop of Nueva Segovia, 1745-50, that the Archbishop received orders to expel the Chinese from the islands, but, on the ground that to have done so would have prejudiced public interests, he simply archived the decree. Even up to the close of Spanish rule, the authorities and the national trading class considered the question from very distinct points of view, for the fact is, that only the mildest action was taken just enough to appease the wild demands of the people. Still, the Chinaman was always subject to the ebb and flow of the tide of official goodwill, and only since 1843 were Chinese shops allowed to be opened on the same terms as other foreigners. There are now streets of Chinese shops. The Chinaman is always ready to sell at any price which will leave him a trifling net gain, whereas the native, having earned sufficient for 112 his immediate wants, would stubbornly refuse to sell his wares except at an enormous profit. Again, but for Chinese coolie competition three constant labor from the natives would have been almost unprocurable. The native day laborer would work two or three days, and then suddenly disappear. The active Chinaman goes day after day to his task, excepting only at the time of the Chinese New Year, in January or February, and can be depended upon, thus the needy native was pushed, by alien competition, to bestir himself. In my time, in the port of Iloilo, four foreign commercial houses had to incur the expense and risk of bringing Chinese coolies for loading and discharging vessels, whilst the natives coolie lounged about and absolutely refused to work. Moreover, the exact ions of the native create a serious impediment to the development of the colony. Only a very small minority of the laboring class will put their hands to work without an advance on their wages, and will often demand it without any guarantee whatsoever. If a native is commissioned to perform any kind of service, he will refuse to stir without a sum of money beforehand, whilst the Chinese very rarely expect payment until they have given value for it. Only the direst necessity will make an unskilled native work steadily for several weeks for a wage which is only to be paid when due. There is scarcely a single agriculturist who is not compelled to sink a share of his capital in making advances to his laborers, who, nevertheless, are in no way legally bound thereby to serve the capitalist, or, whether they are or not, the fact is, that a large proportion of this capital so employed must be considered lost. There are certain lines of business quite impossible without the cooperation of Chinese, and their exclusion will be a loss to the colony. Taxes were first levied on the Mongol traders in 1828. In 1852 a general reform of the fiscal laws was introduced, and the classification of Chinese dealers was modified. They were then divided into four grades or classes, each paying contributions according to the new tariff. In 1886 the Universal Depression, which was first manifest in this colony in 1884, still continued. Remedies of most original character were suggested in the public organs and private circles, and a renewed spasmodic tirade was directed against the Chinese. A petition, made and signed by numbers of the retail trading class, 
was addressed to the sovereign, but it appears to have found its last resting place in the colonial secretary's waste paper basket. The Americans in the United States and Mexico were in open riot against the Celestials the governments of Australia had imposed a capitation tax on their entry for in 113 British Columbia there was a party disposed to throw off its allegiance to Great Britain rather than forego its agitation against the Chinese. Why should not the Chinese be expelled from the Philippines, it was asked, or at least be permitted only to pursue agriculture in the islands. In 1638, around Calumba and along the Laguna shore, they tilled the land, but the selfishness and jealousy of the natives made their permanence impossible. In 1850 the Chinese were invited to take up agriculture, but the rancorous feeling of the natives forced them to abandon the idea, and to seek greater security in the towns. The chief accusation leveled against the Chinaman is, that he comes as an adventurer and makes money, which he carries away, without leaving any trace of civilization behind him. The Chinese immigrant is of the lowest social class. Is not the dream of the European adventurer, of the same or better class, to make his pile of dollars and be off to the land of his birth? If he spends more money in the colony than the Chinaman does, it is because he lacks the Chinaman's self-abnegation and thriftiness. Is the kind of civilization taught in the colonies by low-class European settlers superior? The Chinaman settled in the Philippines under Spanish rule was quite a different being to the obstinate, self-willed, riotous coolie in Hong Kong or Singapore. In Manila he was drilled past docility in six months he became even fawning, cringing, and servile, until goaded into open rebellion. Whatever position he might attain to, he was never addressed, as in the British colonies, as Mr. or Escre, or the equivalent, Senor D, but always Chinaman, Chino. The total expulsion of the Chinese in Spanish times would have been highly prejudicial to trade. Had it suited the state policy to check the ingress of the Chinese, nothing would have been easier than the imposition of a 50 Cuban pesos poll tax. To compel them to take up agriculture was out of the question in a colony where there was so little guarantee for their personal safety. The frugality, constant activity, and commendable ambition of the celestial clashes with the dissipation, indolence and want of aim in life of the native. There is absolutely no harmony of thought, purpose, or habit between the Philippine Malay native and the Mongol race, and the consequence of Chinese coolies working on plantations without ample protection would be frequent assassinations and open affray. Moreover, a native planter could never manage, to his own satisfaction or interest, an estate worked with Chinese labor, but the European might. The Chinese is essentially of a commercial bent, and, in the Philippines at least, he prefers taking his chance as to the profits, in the bubble and risk of independent speculation, rather than calmly labor at a fixed wage which affords no stimulus to his efforts. Plantations worked by Chinese owners with Chinese labor might nave succeeded, but those who arrived in the colony brought no capital, and the government never offered them gratuitous allotment of property. 114 A law relating to the concession of state lands existed, Terrenos Baldios and Colonias Agricolas, but it was enveloped in so many entanglements and so encompassed by tardy process and intricate conditions, that few Orientals or Europeans took advantage of it. History records that in the year 1603 two Chinese Mandarins came to Manila as ambassadors from their emperor to the government general of the Philippines. They represented that a countryman of theirs had informed His Celestial Majesty of the existence of a mountain of gold in the environs of Cavita, and they desired to see it. The government general welcomed them, and they were carried ashore by their own people in ivory and gilded sedan chairs. They wore the insignia of high mandarins, and the governor accorded them the reception due to their exalted station. He assured them that they were entirely misinformed respecting the mountain of gold, which could only be imaginary, but, to further convince them, he accompanied them to Cavita. The mandarins shortly afterwards returned to their country. The greatest anxiety prevailed in Manila. Rumors circulated that a Chinese invasion was in preparation. The authorities held frequent councils, in which the opinions were very divided. A feverish consternation overcame the natives, who were armed, and ordered to carry their weapons constantly. The armory was overhauled. 
A war plan was discussed and adopted, and places were singled out for each division of troops. The natives openly avowed to the Chinese that whenever they saw the first signs of the hostile fleet arriving they would murder them all. The Chinese were accused of having arms secreted, they were publicly insulted and maltreated, the cry was falsely raised that the Spaniards had fixed the day for their extermination, they daily saw weapons being cleaned and put in order, and they knew that there could be no immediate enemy but themselves. There was, in short, every circumstantial evidence that the fight for their existence would ere long be forced upon them. In this terrible position they were constrained to act on the offensive, simply to ensure their own safety. They raised fortifications in several places outside the city, and many an unhappy Chinaman had to shoulder a weapon reluctantly with tears in his eyes. They were traitors. War and revolution were quite foreign to their wishes. The Christian rulers compelled them to abandon their adopted homes and their chattels, regardless of the future. What a strange conception the Chinese must have formed of His Most Catholic Majesty. In their despair many of them committed suicide. Finally, on the eve of St. Francis Day, the Chinese openly declared hostilities beat their war gongs, hoisted their flags, assaulted the armed natives, and threatened the city. Houses were burnt and Binondo was besieged. They fortified Tonda, and the next morning Luis Perez das Marinas, an ex-Gov general, led the troops against them. He was joined by 100 picked 115 Spanish soldiers under Tomás de Acuna. The nephew of the governor and the nephew of the archbishop rallied to the Spanish standard nearly all the flower of Castilian soldiery and hardly one was left to tell the tale. The bloodshed was appalling. The Chinese, encouraged by this first victory, besieged the city, but after a prolonged struggle they were obliged to yield, as they could not provision themselves. The retreating Chinese were pursued far from Manila along the Laguna de Bay shore, thousands of them being overtaken and slaughtered or disabled. Reinforcements met them on the way, and drove them as far as Batangas province and into the Morong district, now included in Rizal province. The natives were in high glee at this license to shed blood unresisted so in harmony with their natural instincts. It is calculated that 24,000 Chinese were slain or captured in this revolt. The priests affirm positively that during the defense of the city St. Francis appeared in person on the walls to stimulate the Christians thus the victory was ascribed to him. This ruthless treatment of a harmless and necessary people for up to this event they had proved themselves to be both threatened to bring its own reward. They were the only industrious, thriving, skillful, wealth-producing portion of the population. There were no other artificers or tradespeople in the colony. Moreover, the Spaniards were fearful lest their supplies from China of food for consumption in Manila 5 and manufactured articles for export to Mexico, should in future be discontinued. Consequently they hastened to dispatch an envoy to China to explain matters, and to reassure the Chinese traders. Much to their surprise, they found the Viceroy of Canton little concerned about what had happened, and the junks of merchandise again arrived as heretofore. Notwithstanding the memorable event of 1603, another struggle was made by the Chinese 36 years afterwards. In 1639, exasperated at the official robbery and oppression of a certain doctor, Luis Arias de Mora, and the governor of the Laguna province, they rose in open rebellion and killed these officials in the town of Calamba. So serious was the revolt that the government general went out against them in person. The rebels numbered about 30,000, and sustained, for nearly a year, a petty warfare all around. The images of the saints were promenade in the streets of Manila, it was a happy thought, for 6,000 Chinese coincidentally surrendered. During this conflict an edict was published ordering all the Chinese in the provinces to be slain. In 1660 there was another rising of these people, which terminated in a great massacre. The Spaniards now began to reflect that they had made rather a 116 bad bargain with the Mongol traders in the beginning, and that the government would have done better had they encouraged commerce with the peninsula. Up to this time the Spaniards had vainly reposed on their laurels as conquerors. They squandered lives and treasure on innumerable fruitless expeditions to Gamboge, Cochin China, Siam, P. 
Pigo, Japan, and the Moluccas, in quest of fresh glories, instead of concentrating their efforts in opening up this colony and fostering a Philippine export trade, as yet almost unknown, if we exclude merchandise from China, etc., in transit to Mexico. From this period restrictions were, little by little, placed on the introduction of Chinese, they were treated with arrogance by the Europeans and Mexicans, and the jealous hatred which the native to this day feels for the Chinaman now began to be more openly manifested. The Chinaman had, for a long time past, been regarded by the European as a necessity and henceforth an unfortunate one. Nevertheless, the lofty Spaniard who by favor of the king had arrived in Manila to occupy an official post without an escudo too much in his pocket, did not disdain to accept the hospitality of the Chinese. It was formerly their custom to secure the goodwill and personal protection of the Spanish officials by voluntarily keeping lodging houses ready for their reception. It is chronicled that these gratuitous residences were well furnished and provided with all the requisites procurable on the spot. For a whole century the Spaniards were lulled with this easy-going and felicitous state of things, whilst the insidious Mongol, whose clear-sighted sagacity was sufficient to pierce the thin veil of friendship proffered by his guest, was ever prepared for another opportunity of rising against the dominion of Castile, of which he had had so many sorry experiences since 1603. The occasion at last arrived during the British occupation of Manila in 1763. The Chinese voluntarily joined the invaders, but were unable to sustain the struggle, and it is estimated that some 6,000 of them were murdered in the provinces by order of the notorious Simon de Anda, Vidi P. 93. They menaced the town of Pasig near Manila and Fray Juan de Torres, the parish priest, put himself at the head of 300 natives, by order of his prior, Fray Andres Fuentes, to oppose them, and the Chinese were forced to retire. On October 9, 1820, a general massacre of Chinese, British, and other foreigners took place in Manila and Cavita. Epidemic cholera had affected the capital and surrounding districts, great numbers of natives succumbed to its malignant effects, and they accused the foreigners of having poisoned the drinking water in the streams. Foreign property was attacked and pillaged even ships lying in the bay had to sail off and anchor out afar for safety. The outbreak attained such grave proportions that the clergy intervened to dissuade the populace from their hallucination. The high host was carried through the 117 streets, but the rioters were only pacified when they could find no more victims. Amongst other reforms concerning the Chinese which the Spanish colonists and Manila natives called for in 1886, through the public organs, was that they should be forced to comply with the law promulgated in 1867, which provided that the Chinese, like all other merchants, should keep their trade books in the Spanish language. The demand had the appearance of being based on certain justifiable grounds, but in reality it was a mere ebullition of spite intended to augment the difficulties of the Chinese. The British merchants and bankers are, by far, those who give most credit to the Chinese. The Spanish and native creditors of the Chinese are but a small minority, taking the aggregate of their credits, and instead of seeking malevolently to impose new hardships on the Chinese, they could have abstained from entering into risky transactions with them. All merchants are aware of the Chinese trading system, and none are obliged to deal with them. A foreign house would give a Chinaman credit for, say, 300 pounds to 400 pounds worth of European manufactured goods, knowing full well, from personal experience, or from that of others, that the whole value would probably never be recovered. It remained a standing debt on the books of the firm. The Chinaman retailed these goods, and brought a small sum of cash to the firm, on the understanding that he would get another parcel of goods, and so he went on for years. Point six. Thus the foreign merchants practically sunk an amount of capital to start their Chinese constituents. Sometimes the acknowledged owner and responsible man in one Chinese retail establishment would have a share in, or own, several others. If matters went wrong, he absconded abroad, and only the one shop which he openly represented could be embargoed, whilst his goods were distributed over several shops under any name but his. It was always difficult to bring legal proof of this, the books were in Chinese, 
and the whole business was in a state of confusion incomprehensible to any European. But these risks were well known beforehand. It was only then that the original credit had to be written off by the foreigner as a net loss often small when set against several years of accumulated profits made in successive operations. The Chinese have guilds or secret societies for their mutual protection, and it is a well ascertained fact that they had to pay the Spanish authorities very dearly for the liberty of living at peace with their fellow men. If the wind blew against them from official quarters the affair brought on the tapi was hushed up by a gift. These peace offerings, at times of considerable value, were procured by a tax privately levied on each Chinaman by the headmen of their guilds. 118 In 1880-83 the government general and other high functionaries used to accept Chinese hospitality, etc. In December, 1887, the Medal of Civil Merit was awarded to a Chinaman named Xiao Ziante, resident in Binondo, whilst the government for several years had made contracts with the Chinese for the public service. Another Chinaman, christened in the name of Carlos Palanxa, was later on awarded the Grand Cross of Isabella the Catholic, with the title of Excellency. Many Chinese have adopted Christianity, either to improve their social standing, or to be enabled thereby to contract marriage with natives. Their intercessor and patron is Saint Nicholas, since the time, it is said, that a Chinaman, having fallen into the Pasig River, was in danger of being eaten by an alligator, and saved himself by praying to that saint, who caused the monster to turn into stone. The legendary stone is still to be seen near the left bank of the river. There appears to be no perfectly reliable data respecting the number of Chinese residents in the archipelago. In 1886 the statistics differed largely. One statistician published that there was a total of 66,740 men and 194 women, of whom 51,348 men and 191 women lived in Manila and suburbs, 1,154 men and 3 women in Iloilo, and 983 men in Cebu, the rest being dispersed over the coast villages and the interior. The most competent local authorities in two provinces proved to me that the figures relating to their districts were inexact, and all other information on the subject which I have been able to procure tends to show that the number of resident Chinese was underrated. I estimate that just before the rebellion of 1896 there were 100,000 Chinese in the whole colony, including upwards of 40,000 in and around the capital. Crowds of Chinese passed to these islands via Sulu, Holo, which, as a free port, they could enter without need of papers. Pretending to be resident colonists there, they managed to obtain passports to travel on business for a limited period in the Philippines, but they were never seen again in Sulu. In Spanish times the Chinaman was often referred to as a Macau or a Sangli. The former term applied to those who came from southern China, Canton, Macau, Amoy, etc. They were usually cooks and domestic servants. The latter signified the northern Chinamen of the trading class. The popular term for a Chinaman in general was a suya. In Manila and in several provincial towns where the Chinese residents were numerous, they had their own separate tribunals or local courts, wherein minor affairs were managed by petty governors of their own nationality, elected biannually, in the same manner as the natives. In 1888 the question of admitting a Chinese consulate in the Philippines was talked of in official circles, which proves that the government was far from seeing the Chinese question in the same light as the Spanish or native merchant class. In the course of time they acquired a certain 119 consideration in the body politic, and deputations of Chinese were present in all popular ceremonies during the last few years of Spanish rule. Wherever the Chinese settle they exhibit a disposition to hold their footing, if not to strengthen it, at all hazards, by force if need be. In Sarawak their secret societies threatened to undermine the prosperity of that little state, and had to be suppressed by capital punishment. Since the British occupation of Hong Kong in 1841, there have been two serious movements against the Europeans. In 1848 the Chinese murdered Governor Emeril of Macau, and the colonists had to fight for their lives. 
In Singapore the attempts of the Chinese to defy the government called for coercive measures, but the danger is small, because the immigrant Chinaman has only the courage to act in mobs. In Australia and the United States it was found necessary to enact special laws regulating the ingress of Mongols. Under the Spanish Philippine government the most that could be said against them, as a class, was that, through their thrift and perseverance, they outran the shopkeeping class in the race of life. The Insular Government Chinese Exclusion Act, at present in operation, permits those Chinese who are already in the islands to remain conditionally, but rigidly debars fresh immigration. The corollary is that, in the course of a few years, there will be no Chinese in the Philippines. The working of the above act is alluded to in Chapter XXXI. Under a native government their lot is not likely to be a happy one. One of the aims of the Tagalog revolutionists was to exclude the Chinese entirely from the island's 121 History General de Filipinas, by Juan de la Concepcion, Volume 4, p. 53. Published in Manila, 1788. 2 Ibid, Volume V, p. 429. 3 About 2 per thousand of the resident Chinese were not originally coolies. 4 General Wang Yongho, accompanied by a Chinese Justice of the High Court, visited Australia in the middle of the year 1887. In a newspaper of that colony, it was reported that after these persons had been courteously entertained and shown the local institutions and industries, they had the effrontery to protest against the state laws, and asked for a repeal of the poll tax considered there the only check upon a Chinese coolie inundation. 5. Just before the naval engagement of Playa Honda between Dutch and Spanish ships, Vidi P-75, the Dutch intercepted Chinese junks on the way to Manila, bringing, amongst their cargoes of food, as many as 12,000 capons. 6. Since about the year 1885, this system, which entailed severe losses, gradually fell into disuse, and business on cash terms became more general. Wild tribes and pagans The population of the Philippines does not consist of one homogeneous race, there are Mohammedans, pagans, and Christians, the last being in the majority. The one tribe is just as much Filipino as the other, and, from the point of view of nationality, they are all equally fellow countrymen. Point one so far as tradition serves to elucidate the problem of their origin, it would appear that the Filipinos are a mixed people, descendants of Papuan, Arabian, Hindu, Malay, Japanese, Chinese, and European forefathers. Point two according to the last census, 1903, the uncivilized population amounted to eight one half per cent of the whole. The chief of these tribes are the Edas, or Negritos, the Gadaints, Itavis, Igor Rotes, Igoro Chinese, Tinguians, Tagbanuas, Bataks, Manobos, etc. Also among the southern races of Mindanao Island, referred to in chapters X and XXIX, there are several pagan tribes interspersed between the Mahometan clans. I have used only the generic denominations, for whilst these tribes are subdivided, for instance, the Buckwills of Zimbals, a section of the Negritos, the Guinans, a sanguinary people inhabiting the mountains of the Igor Road district, etc., the fractions denote no material physical or moral difference, and the local names adopted by the different clans of the same race are of no interest to the general reader. The expression Bukidnon, so commonly heard, does not signify any particular caste, but, in a general sense, the people of the mountain, Bukid. Edas, or Negritos, numbering 22,000 to 24,000, inhabit the mountain regions of Luzon, Panay, Negros, and some smaller islands. 121 They are dark, some of them being as black as African Negros. Their general appearance resembles that of the Alfur Papuan of New Guinea. They have curly matted hair, like astrakhan fur. The men cover only their loins, and the women dress from the waist to the knees. They are a spiritless and cowardly race. They would not deliberately face white men in anything like equal numbers with warlike intentions, although they would perhaps spend a quiverful of arrows from behind a tree at a retreating foe. A Negrito family. A Negrito family. 
The Ida carries a bamboo lance, a palmwood bow, and poisoned arrows when out on an expedition. He is wonderfully light-footed, and runs with great speed after the deer, or climbs a tree like a monkey. Groups of 50 to 60 souls live in community. Their religion seems to be a kind of cosmolatry and spirit worship. Anything which for the time being, in their imagination, has a supernatural appearance is deified. They have a profound respect for old age and for their dead. They are of extremely low intellect, and, although some of them have been brought up by civilized families living in the vicinity of the Negrito mountainous country, they offer little encouragement to those who would desire to train them. Even when more or less domesticated, the Negrito cannot be trusted to do anything which requires an effort of judgment. At times his mind seems to wander from all social order, and an apparently overwhelming eagerness to return to his native haunts disconcerts all one's plans for his civilization. For a long time they were the sole masters of Luzon Island, where they exercised seigneurial rights over the Malay immigrants, until these arrived in such numbers, that the Negritos were forced to retire to the highlands. The taxes imposed upon primitive Malay settlers by the Negritos were levied in kind, and when payment was refused, they swooped down in a posse, and carried off the head of the defaulter. Since the arrival of the Spaniards, the terror of the white man has made them take definitely to the mountains, where they appear to be very gradually decreasing. The Spanish government, in vain, made strenuous efforts to implant civilized habits among this weak-brained race. In 1881 I visited the Capas missions in Upper Pampanga. The authorities had established there what is called a real a kind of model village of bamboo and palm leaf huts to each of which a family was assigned. They were supplied with food, clothing, and all necessaries of life for one year, which would give them an opportunity of tilling the land and providing for themselves in future. But they followed their old habits when the year had expired and the subsidy ceased. On my second visit they had returned to their mountain homes, and I could see no possible inducement for them to do otherwise. The only attraction for them during the year was the fostering of their inbred 122 indolence, and it ought to have been evident that as soon as they had to depend on their own resources they would adopt their own way of living free of taxes, military service, and social restraint as being more congenial to their tastes. Being in the Bataan province some years ago, I rode across the mountain range to the opposite coast with a military friend. On our way we approached an agrito reel, and hearing strange noises and extraordinary calls, we stopped to consult as to the prudence of riding up to the settlement. We decided to go there, and were fortunate enough to be present at a wedding. The young bride, who might have been about 13 years of age, was being pursued by her future spouse as she pretended to run away, and it need hardly be said that he succeeded in bringing her in by feigned force. She struggled and again got away, and a second time she was caught. Then an old man with grey hair came forward and dragged the young man up a bamboo ladder. An old woman grasped the bride, and both followed the bridegroom. The aged sire then gave them a douche with a coconut shell full of water, and they all descended. The happy pair knelt down, and the elder having placed their heads together, they were man and wife. We endeavored to find out which hut was allotted to the newly married couple, but we were given to understand that until the sun had reappeared five times they would spend their honeymoon in the mountains. After the ceremony was concluded, several present began to make their usual mountain call. In the lowlands, the same peculiar cry serves to bring home straggling domestic animals to their nocturnal resting place. There is something picturesque about a well-formed, healthy Negrita damsel, with jet black piercing eyes, and her hair in one perfect ball of close curls. The men are not of a handsome type, some of them have a hale, swarthy appearance, but many of them present a sickly, emaciated aspect. A Negrita matron past thirty is perhaps one of the least attractive objects in humanity. They live principally on fish, roots, and mountain rice, but they occasionally make a raid on the neighboring valleys and carry off the herds. So great was their cattle-stealing propensity in Spanish times, that several semi-official expeditions were sent to punish the marauders, particularly on the Cordillera de Zimbals, on the west side of Luzon Island. The husbandry of the Negritos is the most primitive imaginable. 
it consists of scraping the surface of the earth without clearance of forest and throwing the seed. They never take up a piece of land, but so in the manner described wherever they may happen temporarily to settle. The Gadaints occupy the extreme NW corner of Luzon Island, and are entirely out of the pale of civilization. I have never heard 123 that any attempt has been made to subdue them. They have a fine physical bearing, wear the hair down to the shoulders, are of a very dark color, and feed chiefly on roots, mountain rice, game, fruits, and fish. They are considered the only really warlike and aggressively savage tribe of the north, and it is the custom of the young men about to marry to be with each other in presenting to the sires of their future brides all the scalps they are able to take from their enemies, as proof of their manly courage. This practice prevails at the season of the year when the tree, commonly called by the Spaniards the fire tree, is in bloom. The flowers of this tree are of a fire red hue, and their appearance is the signal for this race to collect their trophies of war and celebrate certain religious rites. When I was in the extreme north, in the country of the Ibanax III preparing my expedition to the Gadaines tribe, I was cautioned not to remain in the Gadaines country until the fire tree blossomed. The arms used by the Gadaines are frightful weapons long lances with tridented tips, and arrows pointed with two rows of teeth, made out of flint or sea shells. These weapons are used to kill both fish and foe. The Atavis inhabit the district to the south of that territory occupied by the Gadaints, and their mode of living and food are very similar. They are, however, not so fierce as the Gadaints, and if assaults are occasionally made on other tribes, it may be rather attributed to a desire to retaliate than to a love of bloodshed. Their skin is not so dark as that of their northern neighbors the Gadaints or the partially civilized Ibanax and their hair is shorter. The Igor roads are spread over a considerable portion of Luzon, principally from Enlat. 16 degrees 30 minutes to 18 degrees. They are, in general, a fine race of people, physically considered, but semi-barbarous and living in squalor. They wear their hair long. At the back it hangs down to the shoulders, whilst in front it is cut shorter and allowed to cover the forehead halfway like a long fringe. Some of them, settled in the districts of Lepinto and El Abra, have a little hair on the chin and upper lip. Their skin is of a dark copper tinge. They have flat noses, thick lips, high cheekbones, and their broad shoulders and limbs seem to denote great strength, but their form is not at all graceful. Like all the wild races of the Philippines, the Igor Rotes are indolent to the greatest degree. Their huts are built beehive fashion, and they creep into them like quadrupeds. Fields of sweet potatoes and sugar cane are under cultivation by them. They cannot be forced or persuaded to embrace the Western system of civilization. Adultery is little known, but if it occurs, the dowry is returned and the divorce settled. Polygamy seems to be permitted, but little practiced. Murders are 124 common, and if a member of one hut or family group is killed, that family avenges itself on one of the murderer's kinsmen, hence those who might have to pay the piper are interested in maintaining order. In the province of La Isabella, the Negrito and Igor Road tribes keep a regular DR and CR account of heads. In 1896 there were about 100,000 head hunting Igor Roads in the Bengay district. This tribe paid to the Spaniards a recognition of vassalage of one quarter of a peso per capita in Bengay, Abra, Bontoc, and Lapunto. Their aggressions on the coast settlers have been frequent for centuries past. From time to time they came down from their mountain retreat to steal cattle and effects belonging to the domesticated population. The first regular attempt to chastise them for these inroads, and afterwards gain their submission, was in the time of Governor Pedro de Arandia, 1754 to 59 when a plan was concerted to attack them simultaneously from all sides with 1080 men their ranches and crops were laid waste and many igor roads were taken prisoners but the ultimate idea of securing their allegiance was abandoned as an impossibility in 1881 general primo de rivera at the head of a large armed force invaded their district with the view of reducing them to obedience 
but the apparent result of the expedition was more detrimental than advantageous to the project of bringing this tribe under Spanish dominion and of opening up their country to trade and enlightened intercourse. Whilst the expeditionary forces were not sufficiently large or in a condition to carry on a war a outrance successfully, to be immediately followed up by a military system of government, on the other hand, the feeble efforts displayed to conquer them served only to demonstrate the impotence of the Europeans. This gave the tribes courage to defend their liberty, whilst the license indulged in by the white men at the expense of the mountaineers and boasted of to me personally by many Spanish officers had merely the effect of raising the veil from their protestations of goodwill towards the race they sought to subdue. The enterprise ignominiously failed, the costly undertaking was an inglorious and fruitless one, except to the general, who being under royal favor since, at Sagantá, in 1875, he pronounced for King Alfonso secured for himself the title of Count of La Union. The Igor Rhodes have, since then, been less approachable by Europeans, whom they naturally regard with every feeling of distrust. Rightly or wrongly, if it can be a matter of opinion, they fail to see any manifestation of ultimate advantage to themselves in the arrival of a troop of armed strangers who demand from them food, even though it be on payment, and perturbate their most intimate family ties. They do not appreciate being civilized to exchange their usages, independence, and comfort for even the highest post obtainable by a native in the 125 provinces, which then was practically that of local head servant to the district authority, under the name of municipal captain. To roam at large in their mountain home is far more enjoyable to them than having to wear clothes, to present themselves often, if not to habitually reside, in villages, to pay taxes, for which they would get little return not even the boon of good high roads and to act as unsalaried tax collectors with the chance of fine, punishment, and ruin if they did not succeed in bringing funds to the public treasury. An Igor Road Type, Luzon An Igor Road Type, Luzon As to Christianity, it would be as hard a task to convince them of what Roman Catholicism deems indispensable for the salvation of the soul, as it would be to convert all England to the teachings of Buddha although Buddhism is as logical a religion as Christianity. Just a few of them, inhabiting the lowlands in the neighborhood of Vigan and other Christian towns, received baptism and paid an annual tribute of half a peso from the year 1893 to 1896. Being in Tegegarau, the capital of Cagayan province, about 60 miles up the Rio Grande, I went to visit the prisons, where I saw many of the worst types of Igor Rhodes. I was told that a priest who had endeavored to teach them the precepts of Christianity, and had explained to them the marvelous life of Saint Augustine, was dismayed to hear an Igor Rhodes exclaim that no colored man ever became a white man's saint. Nothing could convince him that an exception to the rule might be possible. Could experience have revealed to him the established fact the remarkable anomaly that the grossest forms of immorality were only to be found in the trail of the highest order of white man's civilization? The Igor Rhodes have worked the copper mines of their region for generations past, in their own primitive way, with astonishing results. They not only annually barter several tons of copper ingots, but they possess the art of manufacturing pots, cauldrons, tobacco pipes, and other utensils made of that metal. They also understand the extraction of gold, which they obtain in very small quantities by crushing the quartz between heavy stones. Specimens of the different tribes and races of these islands were on view at the Philippine exhibition held in Madrid in 1887. Some of them consented to receive Christian baptism before returning home, but it was publicly stated that the Igor Rotes were among those who positively refused to abandon their own belief. A selection of this tribe was included in the Filipinos on show at the San Luis Exhibition, USA, in 1904, and attracted particular attention. Some of them liked the United States so much that they tried hard to break away from their keepers in order to remain there. The Kalinas are a branch of the Igor Rhodes, found along the Cagayan River around Iligan. They are not only head hunters, but cannibals. A friend of mine, an American colonel, was up there some 126 time during the war, and explained to me the difficulty he had in convincing a Kalinga chief that a man's head is his personal property, and that to steal it is a crime. 
The Igoro Chinese are supposed to be the descendants of the Chinese who fled to the hills on the departure of the Corsair Limahong from Ponga Sinan province in 1754, Vidi P50. Their intermarriage with the Igoro tribe has generated a caste of people quite unique in their character. Their habits are much the same as those of the pure Igor Rots, but with their fierce nature is blended the cunning and astuteness of the Mongol, and although their intelligence may be often misapplied, yet it is superior to that of the pure Igor Rot. In the province of Ponga Sinan there are numbers of natives of Chinese descent included in the domesticated population, and their origin is evidently due to the circumstances mentioned. The Tingulans inhabit principally the district of El Abra, NW Coast, Luzon is. They were nominally under the control of the Spanish government, who appointed their headmen petty governors of villages or ranches on the system adopted in the subdued districts. According to Father Ferrando, 63 years ago, the form of oath taken in his presence by the newly elected headman on receiving the staff of office was the following, viz colon may a pernicious wind touch me, may a flash of lightning kill me, and may the alligator catch me asleep if I fail to fulfill my duty. The headman presented himself almost when he chose to the nearest Spanish governor, who gave him his orders, which were only fulfilled according to the traditional custom of the tribe. Thus, the headman, on his return to the ranch, delegated his powers to the council of elders, and according to their decision he acted as the executive only. Whenever it was possible, they applied their own lex non scripta in preference to acting upon the Spanish code. According to their law, the crime of adultery is punished by a fine of 30 pesos value and divorce, but if the adultery has been mutual, the divorce is pronounced absolute, without the payment of a fine. When a man is brought to justice on an accusation which he denies, a handful of straw is burnt in his presence. He is made to hold up an earthenware pot and say as follows May my belly be converted into a pot like this, if I have committed the deed attributed to me. If the transformation does not take place at once, he is declared to be innocent. The Tinguins are pagans, but have no temples. Their gods are hidden in the mountain cavities. Like many other religionists, they believe in the efficacy of prayer for the supply of their material wants. Hence if there be too great an abundance of rain, or too little of it, or an epidemic disease raging, or any calamity affecting the community in general, the anatos, images representing the gods or saints, are 127 carried round and exhorted, whilst nature continues her uninterrupted course. The minister of Anato is also appealed to when a child is to be named. The infant is carried into the woods, and the pagan priest pronounces the name, whilst he raises a bowie knife over the newborn creature's head. On lowering the knife, he strikes at a tree. If the tree emits sap, the first name uttered stands good, if not, the ceremony is repeated, and each time the name is changed until the oozing sap denotes the will of the deity. The Tinguins are monogamists, and generally are forced by the parents to marry before the age of puberty, but the bridegroom, or his father or elder, has to purchase the bride at a price mutually agreed upon by the relations. These people live in cabins on posts or trees 60 to 70 feet from the ground, and defend themselves from the attacks of their traditional enemies, the Guinans, by heaving stones upon them. Nevertheless, in the more secure vicinities of the Christian villages, these people build their huts similar to those of the domesticated natives. From the doors and window openings skulls of buffaloes and horses are hung as talismans. Physically they are of fine form, and the nose is aquiline. They wear the hair in a tuft on the crown, like the Japanese, but their features are similar to the ordinary lowland native. They are fond of music and personal ornaments. They tattoo themselves and black their teeth, and for these, and many other reasons, it is conjectured that they descend from the Japanese shipwrecked crews who, being without means at hand with which to return to their country, took to the mountains inland from the west coast of Luzon. I spent several months with this tribe, but I have never seen a Tinguian with a bow and arrow, they carry the lance as the common weapon, and for hunting and spearing fish. Their conversion to Christianity has proved to be an impossible task. A Royal Decree of Ferdinand VI. Dated in Aranjuez, June 18, 
1758, sets forth that the infidels called Tinguians, Igor Rotes, and by other names who should accept Christian baptism, should be exempt all their lives from the payment of tribute and forced labor. Their offspring, however, born to them after receiving baptism, would lose these privileges as well as the independence enjoyed by their forefathers. This penalty to future generations for becoming Christians was afterwards extended to all the undomesticated races. Many of these tribes did a little barter traffic with the Chinese, but with the hope that necessity would bring them down to the Christian villages to procure commodities, and thus become socialized the government prohibited this trade in 1886. The Tinguians appear to be as intelligent as the ordinary subdued natives. They are by no means savages, and they are not entirely strangers to domestic life. A great many Christian families of El Abra 128 and Ilico Sur are of Tinguian origin, and I may mention here that the Ilocano-dominated natives have the just reputation of being the most industrious Philippine people. For this reason, Ilocano servants and workmen are sought for in preference to most others. A Tagalog girl A Tagalog girl The Bazans are a very timid people who inhabit the mountains of Mindoro Island. They have long, lank hair and whitish faces, and do not appear to be of one of the original races. They are occasionally met with, when they do not hide themselves, in the Cordillera which runs northwest to southeast and then ends off in two spurs, between which, after passing Mount Halcon, there is a large valley leading to the southern shore. The Mangians, another Mindoro wild tribe, come to the coast villages sometimes to barter, and bring pieces of gold for the purpose. They also wear gold jewelry made of the metal extracted by themselves. There is another race of people whose source is not distinctly known, but, according to tradition, they descend from the sepoys who formed part of the troops under British command during the military occupation of Manila in 1763, Vidi P88. The legend is, that these Hindus, having deserted from the British army, migrated up the Pasig River. However that may be, the sharp-featured, black-skinned settlers in the Barrio de Dayap, of Cainta Town, Morong District, are decidedly of a different stock to the ordinary native. The notable physical differences are the fine aquiline nose, bright expression, and regular features. They are Christians far more laborious than the Philippine natives, and are a law-abiding people. I have known many of them personally for years. They were the only class who voluntarily presented themselves to pay the taxes to the Spaniards, and yet, on the ground that generations ago they were intruders on the soil, they were more heavily laden with imposts than their fellow neighbors until the abolition of tribute in 1884. A pagan type, Mindanao. A pagan type, Mindanao. There are also to be seen in these islands a few types of that class of tropical inhabitant, preternaturally possessed of a white skin and extremely fair hair sometimes red known as albinos. I leave it to physiologists to elucidate the peculiarity of vital phenomena in these unfortunate abnormities of nature. Amongst others, I once saw in Negro's Island a hapless young albino girl, with marble white skin and very light pink white hair, who was totally blind in the sunny hours of the day. The Mahometan and other tribes, inhabiting the Sulu Sultanate, Mindanao, Palawan, Paragua, and the adjacent islands of the south constituting Moro land, are described in chapters X and XXIX 129 1 in old writings, laws, and documents, and in ordinary parlance up to the evacuation by the Spaniards in 1898, the inhabitants of these islands, civilized or uncivilized, were almost invariably referred to as indios, indigenas, naturals, mestizos, espanols, filipinos, etc., the term Filipino being seldom used. The revolution of 1896 generalized the appellation Filipino now in common use. Throughout this work, Filipino is taken as the substantive and Philippine as the adjective, that being the correct English form. The Americans, however, use Filipino both substantively and adjectively. Two for an exhaustive treatise on this subject the reader is recommended to peruse A. R. Wallace's The Malay Archipelago. Published in London, 1869. 
3. The Ibanaks are the ordinary domesticated natives inhabiting the extreme north of Luzon and the banks of the Rio Grande de Cagayan for some miles up. Some of them have almost black skins. I found them very manageable. Mahometans and southern tribes simultaneously with the Spanish conquest of the Philippines, two Borneo chiefs, who were brothers, quarreled about their respective possessions, and one of them had to flee. His partisans joined him, and they emigrated to the island of Basilan one situated to the south of Samboanga, Mindanao is. The Moros, as they are called in the islands, are therefore supposed to be descended from the Mahometan Dayaks of Borneo. They were a valiant, warlike, piratical people, who admired bravery in others had a deep-rooted contempt for poltroons, and lavished no mercy on the weak. In the suite of this emigrant chief, called Pagian Tindig, Cato his cousin Adeseolan, who was so captivated by the fertility of Basilan Island that he wished to remain there, so Tindig left him in possession and withdrew to Sulu Island, where he easily reduced the natives to vassalage, for they had never yet had to encounter so powerful a foe. So famous did Pagian Tindig become that, for generations afterwards, the sultans of Sulu were proud of their descent from such a celebrated hero. After the Spaniards had pacified the great Butuan chief on the north coast of Mindanao, Tindig consented to acknowledge the suzerainty of their king, in exchange for undisturbed possession of the realm which he had just founded. Adeseolan espoused the princess Pagian Gon, daughter of Demesangay, king of Mindanao, by his wife Mbog, a Sulu woman, and with this relationship he embraced the Mahometan faith. His ambition increased as good fortune came to him, and, stimulated by the promised support of his father-in-law, he invaded Sulu, attacked his cousin Tindig, and attempted to murder him in order to annex his kingdom. A short but fierce contest ensued. Tindig's fortified dwelling was besieged in vain. The posts which supported the upper story were greased with oil, and an entrance could not be effected. Wearied of his failures, Adeseolan retired from the enterprise, and Tindig, in turn, declared war on the Basilan king after he had been to 130 Manila to solicit assistance from his Spanish suzerain's representative, who sent two armed boats to support him. When Tindig, on his return from Manila, arrived within sight of Sulu, his anxious subjects rallied round him, and prepared for battle. The two armed boats furnished by the Spaniards were on the way, but, as yet, too far off to render help, so Adeseolan immediately fell upon Tindig's party and completely routed them. Tindig himself died bravely, fighting to the last moment, and the Spaniards, having no one to fight for when they arrived, returned to Manila with their armed boats. Adeseolan, however, did not annex the territory of his defeated cousin. Raja Bangso succeeded Tindig in the government of Sulu, and when old age enfeebled him, he was wont to show with pride the scars inflicted on him during the War of Independence. Adeseolan then made alliances with Mindanao and Borneo people, and introduced the Mahometan religion into Sulu. Since then, Sulu, called Holo, by the Spaniards, has become the Mecca of the southern archipelago. Point to the earliest records relating to Mindanao Island, since the Spanish annexation of the Philippines show that about the year 1594 a rich Portuguese cavalier of noble birth, named Estevan Rodriguez, who had acquired a large fortune in the Philippines, and who had a wealthy brother in Mexico, proposed to the governor Pérez das Marinas the conquest of this island. For this purpose he offered his person and all his means, but having long waited in vain to obtain the royal sanction to his project, he prepared to leave for Mexico, disgusted and disappointed. He was on the point of starting for New Spain, he had his ship laden and his family on board, when the royal confirmation arrived with the new governor, Dr. Antonio Morga, 1595-96. Therefore he changed his plans, but dispatched the laden ship to Mexico with the cargo, intending to employ the profits of the venture in the prosecution of his Mindanao enterprise. With the title of general, he and his family, together with three chaplain priests, started in another vessel for the south. They put in at Otong, Panay is, on the way, and left there in April, 
1596. Having reached the great Mindanao River, Rio Grande, the ship went up it as far as Boyan, in the territory of the chief Silonan. A party under Juan de la Jara, the Maestre de Campo, was sent ashore to reconnoitre the environs. Their delay in returning caused alarm, so the general buckled on his shield, and, with sword in hand, disembarked, accompanied by a Cebuano servant and two Spaniards, carrying lances. On the way they met a native, who raised his campolan to deal a blow, which the general received on his shield, and cut down the foe to the waist. 131 Then they encountered another, who clove the general's head almost in two, causing his death in six hours. The Cebuano at once ran the native through with a lance. This brave was discovered to be the youngest brother of the chief Silonan, who had sworn to Muhammad to sacrifice his life to take that of the Castilian invader. The general's corpse was sent to Manila for interment. The expedition led by the Maestre de Campo fared badly, one of the party being killed, another seriously wounded, and the rest fleeing on board. The next day it was decided to construct trenches at the mouth of the river, where the camp was established. The command was taken by the Maestre de Campo, whose chief exploit seems to have been that he made love to the deceased general's widow and proposed marriage to her, which she indignantly rejected. Nothing was gained by the expedition, and after the last priest died, the project was abandoned and the vessel returned to Cebu. In 1638 another expedition against the Moros was headed by the government general Sebastian Hurtado de Corcuera, who made the first landing of troops in Sulu Island on April 17 of that year. He also established some military posts on the coast of Mindanao Island, one of which was Sampania, now called Malabang, on the Ilana Bay shore. Four years afterwards it was abandoned until 1891, when General Whaler went there and had a fort built, which still exists. It would appear that all over these islands the strong preyed on the weak, and the boldest warrior or oppressor assumed the title of Sultan, Ditto, etc., over all the territory he could dominate, making the dignity hereditary. So far as can be ascertained, one of the oldest titles was that of Prince of Sabugi, whose territory was situated on the bay of that name which washes the N.E. coast of Samboanga province. The title fell into disuse, and the grandson of the last prince, the present Mangigan, or Sultan of Mindanao, resides at Dinas. The Sultanate dates from the year 1640, but, in reality, there never was a Sultan with effective jurisdiction over the whole island, as the title would seem to imply. The Sultan's heir is styled the Rajamuta. The alliances effected between the Sulu and Mindanao potentates gave a great stimulus to piracy, which hitherto had been confined to the waters in the locality of those islands. It now spread over the whole of the Philippine archipelago, and was prosecuted with great vigor by regular organized fleets, carrying weapons almost equal to those of the Spaniards. In meddling with the Mahometan territories the Spaniards may be said to have unconsciously lighted on a hornet's nest. Their eagerness for conquest stirred up the implacable hatred of the Mahometan for the Christian, and they unwittingly brought woe upon their own heads for many generations. Indeed, if half the consequences could have been foreseen, they surely never would have attempted to gain what, up to their last day, they 132 failed to secure, namely, the complete conquest of Mindanao and the Sulu Sultanate. Weapons of the Moros Weapons of the Moros Left, Barong, right, Chris, center, the Sultan of Sulu's dress sword, presented to the author by His Excellency. For over two and a half centuries Mahometan war junks ravaged every coast of the colony. Not a single peopled island was spared. Thousands of the inhabitants were murdered, whilst others were carried into slavery for years. Villages were sacked, the churches were looted, local trade was intercepted, the natives subject to Spain were driven into the highlands, and many even dared not risk their lives and goods near the coasts. The utmost desolation and havoc were perpetrated, and militate vastly against the welfare and development of the colony. For four years the government had to remit the payment of tribute in Negros Island, and the others lying between it and Luzon, 
on account of the abject poverty of the natives, due to these raids. From the time the Spaniards first interfered with the Mahometans there was continual warfare. Expeditions against the pirates were constantly being fitted out by each succeeding governor. Piracy was indeed an incessant scourge and plague on the colony, and it cost the Spaniards rivers of blood and millions of dollars only to keep it in check. In the last century the Mahometans appeared even in the Bay of Manila. I was acquainted with several persons who had been in Mahometan captivity. There were then hundreds who still remembered, with anguish, the insecurity to which their lives and properties were exposed. The Spaniards were quite unable to cope with such a prodigious calamity. The coast villagers built forts for their own defense, and many an old stone watchtower is still to be seen on the island south of Luzon. On several occasions the Christian natives were urged, by the inducement of spoil, to equip corsairs, with which to retaliate on the indomitable marauders. The Sulu people made captive the Christian natives and Spaniards alike, whilst a Spanish priest was a choice prize. And whilst Spaniards in Philippine waters were straining every nerve to extirpate slavery, their countrymen were diligently pursuing a profitable trade in it between the west coast of Africa and Cuba. One must admit that, indirectly, the Mahometan attacks had the good political effect of forcing hundreds of Christians up from the coast to people and cultivate the interior of these islands. Due to the enterprise of a few Spanish and foreign merchants, steamers at length began to navigate the waters of the archipelago, provided with arms for defense, and piracy by Mahometans beyond their own locality was doomed. In the time of government general Norzagare, 1857 to 60, 18 steam gunboats were ordered out, and arrived in 1860, putting a close forever to this epoch of misery, bloodshed, and material loss. The end of piracy brought repose to the colony, and in no small degree facilitated its social advancement. During the protracted struggle with the Mahometans, Samboanga, Mindanao is, was fortified, and became the headquarters of the 133 Spaniards in the south. After Cavita it was the chief naval station, and a penitentiary was also established there. Point three, its maintenance was a great burden to the treasury its existence a great eyesore to the enemy, whose hostility was much inflamed thereby. About the year 1635 its abandonment was proposed by the military party, who described it as only a sepulchre for Spaniards. The Jesuits, however, urged its continuance, as it suited their interests to have material support close at hand, and their influence prevailed in Manila bureaucratic centers. In 1738 the fixed annual expenses of Samboanga Fort and equipment were 17,500 pesos, and the incidental disbursements were estimated at 7,500 pesos. These sums did not include the cost of scores of armed fleets which, at enormous expense, were sent out against the Mahometans to little purpose. Each new, Samboanga, governor of a martial spirit, and desiring to do something to establish or confirm his fame for prowess, seemed to regard it as a kind of duty to premise the quelling of imaginary troubles in Sulu and Mindanao. Some, with less patriotism than selfishness, found a ready excuse for filling their own pockets by the proceeds of warfare, in making feigned efforts to rescue captives. It may be observed, in extenuation, that, in those days, the Spaniards believed from their birth that none but a Christian had rights, whilst some were deluded by a conscientious impression that they were executing a high mission, myth as it was, it at least served to give them courage in their perilous undertakings. Peace was made and broken over and over again. Spanish forts were at times established in Sulu, and afterwards demolished. Every decade brought new devices to control the desperate foe. Several governors general headed the troops in person against the Mahometans with temporary success, but without any lasting effect, and almost every new governor made a solemn treaty with one powerful chief or another, which was respected only as long as it suited both parties. This continued campaign, the details of which are too prolix for insertion here, may be qualified as a religious war, for Roman Catholic priests took an active part in the operations with the same ardent passion as the Mahometans themselves. 
Among these Tunzured warriors who acquired great fame out of their profession may be mentioned Father Ducos, the son of a colonel, José Villanueva, and Pedro de San Agustín, the last being known, with dread, by the Mahometans in the beginning of the 17th century under the title of the Captain Priest. One of the most renowned kings in Mindanao was Cacal Coralat, an astute, far-seeing chieftain, who ably defended the independence of his territory, and kept the Spaniards at bay during the whole of his manhood. An interesting event in the Spanish Sulu history is the visit of 134 the Sultan Muhammad Ali Mutin to the government general in 1750, and his subsequent vicissitudes of fortune. The first royal dispatch addressed by the King of Spain to the Sultan of Sulu was dated in Bun Retiro, July 12, 1744, and everything, for the time being, seemed to augur a period of peace. In 1749, however, the Sultan was violently deposed by an ambitious brother, Prince Bant Elon, and the Sultan forthwith went to Manila to seek the aid of his suzerain's delegate, the government general of the Philippines, who chanced to be the Bishop of Nueva Segovia. In Manila the priest governor cajoled his guest with presents, and accompanied him on horseback and on foot, with the design of persuading him to renounce his religion in favor of Christianity. The Sultan finally yielded, and avowed his intention to receive baptism. Among the friars an animated discussion ensued as to the propriety of this act, special opposition being raised by the Jesuits, but in the end the Sultan, with a number of his suite, outwardly embraced the Christian faith. The Sultan at his baptism received the name of Ferdinand I of Sulu, at the same time he was invested with the insignia and grade of a Spanish lieutenant general. Great ceremonies and magnificent feasts followed this unprecedented incident. He was visited and congratulated by all the elite of the capital. By proclamation, the festivities included four days illumination, three days procession of the giants for three days of bullfighting, four nights of fireworks, and three nights of comedy, to terminate with high mass, a te deum, and special sermon for the occasion. In the meantime, the Sultan had requested the governor to have the crown prince, princesses, and retainers escorted to Manila to learn Spanish manners and customs, and on their arrival the Sultan and his male and female suite numbered 60 persons. The bishop governor defrayed the cost of their maintenance out of his private purse until after the baptism, and thenceforth the government supported them in Manila for two years. At length it was resolved, according to appearances, to restore the Sultan Ferdinand I to his throne. With that idea, he and his retinue quitted Manila in the Spanish frigate San Fernando, which was convoyed by another frigate and a galley, until the San Fernando fell in with bad weather off Mindoro Island, and had to make the port of Calapan. Thence he proceeded to Iloilo, where he changed vessel and set sail for Samboanga, but contrary winds carried him to Dapitan, NW coast of Mindanao is, where he landed and put off again in a small Visayan craft for Samboanga, arriving there on July 12, 1751. Thirteen days afterwards the San Fernando, which had been repaired, reached Samboanga also. Before Ferdinand I left Manila he had, at the instance of the Spanish government general, José de Abando, 1750-54, addressed a letter to 135 Sultan Mohammed Amirabdin, of Mindanao. The original was written by Ferdinand I in Arabic, a version in Spanish was dictated by him, and both were signed by him. These documents reached the governor of Samboanga by the San Fernando, but he had the original in Arabic retranslated, and found that it did not at all agree with the Sultan's Spanish rendering. The translation of the Arabic runs thus I shall be glad to know that the Sultan Mohammed Amirabdin and all his chiefs, male and female, are well. I do not write a lengthy letter, as I intended, because I simply wish to give you to understand, in case the Sultan or his chiefs and others should feel aggrieved at my writing this letter in this manner, that I do so under pressure, being under foreign dominion, and I am compelled to obey whatever they tell me to do, and I have to say what they tell me to say. Thus the governor has ordered me to write to you in our style and language, therefore, do not understand that I am writing you on my own behalf, but because I am ordered to do so, and I have nothing more to add.
written in the year 1164 on the ninth day of the Rubelager moon, Ferdinand I, King of Sulu, who seals with his own seal. This letter was pronounced treasonable. Impressed with, or feigning, this idea, the Spaniards saw real or imaginary indications of a design on the part of the Sultan to throw off the foreign yoke at the first opportunity. All his acts were thus interpreted, although no positive proof was manifest, and the governor communicated his suspicions to Manila. There is no explanation why the Spaniards detained the Sultan at Samboanga, unless with the intention of trumping up accusations against him. The Sultan arrived there on July 12, and nothing was known of the discrepancy between the letters until after July 25. To suppose that the Sultan could ever return to reign peacefully as a Christian over Mahometan subjects was utterly absurd to any rational mind. On August 3 the Sultan, his sons, vassals and chiefs were all cast into prison, without opposition, and a letter was dispatched, dated August 6, 1751, to the governor in Manila, stating the cause. The Sultan was the first individual arrested, and he made no difficulty about going to the fort. Even the princessin, the Sultan's brother, who had voluntarily come from Sulu in apparent good faith with friendly overtures to the Spaniards, was included among the prisoners. The reason assigned was, that he had failed to surrender Christian captives as provided. The prisoners, besides the Sultan, were the following, viz. Colon four sons of the Sultan. Princessin, brother. Prince Mustafa, son-in-law. Princess Pangian Bonquiling, sister. Four princesses, daughters. Dato Yamudin, a noble. 160 ordinary male and female retainers. Five brothers-in-law. One Mahometan sheriff. Seven Mahometan priests. Concubines with 32 female servants. 136 The political or other crime, if any, attributed to these last is not stated, nor why they were imprisoned. The few weapons brought, according to custom, by the followers of the Sultan who had come from Sulu to receive their liege lord and escort him back to his country, were also seized. A decree of Government General Jose de Obando set forth the following accusations against the prisoners, viz. Colon, 1, that Princessin had not surrendered captives. 2, that whilst the Sultan was in Manila, new captives were made by the party who expelled him from the throne. 3, that the number of arms brought to Samboanga by Sulu chiefs was excessive. 4, that the letter to Sultan Mohammed Amirabdin insinuated help wanted against the Spaniards. 5, that several Mahometan, but no Christian books were found in the Sultan's baggage. 6, that during the journey to Samboanga he had refused to pray in Christian form. 7, that he had only attended Mass twice. 8, that he had celebrated Mahometan rites, sacrificing a goat, and had given evidence in a hundred ways of being a Mahometan. 9, that his conversation generally denoted a want of attachment to the Spaniards, and a contempt for their treatment of him in Manila 5 and, 10, that he still cohabited with his concubines, contrary to Christian usage. The greatest stress was laid on the recovery of the captive Christians, and the government general admitted that although the mission of the fleet was to restore the Sultan to the throne, which, by the way, does not appear to have been attempted, the principal object was the rescue of Christian slaves. He therefore proposed that the liberty of the imprisoned nobles and chiefs should be bartered at the rate of 500 Christian slaves for each one of the chiefs and nobles, and the balance of the captives for princes and the clergy. One may surmise, from this condition, that the number of Christians in captivity was very considerable. A subsequent decree, dated in Manila December 21, 1751, ordered the extermination of the Mahometans with fire and sword, the fitting out of Visayan corsairs, with authority to extinguish the foe, burn all that was combustible, destroy the crops, desolate their cultivated land, make captives, and recover Christian slaves. One fifth of the spoil, the real quinto, was to belong to the king, and the natives were to be exempt from the payment of tribute whilst so engaged. Before giving effect to such a terrible, but impracticable resolution, 
it was thought expedient to publish a pamphlet styled a historical manifest, in which the government general professed to justify his acts for public satisfaction. However, public opinion in Manila was averse to the intended warfare, so to make it more popular, the governor 137 abolished the payment of one-fifth of the booty to the king. An appeal was made to the citizens of Manila for arms and provisions to carry on the campaign, they therefore lent or gave the following, viz. 26 guns, 13 bayonets, 3 sporting guns, 15 carbines, 5 blunderbusses, 7 braces of pistols, 23 swords, 15 lances, 900 cannonballs, and 150 pesos from Spaniards, and a few lances and 188 pesos from natives. Meanwhile, Princessin died of grief at his position. Under the leadership of the Maestre de Campo of Samboanga, hostilities commenced. With several ships he proceeded to Sulu, carrying a large armament and 1,900 men. When the squadron anchored off Sulu, a white and a red flag were hoisted from the principal fort, for the Spaniards to elect either peace or war. Several Sulus approached the fleet with white flags, to inquire for the Sultan. Evasive answers were given, followed by a sudden cannonade. No good resulted to the Spaniards from the attack, for the Sulus defended themselves admirably. Ta'ai Ta'ai Island was next assaulted. A captain landed there with troops, but their retreat was cut off and they were all slain. The commander of the expedition was so discouraged that he returned to Samboanga and resigned. Pedro Gustamba then took command, but after having attacked Basilan Island fruitlessly, he retired to Samboanga. The whole campaign was an entire fiasco. It was a great mistake to have declared a war of extermination without having the means to carry it out. The result was that the irate Sulus organized a guerrilla warfare, by sea and by land, against all Christians, to which the Spaniards but feebly responded. The tables were turned. In fact, they were in great straits, and, wearied at the little success of their arms, endless councils and discussions were held in the capital. Meanwhile, almost every coast of the archipelago was energetically ravaged. Hitherto the Spaniards had only had the Sulus to contend with, but the license given by the government general to reprisal excited the cupidity of unscrupulous officials, and, without apparent right or reason, the Maestre de Campo of Samboanga caused a Chinese junk from Amoy, carrying goods to a friendly sultan of Mindanao, to be seized. After tedious delay, vexation, and privation, the master and his crew were released and a part of the cargo restored, but the Maestre de Campo insisted upon retaining what he chose for his own use. This treachery to an amicable chief exasperated and undeceived the Mindanao Sultan to such a degree that he forthwith took his revenge by cooperating with the Sulus in making war on the Spaniards. Fresh fleets of armed canoes replenished the Sulu armadillas, ravaged the coasts, hunted down the Spanish priests, and made captives. On the north coast of Mindanao several battles took place. There is a legend that over 600 Mahometans advanced to the village of Lubungan, but were repulsed by the villagers, who declared their 138 patron, St. James, appeared on horseback to help them. Fray Roque de Santa Monica was chased from place to place, hiding in caves and rocks. Being again met by four Mahometans, he threatened them with a blunderbuss, and was left unmolested. Eventually he was found by friendly natives, and taken by them to a wood, where he lived on roots. Thence he journeyed to Linneo, became raving mad, and was sent to Manila, where he died quite frantic, in the convent of his order. The Sultan and his fellow prisoners had been conveyed to Manila and lodged in the fortress of Santiago. In 1753 he petitioned the government general to allow his daughter, the Princess Fatima, and two slaves to go to Sulu about his private affairs. A permit was granted on condition of her returning, or, in exchange for her liberty and that of her two slaves, to remit fifty captives, and, failing to do either, the Sultan and his suite were to be deprived of their dignities and treated as common slaves, to work in the galleys, and to be undistinguished among the ordinary prisoners. On these conditions, the princess left, and forwarded fifty slaves, 
and one more a Spaniard, José de Montesinos as a present. The Princess Fatima, nevertheless, did return to Manila, bringing with her an ambassador from Prince Bantilan, her uncle and governor of Sulu, who, in the meantime, had assumed the title of Sultan Muhammad Mayuthuddin. The ambassador was Prince Muhammad Ismail de Tomarealela. After an audience with the governor, he went to the fort to consult with the captive sultan, and they proposed a treaty with the governor, of which the chief terms were as follows, viz. an offensive and defensive alliance. All captives within the Sultanate of Sulu to be surrendered within one year. All articles looted from the churches to be restored within one year. On the fulfillment of these conditions, the Sultan and his people were to be set at liberty. The treaty was dated in Manila March 3, 1754. The terms were quite impossible of accomplishment, for the Sultan, being still in prison, had no power to enforce commands on his subjects. The war was continued at great sacrifice to the state and with little benefit to the Spaniards, whilst their operations were greatly retarded by discord between the officials of the expedition, the authorities on shore, and the priests. At the same time, dilatory proceedings were being taken against the Maestre de Campo of Samboanga, who was charged with having appropriated to himself others' share of the war booty. Sire Gao Island, off the N.E. point of Mindanao is, had been completely overrun by the Mohammedans, the villages and cultivated land were laid waste, and the Spanish priest was killed. When the governor Pedro de Arandia arrived in 1754, the sultan took advantage of the occasion to put his case before him. He had, indeed, experienced some of the strangest mutations of fortune, and 139 Arandia had compassion on him. By Arandia's persuasion, the archbishop visited and spiritually examined him, and then the sultan confessed and took the communion. In the college of Santa Potenciana there was a Mahometan woman who had been a concubine of the sultan, but who now professed Christianity, and had taken the name of Rita Calderon. The sultan's wife having died, he asked for this ex-concubine in marriage, and the favor was conceded to him. The nuptials were celebrated in the governor's palace on April 27, 1755, and the espoused couple returned to their prison with an allowance of 50 pesos per month for their maintenance. In 1755 all the sultan's relations and suite who had been incarcerated in Manila, except his son Ismail and a few chiefs, were sent back to Sulu. The sultan and his chiefs were then allowed to live freely within the city of Manila, after having sworn before the governor, on bended knees, to pay homage to him, and to remain peaceful during the king's pleasure. Indeed, Governor Arandia was so favorably disposed towards the Sultan Muhammad Ali Mutin, Ferdinand I, that personally he was willing to restore him to his throne, but his wish only brought him in collision with the clergy, and he desisted. The British, after the military occupation of Manila in 1763, took up the cause of the Sultan, and reinstated him in Sulu. Then he avenged himself on the Spaniards by fomenting incursions against them in Mindanao, which the government general, José Ruin, was unable to oppose for want of resources. The Mohammedans, however, soon proved their untrustworthiness to friend and foe alike. Their friendship lasted on the one side so long as danger could thereby be averted from the other, and a certain Dato Teng Teng attacked the British garrison one night at Balambangan and slaughtered all but six of the troops. Vidi pages 92, 98. In 1836 the sovereignty of the Sultan was distinctly recognized in a treaty made between him and Spain, whereby the Sultan had the right to collect dues on Spanish craft entering Holo, whilst Sulu vessels paid dues to the Spaniards in their ports as foreign vessels. In 1844 Government General Narciso Claveria led an expedition against the Moros and had a desperate, but victorious, struggle with them at the fort of Balanguigi, an islet 14 miles due east of Sulu is, for which he was rewarded with the title of Conde de Manila. The town of Sulu, Holo, was formerly the residence of the Sultan's court. This sovereign had arrogantly refused to check the piratical cruisings made by his people against Spanish subjects in the locality and about the islands of Colombians, therefore, on February 11, 1851, General Antonio de Urbistondo, 
Marquis de la Solana, an ex Carlist chief, who had been appointed government general of the Philippines in the previous year, undertook to redress his nation's grievances by force. The Spanish flag was hoisted in several places. Sulu town, which was shelled by the gunboats, was captured and held by the 140 invaders, and the Sultan Mohammed Pulalan fled to Maybun on the south coast, to which place the court was permanently removed. At the close of this expedition another treaty was signed, 1851, which provided for the annual payment of 1,500 Cuban pesos to the Sultan and 600 Cuban pesos each to three ditos, on condition that they would suppress piracy and promote mutual trade. Still the Mahometans paid the Spaniards an occasional visit and massacred the garrison, which was as often replaced by fresh levies. In 1876 the incursions of the Mahometans and the temerity of the chiefs had again attained such proportions that European dominion over the Sulu Sultanate and Mindanao, even in the nominal form in which it existed, was sorely menaced. Consequent on this, an expedition, headed by Vice Admiral Mal Campo, arrived in the waters of the Sultanate, carrying troops, with the design of enforcing submission. The chief of the land forces appears to have had no topographical plan formed. The expedition turned out to be one of discovery. The troops were marched into the interior, without their officers knowing where they were going, and they even had to depend on Sulu guides. Naturally, they were often deceived, and led to precisely where the Mahometans were awaiting them in ambush, the result being that great havoc was made in the advance column by frequent surprises. Now and again would appear a few Juramantadus, or sworn Mahometans, who sought their way to Allah by the sacrifice of their own blood, but causing considerable destruction to the invading party. With a kris at the waist, a javelin in one hand, and a shield supported by the other, they would advance before the enemy, dart forward and backwards, make zigzag movements, and then, with a war hoop, rush in three or four at a time upon a body of Christians twenty times their number, giving no quarter, expecting none to die, or to conquer. The expedition was not a failure, but it gained little. The Spanish flag was hoisted in several places, including Sulu, Holo, where it remained from February 29, 1876, until the Spanish evacuation of the islands in 1898. The Mahometans, called by the Spaniards Moros, now extend over nine-tenths of Mindanao Island, and the whole of the Sultanate of Sulu, which comprises Sulu Island, 34 miles long from E to W, and 12 miles in the broadest part from N to S, and about 140 others, 80 to 90 of which are uninhabited. The native population of the Sulu Sultanate alone would be about 100,000, including free people, slaves, and some 20,000 men at arms under orders of the Ditos. Point six, the domains of His Highness reach westward as far as Borneo, where, up to 25 years ago, the Sultanate of 141 Brunei 7 was actually tributary, and now nominally so, to that of Sulu. The Sultan of Sulu is also feudal lord of two vassal sultanates in Mindanao Island. There is, moreover, a half-caste branch of these people in the southern half of Palawan Island, Paragua, of a very subdued and peaceful nature, compared with the Sulu, nominally under the Sulu Sultan's rule. In Mindanao Island only a small coast district here and there was really under Spanish Empire, although Spain, by virtue of an old treaty, which never was respected to the letter, claimed Susi Ainti over all the territory subject to the Sultan of Sulu. After the Sulu War of 1876 the Sultan admitted the claim more formally, and on March 11, 1877, a protocol was signed by England and Germany recognizing Spain's rights to the Ta'i Ta'i group and the chain of islands stretching from Sulu to Borneo. At the same time it was understood that Spain would give visible proof of annexation by establishing military posts, or occupying these islands in some way, but nothing was done until 1880, when Spain was stirred into action by a report that the Germans projected a settlement there. A convict corps at once took possession, military posts were established, and in 1882 the 6th Regiment of Regular Troops was quartered in the group at Bongao and Siasi. Meanwhile, in 1880, 
a foreign colonizing company was formed in the Sultanate of Brunei, under the title of British North Borneoco. Royal Charter of November 7, 1881. The company recognized the suzerain rights of the Sultan of Sulu, and agreed to pay to him an annual sum as feudal lord. Spain protested that the territory was hers, but could show nothing to confirm the possession. There was no flag, or a detachment of troops, or anything whatsoever to indicate that the coast was under European protection or dominion. Notes were exchanged between the cabinets of Madrid and London, and Spain relinquished forever her claim to the Borneo fief of Brunei. The experience of the unfortunate Sultan Ali Mutin, Ferdinand I, taught the Sulu people such a sad lesson that subsequent sultans have not cared to risk their persons in the hands of the Spaniards. There was, moreover, a nationalist party which repudiated dependence on Spain, and hoped to be able eventually to drive out the Spaniards. Therefore, in 1885, when the heir to the throne, Mohammed Jamalul Kiram, who was then about 15 years old, was cited to Manila to receive his investiture at the hands of the government general, he refused to comply, and the government at once offered the sultanate to his uncle, Dato Harun Narasid, who accepted it, and presented himself to the government general in the capital. The ceremony of investiture took place in the government house at Malakanan near Manila on September 24, 1886, when Dato Harun took the oath of allegiance to the King of Spain as his sovereign lord, 142 and received from the government general, Emilio Torero, the title of His Excellency Paduka Mahasari Malana Amiral Mauman and Sultan Mohammed Harun Narasid, with the rank of a Spanish lieutenant general. The government general was attended by his secretary, the official interpreter, and several high officers. In the suite of the Sultan-elect were his secretary, Tuan Haji Omar, a priest, Pundita Tuan Sikh Mustafa, and several dittos. For the occasion, the Sultan-elect was dressed in European costume, and wore a Turkish fez with a heavy tassel of black silk. His secretary and chaplain appeared in long black tunics, white trousers, light shoes, and turbans. Two of the remainder of his suite adopted the European fashion, but the others wore rich typical Moorish vestments. The Sultan returned to his country, and in the course of three months the Nationalist Party chiefs openly took up arms against the King of Spain's nominee, the movement spreading to the adjacent islands of Siasi and Bongao, which form part of the Sultanate. Point eight, the Mahometans on the Great Mindanao River, from Cot Abato 9 upwards, openly defied Spanish authority, and in the spring of 1886 the government were under the necessity of organizing an expedition against them. The Spaniards had ordered that native craft should carry the Spanish flag, otherwise they would be treated as pirates or rebels. In March, 1887, the cacique of the Simona Ranch, Bongao is, named Pandan, refused any longer to hoist the Christian ensign, and he was pursued and taken prisoner. He was conveyed on the gunboat Panay to Sulu, and on being asked by the governor why he had ceased to use the Spanish flag, he haughtily replied that he would only answer such a question to the Captain General, and refused to give any further explanation. Within a month after his arrest the garrison of Sulu, Holo, was strengthened by 377 men, in expectation of an immediate general rising, which indeed took place. The Spanish forces were led by Majors Matos and Villa Abril, under the command of BRIG General Serena. They were stoutly opposed by a cruel and despotic chief, named Uto, who advanced at the head of his subjects and slaves. With the cooperation of the gunboats up the river, the Mahometans were repulsed with great loss. Scores of expeditions had been led against the Mindanao natives, and their temporary submission had usually been obtained by the Spaniards on whose retirement, however, the natives always reverted to their old customs, and took their revenge on the settlers. Moreover, the petty jealousies existing between the highest officers in the south rendered every peaceful effort fruitless 143 Dato Otto having defiantly proclaimed that no Spaniard should ever enter his territory, an armed expedition was fitted out, and from the example of his predecessor in 1881, Vidi P. 124, the government general, Emilio Torero, 
perchance foresaw in a little war the vision of titles and more material reward, besides counterbalancing his increasing unpopularity in Manila, due to the influence of my late friend, the government secretary Felipe Canga Argales. Following in the wake of those who had successfully checked the Mahometans in the previous spring, he took the chief command in person in the beginning of January, 1887, to force a recantation of Dito Otto's utterances. The petty sultans of Bakit, Buyan, and Kudarangan in vain united their fortunes with those of Otto. The stockades of coconut trunks, Palma Bravas, QV, and Earth, Katas, were easily destroyed by the Spanish artillery, and their defenders fled under a desultory fire. There were very few casualties on either side. Some of the Christian native infantry soldiers suffered from the bamboo spikes, Spanish, puas, set in the ground around the stockades, but the enemy had not had time to cover with brush with the pits dug for the attacking party to fall into. In about two months the operations ended by the submission of some chiefs of minor importance and influence, and after spending so much powder and shot and Christian blood, the general had not even the satisfaction of seeing either the man he was fighting against or his enemy's ally, the Sultan of Kudarangan. This latter sent a priest, Pundit Akalabadame, and a Toandig to sue for peace and cajole the general with the fairest promises. Afterwards the son and heir of this chief, Rajamuta Tumbilanang, presented himself, and he and his suite of thirty followers were conducted to the camp in the steam launch Karadadu. Otto, whose residence had been demolished, had not deigned to submit in person, but sent, as emissaries, Dato Sirungang, Buate and Dalandung, who excused only the absence of Otto's prime minister. Capitulations of peace were handed to Otto's subordinates, who were told to bring them back signed without delay, for dispatches from the home government, received four or five weeks previously, were urging the general to conclude this affair as speedily as possible. They were returned signed by Otto or by somebody else and the same signature and another, supposed to be that of his wife, the Rani Putli, a woman of great sway amongst her people, were also attached to a letter, offering complete submission. The Spaniards destroyed a large quantity of rice paddy, and stipulated for the subsequent payment of a war indemnity in the form of cannons, lantacas, buffaloes, and horses. The general gave the emissaries some trifling presents, and they went their way and he his to Manila, which he entered in state on March 21, with flags flying, music playing, and the streets decorated with bunting of the national colors, to give welcome to the conqueror 144 of the Mahometan chief whom he had never seen the bearer of peace capitulation signed by whom. As usual, a te deum was celebrated in the cathedral for the victories gained over the infidels, the officers and troops who had returned were invited by the municipality to a theatrical performance, and the government general held a reception in the palace of Malakanan. Some of the troops were left in Mindanao, it having been resolved to establish armed outposts still farther up the river for the better protection of the port and settlement of Kat Abado. Whilst the government general headed this military parade in the Kat Abado district, the ill feeling of the Sulu natives towards the Spaniards was gradually maturing. An impending struggle was evident, and Colonel Juanarolas, the governor of Sulu, concentrated his forces in expectation. The Sulus, always armed, prepared for events in their katas, Arolas demanded their surrender, which was refused, and they were attacked. Two katas, well defended, were ultimately taken, not without serious loss to the Spaniards. In the report of the slain a captain was mentioned. Arolas then twice asked for authority to attack the Mahometans at Maybun, and was each time refused. At length, acting on his own responsibility, on April 15, 1887, he ordered a gunboat to steam round to Maybun and open fire at daybreak on the Sultan's capital, which was in possession of the party opposed to the Spanish nominee, Harun Narasid. At 11 o'clock the same night he started across country with his troops towards Maybun, and the next morning, whilst the enemy was engaged with the gunboat, he led the attack on the land side. The Mahometans, quite surprised, fought like lions, but were completely rooted, and the seat of the Sultanate was razed to the ground. 
it was the most crushing defeat ever inflicted on the Sulu Nationalist Party. The news reached Manila on April 29, and great praise was justly accorded to Colonel Arolas, whose energetic operations contrasted so favorably with the Cotabato expedition. All manner of festivities in his honor were projected in Manila, but Arolas elected to continue the work of subduing the Moro country. Notwithstanding his well-known Republican tendencies, on September 20, 1887, the Queen Regent cabled through her ministry her acknowledgement of Colonel Arola's valuable services, and the pleasure it gave her to reward him with a BRIG General's Commission. Point 10 in 1895 an expedition against the Mahometans was organized under the supreme command of Government General Ramon Blanco. It was known as the Marewi, or Maraurt, campaign. The tribes around Lake Laneo, ancient name Malaneo, and the Marewi district had, for some time past, made serious raids on the Spanish settlement at Iligan, which is connected with Lake Laneo by a river navigable only by canoes. 145 indeed, the lives and property of Christians in all the territory adjoining Iligan were in great jeopardy, and the Spanish authorities were set at defiance. It was therefore resolved, for the first time, to attack the tribes and destroy their katas around the lake for the permanent tranquility of Iligan. The Spanish and native troops alike suffered great hardships and privations. Steam launches in sections, constructed in Hong Kong, small guns, and war material were carried up from Iligan to the lake by natives over very rugged ground. On the lake shore the launches were fitted up and operated on the lake, to the immense surprise of the tribes. From the land side their katas were attacked and destroyed, under the command of my old friend BRIG General Gonzalez Paradu. The operations, which lasted about three months, were a complete success, and General Gonzalez Paradu was rewarded with promotion to General of Division. Lake Laneo, with the surrounding district and the route down to Iligan, was in possession of the Spaniards, and in order to retain that possession without the expense of maintaining a large military establishment, it was determined to people the conquered territory with Christian families from Luzon and the other islands situated north of Mindanao. It was the attempt to carry out this colonizing scheme which gave significance to the Marewi expedition and contributed to that movement which, in 1896, led to the downfall of Spanish rule in the archipelago. The last Spanish punitive expedition against the Mindanao Mahometans was sent in February, 1898, under the command of General Bill. The operations lasted only a few days. The enemy was driven into the interior with great loss, and one chief was slain. The small gunboats built in Hong Kong for the Marewi campaign the General Blanco, Corcuera, and Laneo again did good service. There are three branches or tribes of the Malaneo Moros around the Lake Laneo, one, Bayabas, at the north of the lake, their center being Marewi. Two, Onayans, at the south of the lake, their center being Bayan. Three, Makuai tribe includes the remaining Lake Laneo people, except a few independent ranches to the east of the Makuai, belonging to the Bayabas. The Makuai claim to be the most ancient, although no tribe can trace descent farther back than the 13th century. Intermarriage has destroyed traces, but there are over a hundred sultans who claim to be of royal blood. The other principal Mindanao tribes are as follows, Vizcolanitas, in the regions near Mount Apo, Vidi P 121. Begabas, on the foothills of Mount Apo. A peaceful people, disposed to work, and reputed to be human sacrificers. Manobos, in the valley of the Agasan River. There are also some on the Gulf of Davao and in the Cotabato district. Somalis inhabit the small islands in the Gulf of Davao, but there is 146 quite a large colony of them at Megai, a suburb of Samboanga, from the neighboring islets, under Rajamuta de Tomundi. Subuanos occupy the peninsula of the Samboanga province. They are docile and lazy, and much prone to stealing. They are far less courageous than the Somalis, by whom they are overawed. Some physiognomists consider them to be of the same caste as the Manobos, the Gambanos of Sulu, and the Samkas of Basilan. Tagubans live on the north shore of the Gulf of Davao. 
Tirarayas inhabit the mountains to the west of the Rio Grande. There is a large number of smaller tribes. A few years ago we were all alarmed on Corpus Christi Day, during the solemn procession of that feast in Cotabato, by the sudden attack of a few Mahometans on the crowd of Christians assembled. Of course the former were overwhelmed and killed, as they quite expected to be. They were of that class known as Juramantadus, or sworn Mahometans, who believe that if they make a solemn vow, in a form binding on their consciences, to die taking the blood of a Christian, their souls will immediately migrate to the happy hunting ground, where they will ever live in bliss, in the presence of the great prophet. This is the most dangerous sect of Mahometans, for no exhibition of force can suffice to stay their ravages, and they can only be treated like mad dogs, or like a Malay who has run amok. The face of a Mindanao south coast Moro is generally pleasant, but a smile spoils his appearance, the parting lips disclose a filthy aperture with dyed teeth in a mahogany-colored foam of masticated betel nut. Holes as large as sixpences are in the ears of the women, who, when they have no earrings, wear a piece of reed with a vermilion tip. The dress is artistically fantastic, with the sarong and the jabal and no trousers visible. Apparently the large majority, perhaps 70 percenter, of the Parang Parang Moros have a loathsome skin disease. Those who live on shore crop their hair, but the swamp, river, and sea people who live afloat let it grow long. The Sulu Islanders, male and female, dress with far greater taste and ascetic originality than the Christian natives. The women are fond of gay colors, the predominant ones being scarlet and green. Their nether bifurcated garment is very baggy, the bodice is extremely tight, and, with equally close-fitting sleeves, exhibits every contour of the bust and arms. They use also a strip of stuff sewn together at the ends called the javul, which serves to protect the head from the sun rays. The end of the javul would reach nearly down to the feet, but is usually held retrousse under the arm. They have a passion for jewelry, and wear many finger rings of metal and sometimes of seashells, whilst their earrings are gaudy and of large dimensions. The hair is gracefully tied in a coil on the top of the head, and 147 their features are at least as attractive as those of the generality of Philippine Christian women. The men wear breeches of bright colors, as tight as gymnasts' pantaloons, with a large number of buttons up the sides, a kind of waistcoat buttoning up to the throat, a jacket reaching to the hips, with close sleeves, and a turban. A chief's dress has many adornments of trinkets, and is quite elegant, a necessary part of his outfit being the barong, sword, which apparently he carries constantly. They are robust, of medium height, often of superb physical development, of a dusky bronze color, piercing eyes, low forehead, lank hair, which is dressed as a chignon and hangs down the back of the neck. The body is agile, the whole movement is rapid, and they have a wonderful power of holding the breath under water. They are of quick perception, audacious, haughty, resolute, zealous about their genealogies, extremely sober, ready to promise everything and do nothing, vindictive and highly suspicious of a stranger's intentions. Their bearing towards the Christian, whom they call the infidel, is full of contempt. They know no gratitude, and they would not cringe to the greatest Christian potentate. They are very long-suffering in adversity, hesitating in attack, and the bravest of the brave in defense. They disdain work as degrading and only a fit occupation for slaves, whilst warfare is, to their minds, an honorable calling. Every male over 16 years of age has to carry at least one fighting weapon at all times, and consider himself enrolled in military service. They have a certain knowledge of the arts. They manufacture on the anvil very fine criss daggers, knives, lance heads, etc. Many of their fighting weapons are inlaid with silver and set in polished hardwood or ivory handles artistically carved. In warfare they carry shields, and their usual arms on land are the campolan, a kind of short two-handed sword, wide at the tip and narrowing down to the hilt, the barong for close combat, the straight criss for thrusting and cutting, and the waved, serpent-like criss for thrusting only. They are dexterous in the use of arms, and can most skillfully decapitate a foe at a single stroke. 
At sea they use a sort of asagai, called bagsake, or symbilin, about half an inch in diameter, with a sharp point. Some can throw as many as four at a time, and make them spread in the flight, they use these for boarding vessels. They make many of their own domestic utensils of metal, also coats of mail of metal wire and buffalo horn, which resist hand weapons, but not bullets. The wire probably comes from Singapore. The local trade is chiefly in pearls, mother of pearl, shells, shark fins, etc. 11 The Sultan, in Spanish times, had a sovereign right to all 148 pearls found which exceeded a certain size fixed by Sulu law hence it was very difficult to secure an extraordinary specimen. The Mahometans trade at great distances in their small craft, called vintas, for they are wonderfully expert navigators. Their largest vessels do not exceed seven tons, and they go as far as Borneo, and even down to Singapore on rare occasions. A scene in the Moro country A scene in the Moro country I found that almost any coinage was useful for purchasing in the marketplaces. I need hardly add that the Chinese small traders have found their way to these regions, and it would be an unfavorable sign if a Chinaman were not to be seen there, for where the frugal celestial cannot earn a living one may well assume there is little prosperity. Small Chinese coins, known as cash in the China Treaty ports, are current money there, and I think, the most convenient of all copper coins, for, having a hole in the center, they can be strung together. Chinese began to trade with this island in 1751. Samboanga Fortress, Fuerza del Pilar, Samboanga Fortress, Fuerza del Pilar, the root of the Sulu language is Sanskrit, mixed with Arabic. Each Friday is dedicated to public worship, and the faithful are called to the temple by the beating of a box or hollow piece of wood. All recite the Iman with a plaintive voice in honor of the great prophet, a slight gesticulation is then made whilst the pundit reads a passage from the Mistah. I observed that no young women put in an appearance at the temple on the occasion of my visit. At the beginning of each year there is a very solemn ceremonial, and, in the event of the birth or death of a child, or the safe return from some expedition, it is repeated. It is a sort of te deum in conformity with Mahometan rites. During a number of days in a certain month of the year they abstain from eating, drinking, and pleasure of all kinds, and suffer many forms of voluntary penance. Strangers are never allowed, I was told, inside the mosque of the Sultan. The higher clergy are represented by the hereditary cherif, who has temporal power also. The title of Pandita simply means priest, and is the common word used in Mindanao as well as in Palawan Island. He seems to be almost the chief in his district not in a warlike sense, like the Ditto, but his word has great influence. He performs all the functions of a priest, receives the vow of the Juramantadus, and expounds the mysteries and the glories of that better world whither they will go without delay if they die taking the blood of a Christian. In theory, the Moros accept the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad, in practice, they omit the virtues of their religious system and follow those precepts which can be construed into favoring vice, hence they interpret guidance of the people by oppression, polygamy by licentiousness, and maintenance of the faith by bloodshed. Relays of Arabs come, from time to time, under the guise of Quran expounders, to feed on the people and whet their animosity towards the Christian. The Punditas are doctors also. If a Ditto dies, they intone a 149 Dolorous chant, the family bursts into lamentations, which are finally drowned in the din of the clashing of cymbals and beating of gongs, whilst sometimes a gun is fired. In rush the neighbors, and join in the shouting, until all settle down quietly to a feast. The body is then sprinkled with salt and camphor and dressed in white, with the chris attached to the waist. There is little ceremony about placing the body in the coffin and burying it. The mortuary is marked by a wooden tablet sometimes by a stone, on which is an inscription in Arabic. A slip of board, or bamboo, is placed around the spot, and a piece of wood, carved like the bows of a canoe, is stuck in the earth, in front of this is placed a coconut shell full of water. The old native town, or kata of Sulu, Holo, 
was a collection of bamboo houses built upon piles extending a few hundred yards into the sea. This was all demolished by the Spaniards when they permanently occupied the place in 1876, excepting the military hospital, which was reconstructed of light materials, native fashion. The sea beach was cleared, and the native village put back inland. The site is an extremely pretty little bay on the north of the island, formed by the points Dangapak and Candia, and exactly in front, about four or five miles off, there are several low-lying islets, well wooded, with a hill abruptly jutting out here and there, the whole forming a picturesque miniature archipelago. Looking from the sea, in the center stands the modern Spanish town of Sulu, Holo, built on the shore, rising about a couple of yards above sea level, around which there is a short stone and brick sea wall, with several bends pleasantly relieving the monotony of a straight line. Forming a background to the European town, there are three thickly wooded hillocks almost identical in appearance, and at each extremity of the picture, lying farther back inland, there is a hill sloping down gradually towards the coast. The slope on the eastern extremity has been cleared of undergrowth to the extent of about 50 acres, giving it the appearance of a vast lawn. At the eastern and western extremities are the native suburbs, with huts of light material built a few yards into the sea. On the east side there is a big Moro bungalow, erected on small tree trunks, quite a hundred yards from the beach seawards. To the west, one sees a long shanty-built structure running out to sea like a jetty, it is the shore market. The panorama could not be more charming and curious. Still farther west, towering above every other, stands the bad Tumantangas Peak, Mount of Tears, the last point discernible by the westward journeying Yolono, who is said to sigh with patriotic anguish at its loss to view, with all the feeling of a Moorish Bobdile bidding adieu to his beloved Granada 150 the town is uniformly planned, with well-drained streets, running parallel, crossed at rectangles by lovely avenues of shading trees. Here and there are squares, pretty gardens, and a clean and orderly marketplace. There is a simple edifice for a church, splendid barracks equal to those in Manila when these were built, many houses of brick and stone, others of wood, and all roofed with corrugated iron. The neighborhood is well provided with water from natural streams. The town is supplied with drinking water conducted in pipes, laid for the purpose from a spring about a mile and a quarter distant, whilst other piping carries water to the end of the pier for the requirements of shipping. This improvement, the present salubrity of the town, once a fever focus, and its latest Spanish embellishments, are mainly due to the intelligent activity of its late governors, Colonel, now General, Gonzalez Paradu, and the late General Juan Arolas. The town is encircled on the land side by a brick loopholed wall. The outside, Spanish, defenses consisted of two forts, viz. the Princesa de Asturias and Torre de la Reina and within the town those of the Puerta Bloc cause, Puerta España and the redoubt Alfonso XII. This last had an Ordenfeld gun. The Spanish government of Sulu was entirely under martial law, and the Europeans, mostly military men, were constantly on the alert for the ever-recurring attacks of the natives. The general aspect of Sulu, Holo, is cheerful and attractive. The day scene, enlivened by the Moro, passing to and fro with his lithe gait, in gay attire, with the barong in a huge sash, and every white man, soldier, or civilian, carrying arms in self-defense, may well inflame the imaginative and romantic mind. One can hardly believe one is still in the Philippines. At night, the shaded avenues, bordered by stately trees, illuminated by a hundred lamps, present a beautiful, picturesque scene which carries the memory far, far away from the surrounding savage races. Yet all may change in a trice. There is a hue and cry, a Moro has run amuck his glistening weapon within a foot of his escaping victim, the Christian native hiding away in fear, and the European off in pursuit of the common foe, there is a tramping of feet, a cracking of firearms, the Moro is biting the dust, and the memory is brought abruptly back from imagination's flights to full realization of one's Mahometan entourage. By a decree dated September 24, 1877, all the natives, and other races or nationalities settled there, 
were exempted from all kinds of contributions or taxes for 10 years. In 1887 the term was extended for another 10 years, hence, no imposts being levied, all the Spaniards had to do was to maintain their prestige with peace. In his relations with the Spaniards, the Sultan held the title of Excellency, and he, as well as several chiefs, received annual pensions from the government at the following rates 151 pesos. Sultan of Sulu 2400 Sultan of Mindanao 1000 Dito Baraduran, heir to the Sulu Sultanate 700 Paduka Dito Ali Mutin, of Sulu 600 Dito Amaral, of Mindanao 800 other minor pensions 600 6100 Cuban pesos and an allowance of 2 pesos for each captive rescued, and 3 pesos for each pirate caught, whether in Sulu or Mindanao waters. The Sultan is the Mahasari, the stainless, the spotless, the pontiff king the chief of the state and the church, but it is said that he acknowledges the Sultan of Turkey as the Padishah. He is the irresponsible lord and master of all life and property among his subjects, although in his decrees he is advised by a council of elders. Nevertheless, in spite of his absolute authority, he does not seem to have perfect control over the acts of his nobles or chiefs, who are a privileged class, and are constantly waging some petty war among themselves, or organizing a marauding expedition along the coast. The Sultan is compelled, to a certain extent, to tolerate their excesses, as his own dignity, or at least his own tranquility, is in a great measure dependent on their common goodwill towards him. The chiefs collect tribute in the name of the Sultan, but they probably furnish their own wants first and pay differences into the royal treasury, seeing that it all comes from their own feudal dependence. The Sultan claims to be the nominal owner of all the product of Sulu waters. In the valuable pearl fisheries he claims to have a prior right to all pearls above a certain value, although the finder is entitled to a relative bounty from the Sultan. Amble, a product found floating on the waters and much esteemed by the Chinese as medicine, is subject to royal dues. The great pearl fishing center is Siasi Island, in the Topol Group, lying about 20 miles south of Sulu Island. The Sultanate is hereditary under the Salic law. The Sultan is supported by three ministers, one of whom acts as regent in his absence, for he might choose to go to Singapore, or have to go to Mecca, if he had not previously done so, the other is Minister of War, and the third is Minister of Justice and Master of the Ceremonies. Slavery exists in a most ample sense. There are slaves by birth and others by conquest, such as prisoners of war, insolvent debtors and those seized by piratical expeditions to other islands. A Creole friend of mine was one of these last. He had commenced clearing an estate for cane growing on the Negro's coast, when he was seized and carried off to Sulu Island. In a few years he was ransomed and returned to Negro's, where be formed one of the finest sugar haciendas and factories in the colony 152 in 1884 a Mahometan was found on a desolate isle lying off the antique coast, Panayas, and of course had no document of identity, so he was arrested and confined in the jail of San Jose de Buena Vista. From prison he was eventually taken to the residence of the Spanish governor, Don Manuel Castellan, a very humane gentleman and a personal friend of mine. In Don Manuel's study there was a collection of native arms which took the stranger's fancy, one morning he seized a chris and lance, and, bounding into the breakfast room, capered about, gesticulated, and brandished the lance in the air, much to the amusement of the governor and his guests. But in an instant the fellow, hitherto a mystery, but undoubtedly a juraman to do, hurled the lance with great force towards the public prosecutor, and the missile, after severing his watch chain, lodged in the side of the table. The governor and the public prosecutor at once closed with the would-be assassin, whilst the governor's wife, with great presence of mind, thrust a table knife into the culprit's body between the shoulder blade and the collar bone. The man fell, and, when all supposed he was dead, he suddenly jumped up. No one had thought of taking the Chris out of his grasp, and he rushed around the apartment and severely cut two of the servants, but was ultimately dispatched by the bayonets of the guards who arrived on hearing the scuffle. The governor showed me his wounds, which were slight, 
but his life was saved by the valor of his wife Dona Justa. It has often been remarked by old residents, that if free license were granted to the domesticated natives, their barbarous instincts would recur to them in all vigor. Here was an instance. The body of the Moro was carried off by an excited populace, who tied a rope to it, beat it, and dragged it through the town to a few miles up the coast, where it was thrown on the seashore. The priests did not interfere, like the Egyptian mummies cast on the Stygian shores, the culprit was unworthy of sepulture besides, who would pay the fees. During my first visit to Sulu in 1881, I was dining with the governor, when the conversation ran on the details of an expedition about to be sent to Mabun, to carry dispatches received from the government general for the sultan, anent the protectorate. The governor seemed rather surprised when I expressed my wish to join the party, for the journey is not unattended with risk to one's life. I may here mention that only a few days before I arrived, a young officer was sent on some mission a short distance outside the town of Holo, accompanied by a patrol of two guards. He was met by armed Mohammedans, and sent back with one of his hands cut off. I remember, also, the news reaching us that several military officers were sitting outside a cafe in Holo town, when a number of juramen to came behind them and cut their throats. However, the governor did not oppose my wish on the contrary, he jocoselli replied that he could not extend my passport so far, because the Sulus would not respect it, yet the more Europeans the better 153 officials usually went by sea to Mabun, and a gunboat was now and again sent round the coast with messages to the Sultan, but there was no government vessel in Holo at this time. Our party, all told, including the native attendants, numbered about 30 Christians, and we started early in the morning on horseback. I carried my usual weapon a revolver hoping there would be no need to use it on the journey. And so it resulted, we arrived, without being molested in any way, in about three hours, across a beautiful country. We passed two low ranges of hills, which appeared to run from SW to NE, and several small streams, whilst here and there was a ranch of the Sultan's subjects. Each ranch was formed of a group of 10 to 20 huts, controlled by the cacique. Agriculture seemed to be pursued in a very pristine fashion, but, doubtless owing to the exuberant fertility of the soil, we saw some very nice crops of rice, Indian corn, sugar cane, and indigo and coffee plantations on a small scale. In the forest which we traversed there were some of the largest bamboos I have ever seen, and fine building timber, such as teak, nera, molave, mangakapui, and camagon, vitae woods. I was assured that cedars also flourished on the island. We saw a great number of monkeys, wild pigeons, cranes, and parrots, whilst deer, buffaloes, and wild goats are said to abound in these parts. On our arrival at Maybun, we went first to the bungalow of a Chinaman the Sultan's brother-in-law where we refreshed ourselves with our own provisions, and learned the gossip of the place. On inquiry, we were told that the Sultan was sleeping, so we waited at the Chinaman's. I understood this man was a traitor, but there were no visible signs of his doing any business. Most of our party slept the siesta, and at about four o'clock we called at the palace. It was a very large building, well constructed, and appeared to be built almost entirely of materials of the country. A deal of bamboo and wood were used in it, and even the roof was made of split bamboo, although I am told that this was replaced by sheet iron when the young sultan came to the throne. The vestibule was very spacious, and all around was pleasantly decorated with lovely shrubs and plants peculiar to most mid-tropical regions. The entrance to the palace was always open, but well guarded, and we were received by three dittos, who saluted us in a formal way, and, without waiting to ask us any question, invited us, with a wave of the hand, to follow them into the throne room. Point twelve. The Sultan was seated on our entering, but when the bearer of the dispatches approached with the official interpreter by his side, and we following, he rose in his place to greet us. His Highness was dressed in very tight silk trousers, fastened partly up the sides with showy chased gold or gilt buttons, a short eaten cut olive green jacket with an infinity of buttons, white socks, ornamented 154 slippers, 
a red sash around his waist, a kind of turban, and a kris at his side. His general appearance was that of a Spanish bullfighter with an oriental finish off. We all bowed low, and the sultan, surrounded by his sultanas, put his hands to his temples, and, on lowering them, he bowed at the same time. We remained standing whilst some papers were handed to him. He looked at them a few words were said in Spanish, to the effect that the bearer saluted his highness in the name of the governor of Sulu. The sultan passed the documents to the official interpreter, who read or explained them in the Sulu language, then a brief conversation ensued, through the interpreter, and the business was really over. After a short pause, the sultan motioned to us to be seated on floor cushions, and we complied. The cushions, covered with rich silk, were very comfortable. Servants, in fantastic costumes, were constantly in attendance, serving betel nut to those who cared to chew it. One sultana was fairly pretty, or had been so, but the others were heavy, languid, and lazy in their movements, and their teeth, dyed black, did not embellish their personal appearance. The sultan made various inquiries, and passed many compliments on us, the governor, government general, etc., which were conveyed to us through the interpreter. Meanwhile, the sultanas chatted among themselves, and were apparently as much interested in looking at us as we were in their style, features, and attire. They all wore light-colored dual garments of great width, and tight bodices. Their coiffure was carefully finished, but a part of the forehead was hidden by an ungraceful fringe of hair. We had so little in common to converse on, and that little had to be said through the interpreter, that we were rather glad when we were asked to take refreshments. It at least served to relieve the awkward feeling of glancing at each other in silence. Chocolate and ornamental sweetmeats were brought to us, all very unpalatable. When we were about to take our departure, the sultan invited us to remain all night in the palace. The leader of our party caused to be explained to him that we were thankful for his gracious offer, but that, being so numerous, we feared to disturb his highness by intruding so far on his hospitality. Still the sultan politely insisted, and whilst the interpretation was being transmitted I found an opportunity to acquaint our chief of my burning curiosity to stay at the palace. In any case, we were a large number to go anywhere, so our leader, in reply to the sultan, said that he and four Europeans of his suite would take advantage of his highness's kindness. We withdrew from the sultan's presence, and some of us Europeans walked through the town accompanied by functionaries of the royal household and the interpreter. There was nothing striking in the place, it was like most others. There were some good bungalows of bamboo and thatching. I noticed that men, women, and children were smoking tobacco or chewing, and had no visible occupation. Many of the smaller dwellings were built on piles out to the sea. We saw a number of divers 155 preparing to go off to get pearls, mother of pearl, etc. They are very expert in this occupation, and dive as deep as 100 feet. Prior to the plunge they go through a grotesque performance of waving their arms in the air and twisting their bodies, in order as they say to frighten away the sharks, then with a hoop they leap over the edge of the prahu, and continue to throw their arms and legs about for the purpose mentioned. They often dive for the shark and rip it up with a criss. Five of us retired to the palace that night, and were at once conducted to our rooms. There was no door to my room, it was, strictly speaking, an alcove. During the night, at intervals of about every hour, as it seemed to me, a palace servant or guard came to inquire how the seigneur was sleeping, and if I were comfortable. To Ermel Seigneur. Does the gentleman sleep? was apparently the limit of his knowledge of Spanish. I did not clearly understand more than the fact that the man was a nuisance, and I regretted there was no door with which to shut him out. The next morning we paid our respects to His Highness, who furnished us with an escort more as a compliment than a necessity and we reached Holo Town again, after a very enjoyable ride through a superb country. The Sultan's subjects are spread so far from the center of government Mabon that in some places their allegiance is but nominal. Many of them residing near the Spanish settlements are quick at learning Castilian sufficiently well to be understood, 
but the Spaniards tried in vain to subject them to a European order of things. About 20 miles up the coast, going north from Samboanga, the Jesuits sent a missionary in 1885 to convert the Subuanos. He endeavored to persuade the people to form a village. They cleared a way through the forest from the beach, and at the end of this opening, about three quarters of a mile long, I found a church half built of wood, bamboo, and palm leaves. I had ridden to the place on horseback along the beach, and my food and baggage followed in a canoe. The opening was so roughly cleared that I thought it better to dismount when I got halfway. As the church was only in course of construction, and not consecrated, I took up my quarters there. I was followed by a subuano, who was curious to know the object of my visit. I told him I wished to see the headman, so this personage arrived with one of his wives and a young girl. They sat on the floor with me, and as the cacique could make himself understood in Spanish, we chatted about the affairs of the town in Posse. The visiting priest had gone to the useless trouble of baptizing a few of these people. They appeared to be as much Christian as I was Mohammedan. The cacique had more than one wife the word of the pundita of the settlement was the local law, and the pundita himself of course had his seraglio. I got the first man, who had followed me, to direct me to the pundita's house. My guide was gaily attired in 156 bright red tight acrobat breeches, with buttons up the side, and a jacket like a waistcoat, with sleeves so close fitting that I suppose he seldom took the trouble to undress himself. I left the cacique, promising to visit his bungalow that day, and then my guide led me through winding paths, in a wood, to the hut of the pundita. On the way I met a man of the tribe carrying spring water in a bamboo, which he tilted to give me a drink. To my inquiries if he were a Christian, and if he knew the Castilian pundita, Spanish priest, he replied in the affirmative, continuing the interrogation, I asked him how many gods there were, and when he answered four, I closed my investigation of his Christianity. My guide was too cunning to take me by the direct path to the pundita's bungalow. He led me into a half-cleared plot of land facing it, whence the inmates could see us for at least ten minutes making our approach. When we arrived, and after scrambling up the staircase, which was simply a notched trunk of a tree about nine inches diameter, I discovered that the pundita, forewarned, had fled to the mountain close by, leaving his wives to entertain the visitor. I found them all lounging and chewing betel nut, and when I squatted on the floor amongst them they became remarkably chatty. Then I went to the cacique's bungalow. In the rear of this dwelling there was a small forge, and the most effective bellows of primitive make which I have ever seen in any country. It was a double-action apparatus, made entirely of bamboo, except the pistons, which were of feathers. These pistons, working up and down alternately by a bamboo rod in each hand, sustained perfectly a constant draft of air. One man was squatting on a bamboo bench the height of the bellows rods, whilst the smith crouched on the ground to forge his kris on the anvil. The headman's bungalow was built the same as the others, but with greater care. It was rather high up, and had the usual notched log of wood staircase, which is perhaps easy to ascend with naked feet. The cacique and one of his wives were seated on mats on the floor. After mutual salutations the wife threw me three cushions, on which I reclined doing the dolce far niente whilst we talked about the affairs of the settlement. The conversation was growing rather wearisome anent the Spanish priest having ordered huts to be built without giving materials, about the scarcity of palm leaves in the neighborhood, and so forth, so I bade them farewell and went on to another hut. Here the inmates were numerous four women, three or four men, and two rather pretty male children, with their heads shaven so as to leave only a tuft of hair towards the forehead about the size of a crown piece. To entertain me, six copper tom-toms were brought out, and placed in a row on pillows, whilst another large one, for the bass accompaniment, was suspended from a wooden frame. A man beat the bass with a stick, whilst the women took it in turns to kneel on the floor, with a stick in 157 each hand, to play a tune on the series of six. A few words were passed between the three men, when suddenly one of them arose and performed a war dance, 
quaintly twisting his arms and legs in attitudes of advance, recoil, and exultation. The dance finished, I mounted my horse and left the settlement in embryo, called by the missionaries Reus, which is the name of a town in Catalonia. The climate of Mindanao and Sulu Islands is healthy and delightful. The heat of Samboanga is moderated by daily breezes, and in Sulu, in the month of June, it is not oppressive. A year's temperature readings on the Ilana Bay coast, Mindanao is, are as follows, viz colon average of inside the house, Fahrenheit. Outside in the shade, Fahrenheit. 6 a.m. noon. 6 p.m. 6 a.m. noon. 6 p.m. January, March 73 degrees 84 degrees 83 degrees 72 degrees 84 degrees 80 degrees April, June 74 one half degree 83 degrees 78 one half degree 74 one half degree 92 one half degree 78 degrees July, Sept. 74 degrees 84 degrees 80 degrees 72 one half degree 88 degrees 79 degrees October, December. 73 degrees 85 degrees 80 degrees 73 degrees 83 degrees 78 degrees the island of Palawan, Paragua, was anciently a dependency of the Sultanate of Brunei, Borneo, hence the dominion over this island of the Sultan of Sulu as suzerain lord of Brunei. At the beginning of the 18th century Spaniards had already settled in the north of it. It had a very sparse population, and a movement was set on foot to subjugate the natives. In order to protect the Spanish settlers from Mahometan attacks a fort was established at Labo. However, the supplies were not kept up, and many of the garrison died of misery, hunger, and nakedness, until 1720, when it was abandoned. Some years afterwards the island was gratuitously ceded to the Spaniards by the Sultan of Sulu, at their request. Captain Antonio Fabo was sent there with troops to take formal possession, being awarded the handsome salary of 50 Cuban pesos per month for this service. On the arrival of the ships, an officer was sent ashore, the people fled inland, and the formalities of annexation were proceeded with unwitnessed. The only signs of possession left there were the corpses of the troops and sailors who died from eating rotten food, or were murdered by Mahometans who attacked the expedition. Subsequently a fortress was established at Tete, where a number of priests and laymen in a few years succeeded in forming a small colony, which at length shared the fate of Lavo. The only Spanish settlement in the island at the date of the evacuation was the colony of Puerta Princesa, on the east coast. 13158 Before starting on my peregrination in Palawan Island, I sought in vain for information respecting the habits and nature of the Tagbanuas, a half caste Malaita tribe disseminated over a little more than the southern half of the island 14 it was only on my arrival at Puerta Princesa that I was able to procure a vague insight into the peculiarities of the people whom I intended to visit. The governor, Don Felipe Canga Argels, was highly pleased to find a traveler who could sympathize with his efforts, and help to make known, if only to the rest of the archipelago, this island almost unexplored in the interior. He constantly wrote articles to one of the leading journals of Manila, under the title of Echoes from Paragua, Palawan, partly with the view of attracting the attention of the government to the requirements of the colony, but also to stimulate a spirit of enterprise in favor of this island, rich in hardwoods, etc. Puerta Princesa is a good harbor, situated on a gulf. The soil was leveled, trees were planted, and a slip for repairing vessels was constructed. There was a fixed white light visible 11 miles off. It was a naval station for two gunboats, the commander of the station being ex officio governor of the colony. It was also a penal settlement for convicts, and those suspected by the civil or religious authorities. To give employment to the convicts and suspects, a model sugar estate was established by the government. The locality supplied nearly all the raw material for working and preserving the establishment, such as lime, stone, bricks, timber, sand, firewood, straw for bags, rattans, etc. The aspect of the town is agreeable, and the environs are pretty, but there is a great drawback in the want of drinking water, which, in the dry season, has to be procured from a great distance. 
The governor showed me great attention, and personally took command of a gunboat, which conducted me to the mouth of the Agiwajit River. This is the great river of the district, and is navigable for about three miles. I put off in a boat manned by marines, and was rowed about two miles up, as far as the mission station. The missionary received me well, and I stayed there that night, with five men, whom I had engaged to carry my luggage, for we had a journey before us of some days on foot to the opposite coast. My luggage, besides the ordinary traveling requisites and provisions, included about 90 yards of printed stuffs of bright colors, six dozen common handkerchiefs, and some 12 pounds weight of beads on strings, with a few odds and ends of trinkets, whilst my native bearers were provided with rice, dried fish, betel nut, tobacco, etc., for a week or more. We set out on foot the next day, and in three days and a half we reached the western shore. The greatest height above the sea level on our route was about 159-900 meters, according to my aneroid reading, and the maximum heat at midday in the shade, month of January, was 82 degrees Fahrenheit. The nights were cold, comparatively speaking, and at midnight the thermometer once descended to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. The natives proved to be a very pacific people. We found some engaged in collecting gum from the trees in the forest, and others cutting and making up bundles of rat hands. They took these products down to the Agiwajit River Mission Station, where Chinese traders bartered for them stuffs and other commodities. The value of coin was not altogether unknown in the mission village, although the difference in value between copper and silver coinage was not understood. In the interior they lived in great misery, their cabins being wretched hovels. They planted their rice without plowing at all, and all their agricultural implements were made of wood or bamboo. The native dress is made of the bark of trees, smashed with stones, to extract the ligneous parts. In the cool weather they make tunics of bark, and the women wear drawers of the same material. They adorn their waists with seashell and coconut shell ornaments, whilst the fiber of the palm serves for a waistband. The women pierce very large holes in their ears, in which they place shells, wood, etc. They never bathe intentionally. Their arms are bows and arrows, and darts blown through a kind of pea shooter made of a reed resembling bojo, q.v. They are a very dirty people, and they eat their fish or flesh raw. I had no difficulty whatever in procuring guides from one group of huts to the next on payment in goods, and my instructions were always to lead me towards the coast, the nearest point of which I knew was due west or a few points to the north. We passed through a most fertile country the whole way. There were no rivers of any importance, but we were well supplied with drinking water from the numerous springs and rivulets. The forests are very rich in good timber, chiefly ipil, a permadecandria, a very useful hardwood, vitae woods. I estimated that many of these trees, if felled, would have given clean logs of 70 to 80 feet long. I presume the felling of timber was not attempted by these natives on account of the difficulties, or rather, total want of transport means. From a plateau, within half a day's journey of the opposite coast, the scenery was remarkably beautiful, with the sea to the west and an interminable grandeur of forest to the east. There were a few fishermen on the west coast, but further than that, there was not a sign of anything beyond the gifts of nature. About half a mile from the coast, on the fringe of the forest, there was a group of native huts, two of which were vacated for our accommodation in exchange for goods. With an abundance of fish, we were able to economize our provisions. One of my men fell ill with fever, so that we had to wait two days on the west coast, whilst I dosed him with Eno's fruit salt and quinine. 160 in the meantime, I studied the habits of these people. Among the many things which astonished them was the use of matches, whilst our cooking highly amused them. Such a thing as a horse I suppose had never been seen here, although I would gladly have bought or hired one, for I was very weary of our delay. We all went on the march again, on foot nearly all the way, by the same passes to the Agiwajit River, where we found a canoe, which carried us back to Puerto Princesa. The island produces many marketable articles, such as beeswax, edible birds' nests, 
fine shells, dried shellfish, a few pearls, bush rope or palasin, qv, of enormous length, wild nutmegs, ebony, logwood, etc., which the Chinese obtain in barter for knives and other small manufactures. The first survey of the Palawan Island coast is said to have been made by the British. A British map of Puerto Princesa, with a few miles of adjoining coast, was shown to me in the government house of this place. It appears that the west coast is not navigable for ships within at least two miles of the shore, although there are a few channels leading to creeks. Vessels coming from the west usually pass through the Straits of Balabac, between the island of that name and the islets off the Borneo Island coast. In the island of Balabac there was absolutely nothing remarkable to be seen, unless it were a little animal about the size of a big cat, but in shape a perfect model of a doe.15 I took one to Manila, but it died the day we arrived. No part of the island, which is very mountainous and fertile, appeared to be cultivated, and even the officials at the station had to obtain supplies from Manila, whilst cattle were brought from the island of Kyo, one of the Colombians group. In the latter years, the home government made efforts to colonize Palawan Island by offering certain advantages to emigrants. By royal order, dated February 25, 1885, the islands of Palawan and Mindanao were to be occupied in an effectual manner, and outposts established, wherever necessary, to guarantee the secure possession of these islands. The points mentioned for such occupation in Palawan Island were Tagbuseo and Malahut on the east coast, and Kolashian and Malinat on the west coast. It also confirmed the royal decree of July 30, 1860, granting to all families emigrating to these newly established military posts, and all peaceful tribes of the islands who might choose to settle there, exemption from the payment of tribute for six years. The families would be furnished with a free passage to these places, and each group would be supplied with seed and implements. A subsequent royal order, dated January 19, 1886, was issued, to the effect that the provincial governors of the provinces of North 161 and South Ilocos were to stimulate voluntary emigration of the natives to Palawan Island, to the extent of 25 families from each of the two provinces per annum. That any payments due by them to the public treasury were to be condoned. That such families and any persons of good character who might establish themselves in Palawan should be exempt from the payment of taxes for 10 years, and receive free passage there for themselves and their cattle, and three hectares of land gratis, to be under cultivation within a stated period. That two chupas of rice, vidi rice measure, and ten cents of a peso should be given to each adult, and one chupa of rice to each minor each day during the first six months from the date of their embarking. That the governor of Palawan should be instructed respecting the highways to be constructed, and the convenience of opening free ports in that island that the land and sea forces should be increased, and of the latter, a third-rate man-o-war should be stationed on the west coast. That convicts should continue to be sent to Palawan, and the governor should be authorized to employ all those of bad conduct in public works. That schools of primary instruction should be established in the island wherever such might be considered convenient, etc., etc. 16 The Spaniards, in 1898, left nearly half the Philippine archipelago to be conquered, but only its Mahometan inhabitants ever persistently took the aggressive against them in regular continuous warfare. The attempts of the Jesuit missionaries to convert them to Christianity were entirely futile, for the Punditas and the Romish priests were equally tenacious of their respective religious beliefs. The last treaty made between Spain and Sulu especially stipulated that the Mahometans should not be persecuted for their religion. To overturn a dynasty, to suppress an organized system of feudal laws, and to eradicate an ancient belief, the principles of which had firmly established themselves among the populace in the course of centuries, was a harder task than that of bringing under the Spanish yoke detached groups of Malay immigrants. The pliant, credulous nature 162 of the Luzon settlers the fact that they professed no deeply rooted religion, and although advanced from the migratory to the settled condition were mere nominal lieges of their puppet kinglings, were facilities for the achievement of conquest. True it is that the dynasties of the Aztecs of Mexico and the Incas of Peru yielded to Spanish valor, 
but there was the incentive of untold wealth, here, only of military glory, and the former outweighed the latter. If the Spaniards failed to subjugate the Mahometans, or to incorporate their territory in the general administrative system of the colony, after three centuries of intermittent endeavor, it is difficult to conceive that the Philippine Republic, had it subsisted, would have been more successful. It would have been useless to have resolved to leave the Moros to themselves, practically ignoring their existence. Any Philippine government must needs hold them in check for the public will, for the fact is patent that the Moro hates the native Christian not one iota less than he does the white man 163 one according to Father Pedro Murillo, the ancient name of Basilan was Taguima, so called from a river there of that name. Two Mahometanism appears to have been introduced into the islands of Borneo and Mindanao by Arabian missionary prophets. Three it was called the Fuerza del Pilar, and is now the American Moro Province Military Headquarters and Headquarter Master's Office and Depot. The image of Our Lady in a niche in the north wall is much revered by Catholics. For Paseo de los Gigantes, the custom still existing in Spain of introducing giant figures into popular festivities, reminding one of Guy Fox. 5. The Sultan complained that he had not been treated in Manila with dignity equal to his rank and quality, and that he had constantly been under guard of soldiers in his residence, this was explained to be a guard of honor. 6. Cholera has considerably reduced the population. In 1902 this disease carried off about 10 per center. 7. Brunei signifies, in pure Malay, the whole of Borneo Island. 8. The Sultan told me years afterwards that his uncle's nomination by the Spaniards troubled him very little, as he was always recognized by his people as their sovereign. In the end intrigues were made against Ditto Harun Narasid, who agreed to accept his nephew's vassal Sultanate of Paragua, where he died, and was succeeded by his son, Sultan Tatarasa, whom I met in Holo in 1904. 9. Kata Abato is derived from Kata, a fort, and Bato, stone. 10. By Royal Order of June, 1890, BRIG General Arolas was appointed Governor of Mindanao. He died in Valencia, Spain, May, 1899. 11. According to Sun Arat, Sulu Island produced elephants, Vidi Voyages Auxiliary in ZT Alachain, Volume 3, Chap X. I have not seen the above statement confirmed in any writing. Certainly there is no such animal in these islands at the present day. 12. This building was destroyed by Colonel Arolas, April 15, 1887, Vidi P. 144. 13. A few outposts had recently been established by royal decree. They were all under the command of a captain, Vidi Chap 13. 14. There is another tribe in Palawan Island called Batax, with Papuan noses, curly hair, and very dark skin. Their origin is a mystery. 15. Alfred March calls this the Tragulus Ranchil, and says it is also to be found in Malacca, Cochin China, and Pilo Condor, Vidi Lucan et Palawan, P.A.R.A. March. Paris, 1887. 16. By royal order of August 20, 1888, a concession of 12,000 to 14,000 hectares of land in Palawan was granted to Felipe Kanga Argel's y Alba, ex-governor of Puerta Princesa, for the term of 20 years. He could work mines, cut timber, and till the land so conceded under the law called Leyte Colonias Agricolas, of September 4, 1884, which was little more than an extension to the Philippines of the Peninsula Forest and Agricultural Law of June 3, 1868, Vidi Gacita de Madrid of September 29, 1888. It appears, however, from the Colonial Minister's Dispatch No. 515, to the Government General of the Colony, dated May 24, 1890, that the concessionaire had endeavored to associate himself with foreigners for the working of the concession. I myself had received from him several letters on the subject. The wording of the dispatch shows that suspicion was entertained of an eventual intention to declare territorial independence in Palawan. The government, wishing to avoid the possibility of embroilment with a foreign nation, 
unfortunately felt constrained to impose such restrictions upon the concessionaire as to render his enterprise valueless. Domesticated natives' origin character The generally accepted theory regarding the origin of the composite race which may be termed domesticated natives, is, that their ancestors migrated to these islands from Malaysia or the Malay Peninsula. But so many learned dissertations have emanated from distinguished men, propounding conflicting opinions on the descent of the Malays themselves, that we are still left on the field of conjecture. There is good reason to surmise that, at some remote period, these islands and the islands of Formosa and Borneo were united, and possibly also they conjointly formed a part of the Asiatic mainland. Many of the islets are mere coral reefs, and some of the larger islands are so distinctly of coral formation that, regarded together with the numerous volcanic evidences, one is induced to believe that the Philippine archipelago is the result of a stupendous upheaval by volcanic action. Point one at least it seems apparent that no autochthonous population existed on these lands in their island form. The first settlers were probably the Edas, called also Negritos and Bailugas, who may have drifted northwards from New Guinea and have been carried by the strong currents through the San Bernardino Straits and round Punta Santiago until they reached the still waters in the neighborhood of Corregidor Island, whilst others were carried westwards to the tranquil Sulu Sea, and traveling thence northwards would have settled on the island of Negros. It is a fact that for over a century after the Spanish conquest, Negros Island had no other inhabitants but these mountaineers and escaped criminals from other islands. The sturdy races inhabiting the central Luzon highlands, decidedly superior in physique and mental capacity to the Edas, may be of Japanese origin, for shortly after the conquest by Legaspi a Spanish galley cruising off the north coast of Luzon fell in with Japanese, who probably 164 penetrated to the interior of that island up the Rio Grande de Cagayan. Tradition tells us how the Japanese used to sail down the east coast of Luzon as far as the neighborhood of Lamon Bay, where they landed and, descending the little rivers which flowed into the Lake of Bay, settled in that region which was called by the first Spanish conquerors Pixinjan province, and which included the Laguna province of today, with a portion of the modern Tayaba province. A Visayan girl a Visayan girl either the Japanese extended their sphere from the Lake of Bay shore, or, as some assert, Probably erroneously, shipwrecked Japanese went up the Pansipat River to the Bomban Lake, the fact remains that Tal, with the Bomban Lake shore, was a Japanese settlement, and even up to now the Talinos have characteristics differing from those of the pure Malay immigrant descendants. The Philippine patriot, Dr. Jose Rizal, was a good Japanese Malay type. A Tagalog girl a Tagalog girl the Tagalogs, who occupy a small portion of Luzon Island, chiefly the provinces of Batangas, Laguna, Rizal, and Bulacan, are believed to be the crossbreed descendants of these Japanese immigrants. At the period of the Spanish conquest the Tao Ilog, that is to say, the man who came by the river, afterwards corrupted into the more euphonious name of Tagalog, occupied only the lands from the south shore of Laguna de Bay southwards. Some traded with the Malay settlers at Manila, as the city on the Pasig River was then called, and, little by little, radicate themselves in the Manila suburbs of Quiapo, Sampaloc, and Santa Cruz. Point two from the west, long before the Spanish conquest, there was a great influx of Malays, who settled on the shores and the lowlands and drove the first settlers, Itas, to the mountains. Central Luzon and the lake environs being already occupied, they spread all over the vacant lands and adjacent islands south of Luzon. These expeditions from Malaysia were probably accompanied by Mahometan propagandists, who had imparted to the Malays some notions, more or less crude, of their religion and culture, for at the time of Legaspi's arrival in Manila we find he had to deal with two chiefs, or petty kings, both assuming the Indian title of Raja, whilst one of them had the Mahometan Arabic name of Solomon. Hitherto the Tau Ilog, or Tagalog, had not descended the Pasig River so far as Manila, and the religious rites of the Tonda Manila people must have appeared to Legaspi similar to the Mahometan rites 3 for in several of his dispatches to 165 his royal master he speaks of these people as Moros. All the dialects spoken by the Filipinos of Malay and Japanese descent have their root in the pure Malay language. 
After the expulsion of all the adult male Japanese lake settlers in the 17th century, it is feasible to suppose that the language of the males who took their place in the lake district and intermarried there, should prevail over the idiom of the primitive settlers, and possibly this amalgamation of speech accounts for the difference between the Tagalog dialect and others of these islands peopled by Malays. The Malay immigration must have taken place several generations prior to the coming of the Spaniards, for at that period the lowland occupants were already divided into people speaking different dialects and distinguishing themselves by groups whose names seemed to be associated with the districts they inhabited, such as Pampanga, Ilico, and Cagayan, these denominations are probably derived from some natural condition, such as Pampang, meaning a river embankment, Ilog, a river, Kauyan, a bamboo, etc. In a separate chapter, X, the reputed origin of the Mahometans of the southern islands is alluded to. They are also believed to be immigrants from the west, and at the time of the conquest recent traditions which came to the knowledge of the Spaniards, and were recorded by them, prove that commercial relations existed between Borneo and Manila. There is a tradition for also of an attempted conquest of Luzon by a Borneo chief named Lakasama, about 250 years before the Spanish advent, but apparently the expedition came to grief near Luzon, off an island supposed by some to be Masbait. The descendants of the Japanese and Malay immigrants were the people whom the Spanish invaders had to subdue to gain a footing. To the present day they, and the correlative Chinese and Spanish half-castes, are the only races, among the several in these islands, subjected, in fact, to civilized methods. The expression Filipino neither denotes any autochthonous race, nor any nationality, but simply one born in those islands named the Philippines, it is, therefore, open to argument whether the child of a Filipino, born in a foreign country, could be correctly called a Filipino. The Christianized Filipinos, enjoying today the benefits of European training, are inclined to repudiate, as compatriots, the descendants of the non-Christian tribes, although their concurrent existence, since the time of their immigrant forefathers, makes them all equally Filipinos. Hence many of them who were sent to the St. Louis exhibition in 1904 were indignant because the United States government had chosen to exhibit some types of uncivilized natives, representing about one-twelfth of the Philippine population. Without 166 these exhibits, and on seeing only the educated Filipinos who formed the Philippine Commission, the American people at home might well have asked is not American civilization a superfluity in those islands? The inhabitants of these islands were by no means savages, entirely unreclaimed from barbarism before the Spanish advent in the 16th century. They had a culture of their own, towards which the Malay settlers themselves appear to have contributed very little. In the nascent pre-Spanish civilization, Japanese immigrants were almost the only agriculturists, mine workers, manufacturers, gold seekers, goldsmiths, and masters of the industrial arts in general. Pixinjan, Laguna, was their great industrial center Malolos, Bulacan, was also an important Japanese trading base. Whilst working the mines of Ilocos their exemplary industry must undoubtedly have influenced the character of the Ilocanos. Away down in the Baikal country of Camarines, the Japanese pushed their trade, and from their great settlement in Tal their traffic must have extended over the whole province, first called by the Spaniards Tal y Balayan, but since named Batangas. From the Japanese, the Malays learned the manufacture of arms, and the Igor wrote the art of metal working. Along the coasts of the large inhabited islands the Chinese traveled as traders or middlemen, at great personal risk of attack by individual robbers, bartering the goods of manufacturers for native produce, which chiefly consisted of cinnamite cloth, shark fin, ballet, trepang, edible bird's nests, gold in grain, and sigi shells, for which there was a demand in Siam for use as money. Every northeast monsoon brought down the junks to barter leisurely until the southwest monsoon should waft them back, and neither Chinese nor Japanese made the least attempt, nor apparently had the least desire, to govern the islands or to overrule the natives. Without coercion, 
the Malay settlers would appear to have unconsciously submitted to the influence of the superior talent or astuteness of the sedulous races with whom they became merged and whose customs they adopted, proof of which can be traced to the present day. Point five, presumably the busy, industrious immigrants had neither time nor inclination for sanguinary conflicts, for those recorded appear to be confined to the raids of the migratory mountaineers and an occasional attack by some ambitious Borneo buccaneer. The reader who would wish to verify these facts is recommended to make a comparative study of native character in Vigan, Malolos, Tal, and Pixinjan. In treating of the domesticated native's character, I wish it to be understood that my observations apply solely to the large majority of the six or seven millions of them who inhabit these islands. In the capital and the ports open to foreign trade, where cosmopolitan vices and virtues obtain, and in large towns, where 167 there is a constant number of domiciled Europeans and Americans, the native has become a modified being. It is not in such places that a just estimate of character can be arrived at, even during many years' sojourn. The native must be studied by often repeated casual residence in localities where his, or her, domestication is only by law established, imposing little restraint upon natural inclinations, and where exotic notions have gained no influence. Several writers have essayed to depict the Philippine native character, but with only partial success. Dealing with such an enigma, the most eminent physiognomists would surely differ in their speculations regarding the Philippine native of the present day. That Catonian figure, with placid countenance and solemn gravity of feature, would readily deceive anyone as to the true mental organism within. The late parish priest of Alaminos, Batangas, a Franciscan friar, who spent half his life in the colony left a brief manuscript essay on the native character. I have read it. In his opinion, the native is an incomprehensible phenomenon, the mainspring of whose line of thought and the guiding motive of whose actions have never yet been, and perhaps never will be, discovered. The reasoning of a native and a European differs so largely that the mental impulse of the two races is ever clashing. Sometimes a native will serve a master satisfactorily for years, and then suddenly abscond, or commit some such hideous crime as conniving with a brigand band to murder the family and pillage the house. When the hitherto faithful servant is remonstrated with for having committed a crime, he not unfrequently accounts for the fact by saying, Senor, my head was hot. When caught in the act on his first start on highway robbery or murder, his invariable excuse is that he is not a scoundrel himself, but that he was invited by a relation or compadre to join the company. He is fond of gambling, profligate, lavish in his promises, but latch in the extreme as to their fulfillment. He will never come frankly and openly forward to make a clean breast of a fault committed, or even a pardonable accident, but will hide it, until it is found out. In common with many other non-European races, an act of generosity or a voluntary concession of justice is regarded as a sign of weakness. Hence it is that the experienced European is often compelled to be more harsh than his real nature dictates. If one pays a native 20 cents for a service performed, and that be exactly the customary remuneration, he will say nothing, but if a feeling of compassion impels one to pay 30 cents, the recipient will loudly protest that he ought to be paid more. Point six in Luzon, the native 168 is able to say thank you, salamat po, in his mother tongue, but in Panay and Negroes there is no way of expressing thanks in native dialect to a donor, the nearest approach to it is Dios Maabea, and although this may, at first sight, appear to be an insignificant fact, I think, nevertheless, a great deal may be deduced from it for the deficiency of the word in the Vasia vernacular denotes a deficiency of the idea which that word should express. If the native be in want of a trivial thing, which by plain asking he could readily obtain, he will come with a long tail, often begin by telling a lie, and whilst he invariably scratches his head, he will beat about the bush until he comes to the point, with a supplicating tone and a saintly countenance hiding a mass of falsity. But if he has nothing to gain for himself, his reticence is astonishingly inconvenient, for he may let one's horse die and tell one afterwards it was for want of rice paddy, or, just at the very moment one wants to use something, he will tell one Ualapo there is not any. 
I have known natives whose mothers, according to their statement, have died several times, and each time they have tried to beg the loan of the burial expenses. The mother of my first servant died twice, according to his account. Even the best class of natives do not appreciate, or feel grateful for, or even seem to understand a spontaneous gift. Apparently, they only comprehend a favor when one yields to their asking. The lowest classes never give to each other, unsolicited, a sense worth, outside the customary reciprocal feast offerings. If a European makes voluntary gratuities to the natives, he is considered a fool they entertain a contempt for him, which develops into intolerable impertinence. If the native comes to borrow, lend him a little less than he asks for, after a verbose preamble, if one at once lent, or gave, the full value requested, he would continue to invent a host of pressing necessities, until one's patience was exhausted. He seldom restores the loan of anything voluntarily. On being remonstrated with for his remissness, after the date of repayment or return of the article has expired, he will coolly reply, you did not ask me for it. An amusing case of native reasoning came within my experience just recently. I lent some articles to an educated Filipino, who had frequently been my guest, and, at the end of three months, I requested their return. Instead of thanking me for their use, he wrote a letter expressing his indignation at my reminder, saying that I ought to know they were in very good hands. A native considers it no degradation to borrow money, it gives him no recurrent feeling of humiliation or distress of mind. Thus, he will often give a costly feast to impress his neighbors with his wealth and maintain his local prestige, whilst on all sides he has debts innumerable. At most, with his looseness of morality, he regards debt as an inconvenience, not as a calamity 169 before entering another, middle or lower class, native's house, he is very complimentary, and sometimes three minutes polite excusatory dialogue is exchanged between the visitor and the native visited before the former passes the threshold. When the same class of native enters a European's house, he generally satisfies his curiosity by looking all around, and often pokes his head into a private room, asking permission to enter afterwards. The lower class native never comes at first call, among themselves it is usual to call five or six times, raising the voice each time. If a native is told to tell another to come, he seldom goes to him to deliver the message, but calls him from a distance. When a native steals, and I must say they are fairly honest, he steals only what he wants. One of the rudest acts, according to their social code, is to step over a person asleep on the floor. Sleeping is, with them, a very solemn matter, they are very averse to waking anyone, the idea being, that during sleep the soul is absent from the body, and that if slumber be suddenly arrested the soul might not have time to return. When a person, knowing the habits of the native, calls upon him and is told he is asleep, he does not inquire further the rest is understood, that he may have to wait an indefinite time until the sleeper wakes up so he may as well depart. To urge a servant to rouse one, one has to give him very imperative orders to that effect, then he stands by one side and calls senor, senor, repeatedly, and each time louder, until one is half awake, then he returns to the low note, and gradually raises his voice again until one is quite conscious. In Spanish times, wherever I went in the whole archipelago near the capital, or 500 miles from it I found mothers teaching their offspring to regard the European as a demoniacal being, an evil spirit, or, at least, as an enemy to be feared. If a child cried, it was hushed by the exclamation, Castilla. European. If a white man approached a poor hut or a fine native residence, the cry of caution, the watchword for defense was always heard Castilla. And the children hastened their retreat from the dreaded object. But this is now a thing of the past since the native crossed swords with the Castilla, QV, and the American on the battlefield, and, rightly or wrongly, thoroughly believes himself to be a match for either in equal numbers. The Filipino, like most Orientals, is a good imitator, but having no initiative genius, he is not efficient in anything. 
he will copy a model any number of times, but one cannot get him to make two copies so much alike that the one is undistinguishable from the other. Yet he has no attachment for any occupation in particular. Today he will be at the plow, tomorrow a coachman, a collector of accounts, a valet, a sailor, and so on, or he will suddenly renounce social trammels in pursuit of lawless vagabondage. I once traveled 170 with a Colonel Marcus, acting governor of Cebu, whose valet was an ex-law student. Still, many are willing to learn, and really become very expert artisans, especially machinists. The native is indolent in the extreme, and never tires of sitting still, gazing at nothing in particular. He will do no regular work without an advance, his word cannot be depended upon, he is fertile in exculpatory devices, he is momentarily obedient, but is averse to subjection. He feigns friendship, but has no loyalty, he is calm and silent, but can keep no secret, he is daring on the spur of the moment, but fails in resolution if he reflects. He is wantonly unfeeling towards animals, cruel to a fallen foe, tyrannical over his own people when in power, rarely tempers his animosities with compassion or pity, but is devotedly fond of his children. He is shifty, erratic, void of chivalrous feeling, and if familiarity be permitted with the common class native, he is liable to presume upon it. The Tagalog is docile and pliant, but keenly resents an injustice. Native superstition and facile credulity are easily imposed upon. A report emitted in jest, or in earnest, travels with alarming rapidity, and the consequences have not unfrequently been serious. The native rarely sees a joke, and still more rarely makes one. He never reveals anger, but he will, with the most profound calmness, avenge himself, awaiting patiently the opportunity to use his bowie knife with effect. Mutilation of a vanquished enemy is common among these islanders. If a native recognizes a fault by his own conscience, he will receive a flogging without resentment or complaint, if he is not so convinced of the misdeed, he will await his chance to give vent to his rancor. He has a profound respect only for the elders of his household, and the lash justly administered. He rarely refers to past generations in his lineage, and the lowest class do not know their own ages. The Filipino, of any class, has no memory for dates. In 1904 not one in a hundred remembered the month and year in which General Aguinaldo surrendered. During the Independence War, an esteemed friend of mine, a Philippine priest, died, presumably of old age. I went to his town to inquire all about it from his son, but neither the son nor another near relation could recollect, after two days reflection, even the year the old man passed away. Another friend of mine had his brains blown out during the revolution. His brother was anxious to relate the tragedy to me and how he had lost 20,000 pesos in consequence, but he could not tell me in which month it happened. Families are very united, and claims for help and protection are admitted however distant the relationship may be. Sometimes the connection of a hanger-on with his host's family will be so remote and doubtful, that he can only be recognized as un poco parent not a moss, a sort of kinsman. But the house is open to all. The native is a good father and a good husband, unreasonably 171 jealous of his wife, careless of the honor of his daughter, and will take no heed of the indiscretions of his spouse committed before marriage. Cases have been known of natives having fled from their burning huts, taking care to save their fighting cocks, but leaving their wives and children to look after themselves. If a question be suddenly put to a native, he apparently loses his presence of mind, and gives the reply most convenient to save himself from trouble, punishment, or reproach. It is a matter of perfect indifference to him whether the reply be true or not. Then, as the investigation proceeds, he will amend one statement after another, until, finally, he has practically admitted his first explanation to be quite false. One who knows the native character, so far as its mysteries are penetrable, would never attempt to get at the truth of a question by a direct inquiry he would beat about the bush, and extract the truth bit by bit. Nor do the natives, rich or poor, of any class in life, and with very few exceptions in the whole population, 
appear to regard lying as a sin, but rather as a legitimate, though cunning, convenience, which should be resorted to whenever it will serve a purpose. It is my frank opinion that they do not, in their consciences, hold lying to be a fault in any degree. If the liar be discovered and faced, he rarely appears disconcerted his countenance rather denotes surprise at the discovery, or disappointment at his being foiled in the object for which he lied. As this is one of the most remarkable characteristics of the Filipino of both sexes in all spheres of life, I have repeatedly discussed it with the priests, several of whom have assured me that the habit prevails even in the confessional. Point seven in the administration of justice the circumstance is inconvenient, because a witness is always procurable for a few pesos. In a law case, in which one or both parties belong to the lowest class, it is sometimes difficult to say whether the false or the true witnesses are in majority. Men and women alike find exaggerated enjoyment in litigation, which many keep up for years. Among themselves they are tyrannical. They have no real sentiment, nor do they practice virtue for virtue's sake, and, apart from their hospitality, in which they, especially the Tagalogs, far excel the European, all their actions appear to be only guided by fear, or interest, or both. The domesticated Tagalogs of Luzon have made greater progress in civilization and good manners than the Visios of Panay and Negros. The Tagalog differs vastly from his southern brother in his true nature, which is more pliant, whilst he is by instinct cheerfully and 172 disinterestedly hospitable. Invariably a European wayfarer in a Tagalog village is invited by one or another of the principal residents to lodge at his house as a free guest, for to offer payment would give offence. A present of some European article might be made, but it is not at all looked for. The Tagalog host lends his guest horses or vehicles to go about the neighborhood, takes him round to the houses of his friends, accompanies him to any feast which may be celebrated at the time of his visit, and lends him his sporting gun, if he has one. The whole time he treats him with the deference due to the superiority which he recognizes. He is remarkably inquisitive, and will ask all sorts of questions about one's private affairs, but that is of no consequence he is not intrusive, and if he be invited to return the visit in the capital, or wherever one may reside, he accepts the invitation reluctantly, but seldom pays the visit. Speaking of the Tagalog as a host, pure and simple, he is generally the most genial man one could hope to meet. A Visayan planter a Visayan planter the Negroes and Panavisia's cold hospitality is much tempered with the prospect of personal gain quite a contrast to the Tagalog. On the first visit he might admit the white traveler into his house out of mere curiosity to know all about him whence he comes why he travels how much he possesses and where he is going. The basis of his estimation of a visitor is his worldly means, or, if the visitor be engaged in trade, his power to facilitate his host's schemes would bring him a certain measure of civility and complaisance. He is fond of, and seeks the patronage of Europeans of position. In manners, the Negroes, and Panavasia is uncouth and brusque, and more conceited, arrogant, self-reliant, ostentatious, and unpolished than his northern neighbor. If remonstrated with for any fault, he is quite disposed to assume a tone of impertinent retort or sullen defiance. The Cebuano is more congenial and hospitable. The women, too, are less affable in Panay and Negroes, and evince an almost incredible avarice. They are excessively fond of ornament, and at feasts they appear adorned with an amount of gaudy French jewelry which, compared with their means, cost them a lot of money to purchase from the swarm of Jew peddlers who, before the revolution of 1896, periodically invaded the villages. A Chinese half-caste a Chinese half-caste if a European calls on a well-to-do Negroes or Panavasia, the women of the family saunter off in one direction or another, to hide themselves in other rooms, unless the visitor be well known to the family. If met by chance, perhaps they will return a salutation, perhaps not. They seldom indulge in a smile before a stranger, have no conversation, no tuition beyond music and the lives of the saints, and altogether impress the traveler with their insipidity of character, which chimes badly with their manifest air of disdain. The women of Luzon, and in a slightly less degree the Cebuanas, 
173 are more frank, better educated, and decidedly more courteous and sociable. Their manners are comparatively lively, void of arrogance, cheerful, and buoyant in tone. However, all over the islands the women are more parsimonious than the men, but, as a rule, they are more clever and discerning than the other sex, over whom they exercise great influence. Many of them are very dexterous business women and have made the fortunes of their families. A notable example of this was the late Dona Cornelia Loconco, of Manila, with whom I was personally acquainted, and who, by her own talent in trading transactions, accumulated considerable wealth. Dona Cornelia, who died in 1899, was the foundress of the system of blending sugar to sample for export, known in Manila as the Farderia. In her establishment at San Miguel she had a little tower erected, whence a watchman kept his eye on the weather. When threatening clouds appeared a bell was tolled and the mats were instantly picked up and carried off by her Chinese coolie staff, which she managed with great skill, due, perhaps, to the fact that her three husbands were Chinese. The Philippine woman makes an excellent general servant in native families, in the same capacity, in European service, she is, as a rule, almost useless, but she is a good nursemaid. The Filipino has many excellent qualities which go far to make amends for his shortcomings. He is patient and forbearing in the extreme, remarkably sober, plodding, anxious only about providing for his immediate wants, and seldom feels the canker of ambitious thoughts. In his person and his dwelling he may serve as a pattern of cleanliness to all other races in the tropical east. He has little thought beyond the morrow, and therefore never racks his brains about events of the far future in the political world, the world to come, or any other sphere. He indifferently leaves everything to happen as it may, with surprising resignation. The native, in general, will go without food for many hours at a time without grumbling, and fish, rice, betel nut, and tobacco are his chief wants. Inebriety is almost unknown, although strong drink, nipa wine, is plentiful. In common with other races whose lives are almost exclusively passed amid the ever-varying wonders of land and sea, Filipinos rarely express any spontaneous admiration for the beauties of nature, and seem little sensible to any aspect thereof not directly associated with the human interest of their calling. Few Asiatics, indeed, go into raptures over lovely scenery as Europeans do, nor does the gorgeous glamour of the Orient which we speak of so ecstatically strike them as such. When a European is travelling, he never needs to trouble about where or when his servant gets his food or where he sleeps he looks after that. When a native travels, he drops in amongst any group 174 of his fellow countrymen whom he finds having their meal on the roadside, and wherever he happens to be at nightfall, there he lies down to sleep. He is never long in a great dilemma. If his hut is about to fall, he makes it fast with bamboo and rattan cane. If a vehicle breaks down, a harness snaps, or his canoe leaks or upsets, he always has his remedy at hand. He stoically bears misfortune of all kinds with the greatest indifference, and without the least apparent emotion. Under the eye of his master he is the most tractable of all beings. He never, like the Chinese, insists upon doing things his own way, but tries to do just as he is told, whether it be right or wrong. A native enters one service as a coachman, but if he be told to paddle a boat, cook a meal, fix a lock, or do any other kind of labor possible to him, he is quite agreeable. He knows the duties of no occupation with efficiency, and he is perfectly willing to be a jack of all trades. Another good feature is that he rarely, if ever, repudiates a debt, although he may never pay it. So long as he gets his food and fair treatment, and his stipulated wages in advance, he is content to act as a general utility man, lodging he will find for himself. If not pressed too hard, he will follow his superior like a faithful dog. If treated with kindness, according to European notions, he is lost. The native never looks ahead, if left to himself, he will do all sorts of imprudent things, from sheer want of reflection on the consequences, when, as he puts it, 
his head is hot from excitement due to any cause. On March 15, 1886, I was coming round the coast of Zimbals in a small steamer, in which I was the only saloon passenger. The captain, whom I had known for years, found that one of the cabin servants had been systematically pilfering for some time past. He ordered the steward to cane him, and then told him to go to the upper deck and remain there. He at once walked up the ladder and threw himself into the sea, but the vessel stopped, a boat was lowered, and he was soon picked up. Had he been allowed to reach the shore, he would have become what is known as a remontadu and perhaps eventually a brigand, for such is the beginning of many of them. The thoroughbred native has no idea of organization on a large scale, hence a successful revolution is not possible if confined to his own class unaided by others, such as Creoles and foreigners. He is brave, and fears no consequences when with or against his equals, or if led by his superiors, but a conviction of superiority moral or physical in the adversary depresses him. An excess of audacity calms and overawes him rather than irritates him. His admiration for bravery and perilous boldness is only equaled by his contempt for cowardice and puerility, and this is really the secret of the natives' disdain for the Chinese race. Under good European officers he makes an excellent soldier, and would follow a brave leader to death, however, if the leader fell, he would at once become demoralized. 175 There is nothing he delights in more than pillage, destruction, and bloodshed, and when once he becomes master of the situation in an affray, there is no limit to his greed and savage cruelty. Yet, detesting order of any kind, military discipline is repugnant to him, and, as in other countries where conscription is the law, all kinds of tricks are resorted to to avoid it. On looking over the deeds of an estate which I had purchased, I saw that two brothers, each named Catalino Raimundo, were the owners at one time of a portion of the land. I thought there must have been some mistake, but, on close inquiry, I found that they were so named to dodge the Spanish recruiting officers, who would not readily suppose there were two Catalino Raimundos born of the same parents. As one Catalino Raimundo had served in the army and the other was dead, no further secret was made in the matter, and I was assured that this practice was common among the poorest natives. In November, 1887, a deserter from the new recruits was pursued to Lanka, a ward of Makoayan, Bulacan province, where nearly all the inhabitants rose up in his defense, the result being that the lieutenant of Cuadraleros was killed and two of his men were wounded. When the civil guard appeared on the spot, the whole ward was abandoned. According to the Spanish army regulations, a soldier cannot be on sentinel duty for more than two hours at a time under any circumstances. Cases have been known of a native sentinel having been left at his post for a little over that regulation time, and to have become frenetic, under the impression that the two hours had long since expired, and that he had been forgotten. In one case the man had to be disarmed by force, but in another instance the sentinel simply refused to give up his rifle and bayonet, and defied all who approached him. Finally, an officer went with the colors of the regiment in hand to exhort him to surrender his arms, adding that justice would attend his complaint. The sentinel, however, threatened to kill anyone who should draw near, and the officer had no other recourse open to him but to order a European soldier to climb up behind the sentry box and blow out the insubordinate native's brains. In the 70s, a contingent of Philippine troops was sent to assist the French in Tonquin, where they rendered very valuable service. Indeed, some officers are of opinion that they did more to quell the Taduk rising than the French troops themselves. When in the fray, they throw off their boots, and, barefooted, they rarely falter. Even over mud and swamp, a native is almost as sure-footed as a goat on the brink of a quarry. I have frequently been carried for miles in a hammock by four natives and relays, through morassy districts too dangerous to travel on horseback. They are great adepts at climbing wherever it is possible for a human being to scale a height, like 176 monkeys, they hold as much with their feet as with their hands, they ride any horse barebacked without fear, they are utterly careless about jumping into the sea among the sharks, which sometimes they will intentionally attack with knives, and I never knew a native who could not swim. 
there are natives who dare dive for the caiman and rip it up. If they meet with an accident, they bear it with supreme resignation, simply exclaiming disgrace pa it was a misfortune. I can record with pleasure my happy recollection of many a light-hearted, genial, and patient native who accompanied me on my journeys in these islands. Comparatively very few thoroughbred natives travel beyond their own islands, although there is a constant flow of half-castes to and from the adjacent colonies, Europe, etc. The native is very slowly tempted to abandon the habits and traditional customs of his forefathers, and his ambitionless felicity may be envied by any true philosopher. No one who has lived in the colony for years could sketch the real moral portrait of such a remarkable combination of virtues and vices. The domesticated native's character is a succession of surprises. The experience of each year modifies one's conclusions, and the most exact definition of such an inscrutable being is, after all, hypothetical. However, to a certain degree, the characteristic indolence of these islanders is less dependent on themselves than on natural law, for the physical conditions surrounding them undoubtedly tend to arrest their vigor of motion, energy of life, and intellectual power. The organic elements of the European differ widely from those of the Philippine native, and each, for his own durability, requires his own special environment. The half-breed partakes of both organisms, but has the natural environment of the one. Sometimes artificial means the mode of life into which he is forced by his European parent will counteract in a measure natural law, but, left to himself, the tendency will ever be towards an assimilation to the native. Original national characteristics disappear in an exotic climate, and, in the course of time, conform to the new laws of nature to which they are exposed. It is an ascertained fact that the increase of energy introduced into the Philippine native by blood mixture from Europe lasts only to the second generation, whilst the effect remains for several generations when there is a similarity of natural surroundings in the two races crossed. Moreover, the peculiar physique of a Chinese or Japanese progenitor is preserved in succeeding generations, long after the Spanish descendant has merged into the conditions of his environment. The Spanish government strove in vain against natural law to counteract physical conditions by favoring mixed marriages eight but nature overcomes man's law, and climatic influence forces its conditions 177 on the half-breed. Indeed, were it not for new supplies of extraneous blood infusion, European characteristics would, in time, become indiscernible among the masses. Even on Europeans themselves, in defiance of their own volition, the new physical conditions and the influence of climate on their mental and physical organisms are perceptible after two or three decades of years' residence in the mid-tropics. All the natives of the domesticated type have distinct Malay or Malay-Japanese or Mongol features prominent cheekbones, large and lively eyes, and flat noses with dilated nostrils. They are, on the average, of rather low stature, very rarely bearded, and of a copper color more or less dark. Most of the women have no distinct line of hair on the forehead. Some there are with a frontal hairy down extending to within an inch of the eyes, possibly a reversion to a progenitor, the macacus radiata, in whom the forehead had not become quite naked, leaving the limit between the scalp and the forehead undefined. The hair of both males and females stands out from the skin like bristles, and is very coarse. The coarseness of the female's hair is, however, more than compensated by its luxuriance, for, provided she be in a normal state of health, up to the prime of life the hair commonly reaches down to the waist, and occasionally to the ankles. The women are naturally proud of this mark of beauty, which they preserved by frequent washings with gogo, QV, and the use of coconut oil, QV. Hair lip is common. Children, from their birth, have a spot at the base of the vertebrae, thereby supporting the theory of Professor Huxley's Anthropody Suborder or Man, Vidi Professor Huxley's An Introduction to the Classification of Animals, p. 99. Published 1869. Marriages between natives are usually arranged by the parents of the respective families. The nubile age of females is from about 11 years. The parents of the young man visit those of the maiden, to approach the subject delicately in an oratorical style of allegory. 
the response is in like manner shrouded with mystery, and the veil is only thrown off the negotiations when it becomes evident that both parties agree. Among the poorer classes, if the young man has no goods to offer, it is frequently stipulated that he shall serve on probation for an indefinite period in the house of his future bride as Jacob served Laban to make Rachel his wife and not a few drudge for years with this hope before them. Sometimes, in order to secure service gratis, the elders of the young woman will suddenly dismiss the young man after a prolonged expectation, and take another catapad. As he is called, on the same terms. The old colonial legislation Leyista Indias in vain prohibited this barbarous ancient custom, and there was a modern Spanish law, of which few availed themselves, which permitted the intended bride to be 178 deposited away from parental custody, whilst the parents were called upon to show cause why the union should not take place. However, it often happens that when Cupid has already shot his arrow into the virginal breast, and the betrothed foresee a determined opposition to their mutual hopes, they anticipate the privileges of matrimony, and compel the bride's parents to countenance their legitimate aspirations to save the honor of the family. Honi so it ki mal why pence they simply force the hand of a dictatorial mother-in-law. The women are notably mercenary, and if, on the part of the girl and her people, there be a hitch, it is generally on the question of dollars when both parties are native. Of course, if the suitor be European, no such question is raised the ambition of the family and the vanity of the girl being both satisfied by the alliance itself. When the proposed espousals are accepted, the donations proternuptious are paid by the father of the bridegroom to defray the wedding expenses, and often a dowry settlement, called in Tagalog dialect by Gaikea is made in favor of the bride. Very rarely the bride's property is settled on the husband. I never heard of such a case. The Spanish laws relating to married persons' property were quaint. If the husband were poor and the wife well off, so they might remain, notwithstanding the marriage. He, as a rule, became a simple administrator of her possessions, and, if honest, often depended on her liberality to supply his own necessities. If he became bankrupt in a business in which he employed also her capital or possessions, she ranked as a creditor of the second class under the commercial code. If she died, the poor husband, under no circumstances, by legal right, unless under a deed signed before a notary, derived any benefit from the fact of his having espoused a rich wife, her property passed to their legitimate issue, or in default thereof to her nearest blood relation. The children might be rich, and, but for their generosity, their father might be destitute, whilst the law compelled him to render a strict account to them of the administration of their property during their minority. This fact has given rise to many lawsuits. A married woman often signs her maiden name, sometimes adding to her husband's surname. If she survives him, she again takes up her nomen ante nuptias amongst her old circle of friends, and only adds widow of to show who she is to the public, if she be in trade, or to those who have only known her as a married woman. The offspring use both the parental surnames, the mother's coming after the father's, hence it is the more prominent. Frequently, in Spanish documents requiring the mention of a person's name in full, the mother's maiden surname is revived. Thus marriage, as I understand the spirit of the Spanish law, seems to be a simple contract to legitimize and license procreation. Up to the year 1844, only a minority of the Christian natives had 179 distinctive family names. They were, before that date, known by certain harsh ejaculations, and classification of families was uncared for among the majority of the population. Therefore, in that year, a list of Spanish surnames was sent to each parish priest, and every native family had to adopt a separate appellation, which has ever since been perpetuated. Hence one meets natives bearing illustrious names such as Juan Salcido, Juan de Austria, Ryan Zars, Ramon de Cabrera, Pio Nono Lopez, and a great many Legaspis. When a wedding among natives was determined upon, the betrothed went to the priest not necessarily together kissed his hand, and informed him of their intention. There was a tariff of marriage fees, but the priest usually set this aside, 
and fixed his charges according to the resources of the parties. This abuse of power could hardly be resisted, as the natives have a radicate aversion to being married elsewhere than in the village of the bride. The priest, too, not the bride, usually had the privilege of naming the day. The fees demanded were sometimes enormous, the common result being that many couples merely cohabited under mutual vows because they could not pay the wedding expenses. The bans were verbally published after the benediction following the conclusion of the Mass. In the evening, prior to the marriage, it was compulsory on the couple to confess and obtain absolution from the priest. The nuptials almost invariably took place after the first Mass, between five and six in the morning, and those couples who were spiritually prepared first presented themselves for communion. Then an acolyte placed over the shoulders of the bridal pair a thick mantle or pall. The priest recited a short formula of about five minutes duration, put his interrogations, received the muttered responses, and all was over. To the espoused, as they left the church, was tendered a bowl of coin, the bridegroom passed a handful of the contents to the bride, who accepted it and returned it to the bowl. This act was symbolical of his giving to her his worldly goods. Then they left the church with their friends, preserving that solemn, stoical countenance common to all Malay natives. There was no visible sign of emotion as they all walked off, with the most matter-of-fact indifference, to the paternal abode. This was the custom under the Spaniards, and it still largely obtains, the revolution decreed civil marriage, which the Americans have declared lawful, but not compulsory. After the marriage ceremony the feast called the Catapuzan Nine begins. To this the vicar and headmen of the villages, the immediate friends and relatives of the allied families, and any Europeans who may 180 happen to be resident or sojourning, are invited. The table is spread, a la Russe, with all the good things procurable served at the same time sweet meats predominating. Imported beer, Dutch gin, chocolate, etc., are also in abundance. After the early repast, both men and women are constantly being offered betel nut to masticate, and cigars or cigarettes, according to choice. Meanwhile, the company is entertained by native dancers. Two at a time a young man and woman stand vis a vis and alternately sing a love ditty, the burthen of the theme usually opening by the regret of the young man that his amorous overtures have been disregarded. Explanations follow, in the poetic dialogue, as the parties dance around each other, keeping a slow step to the plaintive strains of music. This is called the Balintao. It is most popular in Visayas. Another dance is performed by a young woman only. If well executed it is extremely graceful. The girl begins singing a few words in an ordinary tone, when her voice gradually drops to the diminuendo, whilst her slow gesticulations and the declining vigor of the music together express her forlornness. Then a ray of joy seems momentarily to lighten her mental anguish, the spirited crescendo notes gently return, the tone of the melody swells, her measured step and action energetically quicken until she lapses again into resigned sorrow, and so on alternately. Coy in repulse, and languid in surrender, the Don Suze in the end forsakes her sentiment of melancholy for elated passion. The native dances are numerous. Another of the most typical, is that of a girl writhing and dancing a pasol with a glass of water on her head. This is known as the Comitan. When Europeans are present, the bride usually retires into the kitchen or a back room, and only puts in an appearance after repeated requests. The conversation rarely turns upon the event of the meeting, there is not the slightest outward manifestation of affection between the newly united couple, who, during the feast, are only seen together by mere accident. If there are European guests, the repast is served three times firstly for the Europeans and headmen, secondly for the males of less social dignity, and lastly for the women. Neither at the table nor in the reception room do the men and women mingle, except for perhaps the first quarter of an hour after the arrival, or whilst dancing continues. About an hour after the midday meal, those who are not lodging at the house return to their respective residences to sleep the siesta. On an occasion like this at a catapuzan given for any reason native outsiders, from anywhere, always invade the kitchen in a mob, lounge around doorways, 
fill up corners, and drop in for the feast uninvited, and it is usual to be liberally complacent to all comers. As a rule, the married couple live with the parents of one or the 181 other, at least until the family inconveniently increases. In old age, the elder members of the families come under the protection of the younger ones quite as a matter of course. In any case, a newly married pair seldom reside alone. Relations from all parts flock in. Cousins, uncles, and aunts, of more or less distant grade, hang on to the recently established household, if it be not extremely poor. Even when a European marries a native woman, she is certain to introduce some vagabond relation a drone to hive with the bees a condition quite inevitable, unless the husband be a man of specially determined character. Death at childbirth is very common, and it is said that 25% of the newborn children die within a month. Among the lowest classes, whilst a woman is lying in, the husband closes all the windows to prevent the evil spirit, Azuan, entering, sometimes he will wave about a stick or bowie knife at the door, or on top of the roof, for the same purpose. Even among the most enlightened, at the present day, the custom of shutting the windows is inherited from their superstitious forefathers, probably in ignorance of the origin of this usage. In Spanish times it was considered rather an honor than otherwise to have children by a priest, and little secret was made of it. In October, 1888, I was in a village near Manila, at the bedside of a sick friend, when the curate entered. He excused himself for not having called earlier, by explaining that Turing had sent him a message informing him that as the vicar, a native, had gone to Manila, he might take charge of the church and parish. Is Turing an assistant curate? I inquired. My friend and the pastor were so convulsed with laughter at the idea, that it was quite five minutes before they could explain that the intimation respecting the parochial business emanated from the absent vicar's bone Amy. Consanguine marriages are very common, and perhaps this accounts for the low intellect and mental debility perceptible in many families. Poor parents offer their girls to Europeans for a loan of money, and they are admitted under the pseudonym of sempstress or housekeeper. Natives among themselves do not kiss they smell each other, or rather, they place the nose and lip on the cheek and draw a long breath. Marriages between Spaniards and pure native women, although less frequent than formerly, still take place. Since 1899 many Americans, too, have taken pure native wives. It is difficult to apprehend an alliance so incongruous, there being no affinity of ideas, the only condition in common being, that they are both human beings professing Christianity. The husband is either drawn towards the level of the native by this heterogeneous relationship, or, in despair of remedying the error of a passing passion, he practically ignores his wife in his own social connections. Each forms then a distinct circle of friends of his, or her, own selection, whilst the woman is but slightly raised above her 182 own class by the white man's influence and contact. There are some exceptions, but I have most frequently observed in the houses of Europeans married to native women in the provinces, that the wives make the kitchen their chief abode, and are only seen by the visitor when some domestic duty requires them to move about the house. Familiarity breeds contempt, and these mesalliances diminish the dignity of the superior race by reducing the birth origin of both parents to a common level in their children. A Tagalog milkwoman A Tagalog milkwoman The Spanish half-breeds and Creoles constitute a very influential body. A great number of them are established in trade in Manila and the provinces. Due to their European descent, more or less distant, they are of quicker perception, greater tact, and gifted with wider intellectual faculties than the pure Oriental class. Also, the Chinese half-breeds a caste of Chinese fathers and Philippine mothers who form about one-sixth of the Manila population, are shrewder than the natives of pure extraction, their striking characteristic being distrust and suspicion of another's intentions. It is a curious fact that the Chinese half-caste speaks with as much contempt of the Chinaman as the thoroughbred Filipino does, and would fain hide his paternal descent. There are numbers of Spanish half-breeds fairly well educated, and just a few of them very talented. Many of them have succeeded in making pretty considerable fortunes in their negotiations, as middlemen, 
between the provincial natives and the European commercial houses. Their true social position is often an equivocal one, and the complex question has constantly to be confronted whether to regard a Spanish demi-sang from a native or European standpoint. Among themselves they are continually struggling to attain the respect and consideration accorded to the superior class, whilst their connections and purely native relations link them to the other side. In this perplexing mental condition, we find them on the one hand striving in vain to disown their affinity to the inferior races, and on the other hand, jealous of their true-born European acquaintances. A morosity of disposition is the natural outcome. Their character generally is evasive and vacillating. They are capped eas, fond of litigation, and constantly seeking subterfuges. They appear always dissatisfied with their lot in life, and inclined to foster grievances against whoever may be in office over them. Pretentious in the extreme, they are fond of pomp and paltry show, and it is difficult to trace any popular movement, for good or for evil, without discovering a half-breed initiator, or leader, of one caste or another. They are locally denominated mestizos. A Tagalog townsman A Tagalog townsman the Jesuit father, Pedro Murillo Villarde, at P272 of his work on this colony, expressed his opinion of the political-economical result of mixed marriages to the following effect now, he says, we have a querulous, discontented population of half-castes, who, sooner or later, will bring about a distracted state of society, and occupy the 183 whole force of the government to stamp out the discord. How far the prophecy was fulfilled will be seen in another chapter. Being naturally prone to superstitious beliefs, the islanders accepted, without doubting, all the fantastic tales which the early missionaries taught them. Miraculous crosses healed the sick, cured the plague, and scared away the locusts. Images, such as the holy child of Bangi, relieved them of all worldly sufferings. To this day they revere many of these objects, which are still preserved. The most ancient miraculous image in these islands appears to be the Santo Nino de Cebu the Holy Child of Cebu. It is recorded that on July 28, 1565, an image of the child Jesus was found on Cebu Island shore by a Basque soldier named Juan de Camus. It was venerated and kept by the Austin friars. Irreverent persons have alleged it was a pagan idol. Against this, it may be argued that the heathen Cebuanos were not known to have been idolaters. In 1627 a fire occurred in Cebu City, when the churches of Saint Nicholas and of the Holy Child were burnt down. The image was saved, and temporarily placed in charge of the Ricolito friars. A fire also took place on the site of the first cross erected on the island by Father Martin Dorada, the De Legaspi landed, and it is said that this cross, although made of bamboo, was not consumed. There now stands an oratory, wherein on special occasions is exposed the original cross. Close by is the modern church of the Holy Child. In June, 1887, the prior of the convent conducted me to the strong room where the wonderful image is kept. The saint is of wood, about 15 inches high, and laden with silver trinkets, which have been presented on different occasions. When exposed to public view, it has the honors of field marshal accorded to it. It is a mystic deity with ebon features so different from the lovely child presented to us on canvas by the great masters. During the feast held in its honor, January 20, pilgrims from the remotest districts of the island and from across the seas come to purify their souls at the shrine of the Holy Child. In the same room was a beautiful image of the Madonna, besides two large tin boxes containing sundry arms, legs, and heads of saints, with their robes in readiness for adjustment on procession days. The patron of Cebu City is Saint Vital. The legend of the celestial protector of Manila is not less interesting. It is related that in Dalao, now called Paco, near Manila, a wooden image of Saint Francis de Assisi, which was in the house of a native named Alonso Quiapet, was seen to weep so copiously that many cloths were moistened by its tears. The image, with its hands outspread during three hours, invoked God's blessing on Manila. And then, on closing its hands, it grasped a cross and skull. Vows were made to the saint, 
who was declared protector of the capital, and the same image 184 is now to be seen in the Franciscan Church, under the appellation of San Francisco de los Lagrimas Saint Francis of Tears. Up to the 70s of last century, a disgusting spectacle used to be annually witnessed at the Church of San Miguel, Manila, on December 8, it was a realistic representation of the Immaculate Conception. Our Lady of Cagsese, near Tal, Batangas, has been revered for many years both by Europeans and natives. So enthusiastic was the belief in the miraculous power of this image, that the galleons, when passing the Batangas coast on their way to and from Mexico, were accustomed to fire a salute from their guns, Vidi pages 18, 19. This image was picked up by a native in his fishing net, and he placed it in a cave, where it was discovered by other natives, who imagined they saw many extraordinary lights around it. According to the local legend, they heard sweet sonorous music proceeding from the same spot, and the image came forward and spoke to a native woman, who had brought her companions to adore the saint. The history of the many shrines all over the colony would well fill a volume, however, by far the most popular one is that of the Virgin of Antipolo Nuestra Señora de Bune Viage y de la Paz, Our Lady of Good Voyage and Peace. This image is said to have wrought many miracles. It was first brought from Acapulco, Mexico, in 1626 in the state galleon, by Juan Nino de Tabra, who was appointed government general of these islands, 1626-32, by King Philip IV. The saint, it is alleged, had encountered numberless reverses between that time and the year 1672, since which date it has been safely lodged in the parish church of Antipolo a village in the old military district of Morong, Rizal province, in the custody of the Austin Friars. In the month of May, thousands of people repair to this shrine, indeed, this village of 3,800 inhabitants, diminished to 2,800 in 1903, chiefly depends upon the pilgrims for its existence, for the land within the jurisdiction of Antipolo is all mountainous and very limited in extent. The priests also do a very good trade in prints of saints, rosaries, etc., for the sale of which, in Spanish times, they used to open a shop during the feast inside and just in front of the convent entrance. The total amount of money spent in the village by visitors during the pilgrimage has been roughly computed to be 30,000 Cuban pesos. They come from all parts of the islands. The legends of the saint are best described in a pamphlet published in Manila 10 from which I take the following information. The writer says that the people of Acapulco, Mexico, were loath to part with their holy image, but the saintly virgin herself, desirous of succoring the inhabitants of the Spanish Indies, smoothed all difficulties. During her first voyage, in the month of March, 1626, a 185 tempest arose, which was calmed by the Virgin, and all arrived safely in the galleon at the shores of Manila. She was then carried in procession to the cathedral, whilst the church bells tolled and the artillery thundered forth salutes of welcome. A solemn mass was celebrated, which all the religious communities, civil authorities, and a multitude of people attended. Six years afterwards the government general Juan Nino de Tabara died. By his will he int usted the Virgin to the care of the Jesuits, whilst a church was being built under the direction of Father Juan Salazar for her special reception. During the erection of this church, the Virgin often descended from the altar and exhibited herself amongst the flowery branches of a tree, called by the natives Antipolo, Articarpus Incisa. The tree itself was thenceforth regarded as a precious relic by the natives, who, leaf by leaf and branch by branch, were gradually carrying it off. Then Father Salazar decreed that the tree trunk should serve for a pedestal to the divine miraculous image hence the title Virgin of Antipolo. In 1639 the Chinese rebelled against the Spanish authority, Vidi P. 115. In their furious march through the ruins and the blood of their victims, and amidst the wailing of the crowd, they attacked the sanctuary wherein reposed the Virgin. Seizing the holy image, they cast it into the flames, and when all around was reduced to ashes, there stood the Virgin of Antipolo, resplendent, 
with her hair, her lace, her ribbons and adornments intact, and her beautiful body of brass without wound or blemish. Passionate at seeing frustrated their designs to destroy the deified protectress of the Christians, a wanton infidel stabbed her in the face, and all the resources of art have ever failed to heal the lasting wound. Again the virgin was enveloped in flames, which hid the appalling sight of her burning entrails. Now the Spanish troops arrived, and fell upon the heretical marauders with great slaughter, then, glancing with trembling anxiety upon the scene of the outrage, behold! With glad astonishment they descried the holy image upon a smoldering pile of ashes unhurt. With renewed enthusiasm, the Spanish warriors bore away the Virgin on their shoulders in triumph, and Sebastian Hurtado de Corcuera, the government general at the time, had her conveyed to Cavita to be the patroness of the faithful upon the high seas. A galleon arrived at Cavita, and being unable to go into port, the commander anchored off at a distance. Then the new government general, Diego Fajardo, 1644-53, sent the Virgin on board, and, by her help, a passage was found for the vessel to enter. Later on, twelve Dutch warships appeared off Marivals, the northwestern extremity of Manila Bay. They had come to attack Cavita, and in their hour of danger the Spaniards appealed to the Virgin, who gave them a complete victory over the Dutchmen, causing them to flee, 186 with their commander mortally wounded. During the affray, the Virgin had been taken away for safety on board the San Diego, commanded by Sepita. In 1650 this vessel returned, and the pious prelate, José Milan Pavel XI thought he perceived clear indications of an eager desire on the part of the Virgin to retire to her sanctuary. The people, too, clamoured for the saint, attributing the many calamities with which they were afflicted at that period to her absence from their shores. Assailed by enemies, frequently threatened by the Dutch, lamenting the loss of several galleons, and distressed by a serious earthquake, their only hope reposed in the beneficent aid of the Virgin of Antipolo. But the galleon San Francisco Xavier feared to make the journey to Mexico without the saintly support, and for the sixth time the Virgin crossed the Pacific Ocean. In Acapulco the galleon lay at anchor until March, 1653, when the newly appointed government general, Sabaniano Manrique de Lara, Archbishop Miguel Pobalt, Father Rodrigo Cardenas, Bishop-elect of Cagayan, and many other passengers embarked and set sail for Manila. Their sufferings during the voyage were horrible. Almost overcome by a violent storm, the ship became unmanageable. Rain poured in torrents, whilst her decks were washed by the surging waves, and all was on the point of utter destruction. In this plight the Virgin was exhorted, and not in vain, for at her command the sea lessened its fury, the wind calmed, black threatening clouds dispersed, all the terrors of the voyage ceased, and under a beautiful blue sky a fair wind wafted the galleon safely to the port of Cavita. These circumstances gained for the saint the title of Virgin of Good Voyage and Peace, and the sailors who gratefully acknowledged that their lives were saved by her sublime intercession followed by the ecclesiastical dignitaries and military chiefs, carried the image to her retreat in Antipolo, September 8, 1653, where it was intended she should permanently remain. However, deprived of the succour of the saint, misfortunes again overtook the galleons. Three of them were lost, and the writer of the brochure to which I refer supposes, Chap 4, that perchance the sea, suffering from the number of furrows cut by the keels of the ships, had determined to take a fierce revenge by swallowing them up. Once more, therefore, the Virgin condescended to accompany a galleon to Mexico, bringing her back safely to Philippine shores in 1672. This was the Virgin's last sea voyage. Again, and forever, she was conveyed by the joyous multitude to her resting place in Antipolo Church, and on her journey thither, there was not a flower, adds the chronicler, which did not greet her by opening a bud not a mountain pigeon which remained in silence, whilst the breezes and the rivulets poured forth their silent murmurings of ecstasy. Saintly guardian of the 187 soul, dispersing mundane evils, no colors, the chronicler tells us, can paint the animation of the faithful, 
no discourse can describe the consolation of the pilgrims in their adoration at the shrine of the Holy Virgin of Antipolo. Yet the village of Antipolo and its neighborhood was, in Spanish times, the center of brigandage, the resort of murderous highwaymen, the focus of crime. What a strange contrast to the sublime virtues of the immortal divinity enclosed within its sanctuary. On November 26, 1904, this miraculous image was temporarily removed from Antipolo to Manila for the celebration of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Carried by willing hands to the place of embarkation, it made the voyage to the capital, down the Pasig River, in a gorgeously decorated barge, towed by a steam launch, escorted by hundreds of floating craft and over 20,000 natives, marching along the river banks in respectful accompaniment. The next day a procession of about 35,000 persons followed the Virgin to the Cathedral of Manila, where she was enshrined, awaiting the great event of December 8. Subsequently she was restored to her shrine at Antipolo. The most lucrative undertaking in the colony is that of a shrine. It yields all gain, without possible loss. Among the most popular of these miraculous saint shows was that of Gassi, belonging to the late parish priest of Ilig, in Negros Island. At Gassi, half an hour's walk from the father's parish church, was enthroned San Joaquin, who, for a small consideration, consoled the faithful or relieved them of ear sufferings. His spouse, Santa Ana, having taken up her residence in the town of Molo, Iloilo province, was said to have been visited by San Joaquin once a year. He was absent on the journey at least a fortnight, but the waters in the neighborhood of the shrine being sanctified the clientele was not dispersed. Some septics have dared to doubt whether San Joaquin really paid this visit to his saintly wife, and alleged that his absence was feigned, firstly to make his presence longed for, and secondly to remove the cobwebs from his hallowed brow, and give him a wash and brush up for the year. The shrine paid well for years every devotee leaving his might. At the time of my pilgrimage there, the Holy Father's son was the petty governor of the same town of Illig. Shrine owners are apparently no friends of free trade. In 1888 there was a great commotion amongst them when it was discovered that a would-be competitor and a gownsman had conspired, in Pampanga province, to establish a miraculous saint, by concealing an image in a field in order that it should make itself manifest to the faithful, and thenceforth become a source of income. It is notorious that in a church near Manila, a few years ago, an image was made to move the parts of its body as the reverend preacher 188 exhorted it in the course of his sermon. When he appealed to the saint, it wagged its head or extended its arms, whilst the female audience wept and wailed. Such a scandalous disturbance did it provoke that the exhibition was even too monstrous for the clergy themselves, and the archbishop prohibited it. But religion has many wealth-producing branches. In January, 1889, a friend of mine showed me an account rendered by the superior of the Jesuit school for the education of his sons, each of whom was charged with one peso as a gratuity to the Pope, to induce him to canonize a deceased member of their order. I have been most positively assured by friends, whose good faith I ought not to doubt, that San Pasqual Balan really has, on many occasions, had compassion on barren women, their friends, and given them offspring. Jose Rizal, in his Nalimi Tangeri hints that the real Pasqual was a friar. Trading upon the credulity of devout enthusiasts by fetishism and shrine quackery is not altogether confined to the ecclesiastics. A Spanish layman in Iloilo, some few years ago, when he was an official of the prison, known as the Cata, conceived the idea of declaring that the Blessed Virgin and Child Jesus had appeared in the prison well, where they took a bath and disappeared. When, at length, the belief became popular, hundreds of natives went there to get water from the well, and the official imposed a tax on the pilgrims, whereby he became possessed of a modest fortune, and owned two of the best houses in the square of Iloilo. The Feast of Taigbaoang, near Iloilo, which takes place in January, is also much frequented on account of the miracles performed by the patron saint of the town.
The faith in the power of this minor divinity to dispel bodily suffering is so deeply rooted that members of the most enlightened families of Iloilo and the neighboring towns go to Taikbaong simply to attend High Mass, and return at once. I have seen steamers entering Iloilo from this feast so crowded with passengers that there was only standing room for them. An opprobrious form of religious imposture perhaps the most contemptible which frequently offended the public eye, before the American advent, was the practice of prowling about with doll saints in the streets and public highways. A vagrant, too lazy to earn an honest subsistence, procured a license from the monks to hawk about a wooden box containing a doll or print covered by a pane of glass. This he offered to hold before the nose of any ignorant passerby who was willing to pay for the boon of kissing the glass. During Holy Week, a few years ago, the captain of the civil guard in Teaba province went to the town of Atimanan, and saw natives in the streets almost in a state of nudity doing penance for the wounds of our Lord. They were actually beating themselves with flails, some of which were made of iron chain, and others of rope with thongs of 189 rattan cane. Having confiscated the flails one of which he gave to me he effectually assisted the fanatics in their penitent castigation. Alas! To what excesses will faith, unrestrained by reason, bring one? The result of tuition in mystic influences is sometimes manifested in the appearance of native Sant One's indolent scamps who roam about in remote villages, feigning the possession of supernatural gifts, the faculty of saving souls, and the healing art, with the object of living at the expense of the ignorant. I never happened to meet more than one of these creatures an escaped convict named Apollonio, a native of Caballo, Laguna, who, assuming the character of a prophet and worker of miracles, had fled to the neighborhood of San Pablo village. I have often heard of them in other places, notably in Capiz province, where the Sant Ones were vigorously pursued by the civil guard, and as recently as May, 1904, a notorious humbug of this class, styling himself Pope Igio, alias Nazarenon Gala, was arrested in West Negroes and punished under American authority. The Spanish clergy were justifiably zealous in guarding the Filipinos from a knowledge of other doctrines which would only lead them to immeasurable bewilderment. Hence all the civilized natives were Roman Catholics exclusively. The strict obedience to one system of Christianity, even in its grossly perverted form, had the effect desired by the state, of bringing about social unity to an advanced degree. Yet, so far as I have observed, the native seems to understand extremely little of the inward and spiritual grace of religion. He is so material and realistic, so devoid of all conception of things abstract, that his ideas rarely, if ever, soar beyond the contemplation of the outward and visible signs of Christian belief. The symbols of faith and the observance of religious rites are to him religion itself. He also confounds morality with religion. Natives go to church because it is the custom. Often if a native cannot put on a clean shirt, he abstains from going to mass. The petty governor of a town was compelled to go to high mass accompanied by his ministry. In some towns the Baranahi chiefs were fined or beaten if they were absent from church on Sundays and certain feast days. Point 12 As to the women, little or no pressure was necessary to oblige them to attend Mass, many of them pass half their existence between private devotion and the confessional. 190 The parish priest of Lipa, Batangas, related to a friend of mine that having on one occasion distributed all his stock of pictures of the saints to those who had come to see him on parochial business, he had to content the last suppliant with an empty raisin box, without noticing that on the lid there was a colored print of Garibaldi. Later on Garibaldi's portrait was seen in a hut in one of the suburbs with candles around it, being adored as a saint. A curious case of native religious philosophy was reported in a Manila newspaper. Point 13 A milkman, accused by one of his customers of having adulterated the milk, of course denied it at first, and then, Yielding to more potent argument than words, he confessed that he had diluted the milk with holy water from the church fonts, for at the same time that he committed the sin he was penitent. Undoubtedly Roman Catholicism appears to be the form of Christianity most successful in proselytizing uncivilized races, which are impressed more through their eyes than their understanding. If the grandeur of the ritual, the magnificence of the processions, 
the luster of the church vessels and the images themselves have never been understood by the masses in the strictly symbolic sense in which they appeal to us, at least they have had their influence in drawing millions to civilization and to a unique uniformity of precept, the practice of which it is beyond all human power to control. For music the native has an inherent passion. Musicians are to be found in every village, and even among the very poorest classes. Before the revolution there was scarcely a parish, however remote, without its orchestra, and this natural taste was laudably encouraged by the priests. Some of these bands acquired great local fame, and were sought for wherever there was a feast miles away. The players seemed to enjoy it as much as the listeners, and they would keep at it for hours at a time, as long as their bodily strength lasted. Girls from six years of age learned to play the harp almost by instinct, and college girls quickly learn the piano. There are no native composers they are but imitators. There is an absence of sentimental feeling in the execution of set music, which is all foreign, and this is the only drawback to their becoming fine instrumentalists. For the same reason, classical music is very little in vogue among the Philippine people, who prefer dance pieces and ballad accompaniments. In fact, a native musical performance is so void of soul and true conception of harmony that at a feast it is not an uncommon thing to hear three bands playing close to each other at the same time, and the mob assembled seem to enjoy the confusion of the melody. There are no Philippine vocalists worth hearing. Traveling through the Laguna province in 1882 I was impressed 191 by the ingenuity of the natives in their imitation of European musical instruments. Just an hour before I had emerged from a dense forest, abundantly adorned with exquisite foliage, and where majestic trees, flourishing in gorgeous profusion, afforded a gratifying shelter from the scorching sun. Not a sound was heard but the gentle ripple of a limpid stream, breaking over the boulders on its course towards the ravine below. But it was hardly the moment to ponder on the poetic scene, for fatigue and hunger had almost overcome sentimentality, and I got as quickly as I could to the first resting place. This I found to be a native cane grower's plantation bungalow, where quite a number of persons was assembled, the occasion of the meeting being the baptism and benediction of the sugar cane mill. Before I was near enough, however, to be seen by the party for it was nearly sunset I heard the sound of distant music floating through the air. Such a strange occurrence excited my curiosity immensely, and I determined to find out what it all meant. I soon discovered that it was a bamboo band returning from the feast of the baptism of the mill. Each instrument was made of bamboo on a semi-European model, and the players were merely farm laborers. Philippine musicians have won fame outside their own country. Some years ago there was a band of them in Shanghai and another in Cochin, China on contract. It was reported, too, that the band of the constabulary sent to the St. Louis exhibition in 1904 was the delight of the people in Honolulu, where they touched en route. Slavery was prohibited by law as far back as the reign of Philip II, 14 it nevertheless still exists in an occult form among the natives. Rarely, if ever, do its victims appeal to the law for redress, firstly, because of their ignorance, and secondly, because the untutored class have an innate horror of resisting anciently established custom, and it would never occur to them to do so. Moreover, in the time of the Spaniards, the numberless procuradors and picoplitos touting solicitors had no interest in taking up cases so profitless to themselves. Under the pretext of guaranteeing a loan, parents readily sell their children, male or female, into bondage. The child is handed over to work until the loan is repaid, but as the day of restitution of the advance never arrives, neither does the liberty of the youthful victim. Among themselves it was a law, and is still a practiced custom, for the debts of the parents to pass on to the children, and, as I have said before, debts are never repudiated by them. Slavery, in an overt form, now only exists among some wild tribes and the Moros. 192 education was almost exclusively under the control of the friars. Up to the year 1844 anything beyond religious tuition was reserved for the Spanish youth, the half-castes, and the children of those in office. Among the many reforms introduced in the time of government general Narciso Claveria, 
1844-49, that of extending education to the provincial parishes was a failure. In the middle of the reign of Isabella II, about 1850, it was the exclusive privilege of the classes mentioned and the native petty aristocracy, locally designated the gente ilustrada and the pudiens, intellectuals and people of means and influence. Education, thus limited, divided the people into two separate castes, as distinct as the ancient Roman citizen and the plebeian. Residing chiefly in the ports open to foreign trade, the intellectuals acquired wealth, possessed rich estates and fine houses artistically adorned. Blessed with all the comforts which money could procure and the refinement resulting from education, they freely associated and intermarried with the Spaniards, whose easy grace and dignified manners they gradually acquired and retain, to a great extent, to the present day. The other caste the illiterates were dependents of the intellectuals. Without mental training, with few wants, and little expenses, they were as contented, in their sphere, as the upper class were in theirs. Like their masters, they had their hopes, but they never knew what misery was, as one understands it in Europe, and in this felicitous, ambitionless condition, they never urgently demanded education, even for their children. The movement came from higher quarters, and during the O'Donnell ministry a royal decree was sent from Madrid establishing schools throughout the provinces. On the banks of the Pasig River there was a training college for schoolmasters, who were drafted off to the villages with a miserable stipend, to teach the juvenile rustics. But the governmental system of centralization fell somewhat hard on the village teacher. For instance, I knew one who received a monthly salary of 16 pesos, and every month he had to spend two of them to travel to Manila and back to receive the money and outlay equal to 12 one half per cent of his total income. For such a wretched pittance great things were not to be expected of the teacher, even though he had had a free hand in his work. Other circumstances of greater weight contributed to keep the standard of education among the common town folk very low, in some places to abolish it totally. The parish priests were ex officio inspectors of schools for primary instruction, wherein it was their duty to see that the Spanish language was taught. The old laws of the Indies provided that Christian doctrine should be taught to the heathen native in Spanish. 15 Several decrees confirming that law were issued from time to time, but their fulfillment did not seem to suit the policy of the friars. On June 30, 1887, the government general 193 published another decree with the same object, and sent a communication to the archbishop to remind him of this obligation of his subordinates, and the urgency of its strict observance. But it had no effect whatever, and the poor class villagers were only taught to gabble off the Christian doctrine by rote, for it suited the friar to stimulate that peculiar mental condition in which belief precedes understanding. The school teacher, being subordinate to the inspector, had no voice in the matter, and was compelled to follow the views of the priest. Few Spaniards took the trouble to learn native dialects, of which there are about 30, and only a small percentage of the natives can speak intelligible Spanish. There is no literature in dialect, the few odd compositions in Tagalog still extant are wanting in the first principles of literary style. There were many villages with untrained teachers who could not speak Spanish, there were other villages with no schools at all, hence no preparation whatever for municipal life. If the friars had agreed to the instruction of the town folk through the medium of Spanish, as a means to the attainment of higher culture, one could well have understood their reluctance to teach it to the rural laborers, because it is obvious to anyone who knows the character of this class that the knowledge of a foreign language would unfit them for agricultural labor and the lower occupations, and produce a new social problem. Even this class, however, might have been mentally improved by elementary books translated into dialect. But, unfortunately, the friars were altogether opposed to the education of the masses, whether through dialect or Spanish, in order to hold them in ignorant subjection to their own will, and the result was that the majority grew up as untutored as when they were born. Home discipline and training of manners were ignored, even in well-to-do families. Children were left without control, and by excessive indulgence allowed to do just as they pleased, hence they became ill-behaved and boorish. Planters of means, 
and others who could afford it, sent their sons and daughters to private schools, or to the colleges under the direction of the priests in Manila, Jairo, Iloilo province, or Cebu. A few very few sent their sons to study in Europe, or in Hong Kong. According to the budget of 1,888 the state contributed to the expense of education, in that year, as follows, viz. PCTS schools and colleges for high-class education in Manila, including navigation, drawing, painting, bookkeeping, languages, history, arts and trades, natural history museum and library and general instruction. 86,450 School of Agriculture, including 10 schools and model farms in 10 provinces, 113,686 64 general expenses of public instruction, including national schools in the provinces 38,513 78,650 Cuban pesos 34 194 The teaching offered to students in Manila was very advanced, as will be seen from the following syllabus of education in the Municipal Athenaeum of the Jesuits Agriculture. Geometry Philosophy Algebra Greek Physics and Chemistry Arithmetic History Rhetoric and Poetry Commerce Latin Geography Mechanics Spanish Classics Spanish Composition English Natural History Topography French Painting Trigonometry. In the highest girls' school the Santa Isabel College the following was the curriculum, viz. colon arithmetic. Geology. Philippine history. Drawing. Geometry. Physics. Dress cutting. History of Spain. Reading. French. Music. Sacred history. Geography. Needlework. Spanish Grammar. There were also, for girls, the colleges of Santa Catalina, Santa Rosa, La Concordia, the Municipal School, etc. A few were sent to the Italian convent in Hong Kong. A college known as St. Thomas's was founded in Manila by Fray Miguel de Benavides, third Archbishop of Manila, between the years 1603 and 1610. He contributed to it his library and 1,000 Cuban pesos, to which was added a donation by the Bishop of Nueva Segovia of 3,000 Cuban pesos and his library. In 1620 it already had professors and masters under government auspices. It received three papal briefs for ten years each, permitting students to graduate in philosophy and theology. It was then raised to the status of a university in the time of Philip IV by Papal Bull of November 20, 1645. The first rector of St. Thomas's University was Fray Martin Real de la Cruz. In the meantime, the Jesuits' university had been established. Until 1645 it was the only place of learning superior to primary education, and conferred degrees. The St. Thomas's University, under the direction of Dominican friars, now disputed the Jesuits' privilege to confer degrees, claiming for themselves exclusive right by papal bull. A lawsuit followed, and the Supreme Court of Manila decided in favor of St. Thomas's. The Jesuits appealed to the king against this decision. The Supreme Council of the Indies was consulted, and revoked the decision of the Manila Supreme Court, so that the two universities continued to give degrees until the Jesuits were expelled from the colony in 1768. From 1785 St. Thomas's University was styled the Royal University, and was declared to rank equally with the Peninsular Universities. There were also the Dominican College of San Juan de Letran, founded in the middle of the 17th century, the Jesuit Normal School, the Convent of Mercy for Orphan Students, and the College of St. Joseph. This last was founded in 1601, under the direction of the 195 Jesuits. King Philip V gave it the title of Royal College, and allowed an escutcheon to be erected over the entrance. The same king endowed three professorial chairs with 10,000 Cuban pesos each. Latterly it was governed by the rector of the university, 
whilst the administration was confided to a licentiate in pharmacy. At the time of the Spanish evacuation, therefore, the only university in the city of Manila was that of St. Thomas, which was empowered to issue diplomas of licentiate in law, theology, medicine, and pharmacy to all successful candidates, and to confer degrees of LL.D. The public investiture was presided over by the rector of the university, a Dominican friar, and the speeches preceding and following the ceremony, which was semi-religious, were made in the Spanish language. In connection with this institution there was the modern St. Thomas's College for preparing students for the university. The nautical school naturally stood outside the sphere of ecclesiastical control. Established in 1839 in Calle Cabildo, Walled City, its purpose was to instruct youths in the science of navigation and prepare them for the merchant service within the waters of the archipelago and the adjacent seas. During the earthquake of 1863 the school building was destroyed. It was then re-established in Calle San Juan de Letran, subsequently located in Calle del Palacio, and was finally, in 1898, removed from the walled city to the business quarter of Binondo. Special attention was given to the teaching of mathematics, and considerable sums of money were allocated, from time to time, for the equipment of this technical center of learning. One of the most interesting and amusing types of the native was the average college student from the provinces. After a course of two, three, up to eight years, he learned to imitate European dress and ape Western manners, to fantastically dress his hair, to wear patent leather shoes, jewelry, and a latest fashion felt hat adjusted carefully towards one side of his head. He went to the theater, drove a Tilbury, and attended native reunions, to deploy his abilities before the beau sexy of his class. During his residence in the capital, he was supposed to learn, amongst other subjects, Latin, divinity, philosophy, and sometimes theology, preparatory, in many cases, to succeeding his father in a sugar cane and rice plantation. The average student had barely an outline idea of either physical or political geography, whilst his notions of Spanish or universal history were very chaotic. I really think the Manila newspapers poor as they were contributed very largely to the education of the people in this colony. Still, there are cases of an ardent genius shining as an exception to his race. Amongst the few, there were two brothers named Luna the one was a notably skillful performer on the guitar and violin, who, however, died at an early age. The other, Juan Luna, developed a natural ability for painting. A work of his own conception the 196 Spoliarium, executed by him in Rome in 1884 gained the second prize at the Madrid Academy exhibition of oil paintings. The municipality of Barcelona purchased this chef d'oeuvre for the city hall. Other famous productions of his are The Battle of Lepinto, The Death of Cleopatra, and The Blood Compact, Q.V. This last masterpiece was acquired by the municipality of Manila for the city hall, but was removed when the Tagalog rebellion broke out, for reasons which will be understood after reading chapter XXII. This artist, the son of poor parents, was a second mate on board a sailing ship, when his gifts were recognized, and means were furnished him with which to study in Rome. His talent was quite exceptional, for these islanders are not an artistic people. Having little admiration for the picturesque and the beautiful in nature, they cannot depict them, in this respect they form a decided contrast to the Japanese. Pete, La Laguna, is the only place I know of in the provinces where there are sculptors by profession. The Manila Academy was open to all comers of all nationalities, and, as an ex-student under its professors Don Lorenzo Rocha and Don Augustin says, I can attest to their enthusiasm for the progress of their pupils. Middle-class Tagalog natives Middle-class Tagalog natives in the general post and telegraph office in Manila I was shown an excellent specimen of wood carving a bust portrait of Mr. Morse, the celebrated inventor of the Morse system of telegraphy, the work of a native sculptor. Another promising native, Vicente Francisco, exhibited some good sculpture work in the Philippine exhibition, held in Madrid in 1887, the jury recommended him for a state pension, to study in Madrid and Rome. The beautiful design of the present insular coinage, 
Philippine Peso, is the work of a Filipino. The biography of the patriot martyr Dr. Jose Rizal, QV, the most brilliant of all Filipinos, is related in another chapter. The native of cultivated intellect, on returning from Europe, found a very limited circle of friends of his own new training. If he returned a lawyer or a doctor, he was one too many, for the capital swarmed with them, if he had learned a trade, his knowledge was useless outside Manila, and in his native village his technical acquirements were generally profitless. Usually the native sojourn in Europe made him too self-opinionated to become a useful member of society. It remains to be seen how American training will affect them. The, American, insular government has taken up the matter of Philippine education very earnestly, and at considerable outlay, the subject is referred to in Chapter Triple X. The intellectual and spiritual life, as we have it in Europe, does not exist in the Philippines. If ever a Filipino studied any subject, purely for the love of study, without the hope of material or social advantage being derived therefrom, he would be a rara avis. 197 The disease most prevalent among the Filipinos is fever especially in the spring, and although, in general, they may be considered a robust, enduring race, they are less capable than the European of withstanding acute disease. I should say that quite 50 percenter of the native population are affected by cutaneous disease, said to be caused by eating fish daily, and especially shellfish. It is locally known as sarnas, natives say that monkey flesh cures it. In 1882 cholera morbus in epidemic form ravaged the native population, carrying off thousands of victims, the exact number of which has never been published. The preventive recommended by the priests on this occasion, viz., prayer to Saint Roque, proved quite ineffectual to stay the plague. A better remedy, found in the country, is an infusion of Neota tetrapetala, Tagalog, Manangal. From time to time this disease reappears. The returns given in the official Gazette of March 2, 1904, Volume 2, Number 9, show the average monthly mortality due to cholera, in the 20, 1 slash 3 months between March 20, 1902, and December 1, 1903, to be 5,360. Annually, many natives suffer from what is called cholera in a mild form of cholera, but not epidemic. In the spring, deaths always occur from acute indigestion, due to eating too plentifully of new rice. Many who have recovered from cholera become victims to a disease known as beriberi, said to be caused by the rice and fish diet. The first symptom of wet beriberi is a swelling of the legs, like dropsy, that of dry beriberi is a wasting away of the limbs. Smallpox makes great ravages, and measles is a common complaint. Lung and bronchial affections are very rare. The most fearful disease in the colony is leprosy. 16 To my knowledge it is prevalent in the province of Bulacan, Luzon is, and in the islands of Cebu and Negros. There is an asylum for lepers near Manila and at Mabalo, just outside the city of Cebu, Vidi lepers, but no practical measures were ever adopted by the Spaniards to eradicate this disease. The Spanish authorities were always too indifferent about the propagation of leprosy to establish a home on one island for all male lepers and another home, on another island, for female lepers the only effectual way to extirpate this awful malady. In Bela Uig, Bulacan, leper families, personally known to me, were allowed to mix with the general public. In Cebu and Negros Islands they were permitted to roam about on the high roads and beg. The insular government has taken up the question of the lepers, and in 1904 a tract of land was purchased in the island of Culian, Colomians Group, to provide for their hygienic isolation. 198 According to the official Gazette of March 2, 1904, Volume 2, Number 9, the total number of lepers, of whom the insular government had obtained cognizance, up to December 31, 1903, was 3,343. Besides these there would naturally be an unknown number who had escaped recognition. There is apparently little insanity in the islands. From the report of the Commissioner of Public Health for February, 1904, 
it would appear that there were only about 1,415 insane persons in a population of over seven and a half millions. Since the American advent, 1,898, the death rate is believed to have notably decreased. The report of the Commissioner of Public Health for 1904 states the death rate per thousand in Manila to have been as follows, viz. colon natives 53.72, Europeans other than Spaniards 16.11, Spaniards 15.42, and Americans 9.34. The commissioner remarks that over 50 percenter of the children born in the city of Manila never lived to see the first anniversary of their birthday. The Board of Health is very active in the sanitation of Manila. Inspectors make frequent domiciliary visits. The extermination of rats in the month of December, 1903, amounted to 24,638. House refuse bins are put into the streets at night, and an inspector goes round with a lamp about midnight to examine them. Dead animals, market rubbish, house refuse, rotten hemp, sweepings, etc., are all cremated at Palomar, Santa Cruz, and Paco, and in July, 1904, this enterprising department started the extermination of mosquitoes. In the suburbs of Manila there are now 12 cemeteries and one crematorium 199 one we have several modern instances of similar volcanic disturbances creating and demolishing land surface, on an infinitely lesser scale e.g., the disappearance of Krakatoa and the entire town and busy port of Anger in 1883, the eruption which swallowed up the whole inhabited Japanese island Torishima, the appearance of an entirely new island, Niishima, about lat 25 degrees n, within the past 12 months, and within the historical period, the apparition of the Kuril Islands. 2. Vidi Chap V. By way of retaliation for the expulsion of Spanish missionaries from Japan in the L7th century, all the male Japanese above 10 years of age were ordered to leave their settlements up the lake. Under this order over 20,000 of them were expelled from the colony. There was a Japanese temple existing, though not in use as such, in the suburbs of Manila up to last century, when Government General Norzagare, 1857-60, had it destroyed. 3. The Spaniards must have been quite cognizant of these rights, seeing that the Moorish invasion of Spain lasted nearly eight centuries, namely from the year 711 up to 1492 only a couple of decades before Legaspi's generation. For based on this tradition, Don José Carvajal has written a very interesting play entitled Ligaya. It was produced at the National Theatre, Manila, in 1904. Five possibly the people of Tanda, Manila, learned from the Chinese the art of preparing that canine delicacy called Kyobang Aso. Six consequent on the American advent, wages steadily rose proportionately to the increased cost of everything. But when, later on, wages far exceeded the natives' needs, he demanded more and actually went on strike to obtain it. 7. With regard to this characteristic among the Chinese, Sir John Boring, late governor of Hong Kong, affirms that the Chinese respect their writings and traditions, whilst they do not believe a lie to be a fault, and in some of their classical works it is especially recommended, in order to cheat and confuse foreign intruders, via a visit to the Philippine Islands, by Sir John Boring, Doctor of Laws, FRS Manila, 1876 Spanish edition, p. 176. 8. See the army regulations for the advantages granted to military men who married Philippine-born women, Vidi also p. 53. Nine catapuzan signifies in native dialect the gathering of friends, which terminates the festival connected with any event or ceremony, whether it be a wedding, a funeral, a baptism, or an election of local authorities, etc. The festivities after a burial last nine days, and on the last day of wailing, drinking, praying, and eating, the meeting is called the Catapuzan. 10. Historia de Nuestra Señora la Virgen de Antipolo, by M. Romero. Published in Manila, 1886. 11. He became a prelate 21 years afterwards, having been ordained Bishop of Nueva Segovia in 1671. 12. A decree issued by Don Juan de Ozeda, 
a magistrate of the Supreme Court, in his general visit of inspection to the provinces, dated May 26, 1696, enacts the following, viz. Colon, that Chinese half-castes and headmen shall be compelled to go to church and attend divine service, and act according to the customs established in the villages. The penalty for an infraction of this mandate by a male was twenty lashes in the public highway and two months' labor in the royal rope walk, in Tal, or in the galleys of Kavita. If the delinquent was a female, the chastisement was one month of public penance in the church. The alcalde or governor of the province who did not promptly inflict the punishment was to be mulcted in the sum of Cuban peso 200, to be paid to the royal treasury. 13 Diario de Manila, Saturday July 28, 1888. 14 Vidi P54. According to Concepcion, there were headmen at the time of the conquest who had as many as 300 slaves, and as a property they ranked next in value to gold, Vidi Histori General de Filipinas, by Juan de la Concepcion, published in Manila in 1788, in 14 volumes. 15 Vidi Recopilation de las Leyes de Indias, Lay V13, Libby. 16 Referring to Leprosy, The Charity Record, London, December 15, 1898, says reliable estimates place the number of lepers in India, China, and Japan at 1 million. About 500,000 probably would be a correct estimate for India only, although the official number is less, owing to the many who from being hidden, or homeless, or from other causes, escape enumeration. The religious order's history attests that at least during the first two centuries of Spanish rule, the subjugation of the natives and their acquiescence in the new order of things were obtained more by the subtle influence of the missionaries than by the sword. As the soldiers of Castile carried war into the interior and forced its inhabitants to recognize their king, so the friars were drafted off from the mother country to mitigate the memory of bloodshed and to mold Spain's new subjects to social equanimity. In many cases, in fact, the whole task of gaining their submission to the Spanish crown and obedience to the dictates of Western civilization was confided solely to the Pacific medium of persuasion. The difficult mission of holding in check the natural passions and instincts of a race which knew no law but individual will, was left to the successors of Urdaneta. Indeed, it was but the general policy of Philip II. To aggrandize his vast realm under the pretense of rescuing benighted souls. The efficacy of conversion was never doubted for a moment, however suddenly it might come to pass, and the Spanish cavalier conscientiously felt that he had a high mission to fulfill under the banner of the cross. In every natural event which coincided with their interests, in the prosecution of their mission, the wary priests described a providential miracle. In their opinion the non-Catholic had no rights in this world no prospect of gaining the next. If the Pope claimed the whole world, such as was known of it, to be in his gift how much more so heathen lands. The obligation to convert was imposed by the Pope, and was an inseparable condition of the conceded right of conquest. It was therefore constantly paramount in the conqueror's mind. Point one: the Pope could depose and give away the realm of any sovereign prince s i vel palum deflexerit. The monarch held his scepter under the sordid condition of vassalage, hence Philip II, for the security of his crown, could not have disobeyed the will of the pontiff, whatever his personal two hundred inclinations might have been regarding the spread of Christianity. Point two: If he desired it, he served his ends with advantage to himself if he were indifferent to it, he secured by its prosecution a formidable ally in Rome. America had already drained the peninsula of her able-bodied men to such an extent that a military occupation of these islands would have overtaxed the resources of the mother country. The cooperation of the friars was, therefore, an almost indispensable expedient in the early days, and their power in secular concerns was recognized to the last by the Spanish Philippine authorities, who continued to solicit the aid of the parish priests in order to secure obedience to decrees affecting their parishioners. Up to the rebellion of 1896 the placid word of the ecclesiastic, the superstitious veneration which he inspired in the ignorant native, had a greater law-binding effect than the commands of the civil functionary. The gownsman used those weapons appropriate to his office which best touched the sensibilities and won the adhesion of a rude audience. 
the priest appealed to the soul, to the unknown, to the awful and the mysterious. Go where he would, the convert's imagination was so pervaded with the mystic tuition that he came to regard his tutor as a being above common humanity. The feeling of dread reverence which he instilled into the hearts of the most callous secured to him even immunity from the violence of brigands, who carefully avoided the man of God. In the state official the native saw nothing but a man who strove to bend the will of the conquered race to suit his own. A royal decree or the sound of the cornet would not have been half so effective as the elevation of the Holy Cross before the fanatical majority, who became an easy prey to fantastic promises of eternal bliss, or the threats of everlasting perdition. Nor is this assertion by any means chimerical, for it has been proved on several occasions, notably in the raising of troops to attempt the expulsion of the British in 1763, and in the campaign against the Sultan of Sulu in 1876. But through the Kavita conspiracy of 1872, Vidi P. 106, the friars undoubtedly hastened their own downfall. Many natives, driven to emigrate, cherished a bitter hatred in exile, whilst others were emerging yearly by hundreds from their mental obscurity. Already the intellectual struggle for freedom from mystic enthrallment had commenced without injury to faith in things really divine. Each decade brought some reform in the relations between the parish priest and the people. Link by link the chain of priestcraft encompassing the development of the colony was yielding to natural causes. The most enlightened natives were beginning to understand that their spiritual wants were not the only care of the friars, and that 201 the aim of the religious orders was to monopolize all within their reach, and to subordinate to their common will all beyond their mystic circle. The Romish Church owes its power to the uniformity of precept and practice of the vast majority of its members, and it is precisely because this was the reverse in political Spain where statesmen are divided into a dozen or more groups with distinct policies that the church was practically unassailable. In the same way, all the members of a religious order are so closely united that a quarrel with one of them brings the enmity and opposition of his whole community. The progressists, therefore, who combated ecclesiastical preponderance in the Philippines, demanded the retirement of the friars to conventual reclusion or missions, and the appointment of clerigos, or secular clergymen to the vicarages and curasais. By such a change they hoped to remedy the abuses of collective power, for a misunderstanding with a secular vicar would only have provoked a single-handed encounter. That a priest should have been practically a government agent in his locality would not have been contested in the abstract, had he not, as a consequence, assumed the powers of the old Roman censors, who exercised the most dreaded function of the Regium Morum. Spanish opinion, however, was very much divided as to the political safety of strictly confining the friars to their religious duties. It was doubted by some whether any state authority could ever gain the confidence or repress the inherent inclinations of the native like the friar, who led by superstitious teaching, and held the conscience by an invisible cord through the abstract medium of the confessional. Others opined that a change in the then existing system of semi-sacerdotal government was desirable, if only to give scope to the budding intelligence of the minority, which could not be suppressed. Emerging from the lowest ranks of society, with no training whatever but that of the seminary, it was natural to suppose that these Spanish priests would have been more capable than ambitious political men of the world of blending their ideas with those of the native, and of forming closer associations with the rural population engaged in agricultural pursuits familiar to themselves in their own youth. Before the abolition of monasteries in Spain the priests were allowed to return there after ten years' residence in the colony, since then they have usually entered upon their new lives for the remainder of their days, so that they naturally strove to make the best of their social surroundings. The civil servant, as a rule, could feel no personal interest in his temporary native neighbors, his hopes being centered only in rising in the civil service there or elsewhere Cuba or Puerto Rico, or where the ministerial will of fortune placed him. The younger priests narrow-minded and biased those who had just entered into provincial curacies were frequently the greater bigots. Enthusiastic in their calling, they pursued with ardour their mission of 202 proselytism without experience of the world. They entered the islands with the zeal of youth, bringing with them the impression imparted to them in Spain, 
that they were sent to make a moral conquest of savages. In the course of years, after repeated rebuffs, and the obligation to participate in the affairs of everyday life in all its details, their rigidity of principle relaxed, and they became more tolerant towards those with whom they necessarily came in contact. They were usually taken from the peasantry and families of lowly station. As a rule they had little or no secular education, and, regarding them apart from their religious training, they might be considered a very ignorant class. Amongst them the Franciscan friars appeared to be the least and the Austins the most polished of all. The Spanish parish priest was consulted by the native in all matters, he was, by force of circumstances, often compelled to become an architect to build the church in his adopted village an engineer, to make or mend roads, and more frequently a doctor. His word was paramount in his parish, and in his residence he dispensed with that stern severity of conventual discipline to which he had been accustomed in the peninsula. Hence it was really here that his mental capacity was developed, his manners improved, and that the raw sacerdotal peasant was converted into the man of thought, study, and talent occasionally into a gentleman. In his own vicinity, when isolated from European residents, he was practically the representative of the government and of the white race as well as of social order. His theological knowledge was brought to bear upon the most mundane subjects. His thoughts necessarily expanded as the exclusiveness of his religious vocation yielded to the realization of a social position and political importance of which he had never entertained an idea in his native country. So large was the party opposed to the continuance of priestly influence in the colony that a six months resident would not fail to hear of the many misdeeds with which the friars in general were reproached. It would be contrary to fact to pretend that the bulk of them supported their teaching by personal example. I was acquainted with a great number of the friars, and their offspring too, in spite of their vow of chastity, whilst many lived in comparative luxury, notwithstanding their vow of poverty. There was the late parish priest of Malilos, whose son, my friend, was a prominent lawyer. Father S., of Bugison, had a whole family living in his parish. An archbishop who held the see in my time had a daughter frequently seen on the Paseo de Santa Lucia, and in July, 1904, two of his daughters lived in Calle Quaitan, Santa Cruz, Manila, and two others, by a different mother, in the town of O. The late parish priest of Lipa, Father B., whom I knew, had a son whom I saw in 1893. The late incumbent of Santa Cruz, Father M. L., induced his spiritual flock to petition against his being made prior of his 203 order in Manila so that he should not have to leave his women. The late parish priest, friar, of Bela Uig, Bulacan, had three daughters and two sons. I was intimately acquainted with the latter, one was a doctor of medicine and the other a planter, and they bore the surname of Gonzales. At Cadiz Nuevo, Negros is. I once danced with the daughter of a friar, parish priest of a neighboring village, whilst he took another girl as his partner. I was closely acquainted, and resided more than once, with a very mixed-up family in the south of Negros Island. My host was the son of a secular clergyman, his wife and sister-in-law were the daughters of a friar, this sister-in-law was the mistress of a friar, my host had a son who was married to another friar's daughter, and a daughter who was the wife of a foreigner. In short, bastards of the friars are to be found everywhere in the islands. Regarding this merely as the natural outcome of the celibate rule, I do not criticize it, but simply wish to show that the pretended sanctity of the regular clergy in the Philippines was an absurdity, and that the monks were in no degree less frail than mankind in common. The mysterious deaths of General Solano, August 1860, and of Zamora, the bishop-elect of Cebu, 1873, occurred so opportunely for Philippine monastic ambition that little doubt existed in the public mind as to who were the real criminals. When I first arrived in Manila, a quarter of a century ago, a fearful crime was still being commented on. Father Pierre Navigia, formerly parish priest of San Miguel de Mayamo, had recently committed a second murder. His first victim was a native youth, his second a native woman on Sant. The public voice could not be raised very loudly then against the priests, 
but the scandal was so great that the criminal friar was sent to another province Cavita where he still celebrated the holy sacrifice of the Eucharist. Nearly two decades afterwards in January 1897 this rascal met with a terrible death at the hands of the rebels. He was in captivity, and having been appointed bishop in a rebel diocese, to save his life he accepted the mock dignity, but, unfortunately for himself, he betrayed the confidence of his captors, and collected information concerning their movements, plans, and strongholds for remittance to his order. In expiation of his treason he was bound to a post under the tropical sun and left there to die. See how the public in Spain are gulled. In a Malaga newspaper this individual was referred to as a venerable figure, worthy of being placed high up on an altar, before which all Spaniards should prostrate themselves and adore him. As a religier he was a most worthy minister of the Lord, as a patriot he was a hero. Within my recollection, too, a friar absconded from a Luzon Island parish with a large sum of parochial funds, and was never heard of again. The late parish priests of Mundaloyan and Iba did the same. I well remember another interesting character of the monastic orders. He had been parish priest in Azimbal's province town, but intrigues 204 with the Swati Zanku scene brought him under ecclesiastical arrest at the convent of his order in Manila. Thence he escaped, and came over to Hong Kong, where I made his acquaintance in 1890. He told me he had started life in an honest way as a shoemaker's boy, but was taken away from his trade to be placed in the seminary. His mind seemed to be a blank on any branch of study beyond shoemaking and church ritual. He pretended that he had come over to Hong Kong to seek work, but in reality he was awaiting his cousin, whom he rejoined on the way to Europe, where, I heard, he became a garçon de café in France. In 1893 there was another great public scandal, when the friars were openly accused of having printed the seditious proclamations whose authorship they attributed to the natives. The plan of the friars was to start the idea of an intended revolt, in order that they might be the first in the field to quell it, and thus be able to again proclaim to the home government the absolute necessity of their continuance in the islands for the security of Spanish sovereignty. But the plot was discovered, the actual printer, a friar, mysteriously disappeared, and the courageous government general Despujols, Conde de Casp, was, through monastic influence, recalled. He was very popular, and the public manifestation of regret at his departure from the islands was practically a protest against the religious orders. In June, 1888, some cases of personal effects belonging to a friar were consigned to the care of an intimate friend of mine, whose guest I was at the time. They had become soaked with sea water before he received them, and a neighboring priest requested him to open the packages and do what he could to save the contents. I assisted my friend in this task, and amongst the friar's personal effects we were surprised to find, intermixed with prayer books, scapularies, missals, prints of saints, etc., about a dozen most disgustingly obscene double picture slides for a stereoscope. What an entertainment for a guide in morals! This same friar had held a vicarage before in another province, but having become an habitual drunkard, he was removed to Manila and there appointed a confessor. From Manila he had just been again sent to take charge of the cure of souls. I knew a money-grabbing parish priest a friar who publicly announced raffles from the pulpit of the church from which he preached morality and devotion. On one occasion a 200 peso watch was put up for Cuban peso 500 at another time he raffled dresses for the women. Under the pretext of being a pious institution, he established a society of women, called the Association of Saint Joseph, Confradia de San Jose, upon whom he imposed the very secular duties of domestic service in the convent and raffle ticket hawking. He had the audacity to dictate to a friend of mine a planter the value of the gifts he was to make to him, and when the planter was at length wearied of his importunities, he conspired with a Spaniard to deprive my friend of his estate, alleging 205 that he was not the real owner. Failing in this, he stirred up the petty governor and headman against him. The petty governor was urged to litigation, and when he received an unfavorable sentence, the priest, enraged at the abortive result of his malicious intrigues, 
actually left his vicarage to accompany his litigious protege to the chief judge of the province in quest of a reversion of the sentence. A priest of evil propensities brought only misery to his parish and aroused a feeling of odium against the Spanish friars in general. As incumbents they held the native in contempt. He who should be the parishioner was treated despotically as the subject whose life, liberty, property and civil rights were in his sacerdotal lord's power. And that power was not unfrequently exercised, for if a native refused to yield to his demands, or did not contribute with sufficient liberality to a religious feast, or failed to come to mass, or protected the virtue of his daughter, or neglected the genuflection and kissing of hands, or was out of the priest's party in the municipal affairs of the parish, or in any other trivial way became a persona non grata at the convent, he and his family would become the pastor's sheep marked for sacrifice. As government agent it was within his arbitrary power to attach his signature to or withhold it from any municipal document. From time to time he could give full vent to his animosity by secretly denouncing to the civil authorities as inconvenient in the town all those whom he wished to get rid of. He had simply to send an official advice to the governor of the province, who forwarded it to the government general, stating that he had reason to believe that the persons mentioned in the margin were disloyal, immoral, or whatever it might be, and recommend their removal from the neighborhood. A native so named suddenly found at his door a patrol of the civil guard, who escorted him, with his elbows tied together, from prison to prison, up to the capital town and thence to Manila. Finally, without trial or sentence, he was banished to some distant island of the archipelago. He might one day return to find his family ruined, or he might as often spend his last days in misery alone. Sometimes a native who had privately heard of his denunciation became a remontadu, that is to say he fled to the mountains to lead a bandit's life where the evils of a debased civilization could not reach him. Banishment in these circumstances was not a mere transportation to another place, but was attended with all the horrors of a cruel captivity, of which I have been an eyewitness. From the foregoing it may be readily understood how the conduct of the regular clergy was the primary cause of the rebellion of 1896, it was not the monks' immorality which disturbed the mind of the native, but their Caesarism which raised his ire. The ground of discord was always infinitely more material than sentimental. Among the friars, however, there were many exceptional men of charming manners and eminent virtue. If little was done to coerce the bulk of the friars to live up to the standard 206 of these exceptions, it was said to be because the general interests of Mother Church were opposed to investigation and admonition, for fear of the consequent scandal destructive of her prestige. The hierarchy of the Philippines consists of one archbishop in Manila, and four suffragan bishoprics, respectively of Nueva Segovia, Cebu, Jero, and Nueva Caceres. Point three: The provincials, the vicars general, and other officers of the religious orders were elected by the chapters and held office for four years. The first bishop of Manila took possession in 1581, and the first archbishop in 1598. The Jesuits came to these islands in 1581, and were expelled therefrom in 1770 by virtue of an apostolic brief for of Pope Clement XIV, but were permitted to return in 1859, on the understanding that they would confine their labors to scholastic education and the establishment of missions amongst uncivilized tribes. Consequently, in Manila they refounded their school the Municipal Athenaeum a mission house, and a meteorological observatory, whilst in many parts of Mindanao Island they have established missions, with the vain hope of converting Mahometans to Christianity. Point five: The Jesuits, compared with the members of the other orders, are very superior men, and their fraternity includes a few, and almost the only, learned ecclesiastics who came to the colony. Since their return to the islands, 1859, in the midst of the strife with the religious orders, the people recognized the Jesuits as disinterested benefactors of the country. Several Chinese have been admitted to holy orders, two of them having become Austin Friars. Point six: The first native friars date their admission from the year 1700 since when there have been sixteen of the Order of St. Augustine. Subsequently they were excluded from the confraternities, and only admitted to holy orders as vicars, curates to assist parish vicars, chaplains and in other minor offices. 
up to the year 1872 native priests were appointed to benefices, but in consequence of their alleged implication in the Kavita conspiracy of that year, their 207 church livings, as they became vacant, were given to Spanish friars, whose headquarters were established in Manila. The Austin friars were the religious pioneers in these islands, they came to Cebu in 1565 and to Manila in 1571, then followed the Franciscans in 1577, the Dominicans in 1587, a member of this order having been ordained first bishop of Manila, where he arrived in 1581. The Ricolitos, unshot Augustinians, a branch of the St. Augustine order, came to the islands in 1606, the Capuchins the lowest type of European monk in the Far East, came to Manila in 1886, and were sent to the Caroline Islands, Vidi p. 45, the Paulists, of the Order of St. Vincent de Paul, were employed in scholastic work in Nueva Caceres, Jairo, and Cebu, the same as the Jesuits were in Manila. The Benedictines came to the islands in 1895. Only the members of the first four orders above named were parish priests, and each, except the Franciscans, possessed agricultural land, hence the animosity of the natives was directed against these four confraternities only, and not against the others, who neither monopolized incumbencies, nor held rural property, but were simply teachers, or missionaries, whose worldly interests in no way clashed with those of the people. Therefore, whenever there was a popular outcry against the friars, it was understood to refer solely to the Austins, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Ricolitos. Point seven. There was no Spanish secular clergy in the islands, except three or four military chaplains. The church was financially supported by the state to the extent of about three quarters of a million pesos per annum. The following are some of the most interesting items taken from the budget for 1888, viz. colon sanctorum or church tax of 18 3 fourth cents, i.e., one one half reals, on each sadala personal, say on 2,760,613 sadalas in 1888, less 4, per center cost of collection 496,910 Cuban pesos the friars appointed to incumbencies received in former times tithes from the Spaniards, and a church tax from the natives computed by the amount of tribute paid. Tithe payment, diasmos prediles, by the Spaniards became almost obsolete, and the sanctorum tax on sadalas was paid to the church through the treasury, Vidi p. 55. There were priests in missions and newly formed parishes where the domiciled inhabitants were so few that the sanctorum tax on the aggregate of the sadalas was insufficient for their support. These missionaries were allowed salaries, and parish priests were permitted to appropriate from their revenues, as annual stipend, amounts ranging from 500 to 800 pesos, as a rule, with a few exceptions, such as Binondo 208 Parish and others, rated at 1,200 pesos, whilst one, at least, the parish priest, or missionary of Vergara, Davao province, received 2,200 pesos a year. In practice, however, a great many parish priests spent far more than their allotted stipends. A project was under consideration to value the incumbencies, and classify them, like the courts of justice, Vidi P. 234, with the view of apportioning to each a fixed income payable by the treasury in lieu of accounting to the church for the exact amount of the sanctorum. By decree of Government General Torero, dated November 23, 1885, the state furnished free labor, by natives who did not pay poll tax, for church architectural works provided it was made clear that the cost of such labor could not be covered by the surplus funds of the sanctorum. The chief items of church expenditure were as follows, viz. colon state outlay for church. PCTS Archbishop's salary 12,000 other salaries, cathedral, 40,300 other expenses, cathedral, 3,000 bishops, each with a salary of 6,000 Cuban pesos 24,000 court of arches, amount contributed by the state 8, 
5000 Chaplain of Los Banos 12000 Sulu Mission 1000 Mission House in Manila for Capuchin Friars 1700 12 Capuchins, state paid, for the Caroline and Palu Islands 6 at 300 Cuban pesos and 6 at 500 Cuban pesos each per annum 4800 Transport of missionaries estimated at about Per annum 10,000 the anticipated total state outlay for the support of the church, missions, monasteries, convents, etc., including the above and all other items for the financial year of 1,888 was 724,634 Cuban pesos 50 moreover, the religious corporations possessed large private revenues. The Dominicans' investments in Hong Kong, derived from capitalized income, are still considerable. The Austin, Ricolito, and Dominican friars held very valuable real estate in the provinces, which was rented to the native agriculturists on conditions which the tenants considered onerous. The native planters were discontented with the treatment they received from these landowners, and their numerous complaints formed part of the general outcry against the regular clergy. The bailiffs of these corporation lands were unordained brothers of the order. They resided in the estate houses, and by courtesy were styled fathers by the natives. They were under certain religious vows, but not being entitled to say mass, they were termed legos, or ignorant men, by their own order. The clergy also derived a very large portion of their incomes from 209 commissions on the sale of sathalas, sales of papal bulls, masses, pictures, books, chaplets, and indulgences, marriage, burial and baptismal fees, benedictions, donations touted for after the crops were raised, legacies to be paid for in masses, remains of wax candles left in the church by the faithful, fees for getting souls out of purgatory, alms, etc. The surplus revenues over and above parochial requirements were supposed to augment the common church funds in Manila. The corporations were consequently immensely wealthy, and their power and influence were in consonance with that wealth. Each order had its procurator in Madrid, who took up the cudgels in defense of his corporation's interest in the Philippines whenever this was menaced. On the other hand, the church, as a body politic, dispensed no charity, but received all. It was always begging, always above civil laws and taxes, claimed immunity, proclaimed poverty, and inculcated in others charity to itself. Most of the parish priests Spanish or native were very hospitable to travelers, and treated them with great kindness. Amongst them there were some few misanthropes and churlish characters who did not care to be troubled by anything outside the region of their vocation, but on the whole I found them remarkably complacent. In Spain there were training colleges of the three communities, in Valladolid, Ocana, and Monteagudo respectively, for young novices intended to be sent to the Philippines, the last Spanish colony where friars held vicarages. The ecclesiastical archives of the Philippines abound with proofs of the bitter and tenacious strife sustained, not only between the civil and church authorities, but even amongst the religious communities themselves. Each order was so intensely jealous of the others, that one is almost led to ponder whether the final goal of all could have been identical. All voluntarily faced death with the same incentive, whilst amicable fellowship in this world seemed an impossibility. The first bishop, Vidi P. 56, struggled in vain to create a religious monopoly in the Philippines for the exclusive benefit of the Augustine order. It has been shown how ardent was the hatred which the Jesuits and the other religious orders mutually entertained for each other. Each sacred fraternity labored incessantly to gain the ascendancy in the conquered territories, and their divine calling served for nothing in palliating the acrimony of their reciprocal accusations and recriminations, which often involved the civil power. For want of space I can only refer to a few of these disputes. The Austin friars attributed to the Jesuits the troubles with the Mahometans of Mindanao and Sulu, and, in their turn, the Jesuits protested against what they conceived to be the bad policy of the government, adopted under the influence of the other orders in Manila. So 210 distinct were their interests that the Augustine chroniclers refer to the other orders as different religions. In 1778 the province of Pangasinan was spiritually administered by the Dominicans, 
whilst that of Zimbals was allotted to the Ricolitos. The Dominicans, therefore, proposed to the Ricolitos to cede Zimbals to them, because it was repugnant to have to pass through Ricolito territory going from Manila to their own province. The Ricolitos were offered Mindoro Island in exchange, which they refused, until the archbishop compelled them to yield. Disturbances then arose in Zimbals, the responsibility of which was thrown on the Dominicans by their rival order, and the Ricolitos finally succeeded in regaining their old province by intrigue. During the governorship of Martin de Urena, Count de Lizarraga, 1709-15, the Aragonesa and Castilian priests quarreled about the ecclesiastical preferments. At the beginning of the 18th century the bishop-elect of Cebu, Fray Pedro Sáez de la Vega Lanzaverde, refused to take possession because the nomination was in partibus. He objected also that the bishopric was merely one in perspective and not yet a reality. The see remained vacant whilst the contumacious priest lived in Mexico. Fray Sebastian de Horanda was subsequently appointed to administer the bishopric, but also refused, until he was coerced into submission by the Supreme Court, 1718. In 1767 the Austin Friars refused to admit the episcopal visits, and exhibited such a spirit of independence that Pope Benedict XIV was constrained to issue a bull to exhort them to obey, admonishing them for their insubordination. The friars of late years were subject to a visiting priest the provincial in all matters de vita et moribus, to the bishop of the diocese in all affairs of spiritual dispensation, and to the government general as viceroyal patron in all that concerned the relations of the church to the civil government. Point nine, An observant traveler, unacquainted with the historical antecedents of the friars in the Philippines, could not fail to be impressed by the estrangement of religious men, whose sacred mission, if genuine, ought to have formed an inseverable bond of alliance and good fellowship. 211 One Navarrete's Colección de los Viajes y Descubrimientos, Tom. 2, NOS 12, 18. Madrid, 1825. 2 In the turbulent ages, centuries ago, it was not an uncommon thing for a prince or nobleman to secure his domain against seizure or conquest by transferring it nominally to the Pope, from whom he thenceforth held it as a papal fief. 3 Under the Spanish government, the Sea of Manila comprised the provinces of Bulacan, Pampanga, Zimbals, Cavita, La Laguna, Bataan, Island of Mindoro, and part of Tarlac. The other part of Tarlac was in the Sea of Nueva Segovia, which had, in 1896, ecclesiastical control over 997,629 Christians and 172,383 pagans. The Sea of Jero is the one most recently created, 1867. For the royal decree setting forth the execution of this brief was printed in Madrid in 1773. This politic religious order was banished from Portugal and Spain in 1767. In Madrid, on the night of March 31, the royal edict was read to the members of the Company of Jesus, who were allowed time to pack up their most necessary chattels and leave for the coast, where they were hurriedly embarked for Rome. The same order was suppressed forever in France in 1764. 5. At the date of the Tagalog Rebellion, 1896, the Jesuits in the islands were as follows, in Manila, 24 priests, 25 lay brothers, and 13 teachers, in Mindanao, 62 priests, and 43 lay brothers, making a total of 167 individuals. They were not allowed to possess real estate. 6. Vide Catalogo de los Religiosos de N.S.P. San Agustin. Published in Manila, 1864. 7. The Augustinian Order was founded in the 4th century, the Franciscan in 1210 and confirmed by Papal Bull in 1223, the Dominican in 1261, the Ricolito in 1602, the Benedictine in 530, the Capuchin in 1209 and the Paulist in 1625. 8. For any further expense this might incur, 3. Percenter was deducted from the parish priest's emoluments. 9. Recopilation de las leyes de Indias. Lay 46, 
Tit. 14, Lib 1 Degree, forbids priests and members of any religious body to take part in matters of civil government. Spanish insular government from the days of Legaspi the supreme rule in these islands was usually confided for indefinite periods to military men, but circumstances frequently placed naval officers, magistrates, the supreme court, and even ecclesiastics at the head of the local government. During the last half century of Spanish rule the common practice was to appoint a lieutenant general as governor, with the local rank of captain general pending his three years term of office. An exception to this rule in that period was made, 1883-85, when Joaquin Juveler, a captain general and ex-war minister in Spain, was specially empowered to establish some notable reforms the good policy of which was doubtful. Again, in 1897, Fernando Primo de Rivera, Marquis de Estela, also a captain general in Spain, held office in Manila under the exceptional circumstances of the Tagalog Rebellion of 1896, in succession to Ramon Blanco, Marquis de Pina Plata. Considering that Primo de Rivera, during his previous government generalship, 1880-83, had won great popularity with the Filipinos, he was deemed, in Madrid, to be the man most capable of arresting the revolutionary movement. How far the confidence of the home government was misplaced will be seen in Chapter XXII. Soon after the conquest the colony was divided and subdivided into provinces and military districts as they gradually yielded to the Spanish sway. Such districts, called encomiendas one were then farmed out to encomenderos, who exercised little scruple in their rigorous exact ions from the natives. Some of the encomenderos acquired wealth during the terms of their holdings, whilst others became victims to the revenge of their subjects. They must indeed have been bold, enterprising men who, in those days, would 212 have taken charge of districts distant from the capital. It would appear that their tenure was, in a certain sense, futile, for they were frequently called upon to aid the central government with vessels, men, and arms against the attacks of common enemies. Against Mahometan incursions necessity made them warriors if they were not so by taste civil engineers to open communications with their districts, administrators, judges, and all that represented social order. Encomiendas were sometimes given to Spaniards as rewards for high services rendered to the Commonwealth too although favoritism or, in later years, purchase money more commonly secured the vacancies, and the holders were quite expected to make fortunes in the manner they thought fit, with due regard for the royal treasury, Vidi P. 54. The encomenderos were, in the course of time, superseded by judicial governors, called alcaldes, who received small salaries, from sixty pounds per annum and upwards, but were allowed to trade. The right to trade called indulto de comercio was sold to the alcalde governors, except those of Tonda Three Samboanga, Cavita, Nueva Isija, Islas Batanes and Antique, whose trading right was included in the emoluments of office. The government's object was economy. In 1840 Eusebio Mazorca wrote thus for the salary paid to the chiefs of provinces who enjoy the right of trade is more or less 300 Cuban pesos per annum, and after deducting the amount paid for the trading right, which in some provinces amounts to five-sixths of the whole as in Pangasinan, and in others to the whole of the salary as in Carriga, and discounting again the taxes, it is not possible to conceive how the appointment can be so much sought after. There are candidates up to the grade of brigadier who relinquish a 3,000 Cuban pesos salary to pursue their hopes and projects in governorship. This system obtained for many years, and the abuses went on increasing. The alcaldes practically monopolized the trade of their districts, unduly taking advantage of their governmental position to hinder the profitable traffic of the natives and bring it all into their own hands. They tolerated no competition, they arbitrarily fixed their own purchasing prices, and sold at current rates. Due to the scarcity of silver in the interior, the natives often paid their tribute to the royal treasury in produce chiefly rice which was 213 received into the royal granaries at a ruinously low valuation, and accounted for to the state at its real value, the difference being the illicit profit made by the alcalde. 
Many of these functionaries exercised their power most despotically in their own circuits, disposing of the natives' labor and chattels without remuneration, and not unfrequently, for their own ends, invoking the king's name, which imbued the native with a feeling of awe, as if his majesty were some supernatural being. In 1810 Tamash de Komen wrote as follows in order to be a chief of a province in these islands, no training or knowledge or special services are necessary, all persons are fit and admissible. It is quite a common thing to see a barber or a governor's lackey, a sailor or a deserter, suddenly transformed into an alcalde, administrator and captain of the forces of a populous province without any counselor but his rude understanding, or any guide but his passions. 5. By royal decree of 1844 government officials were thenceforth strictly prohibited to trade, under pain of removal from office. In the year 1850 there were 34 provinces, and two political military commandancies. Until June, 1886, the offices of provincial civil governor and chief judge of that province were vested in the same person the alcalde mayor. This created a strange anomaly, for an appeal against an edict of the governor had to be made to himself as judge. Then if it were taken to the central authority in Manila, it was sent back for information to the judge governor, without independent inquiry being made in the first instance, hence protest against his acts was fruitless. During the regency of Queen Maria Cristina, this curious arrangement was abolished by a decree dated in Madrid, February 26, 1886, to take effect on June 1 following. Eighteen civil governorships were created, and alcaldes' functions were confined to their judgeships, moreover, the civil governor was assisted by a secretary, so that two new official posts were created in each of these provinces. The archipelago, including Sulu, was divided into 19 civil provincial governments, four military general divisions, 43 military provincial districts, and four provincial governments under naval officers, forming a total of 70 divisions and subdivisions 214 cost of Spanish administration PCTS. The government general received a salary of 40,000 the central government office, called Gobierno General, with its staff of officials and all expenses 43,708 the general government center was assisted in the general administration of the islands by two other governing bodies, namely, the general direction of civil administration the administrative council 29,277 34 28,502 the chief of the general direction received a salary of 12,000 Cuban pesos, with an allowance for official visits to the provinces of 500 Cuban pesos per annum. The council was composed of three members, each at a salary of 4,700 Cuban pesos, besides a secretary and officials. 70 divisions and subdivisions as follows, viz. Colon civil government's Manila PCE salary of civil governor 5,000 Cuban pesos total cost. 20,248,00 Alde, Batangas, Bulacan, Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, La Laguna, Pampanga, Pangasinan. Gofts, a first class salary of each civil government 4,500 Cuban pesos total cost of each government 8,900 Cuban pesos 8 first class gofts. Cost 71,200,00 Batan, Comorines Norte, Comorines Sur, Mindoro, Nueva Eclaya, Tayaba, Zimbals.